<laughs> Blue Coal presents The Shadow, the mystery man who strikes terror in the very hearts of shopsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Today, Cole Death. Ladies and gentlemen, an event of unusual interest will be broadcast from this studio at the end of the program. Be sure to listen. And before today's exciting adventure with the shadow begins, I'd like to offer a suggestion for home heating comfort. The next time you need fuel, order Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite. You don't have to get a full supply. The Blue Coal dealer will be glad to send you a trial ton. Use it, compare it with your regular fuel in every way. It's ten to one you'll find blue coal gives you better heat at less cost. So order blue coal by name. Phone your order to your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. Hello, Mr. Carver. Well, what do you want, Dawson? Why aren't you at Carverville? Tend to business. Fine mess you've made of things. Oh, so you've seen the story in the paper about conditions up in the village. Yes, you bring this fool. Don't you know you can't keep things quiet by manhandling a reporter? Now, wait a minute, boss. I can explain that. We had to rough that reporter up. He was taking pictures. Hey, I don't want any excuses. I pay you to manage my mail. If there's any more publicity about living conditions up there, you'll find yourself out of a job. Now, get out. Don't bother me with details. Get out. Okay, Mr. Carver, I won't bother you with details. But if anybody else comes up to Carverville snooping around and asking questions, we'll make them wish they never heard of the place. Commissioner Weston, I tell you, it's an outrage. Don't you agree, Cranston? It's a pretty sorry state of affairs, Commissioner. Uh, granted, the conditions existing in this little mill village Daniel Carver owns are an outrage. Why, he ought to be kicked out of this club. What do you think, Cranston? I agree, if the newspaper accounts are true. Sickness, half a dozen deaths recently. The authorities ought to be able to do something about a man like Carver. Mm. Apparently not. He owns Carverville, Lux, Stock and Barrel. Hmm. Speak of the devil, here's Carver now. Yeah, good evening, gentlemen. I gather you're discussing me and the maliciously distorted story about Carverville that appeared in the papers. As a matter of fact, we were, Mr. Carver. Yeah. Won't you sit down and give us your side of the story? There's nothing to discuss. There isn't one word of truth in that reporter's story. The people in Carverville are perfectly satisfied. They don't complain. Uh, perhaps they don't dare. They have no reason to complain, Cranston. I give them work in Manil, provide them with homes. Homes? Why, well, they make the worst city slums look like Park Avenue. Mm, Carverville is my affair. Well, maybe so, but this club may have something to say about your membership, Daniel Carver. Uh, this club, a <laughs> bunch of mawkish busybodies. What do I care? Vote me out. No one ever speaks to me here anyway. Go ahead, vote me out. Vote me out, go ahead. Must be some justice, some law. Oh, he's within the law. But now here's a case for an amateur criminologist like yourself. Cranston? Yes, there must be some way of helping those poor devils up in Carverville. Some way of dealing with a man like Carver. Lamont Cranston, would you mind telling me the reason for this long drive in zero weather? You'll soon see the reason, Margot. We're now entering Carverville. Take a good look at it. Oh, how drab. How awful. Look, Lamont, broken window stuffed with paper. I'm beginning to understand why you're here. But how did you hear about it? Daniel Carver, the man who owns this charming little mill village, is a fellow club member of mine. What are you going to do, Lamont? I don't know exactly until I've talked to some of these people. As Lamont Cranston or the Shadow? As a nameless social worker for the present, Margot. But I have a strong hunch the Shadow will have to play a big part if anything is to be done to help these people. Hmm. Here we are. You want some gas, mister? Uh, no, thanks, but could you tell me how to get to Mrs. Tucker's house? What do you want? Ma Tucker's got enough trouble already, what with her old man and kid dying since the cold set in. I read about it in the papers. We've come here to help. Listen, mister. Carverville folks ain't got much, but we ain't asking or welcoming no nosing around from strangers. If you'll just point out Mrs. Tucker's house, I'll see what she has to say. Well, uh, right over there by the creek... But don't say I didn't warn you, mister. Thanks. Come along, Margot. I may need your help to get Mrs. Tucker's confidence. Well, I'll do anything I can. 
You know, Lamont, there's something terrifying about this village. How so? Oh, that man and the way people are watching us from behind curtains in the windows of every house along the street. I'm afraid of something, Margot. Of what? That's just what I hope to discover in this house. Oh, there's something sinister about this place. Wait, Margot, someone's coming to the door. What do you want, mister? Are you Mrs. Tucker? I'm Ma Tucker. What do you want? May we come in? You say what you've got to say. Please, Mrs. Tucker, we've come to help you. No, you... Oh, all right. Come in. It don't matter. Nothing matters now. Thank you. Mrs. Tucker, we realize you've been through a terrible ordeal. Losing your husband and son within a week. Well, I ain't no worse off than anybody else in Carverville. What are you going to do? I got one boy left, Sam. He works in the mill. Mrs. Tucker, how much rent do you people have to pay for these houses? Hey, you better get out of here, mister. You don't want to get me in more trouble for talking to you at all. You better get out. Who would make trouble for you because you talk to us? Never you mind that, mister. And if you know what's good for you, you'll get out of Carverville before Dawson and the others from Carverville get here. Hey, Ma, who are these folks? This is my son, Sam. Hello, Sam. Well, howdy. You welfare workers from the city? You might call us there. We've come here to investigate conditions. Uh, they've been asking questions about the houses, Sam, but I didn't tell them nothing. Well, why didn't you, Ma? Huh? I'm sick of all this fear old man Carver and his spies. We kept quiet for years, and, and what's it got us? What did they get Pa and young Jim? We slave in the mill, and they rob us at Carver's store, and we live in these pigsties that Carver calls houses, and, and when we're old and sick, he lets us die off like a lot of mangy dogs. Shut up, Sam. Don't talk like that. Somebody will hear Well, let him hear it's time somebody heard the truth. Can't you do something, mister? Can't you help us? If somebody don't help us. God only knows where this will end. Thanks for speaking out, Sam. You'll have to help. Lamont, there's a crowd gathering outside. What? I knew it. I knew there'd be now, trouble. Be quiet, Ma. Listen, mister, I got a notion you're all right. Come on, Tucker. Sam, open up. We're going to chase them smart out of you strangers out of town. Like we did that reporter. Listen, Sam, we'll have to leave or there'll be trouble. But will you meet me in the next town in a couple of hours? I've got to know everything that's been going on here if I'm to help you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll meet you. Look for my car on Main Street. Come on, Margot. Keep close to me. Lamont, I hope no one saw Sam Tucker meet us down this road as you asked him to. I hope not, Margot. What are you going to do now that he's told you the tragic story of Carverville? Going back to Carverville. Right now, tonight? Yes, first to call on old man Carver. I thought he was in the city. He evidently heard that more strangers were in Carverville this afternoon asking questions. Oh, what a beast Carver must be, Lamont. If he could only be made to see the misery and suffering he's caused. He's going to see it, Margot, tonight. Lamont, there's Carverville. Oh, not that I'm afraid We're but... stopping. That's Carver's house right ahead there. Yes, I see a light downstairs, Lamont. What are you going to do? Margot, do you remember Scrooge in... Dickens' Christmas Carol. Yes, and Carver is worse than Scrooge ever thought of being. Tonight, Daniel Carver is going to feel more remorse than Ebenezer Scrooge ever did. He deserves it. I'll wait in the car, Lamont. It's bitter cold. Well, if those poor people down there in those flimsy houses can stand it, I can. I'll wait here. But how are you going to make Carver visit those poor people? Margot, tonight, Daniel Carver is going on a sightseeing tour, personally conducted by the Shadow. In just a moment, we will continue with the second part of The Shadow's thrilling adventure. While you are engaged in last-minute preparations for Christmas, don't neglect the health and comfort of your family. Be sure of a cozy, warm home during the holidays by ordering a supply of blue coal. No matter how cold or how mild the weather, blue coal is the most economical fuel for heating or cooking purposes. Up in the Arctic regions, where the temperature today is at least 60 degrees below zero... Fur traders and trappers are keeping warm with blue coal. They've used other fuels only to find that blue coal will keep them warm more economically than any other fuel. Blue coal is a Pennsylvania anthracite, the fuel that burns long and steadily. It is the fuel that furnaces, parlor stoves, and cooking ranges in New England were especially designed to burn. And the finest Pennsylvania anthracite is blue coal. Mined by the Glen Alden Coal Company, employing American labor, and it is transported by American railroads. Every carload is laboratory tested for purity and uniform size before shipment. 
Blue coal comes in all domestic sizes. Egg, stove, chestnut, and pea size. For economy's sake, and for greatest comfort in cold weather, insist on blue coal. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer. You'll find his name listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. Dalton, I told you if there's any more trouble up here in Carverville, I'd fire you, didn't I? Yeah. Uh. Well, there ain't been no trouble, Mr. Carver. Not yet. If that guy that was here this afternoon comes back tonight, we'll make him wish he'd never heard of Carterville. Oh, what makes you think he will come back? I know he's coming back. Tonight. You got Sam Tucker to meet him down in the next town. How do you know that? <laughs> I took a rubber hose to the kid when he came back about an hour ago. He wouldn't talk. We got enough out of him to know that that social worker is up to something. Well, I don't want any shooting and killing now. You just leave that fellow to me, Mr. Carver. You said you didn't want to be bothered with details. Uh, what are you going to do, Dawson? Well, nothing much. But don't you worry. There ain't no law against a fellow being shot accidental while he's snooping around in the dark. Mm. You just leave the details to me. So long, boy. Yeah. Yeah, I was a fool to come up here from the city tonight. No coal country house. No electricity. Nothing but candles. Yeah, the wind even blows the door open. <laughs> what was that? Who blew out the candle? The wind. The wind blew out the candle. Are you afraid of the dark, Daniel Carver? Who are you? What do you want? I have no money here. I don't want your money. I have come for you. Who are you? I've been called fear, conscience, remorse. But I am best known to your kind. As the shadow. The shadow? I don't believe in things like that. You're a man. I hear your voice. If you're one of those stupid fools from the village, you've got any idea of killing me, you'd better think first. You will hang for it. Since you will not believe that I am the shadow, let us pretend I'm one of those unfortunates from your village. Let us pretend that here in the darkness I am standing with a gun Pointed at your heart. Oh, what do you want of me? I want you to come with me. Come with me. No, 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 you're going to murder me. I won't leave this house. I won't go with you. Come, or I'll use the gun you are so sure I have in my hand. Even though you can't see the gun, or my hand, or me. Yeah. All right. All right, I'll come. I'll do anything, only don't shoot. If it's money you want, I'll get it for you. Get in your car. Uh, first, let me get an overcoat. It's bitter cold. No. It's time you learned what it feels like to be cold. Uh, where are we going? Drive down to that squalid sink of misery that bears your name. To Carverville. Don't cry out. Don't try to escape me. For I'm right behind you. In the back seat of the car. What do you want me to do in the village? Stop at that little bridge. Be careful, Carver. I can read your thoughts. You're thinking you'll cry out, attract attention, and get away from me. But you'll never get away unless you do exactly as I tell you for the next few minutes. What are you going to make me do? You will go where I tell you. And listen. And watch. And what if I meet someone? If you should, don't speak. Uh, there's a little bridge. Stop the car. Now get out of the car, Daniel Carver. This is the Tucker house. Walk to that lighted window over there. Stand there by that broken pane... Stuffed with paper. Why have you brought me here? You better look out. Little Dawson, my foreman, and some men are out looking for some stranger that's been snooping around here. We might be shot by mistake. That is a chance we must take, Carver. Look into that room and listen. All right. All right. 
Oh, listen, Ma, oh, everything's no, going to turn out all right. Those folks who were here today, they're going to do something. Oh, I'm trying to hope so, Sam. But hoping comes mighty hard when hope's been killed so often. Mm. Pa's dead. Your brother's dead. Listen to that. Oh, Sam, you got to go away. you got to go far away. And after what's happened, Dawson will fix you good. It won't be just a beating. He'll fix it so something will happen to you at the mill. You've got to go away, son. Yeah, but I can't leave you, Ma. Not even long enough to hunt another job. Oh, don't you fret about me, Sam. I ain't got much longer on this earth anyhow, son. You get away. You get away from here while you've got a chance. Oh, Ma. Ma, you're crying. You didn't even cry when Pa died. Seemed like I couldn't. Seemed like he was better off dead. Because he was free of old man Carver at last. <laughs> at last. Oh, Ma, at don't... Last. Come, Carver. I have something else to show you. What? what are you trying to do? Where are you taking me now? You will see. Tell me, Carver, have you ever heard the story of Scrooge? Well, what has the story of Scrooge got to do with me? You are Scrooge, Daniel Carver, a 20th century Scrooge. And this is Christmas. You'd never believe it to look down the streets of this mill town of yours. Would you, Carver? Then what do you expect me to do about it? You are not your brother's keeper, are you, Carver? Uh, let me go. My hands are freezing. Still thinking of yourself? Is that the Christmas spirit, Carver? Uh, let me go and, and I'll do something. Send some Christmas baskets. That would ease your conscience, wouldn't it? No, Carver. You're not going to get off so easy. I've, I've seen enough. Where are you taking me now? Just a little way. A few steps to that lighted window over there. To that house with a car standing in front of it. Uh, if they can afford a car... That is a doctor's car. Your villagers don't own cars. They don't own anything. Go to that lighted window there. Look in. See what is happening. Listen. There's frost on the glass. I can't see. There's another broken pane. The hole is filled with paper to keep out the cold. Like the Tucker's window. Push the paper aside. All right. I will. Try and be calm, Mrs. Uh, Anderson. I know it's hard, but you must for the child's sake. I'll try, Doctor. I, I will try. I can't help feeling the way I do. My husband dying of pneumonia only last month. Now Judy going the same way. Oh, there's still hope. I'd move her to a hospital if there were one near enough. I wish there were only some way of keeping these rotten carver houses warm. But you might as well try to heat a barn. Mommy. Listen, Carver. Mommy. Yes, darling. I'm right here, Judy, dear. Mommy's here. Mommy. Could I have Cecile? Of course you can, honey. Here's your doll, Judy. Mommy, do you think Santa Claus will bring me a real doll? I hope so, Judy. I, I'll ask him. <laughs> Come, Mrs. Anderson. She may sleep now. We'll try to keep the room warm. That's all we can do now. That and hope. Hope for the best. Look at that child, Daniel Carver. She's dying. And you, and you alone, are to blame. Oh, stop. Don't. Don't torture me anymore. If that child dies, Carver, there will be no candles. No gay candles on a gift-laden Christmas tree but white candles shedding a ghostly light around a packing box coffin. No, no, stop. It will be the monument to your life no. of selfish greed no. and a cross you will bear through all eternity. No. Unless... Unless... Unless what? Unless you make amends. I'll do anything. 
I'll do anything to make amends. I didn't know. I've been blind, selfish. No baskets of fruit or pennies in the snow will wipe out your sins against these long-suffering people, Carter. I know. I know. I'll make everything right. That little girl, she needs medicine, a warm house. Let me go in and get the doctor to move her to my house on the hill. I'll get specialists. I'll do anything to save her life. Wait, Carver. That is only the beginning. What of all the others? What of these death traps you call homes? I'll tear them all down, burn them, build new ones. Houses that are warm and comfortable and safe. I swear it. But tell me, who are you? I owe you everything for showing me what I've been doing to these people who depend on me. I told you once before, I am the shadow. But you are a man. Why can't I see you? I have clouded your mind, made it impossible for you to see me. You will never see me. Never hear my voice again, Daniel Carver. If you keep your word. I will keep my word. I swear it. If you don't, the shadow will return. And the next time... Oh, hey, Al. You see that in our bonnet? Oh, hey, Bill. Shadow. It's my foreman, Bill Dawson and Al Trimble. Yes, I know. They mean to kill a man. If they can find him. They're after some fellow that was here this afternoon with a young woman. Welfare workers, I think. What will we do? Let them come. This is your first test. You are responsible for their acts. What are you going to do, Carver? But they, they might shoot us by mistake. They've got shotguns. This is your chance, Carver. That fellow's around here, we'll find him, Al. Go around the back of Tucker Shack and take a look. Okay. I'm just itching to throw a bead on that nosy city fellow. Now's your chance to deal with Dawson. What are you going to do, Carver? I'll show you. Just watch me. Don't shoot. Dawson. Dawson, don't shoot. It's me, Carver. Carver. Hey, what are you doing here? You come within an ace of blowing your head off. I've come here to see what I've been doing to these people by giving you a free hand. Well, you said you didn't want to be bothered. I know. I know. I am to blame. I've been blind. But that's all finished now. I'm going to make this village all over. Build new homes. Make up for all the misery I've caused these people. <laughs> You're getting kind of soft, ain't you, Carver? You won't think so when I tell you that you are through, fired, you and Al Trimble and all your kind. Listen here, you mealy-mouthed old skinflint. You can't fire me. I've done your dirty work too long. You get out of Carverville, you're through, Dawson. Yeah, that's what you think. You or nobody else is firing me. Put down that shotgun, Dawson. You'll hang for this. The devil, I will. It'll be an accident. An accident like what's going to happen to that city. Dawson, son. don't you pull that trigger, you fool. Say your prayers, you rat. Ah, you, you missed. No. No, something, something knocked the gun up in the air. You didn't, Carver, you couldn't. It was something just about knocked the gun out of my hand. <laughs> You are quite right, Bill Dawson. I saved you from committing a cold-blooded murder. What was that? Who said that? A shadow, Dawson. A shadow? A ghost? Call me what you like, but I am here, helping Daniel Carver, helping the people of this village. Bill! Hey, Bill! Dawson! You get him? Al, Al, come on, we're getting out of here. Something just talked to me. Ah, you must be drunk, Bill. Hey, what's that over there? It's old man Carver. But it wasn't him. It knocked my gun right out of my hand. Come on, I tell you, this place is haunted. Ah, there ain't no such thing. <laughs> okay. Listen to that. Where is it? Come on, tell me. Where's it coming from? Who's that laughing? It ain't Carver. Yes. It did sound kind of like a ghost. And I don't see nothing. Go. Go quickly, both of you. Get out of Carverville and don't come back. Come on, Al, you fool. Let's get out of here. Hey, Bill, wait. Wait, don't leave me here alone with that thing. Wait. Shadow. Shadow. Are you still here? Yes, Daniel Carver. Oh, thank you, whoever, whatever you are. Thank you for saving my life. I saved you because you have much work to do. If there was only some way of repaying you for making me see the truth, you should have credit for all this. Just bring happiness to the people of this village, Daniel Carver. That will be your repayment in full to the Shadow. I'll do it. Look, Carver, the people of the village are getting up enough nerve to come out of their house. I'll call them all together right now. I'll tell them what I'm going to do. I'll make this the happiest Christmas season they've ever had. Yes, I believe you will, Daniel Carver. Uh, what happened in her? Who's that? 
Yeah, who, who's been shooting? Anybody hurt? Hey, golly, it's, it's Mr. Carver. Well, what's he doing here? What do you want, Mr. Carver? Uh, hurt wait a Mr. moment. Carver? Wait a moment, all of you. Oh, I know you have good reasons to hate. Tonight I've been shown why. Something, someone came to me. Oh, I don't know what he was. I don't care. All I know is he was like a spirit of God. He has shown me how to create a new Carverville. A happy Carverville where the spirit of Christmas will shine all these years through. Men and women, a shadow has brought us light. This Carver, this is the peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. Friends, this afternoon we have an event of unusual importance to bring to you. The Shadow Program is to be honored with one of radio's most coveted awards, which heretofore has been captured by other outstanding programs such as Jack Benny, Fred Allen, and the March of Time, the Pilot Radio Award. Mr. Harry A. Smith, president of Blue Coal, will accept this award from Mr. Sylvester Thompson, vice president of the Pilot Radio Corporation, who will make the official presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. During the past year, the Pilot Radio Award Society has been making periodic awards to various programs on the air which represent the highest achievements in their particular fields of entertainment. And so it's only natural that your program, The Shadow, should have come to our attention. But we can easily understand the reason why The Shadow has held its high place in popular favor for so many years. It brings all the thrill and flavor of mystery drama to radio audiences. In addition, the committee commends you very highly upon bringing some of the finest actors of the American stage into the homes of so many radio listeners. Recognizing your noteworthy contribution to fine radio entertainment, I take pleasure in presenting to you, Mr. Smith, the Pilot Radio Award of Merit, and I am certain that the shadow will continue to delight radio audiences for many years to come. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. On behalf of the Glen Alden Coal Company and the D.L. and W. Coal Company, producers and sellers of blue coal, it gives me great pleasure to accept this award. We greatly appreciate this recognition of our efforts to entertain the radio public. We realize, however, that the credit is due to those who prepared, directed, and presented the shadow. The Blue Coal Dealers of America join me in expressing their appreciation to our very able artists who have presented this entertainment, and our thanks to you for this recognition of their efforts. I assure you that they will endeavor to keep their future presentations of the same high quality that we endeavor to maintain in every ton of blue coal. The story you have just heard is copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters in this story are entirely fictitious, and a similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, Blue Pole, America's famous anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen, and be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. What evil lurks in the hearts of men. <laughs> the shadow knows.
Ladies and gentlemen, while you're getting set for the Shadow's latest thriller, let me say a few words about that great new Goodrich Silvertown tire. Because believe me, motorists, this new kind of tire is making history. It takes care of skid and blowout problems like they have never been taken care of before. And here's proof positive. The engineers of the famous independent Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory tested the regular and premium price tires of the nation's six largest tire manufacturers. The results? Listen. No other tire tested, regardless of price, came up to the new Goodrich Silvertown in skid resistance. What's more, this great tire gave more non-skid mileage than any other tire tested in its price class, averaging 19.1% more miles before the tires wore smooth. That's the same as saying this new Silvertown gives you every sixth mile free. Ride on the safest thing on wheels, the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown. The shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Mark of the Bat. Alexei, come. Come in the house out of the night air. I am coming, Marie. The dogs were restless, whimpering. Must be the storm coming. It is more than the storm, as you know it, Alexei. I'm not sure. Why aren't you in bed asleep? There'll be no sleep in this house tonight. Or any night. Then you've seen the great bats, too? Yes, I've seen the farmer's cattle. Bloodless, dead in the fields. And the white comb of the dead rooster. Ah, it was the same on the farm of my father in Croatia. Alexei, why did this Dr. Vickers send away his stepfather's servants? Why does he pay us so much to stay in this house? Why do we stay knowing what we know? Jobs are hard to find, Marie. But I think we go soon, when the master of the house dies. It cannot be long, and I am not sorry. It is his own doing. He brought the bats here, set them free to kill. And now they take his life from him, in the night, in the darkness. Only for his daughter am I sorry. She is young. She was beautiful. But each dawn finds her more like those things from the grave. Have you seen the mark of the vampire on her, Marie? Yes. Only this morning. On the throat as she lay sleeping. The sins of the father. It is his punishment. The great bats are children of Satan. He brought them here from the caves he found in that strange country he wrote books about. Yeah. And he laughed at the stories I told him. The vampire bat is a thing of evil, leagued with the devil, stealing the blood of the living, that the dead may go on living in their graves. <laughs> Well, it will drive the bats back into the cave in the mountain. That much is good. <gasps> Marie! What is it? A shadow passed across the moon. Oh! oh! The clouds of the storm, maybe? No, no. A bat like a great bird. It is an omen, Marie, an omen. The dog howls? Yes. <gasps> the dog howls. Quick! Light the candle at the crucifix. Yes. Yes, the crucifix. Here comes Dr. Vickers. Yes, Alexei. It is quite fitting that you light the candle. Say a prayer, Mary. Dr. Vickers, is, is the master, Major Stevens, is he? Yes, Mary. My esteemed stepfather, Major Stevens, is dead. <laughs> Oh, 
Mr. Mark Cranston, we've come 200 miles up into these spooky mountains. Why? I've been reading the obituary columns, Margot. As a result, we're going to visit the home of a man who once had a very strange hobby. Oh, so Lamont Cranston, the amateur criminologist, has been reading between the lines again. Who died recently? The corpse, Margot, is Major Stevens, a noted explorer and zoologist. Oh. Yes. Well, I tell you anything more, let me ask you a question. Yes? Do you believe in vampires? What? Creatures with the power to leave the grave, transform themselves into bats, and draw from the flesh of the living blood to feed the bodies of the restless dead? Lamont, are you serious? Quite. Of course I don't believe it. What's all this about? You guessing, or, or do you know? I'm going on a curious mixture of theory and fact. I've known about Stevens for years. He led an expedition of five men into the mountains of Ecuador, came back alone, with a cage full of vampire bats, big ones. For years, he's been breeding them. Oh, a cheerful hobby, I must say. It's become an obsession. Six months ago, I read that a neighboring farmer sued him, claiming those vampire bats killed three of his cattle. But Lamont, that's preposterous. No, Margot, it isn't. There are authentic cases where cattle have been killed by blood-sucking vampire bats. And you think Major Stevens' pet bats killed those cattle and, and killed the Major as well? It's possible. All of which leads to what, Lamont? Who are we going to call on tonight? Not Major Stevens, I hope. No, the Major is safely interred in his grave. Oh, you make it sound so cozy. Stevens had a daughter, Claire Stevens. I've checked up. She's suffering from the same ailment that supposedly killed her father, anemia. Oh. Stevens was wealthy. Claire's his heir, but she's under age, only 20. And there's a guardian in the picture, Dr. Vickers, uh, who also happens to be the Major's stepson. I think I'm beginning Apparently, to see. Apparently, Vickers is running things. He's even discharged the family servants and hired an old Slavic couple. Why? And they're Croats, Margot, not very far removed from the atmosphere of their native land where for centuries human vampires have been accepted fact. Now, do you see what I'm driving at? Yes. Yes, I'm afraid I do. Claire Stevens is being led to believe that she's a victim of human vampires. Yes. Whereas, actually, she's being bled to death by the giant vampire bats. Is that it, Lamont? That's right, Margot. Oh. It's just a breed of very large bats. I see. Oh, this is a lonely road. We haven't passed a car in ages. My little father, huh? Good heavens. Oh. Oh, what's wrong, Lamont? Look. Look, a man uh, lying there beside the road. Wait here, Margot. This may be a hold-up gag. Well, what's wrong with him? Has he been hit? Beaten up, I think. Wait, I'll, I'll help you with him. Is he alive? Yes, but unconscious. Lamont, there's a paper clutched in his hand. See what it is. Listen to this, Margot. Dave, if you love me, come and take me away from this awful house. I can't explain only... Come, if you don't, you'll never see me alive again. Signed, Claire. Claire Stevens! Oh, Lamont, this boy must have tried to help us. Yes, and failed. What are we going to do, Lamont? Drive him back to the last town we passed? No, Margot, he needs a doctor, and I think the logical man to patch him up is the one who may have had a hand in this. Vickers. You're going to take him to the Stevens house? No, you are, Margot. Oh, but, but you'll be with me in that house. Yes, Margot, but in my role of the shadow... It'd be better if you're not Margot Lane. Pretend to be an old friend of Claire Stevens. If yes. she's in danger, she won't give you away. All right. Help me get the boy into the car. <coughs> then I'll drive. <coughs> Lamont! What's the matter, Margot? Lamont, look on his throat. Good heavens. Oh, a bat. Fastened to his throat. Kill it, Lamont. Yes. Yes, Margot. One of Major Stevens' pets. A vampire bat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, while we leave the shadow for a moment, here's a brief reminder that when you want real tire safety, halfway measures don't go. There's no such thing as saving half your life. The shadow knows. Beware. In these days of high speeds and super highways, you need protection against both skids and blowouts every time you get behind the wheel of your car. And motorists, the tire that will give you life-saving protection against both of these driving hazards is the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown. For remember, only Silvertowns give you the skid protection of the Lifesaver tread. This amazing new Goodrich development protects you against the hazard zone of motoring, where a slippery film of water on the road can make complete command of your car almost impossible. The never-ending spiral bars of this Lifesaver tread act like a whole battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep drainage groove. Make a dry track for the rubber to grip. You stop quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. And don't forget, adding one safety feature to another, Silvertowns also give you the famous golden ply protection against dangerous high-speed blowouts. 
Why ride on anything but the safest thing on wheels, especially when Silvertowns give you these two great life-saving features at no extra cost? Play safe with Goodrich, spelled G-O-O-D-R-I-C-H. Goodrich Safety Silvertown. Alexei, who drove Dave Henderson here? A young girl, Dr. Vickers. She says she's a friend of Miss Stevens. A uh, friend of Claire's, eh, Alexei? Yes. And young Dave Henderson. Huh. Odd that she should come here tonight. Strange that she should find him on the road. Where are they? In the room where the Major worked with the bats, Dr. Vickers. Good. Nothing could be better. It will save me considerable trouble. I lock the door. Unlock it. Then go back and watch Miss Claire's room. See, she does not leave it. Why? <laughs> What's the matter, Alexei? Your hand is shaking. You're afraid. Yes. Yes, and you would be afraid, too. Those caged bats in there, they, they killed the Major. I know, I know. They're creatures of the devil. Nonsense. There's nothing to worry about. I have released the good major's pets. Taken them out of their cages and sent them back to the bottomless pit in the grotto. Yes, but a bat like a bird of evil flew across the moon the night the major died. It was an omen. An omen of death. <laughs> Tell that to Miss Claire. She'll believe you. And watch carefully, Alexei. Two, perhaps three of those bats may fly across the moon tonight. More omens of death. But now, go upstairs. See that I am not disturbed. Yes, doctor. The girl is there, in the far end of the room with the young man. Doctor, are you Dr. Vickers? Yes. I understand you brought a young man here, victim of some hit-and-run driver. No, he's been beaten. I'm afraid his skull is fractured, and not only yes, that... Yes, 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 yes. Alexei told me your fantastic story of finding a giant bat drawing his life blood from his throat. But it's true. The marks are still on his throat. Look there. Hmm, hmm. Still unconscious. Has he spoken at all? No, but don't stand there. Do something. You're a doctor, or so I was told. By whom? Oh, yes, you're a friend of Miss Stevens. Of course you would know. Of course. Where is Claire? Sleeping. You were coming to call on her at this late hour. Why? Well, we're old friends. I, I heard of her father's death. I. You know this young man? I... No, no, I don't. Hmm, that's odd. This man is David Henderson, Miss Stevens' fiancé. Oh, well... Well, you see, I I haven't seen Claire for several years. How many? Why, for... Oh, not for... For three years. Oh, but don't stand there questioning me. Do something for him. There'll be plenty of time for that. I'm more interested in you and just why you happened to pick this night to visit such an old and dear friend. A friend who apparently never spoke of Dave Henderson, to whom she's been engaged for many years. A childhood sweetheart. Well, you... Yes, I see. I see you are lying. Who are you? What do you want in this house? I want you to treat that boy. Yes, I will treat him. In good time and in my own way. But first, I think you need my attention. Keep away from me. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to kill that boy. Oh, now I'm beginning to understand. So you know. Yes, I know. You know too much. Too much to ever leave this house. Lucky interruption for you. It will give you a few minutes grace, young woman, and a chance to see your dear friend, Claire Stevens. What did you and Dr. Vickers done to Dave? Who was that woman? Let go of me. He's in there. I know he is. Come, Doctor, let you stay in your room. Come. Oh. What's going on out here, Alexei? Uh, doctor, I couldn't stop her. She tricked me. She ran down here. I'll take her back. No, come. I won't go. You've got Dave here. It's all right, Alexei. Let her come in. You wait out in the hall. Oh. Yes, Claire, my dear, Dave is here. You can see him. And there is someone else, an old friend of yours. An old, an old friend? Yes, that young woman there. Well, you don't seem to recognize her. Perhaps it's been so long since you've seen each other. Claire, uh, don't you remember me? Grace Wilson, we, we went to school together. What? I heard you were in trouble. I thought I might be able to help. What? What? Oh, oh, oh of course. Grace, Grace Wilson. I I'm so glad you're here, Grace. But, Dave, you said I could see him. Where is he? There, on the couch. Dave. Oh, Dave, Dave, darling. It's Claire. Claire. Oh. Is... Is he dead? No. But he may die if we don't get help. Oh. To revive him. 
This Dr. Vickers won't help. Why won't you do something? Dave's hurt. His head's cut open. Dr. Vickers won't <laughs> help because he did it. What? He wants Dave Henderson to die, just as he wants me out of the way now that I've discovered his secret. And you, Claire Stevens, you're marked for death. No. I can see it in your face. You're as pale as a ghost already, half bled to death. You're a victim, too. A victim of vampire bats. No. No, it can't be. Not that. I- I've been ill. Dr. Vickers has been treating me. Your father died of Dr. Vickers' treatment. Dr. Vickers, you... Why do you look at me like that? Why, my dear child. Oh, then, then it is true. Those sedatives in the open window. That was so the giant bats could come from the well in the grotto oh, and... you've been listening to the fantastic tales of Marie and Alexei, my dear. Monstrous nightmares out of a ghoulish past. Miss Stevens, don't listen to him. He's a murderer. We've got to get your fiancé out of this house. But he won't let us go. The door's locked. He has the key. Yes, my dear, you are quite right. The door is locked. I have the key. The only way out is through that door leading to the tunnel in the cave. To the bottomless pit your father so aptly named the Well of the Bats. Father, seal that tunnel when the bats escape. Yes, but I opened it again. It will come in very handy. Tonight. The storms have kept the bats in the grotto for many nights now. They must be very hungry for blood. (gasps) What a feast they will have. Come, Claire. No. The vampires are tired of coming to you. It is time you visited them. Oh, Stevens, get back. Keep away from me. Stupid heroics will not save you. Keep back, young woman, or I shall have to shoot you. (laughs) The bats won't mind. (laughs) Not so long as the blood in your body is still warm. (laughs) Come, Claire. Come with me. No. No. <laughs> Very well. Perhaps you would rather follow your beloved David. I'll take him first. Oh, no, no, don't. He doesn't know anything. If you'll only let him go, I'll... Oh, oh, no. I thought that would bring you to me. <laughs> Dr. Vickers. Dr. Vickers. You are startled, Doctor. I see in your eyes and read in your reeling mind... Questions, no. questions beating in your brain like the black wings of your destroyers. Who am I? Where am I? Is this voice you hear real, or the trickery of a mind warped and twisted by the remorse of murder done and murders yet to come? No, no. <laughs> the gun in your hand trembles, Doctor Vickers. Your lips are dry. But you. Who are you? The Shadow, Dr. Vickers. The Shadow! The Shadow! It would seem you have heard of the Shadow, Doctor. Yes. Yes, I've heard of you, Shadow. Do you believe what you have heard? Yes. I know all about your devilish tricks of mesmerism. Hypnotic influence. I know you're here in this room, but I can't see you. I know my gun isn't any use against you, but that won't stop me. I'm going into the grotto, and I'm taking these girls with me. Both of them. Try to stop me, Shadow, and I'll shoot them both! All right, Claire. And you too, Miss Wilson, or whoever you really are. Quick! Get through this door and let you want me to use this gun. No, don't! We'd better do as he says, Miss Stevens. Come on. All right. All right, Shadow. Let's see you follow me through this door. (laughs) It bolts on the inside. And by the time you've broken it down, the vampire bats will be feasting on these two women. The only ones who stand between me and Stevens' fortune. It should have been mine in the first place. And now it will be. It will be mine. Don't be too sure, Dr. Vickers. For the grotto will be filled with shadows. Shadows of the living. Shadows of the dead. Listen to me. Wake up. Listen. Oh, oh my head. It aches. Listen, David Henderson. Uh, you came to save your fiance. She's in danger. Uh, Dr. Vickers has taken her to the grotto, to the well of the bats. What? Claire gone into the cave? Yes. What? Well, who am I talking to? There's no one here. Oh, I must be out of my mind. No. There is someone here. The Shadow. The Shadow? Yes. 
Don't be alarmed because you cannot see me. Even to those I try to help, I must remain unseen, unknown, for their own safety. There is no time to explain the whys and wherefores of my presence. I'm here to help you and your fiancé. If we don't get into the grotto and stop him, Vickers will kill Claire Stevens and a girl who's with her. No. Kill them and drop them into the well of the bats. That, that heavy door leads to the pit. Come on. I can't follow that way. I've tried. It's bolted on the other side. Is there another way into the grotto? Any other way of reaching the pit? Well, yeah. Yeah, there is. One other way. Major Stevens showed me years ago. Where? Up on the side of the mountain, there's an opening. Shorter that way. Maybe we can get in that way and head Vickers off before he reaches the pit. Come on, I'll show you the way. If I get my hands on Vickers, the, the bats will have their feast tonight on him. Shadow. Shadow. We're almost there. Shadow. I am still close to you. Go on. We may be too late. Be careful along here. This ledge is slippery. We're getting near the pit. How deep is this pit, this well of the bats? No one knows. Once Major Stevens and I dropped a weighted kite string down into it. A thousand feet of string. It didn't touch bottom. Shadow, look. There's a light. A torch down the passageway. That must be Vickers. It's in the big chamber. That's where the pit is. We're not too late, see? Your fiancé and the other girl is with him. Wait, stop here. Well, he's forcing them toward the pit. He's going to kill both of them. I tell you, let me go. No, you've done your part. Stay here. No, no, I won't. I won't, I tell you. But you must. To understand if Vickers saw you coming, he'd shoot you down. You'd be signing the death warrant of your fiancé and the other girl. Oh, I'll, I'll get him. I'll get him before he sees me. Let, let go of me, Shadow. Let... Sorry, I had to knock you out like that, Henderson, but... It's the only way. They'll kill you with this, Dr. Vickers. The police will find it out. They'll hang you. I think not. <laughs> My dear Claire, you see, to prove a murder has been committed, there must be some trace of the body. Oh. The vampires will leave little in the way of evidence. Oh, have you forgotten the shadow, Dr. Vickers? You think he'll let you live to enjoy the fruits of this ghastly thing you're about to do? So you're still counting on the shadow to save you. He may not be able to save us. But you'll never get away from him unless you follow us into that pit. Oh, hope and faith die hard. I've been wondering why one of you didn't try to get away from me. So I would have an excuse to shoot you down. Oh, you need an excuse. No, not really. But there is something fascinating about watching the reactions of people who are about to die. <laughs> but now I give you your choice. Turn, take each other's hand, and walk straight ahead into the darkness... Or stand there while I count. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Not ten. That is too definite. Too certain. <laughs> I will merely count number after number until my trigger finger obeys the impulse to shoot. No! No, no! Oh, Dave! Dave! Oh, oh she painted. That should make it easier for you. And for her. That's right. Hold her up. Steady her. One, two, what a feast the vampires will have. Three, the bats, they're waiting. Four, far down in the pit. Five, by the thousands they cling to the clammy walls. Six, Hanging heads downward with folded wings. Seven. Waiting. Eight. Waiting. <laughs> yes, Vickers. Waiting. Waiting for you. For you. You got through. It's useless to struggle, Vickers. Your trigger finger obeys the impulse to kill. But the gun hammer won't fall because my hand is on it. Because you should have used an automatic. Oh, you... You don't... Yes. Yes, if you could only break loose, try it and your arm will snap like the stem of a pipe. Let's go. Let's go. I knew you'd find a way, Shadow. You can let go of it now. Well, she's your wife. Yes, she just fainted, that's all. Oh. Oh, there you are, Vickers. Well, the shadow got you. Well, you'll hang for what you did to Claire's father, but first I'm going to pay her for torturing... No, you won't! No, you won't! Stop! And I won't hang! Stand where you are or I'll shoot! Go ahead! 
Shoot! Shoot me! The shadow was right. The vampire bats are waiting. Waiting for their feast. For me! A man won't disappoint them! They'll have their feast! They'll have their feast! Now! Now! You like this thing I'm playing, Margot? Yes, Lamont. Lamont? Mm, yes, Margot? Now that Dr. Vickers is dead and Claire Stevens is out of that awful house, what's going to happen to the Major's little pet? Oh, those vampire bats won't kill any more cattle. Or men, Margot. Thought of that while you and David Henderson were getting Claire to the hospital. Yes, but how, Lamont? <laughs> like this. Dynamite. Yes, yes. I found it in Stevens' tool house. The explosion... Filled the well of the bats with hundreds of tons of rock. Sealed forever. There will be no more black wings across the moon. No more marks of the bat on the throats of sleeping victims. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow magazine... Now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Ladies and gentlemen, the curtain is about to go up on another of the Shadow's exciting adventures. But first, I want to tell you more about that sensational new tire that is making its appearance on highways all over the nation, the new Goodrich Safety Silver Town with Lifesaver Tread. Maybe you've already seen it, but whether you've seen it or not, 
this tire is something brand new, a new kind of tire. The tread is wider and flatter, with never-ending spiral bars. And those spiral bars act like a battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep drainage grooves. Thus, this amazing tread actually gives the tire a drier, safer surface for the rubber to grip. No wonder this new Silvertown will stop you quicker, safer on a wet pavement than you've ever stopped before. Remember, Silvertowns below mean safety above. Put this life-saving tire on your car now. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, Revenge on the Shadow. Mike Matthews talking. Hello, Mike. This is Slick Scarpel. Oh, yeah? What do you want? Okay, start talking. Now, listen, Mike. I know you and I haven't been on the best of terms, but there's something we've got to talk over. Yeah, what? We've got to do something about this guy who calls himself the Shadow. Oh, that's different. Well, what's the dope? Come to my place, the Club Monte Carlo, midnight tonight. We'll talk it over. Okay, I'll be there. Hello. Hello, Dutch. This is Slick Scarpel. Why, well, you've got a nerve calling me after your mob tried to chisel in on my territory. Hello, Dutch. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Listen, Dutch. We've got to call a truce. What for? We've got to get together to protect ourselves. Against what? The shadow. Well. Oh. Well, oh, that's different. Now, listen. Big Mike Matthews is coming to my place midnight tonight to talk it over. Can you be there? Yeah. You bet I'll be there. Oh, say, that's funny. Isn't that big Mike Matthews coming in the door? It looks like him. I've seen his picture in the papers. But what's so unusual about that? Oh, nothing much, I guess. But this club is owned by Slick Scottell, and I always understood that Mike and Slick were deadly enemies. Well, it's none of our business. No, Major 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 are those the three men you told me about? Yes, Margot. They look like gangsters, all right. They are, and usually mortal enemies, but tonight it looks very much as if they're banding together. But I wonder why. I imagine because they're afraid of me. Of you? Then why do you come here and expose they're yourself? They're only afraid of me as the shadow. I do not know Lamont Cranston. Oh, who, who are they? Slick Scarpel, Dutch Broder, and Big Mike Matthews. Three of the human vermin who've been slowly throttling this city, and right now they're probably trying to digest a piece of bad news that I had a hand in today. Pretty black and even. Now listen, Mike. I'm on the level about this meeting. And you'd better play square, too. Do you think I'd walk into your place alone like this if I wasn't, Scarpel? We've got to do something about this shadow. Right. Say, Dutch, I heard your boys ran into a little trouble today, huh? A little trouble? Them cops picked up five of my boys today. Caught them with a hot load of furs worth 15 grand. I know where they got the tip from, too. Now, we gotta do something. That's all that shadow was reckless. Hey, not so loud. Um, These are society people out here. Okay. Take it easy now. Come on. In the office. Okay, Dutch. Now we can talk. You got any ideas? Listen, Slick, how can you think of a way to get a guy which you don't know who he is? Well, the first thing we gotta do is lay off each other. Team up. Get the shadow and get him right. If it's dough that's needed, I'll add it ten grand to the kitty. But dough isn't going to help us find the shadow. No, and nothing else will. Unless we can figure a way to get him to come to us. <laughs> oh, yeah? Better guys than you have tried to do that, and where are they? Never mind. I think I got a plan. And it's a honey. So what? Uh, this it. is what. We'll put the snatch on the mayor. What? That ought to bring uh, Mr. Shadow trotting right over to the rescue. What? Kidnap Mayor Collins? Why, that's playing with dynamite. Uh, yeah, this. yeah. But maybe dynamite's the only thing that'll do us any good. I'll phone the mayor and I'll tell him I want to uh, give him the inside. 
on where Big Mike gets his dope supplies. Squeal on me, why uh, you... Now, wait a minute. I didn't say I would tell him. I just say I'm going to tell him. What do you mean? I'll make a day to see the mayor late at night, see? Tell him I'm afraid someone might recognize me and squeal. The mayor will see me, and he'll be alone. Oh. Hey, that's neat. But if we get the mayor, then what? How are you going about getting the shadow on his trail? I've got that end of it all figured out. The shadow's got a lot of uh, hypnotism stuff. Okay. We'll beat him at his own racket. Both of you guys have done business with Vandange, the Hindu. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you sold him some hot pearls on last week, didn't you, Dutch? Yeah, and for the last time, too. That Hindu gives me the creeps. When he looks at you, it makes you feel like there was something behind you he was really seeing. That's it. Hypnotism stuff. Anangi shot me once. <laughs> he'll beat the shadow with his own game. We'll promise him those Canterbury pearls if he'll make the shadow show himself so we can plug him. Anangi will do everything and anything but pearls. He's nuts for them. Okay, if you say so, Slick, but me, I'm plenty scared of that, Batangi. Well, Dutch, maybe you'd rather have it out with the shadow by yourself. Eh, nix on that. But if we gotta take our choice, I'd sooner take the hinder. If he gets the poils, he'll be on our side. Well, then it's all set, boys. I'll go see Vandangi and make an appointment with the mayor tomorrow night in his office when he's alone. Just leave it to me and Vandangi. I have got an appointment with you, Mayor Collins. Uh, yes? Uh, about Big Mike Matthews? That's right. Uh, what's the information you have to give me? Uh, you'll have to come along with me if you want to get the low down on Big Mike. Well, it so happens I got word about an hour ago that Commissioner Weston expects to arrest him tonight. Arrest Big Mike? Yes. So you see, I'm hardly in need of any information concerning him now. However, Listen, you stop gabbing. I got a gun here. What good will that do you? Plenty good if you start any trouble. You're coming with me. You can't get away with this. The minute we reach the street, I merely have to raise my voice and the police... I know all that. But when we reach the street, you're not going to be able to yell. What do you mean? You'll see. Banangi. Come on in. Give him the work. Uh, so you have an accomplice. Yeah. His honor, the mayor. Who are you? Why do you stand there and stare at me like... You, like... my friend, will stare at me. Eh, that is right. No, no, I... Look into my eyes. No. Deeper. Deeper. No. You are becoming the slave of the triad of the ages. No. Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. You are our slave. No. After I release you from this hypnotic spell in which I am binding you, you will remember nothing. Nothing. No. Do you hear me? Answer. Yes, Master. I do, as you say. You will do even as I think. Slave. Yes, Master. I will do even as you think. Okay, Vatangi? Yes, Mr. Scarpelle. The mayor is now the slave of the master of Vatangi. He will go and do as I order him. Okay. Let's take him to the Club Monte Carlo. We've got our bait. Now we have to wait for the shadow to fight. <laughs> and when he does... I, Vadange, will conquer him. Extra, extra, may you come and kidnap, read all about it. May you come and kidnap, extra, Just a moment. Oh, good morning, Lamont. Good morning, Margaret. Come on in. You heard about Mayor Collins? Yes, isn't it horrible? What do you suppose could have happened to him? I've got a hunch this is the work of Slick Scarpell and Company, and I'm going to find out. In the meantime, they're coming. Something I want you to do, Margot. Yes, Lamont, what? You have to be very careful and do exactly as I say. Go to the Club Monte Carlo on Hemlock Street, where we were the other night. Yes, and then? Keep watch outside. If you see anything that looks at all suspicious, get in touch with me. Be careful to keep out of sight and don't, under any conditions, go inside that house. All right, Lamont, I understand. Remember, keep out of sight and don't go inside that house. <laughs> Hey, listen, Slick, I just heard Big Mike and four of his gang was picked up last night. Yeah, hauling dope? Yeah, that's too bad. It means 20 years, and there's no way to beat that dope rap. Now we gotta get the shadow. Where's Hodangi and the mayor? Upstairs. Say, Slick, huh? 
Look here out the window a minute. Yeah, what? See that dame standing in the doorway over there? Yeah, what about her? She's been hanging around out there most of the day. Yeah? That's kind of funny. Yeah. Hey, Vanagi. Come here a minute. Funny about Big Mike being picked up like that just when we were all set to get the shadow. You call uh, for me? What do you want? Vanangi, take a look at that girl standing in the doorway over there. That says she's been hanging around all day. You ever seen her before? Mm, no. What difference does it make whether or not he knows her or not? We are playing with dangerous game, Mr. Scarpell. It is possible she has been sent to watch us. I can't take any risk, Dutch. You're telling me. Supposing you go out and talk to her, Vanangi. Dutch and I can't be seen until we get this shadow business settled. All right. I will go and question the girl. Watch your step, Anangi. Don't worry about me. I have my own way of getting information. Ah, there she is, over there. Oh, young lady. Yes? Have you seen a little lad of about eight years old wearing a brown sweater? I sent him off to the corner about an hour ago. Why, no, I, I haven't seen him. I'm just passing by myself. What? Why do you stare at me like that? Possibly you are tired and would like to step inside and sit down for a moment. No. I'm not tired. I... I... I mustn't. He said I mustn't go into that house. That is right. Stare at me. No. Into my eyes. Deeper. Oh. Deeper. Oh. I am the voice of the holy triad of Brahma, Vishnu and Siva. You will do my bidding. Follow me into this house. Yes, Master. I follow. Ladies and gentlemen, as we leave the shadow for just a moment, it looks like trouble ahead. But think of the trouble you may be headed for if a skid throws your car out of control. Because when tires lose their grip on a wet, slippery road, who knows what may happen? The shadow knows. Beware. Thousands are killed or injured every year by runaway cars sliding, spinning crazily over glistening pavements. Motorists, I've already told you that the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown will stop you quicker, safer in a wet road emergency than you've ever stopped before. But you don't need to take my word for it. Here is the proof from an impartial source. Exhaustive road tests of both regular and premium priced tires of America's six largest tire manufacturers were made by the nation's largest independent testing laboratory, Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory, noted all over the country for its research independence. And here's what they found. I quote from the report of Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory. Quote, The new Goodrich Silvertown with Lifesaver Tread gave greater skid resistance than any other tire tested, including tires listed at from 40% to 70% higher in price. The Goodrich Silvertown gave more non-skid mileage than any other tire tested in its own price range, averaged 19.1% more mileage before the tires wore smooth. Unquote. So just think what you get in this new kind of tire. The greatest skid protection ever offered. The famous blowout protection of the Goodrich Golden Ply. 19.1% more mileage, which is the same as saying you'll get every sixth mile free. And all at no extra cost. That's why it will pay you to make your next tires Goodrich Safety Silvertowns. I... I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I've been working on it ten minutes for Dengue. I can't stand the more of it. Quiet, Dutch. Slave. Yes? What was your name? My name? Who told you not to enter this house? Who told me? Same old answers for Dengue. Why won't she talk? Oh, she has succumbed too far to my spell. Her mind is a blank. Either that or someone else has control over her mind. You mean the shadow? Possibly. But we shall find out if it is the shadow... You take her upstairs and wait after my father commands. Take her, Dutch. I'll stay here with Vadangi. Okay, Slick. Come along, you. Uh, Go with him. Yes, Master. Vadangi, if she was sent by the shadow, then... Then she shall serve as additional bait to lure him into our trap. Now I am ready to talk to him. Talk to him? How are you going to do that? 
You don't know who he is? I do not have to know who he is. I will send out thought waves. Eh? Well, how do you do that? Uh, I see you are unfamiliar with the higher branches of Hindu mysticism, my friend. To the initiated, it is quite possible for mind to talk to mind regardless of distance. Uh, thus, space becomes non-existent. Eh, you give me the creeps. I don't know how you do it. Oh, you, an infidel, can never know. Attend to matters in which you are proficient. Procure for me the Canterbury pearls. I will do the rest. We'll get the pearls for you, just like we said, Vanessa. Good. Now I will send out my thought waves. The shadow must be receptive to be able to do what it does. Our minds will commune. Now leave the room. I must concentrate. Okay. Now we shall see if this girl is under control of the shadow. If she is, then his own power of subjecting people to his will shall be his downfall. Shadow. Shadow. I call upon you in the name of the triad who are all powerful Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. Shadow. I command you to come to me in thought. Who speaks? Who speaks? It is I, Vadange. Who commands the shadow by the secret and all-powerful method of thought transmission? It is I, Vadange, disciple of the great yoga of India and the temples of Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. Can you hear me, Shadow? Yes, Vadangi. I hear you. Listen carefully, Shadow. This delicate thread of thought communication is easily broken. I am listening. What do you want? You will come to me, Shadow, if you are interested in Mayor Collins. So, the abduction of Mayor Collins was your work, Vadangi. I warn you, release him. Oh, Shadow, you are interested in Mayor Collins. Possibly you are also interested in a certain girl. A certain girl, Vadangi? Yes. Read my mind, Shadow. I will make it crystal clear for you. She is pure, my friend. Pure as a lovely pearl. Read my mind. What do you see? I see the names of Slick Scarpel and Dutch Broder. They are the ones who are behind the kidnapping of Mayor Collins. You read well, Shadow. And the girl. Do you know her? The girl? The image of her is pictured upon my brain, Shadow. Do you know her? The picture of the girl slowly becomes visible to my mind's eyes. I... Ah! Then you do know her? Yes. I have her, Shadow. A prisoner of my hypnotic power. I know where you are, and I'm coming to visit you. You've done a foolish thing, Vadangi, in telling me these things. And you, Shadow, have done a foolish thing in accepting the challenge of the great Vadangi. I await you, Shadow. You shall not wait in vain, Vadangi. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Slick, vadangi has been upstairs half an hour now. Should we see if he's all right? Nah, better not disturb him. He said he'd be down before the shadow got here. Well, I wonder when the shadow's coming. I'm not even sure he'll show up at all. Maybe Vadangi scared him off. But keep your hands on the tommy gun, just in case. I'd be plenty happy if I knew the shadow had took a run out powder. They say, he may. maybe he's here now and we don't know it. Wonder what his voice sounds like. Possibly it sounds like this, well, Dutch. A shadow. He's here. Yes, here in the shadows. Trying to throw a scare into us with that stuff, eh? Well, Shadow, we don't scare. I'm sure you don't. It must take brave men to murder all the defenseless people you two have. Yes, Shadow, we bump plenty. And we're going to give it to you, too. Let him have it, Dutch. Where are you, Shadow? Speak up. Over here, Dutch. You can't hit me, but I'm right over here. Dutch! But the shadow's voice had come from you, Slick. I... A little ventriloquism, Dutch. 
And you'll hang for killing Slick Scarpell. Now, where are you? Where are you? Right behind you, Dutch. Where are you? Oh. Blow on the head will take care of you for an hour or so, Dutch Broder. Now for Vendange. <laughs> Slick, Dutch, what is the matter? Where is it? Oh, fools, what have you done to each other? Victory was in our grasp, and now you... There is a presence here. Is it you, Shadow? Very clever, my friend. But perhaps you are not so... <laughs> so it is you. Yes, Vendangi. You are clever, Shadow. But perhaps not so clever as I. Vendangi, I've come for Mayor Collins and the girl. And you think I, Vendangi, will give them to you just like that? They are both under my hypnotic spell. They are my slaves. I'll have no trouble breaking the hold you have over them. Because I know your strength, Vendangi. My strength is greater... Greater? You, the dog of an infidel, stronger than I, a true disciple. I, who have made the pilgrimage to the tomb of Genghis, the great Khan. Fool! Also remember, my friend, that I am the first to gain control of the girl's mind. Your influence cannot enter until mine has left. But, Dange, I'm going to strip you of all your powers. Your threats are useless, Shadow. I command the girl to appear. In just a moment, she will enter by that door. She, who is pure as a pearl, will perform a deed at my command. A deed which will finish the work I set out to do. A deed which will bring madness to her for the rest of her life. You sent for me, Master. Margot. Oh, she is the girl, Shadow. Yes, Madame. But she is no longer your friend. She is my slave. I know what you've done to her. A simple trick and a simple one to remedy. After I've disposed of you. Slave, pick up that machine gun. Yes. Uh, uh, stop her if you can, Shadow. But Dange, the powers of Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva were never intended for evil. Slave, point the gun at the Shadow. He is here in this room, and I will you to see him. His mind is in the same hypnotic plane as yours. I will you to see him. Yes, Master. Margo, don't point the gun at me. Do you see him now, Slave? Yes, I see him. Then, Margo, recognize me. You know me. I know you. Margo. You won't shoot me. No, I won't shoot Stop you. Stop pointing the gun at me, Margot. I can't. Slave, I command you to pull the trigger. Margot, you will not pull the trigger. Fight the donkey's spell. Fight it, Margot. Slave, in the name of the terrible Vashtar, destroy this infidel dog. Pull the trigger. Margot, Vashtar is evil and has no glory. I command you. Put down the gun. Slave, never again will you look to the east. I command you to shoot. Master. Master. Mayor Collins. Mayor Collins, stay outside. Master. Master, where are you? I feel your spirit leaving. Badangi, your power is slipping away from you. Shadow, never before have I used the forbidden chant of Genghis the Great Khan. You are strong, Shadow, but no one is stronger than the chant. <laughs> Margo? Margo, the chant of Genghis is also evil. You must fight, Margo. Fight! I am trying. I am. I am. Lamont! Lamont! What happened? That that man in the street. I mustn't enter the house. Three shots. Badangi, three shots. It was Lamont I saw. The gun. Oh, Lamont, I killed him. No, Margot, no, I'm here. Oh, Lamont, oh, my dear. Take it easy. <laughs> but I, I thought Badangi had made me kill no, you. No, Margot, it was Badangi who was killed. Oh, then... Then I killed Vadangi. No, Murdered no, him. no, Margot. Mayor Collins shot Vadangi. Oh, Mayor Collins? Yes, when I broke Vadangi's power, his control over Mayor Collins was ended, oh. leaving only hysterical hate. Mayor Collins picked up the other gun and shot Vadangi. Oh, but where is the mayor? Is he hurt? The strain was too much for both of you. You both fainted. The mayor is sleeping in the next room. When he woke, he won't remember anything that happened from the time he awoke. He was kidnapped. Mayor Collins is not to blame. The distortion of his mind and its results were of Vadangi's own doing. I must call Commissioner Weston. Tell him to come here. But what are you going to tell him? The message you receive from the shadow is this. Dutch Broder murdered both Slick Scarpell and Vadangi the Hindu, his accomplices. 
Commissioner Weston will find Broder unconscious and Mayor Collins asleep and unhurt. This attempted revenge on the shadow has failed, as must fail every scheme to overthrow those who administer justice. No matter how cunning the plot, how clever the criminal... You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> all the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the Shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, one of the shadow's most thrilling adventures, Murder from the Grave. That's him there, walking towards the corner. Yeah. Pulling closer to the curb. Okay, okay. Wait till we're right beside him, see? Yeah, I know. All right. Let him have it. Right, Hobie.
over here, Doc. All right. Well, here he is, what there is left of him. Yeah. They did a pretty complete job, officer. Yeah, he must have stopped every slug they threw at him. He's still breathing, though, and I don't know why. Well, we better get him to the hospital at once. Here, give me a hand with him, will you? Okay, but it looks to me like a waste of time. Well, what's the story, Doc? DOA, officer. Dead on arrival. Yeah, I figured that. Well, better make out of the part. You want to send him to the city morgue or hold him here at the hospital? I'll check headquarters and find out. Yes. Gangster, isn't he? Might say so. Do you recognize him at all? Now, how can I answer that? The guy ain't got hardly no face left, has he? Uh, good evening, Dr. Henry. Oh, hello, Dr. Metzger. What brings you down here to the receiving room? Uh, just keeping in touch with the activities of the hospital. Well, what have you there? A gang shooting, Doctor. He seems to be well perforated. Yes. Especially the face. It's been just about shot away. Yes. So I see. He died on the way to the hospital. hospital. So, uh, mind if I have a look at him? No, Doctor. No, go ahead. I'm going to use your phone, Doc. I'll be right back. All right, officer. Dr. Henry. Yes? Did I understand you to say that you have pronounced this man dead? Why, why yes, Doctor. I'm afraid you were mistaken. What? This man is still alive. Well, Dr. Metzger, I couldn't feel any pulse. Uh, no heart you, he is alive. Ring for the other bit at once. But, Doctor, well, as I, I say, you... this man is to be brought to my laboratory. Hurry, Doctor, there's no time to lose. Dr. Henry speaking. Hello, this is Dr. Metzger. Oh, yes, Doctor. That patient, the man who was brought to my laboratory, is alive and can be saved. Why, why that's unbelievable, Doctor. Nevertheless, it is true. But what about his face? His face has been shot away. I intend to give him a new face. Now, listen to me, Dr. Henry. I want a general order given to all in the hospital. That I am not to be disturbed for the next six weeks. Uh, yes, sir. All of my meals and any surgical instruments or supplies that I might need are to be left outside of my door for that period. You understand? Uh, yes, Dr. Metzger. I... If these orders are carried out, I can tell you now, Henry, that in six weeks' time, I will bring forth a man who is whole again. <laughs> Doggone it, Jack. I just can't help it. Old man curiosity is getting the better of him. And you've got to find out what goes on in Metzger's laboratory. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> He's been in there almost six weeks now, Jack. Imagine almost six weeks without telling anyone how his experiment is progressing. Say, does anyone even know if the patient is still alive? Yes, we do know that much. Metzger sent word to that effect to Doc Hawkins yesterday. <laughs> Look, Sherlock, how do you plan to get into the laboratory? Well, when Metzger opens the door for this tray of food, uh -huh. I'll just walk in with him, that's all. Good luck. Yes, I'll need it. Uh, knock on the door for me, will you? Sure. Who is there? Your food tray, Dr. Metzger. Oh, thank you. Uh, where do you want me to uh, put... One moment. You believe the tray with me, Dr. Henry? Well, I was just going you to You put... were just going to try to gain entrance to my laboratory. <laughs> I'm aware of your intense curiosity, Henry. A curiosity that is shared by everyone else in this hospital. Ah, well, you can tell them all for me that my experiment is nearing completion. Very well, Doctor. If they wish, if they wish, they may come here to my laboratory tomorrow at noon. And I shall reveal to them my finished product. I don't know what we're waiting for. Uh, Dr. Metzger asked us all to be here at noon today. It's now quarter after. I, for one, see no reason for waiting around any longer. You're right, Henry. Well, what do we do? Well, we'll let them know we're here. Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger. Why doesn't he answer? Well, there's only one way to find that out. Let's try trying to get in. The door isn't locked. I'll go look for him. Uh, Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger. He must be in there. He's not out here. Come, on. Come here, all of you. Oh, what is it? Look. Look, there on the floor. Oh, hold. It's Metzger. He's dead. Yes. And it looks like murder. His face has been slashed. Look, here on the floor. A broken mirror. Where's the patient, the man he was working on? There was no one else in this room when I came in. Well, then he's gone. Yes. But not before he murdered Dr. Metzger. And since that time, Lamont, the police have learned nothing. Well, that's understandable, Dr. Hawkins. They really have nothing to work on. You have no idea what this Mr. X looks like, have you, Dr. Hawkins? No, we haven't, Margot. Dr. Metzger did a plastic job on his face, changed it completely. That's all we know. Well, it's been 24 hours since the killing. 
man has had ample time to get away and cover up his tracks. Yes. I don't see how Lamont can do any more than the police have done, Doctor. Uh, I didn't ask Lamont to come here for that purpose, Margot. Oh, no? No, I... Well, I discovered something in Dr. Metzger's laboratory that I haven't even told the police about. Well, why not? Because it's something too fantastic for them to believe. Well, what is it, Doctor? Metzger's personal notebook, in which he recorded the progress of his experiment. I have it right here. Well, what does this notebook contain? Well, the first entry was written the night the patient arrived in the hospital. Dr. Metzger wrote in the notebook at that time... Tonight, I have at last been given the opportunity that I have been so patiently waiting for. The perfect subject for my experiment is at this very moment lying on a table before me. I have given him the first injection of the solution. The reaction was most successful. Now, the real work begins. What does all that mean, Dr. Hawkins? You'll learn later, Lamont. Just as I learned as I read further into the notes. The next entry of any importance That's came a week later. At that time, the doctor wrote... Everything is progressing satisfactorily. Today, the patient has sufficient strength for me to begin the plastic work. I have found that best results can be obtained by giving injections of the solution every 24 hours. This is most important. Any period of time beyond this is dangerous. Well, what is the solution that he keeps talking about? I'm coming to that, Margot. I'll skip over the entries that follow. They deal mainly with a growing conflict between the patient and Metzger. A note of regret creeps into his writing. He senses that he's almost sorry for the work that he's done. Eventually, this conflict claims to open hatred. And in the last entry, written the night before he died, Dr. Metzger wrote... May heaven have mercy on me for ever conceiving this work that I have done. The patient has now reverted to the vicious being that he has always been. Instead of having gratitude for what I have done, he shows only resentment. Tomorrow morning, I shall remove the bandages that cover his face. He has threatened me that if he is not pleased with my work, dire consequences will result. This, then, is the fruit of my labor. This is the price I pay for my great discovery. My discovery of a solution that literally brought a dead man back to life again. A solution that will... So that's it. That was the secret solution. Yes. But that's unbelievable, Dr. Hawkins. A solution that brings the dead back to life? Metzger was a great scientist. Nothing was impossible to him. Well, where is the solution now? I couldn't find it. I've searched everywhere in the laboratory. Then it's evident that the patient knowing about it took it with him. I'm afraid so. Well, I'd say you had good cause for alarm, Doctor. This killer who is now at large is a man returned from the dead. A man without a soul. Yes, that's true. But uh, tell me, Lamont, have you gotten any clues from what you've just learned? Only one. The broken mirror that was found near the doctor's body. Obviously, this mirror must have been shattered by the missing man. Why do you say that? He must have broken it in rage when he first saw his new face. Metzger must have made him sufficiently horrible to bring on this range. So we have only one clue to work on. A man with an incredibly ugly face. Dr. Hawkins! Dr. Hawkins! What is it? What is it? Come in. Dr. Hawkins, something terrible has happened. Yeah, what's wrong? In the morgue. The hospital morgue, just a few minutes ago. Yes, what happened? A man with a gun came in. Forced me to take one of the bodies. A dead body out to a car. What? I... I had to obey. Why didn't you call out for help? I I was about to until I saw his face. His face, Dr. Hawkins. It was the most frightening thing I've ever seen. It wasn't human. Doctor, I'd say our killer has made his first move. And I fear that it won't be his last. <laughs> While we're waiting for the curtain to rise in Act Two of Murder from the Grave, I want to ask you something. When the summer months come, what are you going to do for a supply of hot water? Would you be able to have all the hot water you want, when you want it, and will it be available at a cost within your budget? This is an important problem in many homes. That's why today, the Blue Coal Dealers of America are offering the latest in low-cost hot water heating equipment. They've given you the Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator. They've given you the John Barclay Home Heating Service. And now, in 1941, the same Blue Coal dealers bring you the equipment that provides all the low-cost hot water you want. 
Yes, the new Blue Coal Deluxe Water Heater that works automatically gives you more clean hot water than you can use. Think of it. Now, at last, you can have an abundant supply of clean hot water heated at just the right temperature and whenever you want it, all summer long. Phone your neighborhood dealer tomorrow and ask him about this new Blue Coal Deluxe Water Heater. Remember, it will pay for itself in savings over the usual cost of summer hot water. And remember, too, when it comes to keeping your home warm and comfortable, there's no other fuel like blue coal. Give your dealer a call in the morning. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the words blue coal. Put the slip in the car. <laughs> yes, sir. We're getting to be regular customers, ain't we? Hey, why do you do this? Why do you want these bodies? You'll find out. Everybody will find out very soon. This ain't our last visit to you, Mr. Moorkeeper. Uh, you'll be seeing us again. No, no, you'll get me into trouble. Shut up. You? All right, Eddie, step on the gas. Let's get out of here. Extra, extra, another gangster's body kidnapped from the morgue. Here we go. Uh, that particular pendant will cost you $2,000. Oh, I there see. There we are. Well, there. There's a stick-up. Oh. Uh, what do you want with that? You can't get away with this. No. Just watch us. Grab them rings, Eddie. Hi. Right. Bill, take that for your bracelets. Okay. Ah, that's all we need here. Wait a minute, boys. Before we blow, we ought to let the folks have a look at us for purposes of identification. Take off your mask, boys. Oh, no. no. They're not you. Oh, how horrible. We ain't very pretty, are we? Well, nobody is. Once they've been dead. Look, only three guards for a payroll over a hundred grand. Cut them off, Eddie. Squeeze them into the curb. Right. Good work. Come on, boys. What do you guys think you're trying to do? You'll find out soon enough, Buster. You men stand where you are. We've got a tummy gun here. Go ahead and use it, brother. Go ahead. All right. You ask for it. <laughs> Don't you know better than to shoot at a mob that's already been dead? <laughs> Let them have it, boys. Margot, the entire city has been terrorized by this mob of, well, ghouls. That's all you can call them. Lamont, do you honestly believe that this gang consists of the dead men who were kidnapped from the different morgues? Yes, Margot. There's no doubt of it. They've been sustained by Dr. Metzger's life-giving solution. Oh, how horrible. And so far, no one has been able to learn just where this gang is hiding out. Well, what can be done, Lamont? Well, one of the mob was captured by the police this afternoon. They've got him in the city jail. Did he reveal anything? No, he refused to talk. That is, to the police. But I have an idea that I might be able to get something from him. I think I know what you mean, Lamont. I think you do. I'm paying a little visit to his cell. As the shadow. <laughs> Why don't they come for me? They know the cops have got me. Why don't they come? <laughs> what was that? So, your friends have deserted you, eh? Who's talking to me? I must be getting stir-crazy. I don't see nobody. You're not stir-crazy. I've merely made myself invisible to you. You? Made yourself invisible? Oh. I get it. The shadows pay me a bit. That's quite correct. What are you doing here? I've come to talk to you, to learn something about you and your companions. Save your talk. I ain't saying nothing. I know the horrible secret that you and your gang possess. The power that you have to bring life to the bodies of those already dead. How'd you learn? <laughs> Where'd you ever dream up an idea like that? I followed the activities of your leader from the day he killed Dr. Metzger and stole the life-giving solution. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. You're being foolish enough to remain loyal to your mob after they've deserted you. That ain't true. Then why haven't they tried to get you out of this jail? Certainly they must know that you'll soon need another injection of the serum. What? What are you talking about? I learned from Dr. Metzger's own journal that the life-giving solution must be injected every 24 hours. To go beyond this period without it means a return to the dead. No. 
No, you're just trying to scare me. How long has it been since you received your last treatment? Yesterday. Just about this time. Then its effect should be wearing off right now. We must act quickly. Tell me where the hideout is. And after dealing with your friends, I promise to bring back enough of the serum to keep you alive. Uh, are you sure you ain't handing me no line? I swear it. Now, tell me the secret hiding place and just how many men there are. Okay. Okay. About the men... The boss has only two henchmen left now. Phil and Marty. It's been getting harder to make snatches from the morgue. And besides, the boss don't want to waste the serum on us dead ones anyway. Only two days ago, he let one of the boys go back to the grave <laughs> without a shot from the hypo. And believe me, Shadow, his face wasn't pretty to see. Quickly now. Where's the hideout? He, the... Hideout. Well, it's... Hey, what's happening to me? I got a funny feeling in my head. Quickly, man, quickly. My buzzing. Tell me where the hideout is. It, it's... I... How much better for them to have left you untouched after death had claimed you the first time. Margot, we're certain of one thing. What's that, Lamont? That our Mr. X, having built up his mob from the remains of notorious gangsters, is now finding it difficult to get bodies of gangsters who, before they died, knew their trade. Correct. Also, he's obviously running low on Dr. Metzger's solution. He's letting his lesser helpers die without giving them injections. Correct again. Well, then, here's my plan. I'm going to ask Commissioner Weston to plant a story in all the newspapers that our notorious out-of-town gang leader, Dutch Carson has just been killed by the police. Who's Dutch Carson, Lamont? A Middle Western mobster who dropped out of sight about a year ago. Well, why are you doing all this? To attract the attention of Mr. X. Then I shall arrange with the commissioner to be taken to the city morgue and be placed on a slab as the body of the dead Dutch Carson. And unless I'm badly mistaken, Margot, within 24 hours, the three missing ghouls will be back in their graves, and this time, for good. You ready to stretch out on the slab, Mr. Cranston? All right, Tom. <laughs> you know, you're the first live stiff I ever had in here. <laughs> well, I hope I remain that way. Yeah. And will you cover me over with the sheet, please? Uh, sure, sure. Hey, what's going to happen when these fellas find out you ain't a dead one, much less the missing Dutch Carson? <laughs> well, not Tom. Yeah. It's something I'd rather worry about when it happens, if you don't mind. Well, I'm here to tell you I wouldn't touch your That's job. Quiet. Huh? I hear footsteps outside the door. Yeah, yeah, somebody's there. Yeah. Who are you? Take a look at me, Pop. That ought to answer your question. You, uh, you come again. Uh, yeah, I told you I'd be paying you another visit. Well, what do you want? I want the body of Dutch Carson. I got a little job he's going to do for me. Phil. Huh? Makes up a shot of the solution. Hey, it ain't time yet, boss. We don't need none for another hour. It ain't for us, stupid. That's for a new guy I just snatched out of the morgue. I got him in the next room. Yeah, but we're running low on his stuff. Mix it up, I said. We can use this guy. He's valuable. Huh? Who is he? Dutch Carson. Dutch? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know him, but I heard of him. He's, uh... Well, I don't know him either. But he was supposed to be one of the smarter boys in the Middle West until he disappeared about a year ago. What happened to him? I don't know, but what's important now is that we've got his body in the next room. Hey, what's that? What's going on out there? Come on, get inside, you. Hey, why'd you bring that dame in here, Marty? Well, I caught her snooping around outside trying to look in a window. <laughs> Maybe she was trying to cop a quick look at a couple of dead men, eh, boss? Interesting. What's the idea, girlie? Well, it was just... Oh, your face. Find something wrong with it? You're the one. You're the one that killed Dr. Metzger. Oh, so interesting. Where'd you get your information? Let me out of here. Not a chance. Now sit down like a lady like this. You can't push me around like that. Oh, no, well, I'm giving you a pretty good imitation, ain't I? Now, what were you doing outside? Who sent you here? Oh, you're so clever. Why don't you find out? Who sent you here? Answer me. Oh, oh stop it. You're hurting my arm. Lamont. Yeah, no, Lamont. won't do you no goodness, sister. Lamont. Where is he? What have you done with him? I ask you a question. Wait a minute. Done with who? Who are you talking about? You brought him here. What have you done with him? Hey, she must mean the stiff inside. Now, what is this? Who'd you bring here, boss? The body of Dutch Carson. Why? 
Dutch cars. Yeah, I snatched them from the morgue. You heard of them, Marty? Heard of them? Are you kidding? A year ago, I buried Dutch cars in a load of concrete at the bottom of a river. I see. Hey, then who did you bring here, boss? I don't know. Hold on to this damn. Yeah. I'm soon going to find out. He's gone. The body is gone. It's a trap. The cops are behind this. Yeah, one thing is sure. The guy is still in the house. Marty, go out and look around the grounds. Okay, boss. And now, if you don't mind... But I do mind. Just staying right here. No, keep away from me. Give me that knife, Phil. No, no. Sadly, boss, here you are. What are you going to do? I'm going to carve that pretty face of yours to ribbon. No, don't. No, don't. Keep him away. Get ready, sister. (laughs) Who laughed? Not quite so fast, Mr. Rick. Hey, hey, what's happened? You're not touching that girl. Hey, who done that? Who knocked that knife out of my hand? I did, Mr. X. Who's speaking? Where's that voice coming from? It's coming from the shadow. The shadow, eh? Well, now, Shadow, this is one time you've stubbed your toe. Because even you can't do anything to dead men. You're wrong, Mr. X, because I know that you need an injection of Dr. Metzger's solution every 24 hours in order to continue living. Yeah, and we aim to continue getting it. I wouldn't be too sure of that. What do you mean by that, boss? I mean that I now possess the solution. You see? Look. Look, the bottle hanging there in midair. He's got the solution. Give me that bottle, Shadow. Oh, no. This is my hold on you, gentlemen. And I shall keep it until your allotted time expires. I shall watch you return to the dead again. Get away from him, boss, quick. I'll get it all right. We may not be able to see you, Shadow, but we can see the bottle. Boss, put that gun away. That ain't the way to do it. Oh, (laughs) now you've done it. You hit the wrong target, Mr. Rex. Oh, you broke it, boss. You broke the bottle. It spilled all over the floor. I didn't mean to hit the bottle. I wanted to plug him. The cops, the cops, the cops. You'd better give up, Mr. Rex. No, no, we ain't giving up. We still got another hour to live, Shadow. And a lot can be done in that time. We're going to rip this town wide open just for luck. Wait. You're staying here. Yeah, try and stop us. Marco, they've got an hour to spread the greatest terror this city has ever seen. I've got to stop them. We ain't got much time, boss. Look in the back, Marty's gone already. Yeah, I know, Phil. Will we look as bad as that when we return to the dead? We will never know. Besides, right now, we got a little fun ahead of us. Now, when we get to town, shoot and keep shooting at anybody who gets in our way. They're going to remember us when we get done, Phil. Okay, boss. Hey, hey, watch your driving. This is a narrow bridge. You know, it's something's pulling the wheel. I, what? I can't straighten it out. I... <laughs> You'll never straighten it out, Mr. Egg. Shut how did he get here? I've been with you since you left your hideout, gentlemen. Hey, let go of the wheel, Shadow. So that you can carry on your campaign of ruthless killing? Oh, no. Hey, he's trying to steer us into the river. Where is he? Hey, he must be on the running board. Hey, let go, Shadow. Don't be a fool, Shadow. If we drown, you'll drown, too. That's not as important as the lives of the innocent people you're planning to kill. Hey, Phil. Phil, I can't hold the wheel much longer. Stop the car. Stop the car. Too late. It's too late. Lamont, you might have been drowned, along with your ghostly friends. I certainly might have been, Margot. But fortunately, I threw myself into the car before it went over the bridge. You know, Lamont, I've become very attached to you. Oh, don't think for a minute that all our mad exploits together haven't been fun. But I wish that for a while, at least, we could have a calm, peaceful existence. And we shall have, Margot. We shall have. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, nonetheless, I'm sure you'll forgive me if I hang on to my hat when we start out again next week. (laughs) Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. Characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. And now, fresh from the records of the New York General Sessions Court, we bring you conclusive proof that crime does not pay. New York City, December 13th, 1940. Stephen Fleming passes bad check in business deal. Crime, grand larceny in the second degree. New York City, April 1st, 1941. Stephen Fleming sentenced to serve 15 years to life in state's prison. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows.
thrilling adventures of the shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Winter is just around the corner. The cool nights and quick drops in temperature we've already had are reminders to fill your coal bin now. And especially this year, it's well to start the season with a big supply. The producers of blue coal foresee no shortage whatsoever of this finest of all hard coal. But present unsettled conditions make it wise to be prepared. Don't wait. Don't put off ordering. Call your neighborhood dealer tomorrow and order your winter supply of blue coal. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and powerful secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Dragon Tongue Murders. listen to the devious, insidious reasons for its inception. First, let us go to the apartment of one Jerry Post, fashionable young playboy. Jerry Post is entertaining a visitor, an unwelcome visitor. Get me that money. Now, Max, be reasonable. Where can I get $25,000? What about your mother? Ask her for the money. Uh, No, my mother doesn't think very much of me. She disapproved of my gambling, and this isn't the first time I've been in a spot. Max, you've got to give me more time. Your time is ten days from today. Are you going to do something about it? Perhaps things can be arranged. One spoke is in the wheel of fate. One dagger closer to its resting place. Now let us see the second. It is Jerry's sister, Barbara Post, this time. She is talking to her fiancé. Jack Norcott. Jack. Jack, how can you treat me this way? Better dry your eyes, Barbara. <laughs> Tears never move me. But you said you loved me. And you wanted to marry me. You did say that, didn't you? All right, Barbara, all right. Let's be frank about this whole business. My father has warned me that if I were to marry into the Post family, there'd be no more money from him. You told me that you have no money until your mother dies. Now the best thing for us to do is just forget the Wait. whole... No money until my mother dies. What? What did you say? Nothing. Nothing at all. Perhaps things can be arranged. It is said in the Orient that the apple of death falls into three equal parts. Let us now taste of the third part. Thomas Miller, twin brother to Mrs. Post, is calling on an old friend. The Oriental merchant, Wu Long. And what propitious happening has brought you to my humble shop, honorable sir? My sister returns from the Orient tomorrow, Wulong. With her, she brings rare jewel called Light of Orient. Is that not so, Mr. Thomas Miller? How do you know that? I know. 150 years ago, jewel was stolen from sacred temple of Tai E La. We of the Wu family have dedicated our lives to its return. Thus far, all have failed. And perhaps you can succeed where others have failed. I can help you, and you can help me. Continue, honorable sir. I hate my sister. I hate her. All my life she's dominated me. She's been the strong one. I've been the weak. My own twin sister has always been my greatest enemy. It is said that the serpent hates the serpent. When my father died, he left the managing of the estate to her. She's doled out an allowance to me as though I were a poor relation. But with your help, I can change all this. I see. I am to send your twin sister to meet her ancestors. And in return... You will have the jewel. The light of the Orient. I must respectfully beg you to change plan. 
What? I will not engage in murder of your sister, Mrs. Post. But the jewel. You will get the jewel. Not even for most beautiful, most sacred jewel, Mr. Thomas Miller. All right, Wu Long. With your aid or without your aid, perhaps things can be arranged. Margot, this is going to be one awful weekend for me. Oh, please, Lamont. You don't know what this means to me. To write an article about that famous Emerald Light of the Orient, her style and fashion magazines. Why, it's practically a journalistic scoop. Do you realize that if Mrs. Post hadn't known my Aunt Augusta at Vassar... Margot, do you realize what a bunch of characters these posts are? Well, they have been rather prominent in the scandal sheet. Prominent is putting it mildly. They're all a bit... Well, let's call it peculiar. Mm -hmm. uh, take Mrs. Post's twin brother, Thomas Miller, for example. It's a well-known fact that he hates his sister like poison. And then there's that good-for-nothing adopted son, Jerry Post. He's been in more scrapes than you... Than... than you can shake a stick at? Yeah, yeah. And Barbara, the daughter. She's adopted, too. I know. And she falls in love regularly and always with the wrong man. Well, she's engaged to a very nice young man now. His name is Jack Norcott, and Mrs. Post approves of him. How do you know that? Mrs. Post told me. I caught her just as she was going through the customs when her ship docked. At first, she refused to talk to me because she thought I was a reporter. But after I mentioned... That it, Aunt Augusta went to Vassar with her? Yes, how'd you know? I'm psychic. Go on. Oh. Well, I explained how important it was for me to get a story about this light of the Orient. So she asked me out for the weekend and... Oh, I hope she won't mind. Mind what? My bringing you with me. She's very Doesn't abrupt. she know I'm coming? No. I didn't think of it till later. How nice. Lamont Cranston, the uninvited guest. Miss Lane, I've never seen you before in my life. If you don't leave immediately, I shall feel it my duty to turn you over to the authorities. Huh? You see, Margot? You not only forgot to inform Mrs. Post about my arrival, but you also forgot to tell her you were coming. But Lamont... Yeah, now, will you please leave? But don't you remember There I... is no need to continue this farce, Miss Lane. Mrs. Post, I'm sorry that you don't remember our meeting at the pier yesterday. Let's go, Lamont. Oh, forgive me, Mrs. Post. Yes, yes, Face Hunt. But you surely cannot have forgotten Miss Lane. Everything she has related about meeting at pier yesterday and subsequent invitation is quite true. What? Uh, uh, oh, yes, uh, yes, Face Hunt. You're right. Uh, that's quite true. Uh, you see, uh... I suffer from lapse of memory at times. Uh, please make yourselves at home here. Uh, face on my companion will show you to your rooms. Uh, uh, please forgive me. Well, what do you say, Lamont? Shall we stay or not? Well, oh, I... Please stay. There is much danger, and I fear for my mistress' life. Danger? Mr. Cranston, there are several who will profit by my mistress' death. Both her adopted children, Mr. Jerry and Miss Barbara, need money. And my mistress has refused. Only by her death can money be obtained through legacy. And the uncle, uh, what's his name? Thomas Miller. Yes, so what about him? He too has quarreled with my mistress and has refused even to stay in the same house with her. He has gone down to stay in small guest house at the other end of the estate. So, we have three potential murderers living close to the scene of a crime about to happen, eh? Oh, Lamont. Oh, please, not say that. So much evil has befallen this family name already. I've warned you, Jerry. It's true, isn't it, Barbara? I knew that Norcott guy was only after the post millions. I could kill you for that. <laughs> you could kill... Who are you? Mr. Jerry and Miss Barbara, this is Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston, a guest of your mother. Guests? We don't want guests here. Hope you enjoyed the little family scene you just witnessed. I'm sorry, Mr. Post, but we couldn't help overhearing you. <laughs> What's that? Seven, two, Hold on. Oh, yes, Miss oh, yes. I found this in my room. A dagger. Here, oh. let me see it. It was sticking in the wall over my bed. I went to lie down. An oriental dagger, eh? <laughs> and there seems to be a message wrapped around the hilt. Let's see. It says, Death by the fiery tongue of the dragon to those who covet the emerald, light of the orient. No signature but a drawing of a dragon in red. Lord, what does it mean? My jewel. It is not safe. Someone wanted to rob me. You, Jerry, and you, Barbara. You want the jewel. You want to kill me. You both threaten me. Don't be preposterous, Mother. Stop it, you're hysterical. My mistress, do you not believe legend? 
Death to those who covet the jewel. You do not covet the emerald. It is yours already. Yes, you are quite safe. Safe? You are sure, Pisan? I will protect you, mistress, with my life. Touching little scene, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Post. I think it is. You know, Margot, this may turn out to be a very exciting weekend after all. But are you not bound by the vows of our house, Faisan? I renounce you, Wulong, my uncle. And I renounce the vows I never took. And yet you came, knowing what I expected of you. The dagger with message to my mistress this afternoon revealed to me your design. You are wise, my niece. I have not been mistaken in your intelligence. I repeat, I will have no part in your evil plan. Oh, yes, my niece. You will do as I say. Listen as I speak. And forget not one thousandth part of one word. The emerald must be returned to the temple of Ta'ela. And the post family must die to wipe out the curse of alien hands which have defiled it by their touch. Oh, no. No, I will not do it. My niece, Faisan, you will do this deed. Or the fiery tongue of the dragon will wipe your insignificant shadow from the green and pleasant earth. No. No. Oh, you weep, Faisan. Tears betoken acquiescence. Yes, you will do as I say. Fire! 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 What's the matter, Mr. Post? Fire! The guest house is on fire! What? Did you say the guest house, Gary? Yes, look for yourself out that window there on the other side of the grounds. Lamont, where are you? Uh, here, Margot. Turn on a light, someone. Yeah, that's better. Is there anyone there at the guest house? My brother Thomas. Come on, Post. Let's get over there. Oh, no, it's useless. He's dead by now. What are you talking about? Now you come with me or I'll drag you over quite there. quite right, Mr. Cranston. Thomas must be dead. Well, perhaps he woke in time to escape the fire. He may need no. help. Thomas was in the habit of taking sleeping pills. He probably never knew what happened to him. Well, I must say you're all taking this thing pretty calmly. Much too calmly. I'm putting this whole business in the hands of the police. We pause briefly before we start the second act. It's probable that you'll never have to face the particular problem in our story today. But there is a serious problem that you do have to face, come what may. And that's the problem of keeping warm this winter. Well, heat your home with blue coal. And then you can smile with satisfaction while the cold winds blow. Because with blue cold, you'll enjoy comfortable, even warmth throughout the house, no matter how fierce and biting the weather outside. Blue coal, you know, is the finest of Pennsylvania hard coal. It's delivered to your home in exactly the proper size for your heating plant. So blue coal gives you safe, efficient, and economical heat. It's easy to heat with blue coal. And especially if you have the new deluxe blue coal heat regulator. Every home should have one. It's as easy to operate as your electric toaster. It automatically opens and closes the dampers on your furnace and keeps every room at an even temperature at all times. Ask for a free demonstration of the Blue Coal heat regulator in your own home. And remember the name, Blue Coal. Blue Coal is color marked for your protection with a harmless blue tint. Call your reliable neighborhood dealer tomorrow. He is listed under the words Blue Coal in your classified phone directory. And now, back to the shadow. It's quite obvious that the fire that destroyed this guest house was aided by gasoline. And it is my belief that murder has been done. If what you say is true, Mr. Cranston, it's a matter for the police and no business of yours. Commissioner Weston has been sent for, Mr. Post. But until he arrives, I'm taking over as his deputy. Now, Mrs. Post, will you be so kind as to tell me why you were fully dressed at four o'clock in the morning? I, uh, I must have fallen asleep with my clothes on. Hmm. You will just have to take my word. My mother is protecting Faison. She suspects Faison knows a great deal about Uncle Thomas's death. Why do you say that? When I returned home in my car around 3.30, I saw her peering into the window of the guest house. What were you doing there, Faison? That... 
Mr. Cranston, I will not answer. Well, answer it or not, Face Sand, this definitely puts you on our list of suspects. Mr. Post. Yes? Did you get out of your car when you saw Face Sand? No, I didn't. Not till I got to the front of the main house. I see. These tire tracks that lead up to the guest house were made by the tires of your car, Mr. Post. I found them earlier and traced them to you. Also, you will see the imprint of a man's shoe in the soft earth under what was once the side window of the guest house. I've also traced that to you. How do you explain it? I can't explain it. I... I don't know. I may have stopped after all. I don't remember. Hello there! Barbara! And Jack Norcott. Where have you been all night? It's really my fault, Mrs. Post. We ran out of gas over on the island road at about two o'clock. Yes, it took us hours to find a filling station. Say, looks like there's some excitement around here while I was gone. Miss Post, don't you know what has happened? Barbara, Uncle Thomas is dead. Dead? Yeah, burned to death in the guest house. Might as well tell you, dear sister, that we're all under suspicion. Suspicion? Why, I wasn't anywhere near here when the fire started. That's it, dear sister. Establish your alibi. Oh, it's... It's no alibi. We ran out of gas, as we said, and, and we couldn't find a filling station. Miss Post, isn't that a stain of gasoline on your coat? Huh? It still smells quite plainly of gasoline. Uh, I... Yes. Yes, you see, when I helped Jack carry the gas back to the car, some spilled on my coat. That's very interesting, Miss Post, because gasoline was used to start the fire that caused your uncle's death. I'm holding you also as a suspect. <laughs> This whole thing has Commissioner Weston confused, Margot. Well, I can understand that, Lamont. He says Mrs. Post is the logical victim. Everyone had a motive to kill her. But she turns up as one of the suspects. I'll have to agree with him on that, too, Lamont. Perhaps, Margot, some of this puzzle might be unraveled if the shadow paid Mrs. Post a visit. Tell me, Faison... What were you doing at the guest house when Jerry saw you peering in one of the windows? Since you commanded my mistress, I will tell you. Do you not recall that after quarrel with your brother, he left in anger to spend weekend in guest house? Yes. Then telephone call came from him asking you to come last night as he had matter of great importance to discuss. Later, I fear he might do you great harm, so I went in search of oh, you. Oh, yes, yes. But I decided not to go and called him back and told him that if he wanted to talk to me, he could come here. <laughs> what was that? That still does not explain one very important thing, Mrs. Post. I heard a voice. It is a voice of evil spirit. No, Faison. It is the voice of the shadow, whose mission is to fight evil. I can't see you. No, I have cast a mist of hypnosis over your mind, which makes me invisible. What do you wish of us? The truth, Faison. Mrs. Post... Why were you not in your bed at four o'clock this morning? I was too nervous to sleep. I, I half expected my brother Thomas to come here, as I had asked him to, and I waited in the library. I must have fallen asleep. I see. Shadow, if you are indeed friend of good, you will believe my mistress. She is telling you the truth. Mrs. Post. Mrs. Post. What shall I do, Shadow? Answer him. What do you want, Commissioner Weston? Down to the library right away. We're getting everyone together, and we're going to settle this case once and for all. I shall be down immediately. Well, Shadow... Are you satisfied that I am innocent of my brother's death? Your explanation seems logical, Mrs. Post. But I have only your word for it. Remember that the shadow has ways of finding the truth. This is ridiculous. You can't yes, prove yes, anything. Yes, How long is this silly entire... question going to continue? Quiet. Quiet. Now, wait a minute. That's better. Now, if you'll pardon me, Commissioner. Oh, what do you want, Cranston? It's just occurred to me that none of us has seen this fabulous emerald... That there's been so much talk about. Now, look, Cranston, I'm running this business. Uh, hear me out, Weston. As if I could help it. Go right ahead. Perhaps you haven't heard the legend of the emerald called the Light of the Orient, Commissioner. The legend goes, death by the fiery tongue of the dragon to those who covet the jewel. Superstition. Now, no, no, wait a minute, story. please. Where is the emerald? Mrs. Post, have you looked at it since you arrived? Uh... I know I, I haven't. Well, suppose it's stolen. Stolen? Mrs. Post, would you mind producing the emerald, please? The emerald? Um, uh, why, Fesson, uh, get the emerald and bring it here. Why, mistress, it is here, in oh. this room. Oh, 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 yes, yes, of course. Uh, get it, Fesson. But, mistress, it is in the safe. 
And you warn me no one is to touch safe but you. You mean you'd trust a priceless jewel like that in that old cracker box behind the picture? Why, even I know the combination to that old thing. Why, I've known it since I was ten years old. Here. Here, I'll show you. You just push this button here and... And there the picture slides away, like this. There. That's the safe. Ah! That face! What that is it, Miss Cole? What's the matter? Oh, that face I saw. A face pressed against the window. A horrible oriental face. Oh, you're seeing. Must be your imagination, Mr. No, I tell you, I saw a face. Now, don't worry, Mrs. Post. I've got my men surrounding the house. If there was anyone there, he'll be caught. My mother, Commissioner Weston, has a very vivid imagination. Shall I open the safe? Yes, Barbara, open it. Right. Now, turn ten to the right. Six to the... What happened? What has happened to Barbara? Oh, call a doctor, somebody. Just a moment. I'm afraid it's too late for a doctor. Mrs. Post... Your daughter is dead. We examined the safe, Margot, and found it to be some sort of a burglar catching device that got Barbara Post when she worked the combination. The purpose of the burglar catcher was to send in an alarm and hold the criminal until the police came. But she was killed by it. Well, the doctor said death was caused more by heart failure than the shock she received. Well, why didn't Mrs. Post warn her? Or have her turn off that burglar catcher when she opened the safe. Well, that's what's got Weston up a tree. Mrs. Post disclaimed any knowledge of the device that killed her daughter. That doesn't seem likely. No, it doesn't. And it's true, nevertheless. That occurrence proves something to me that's been bothering me ever since we came here. What's that, Lamont? I can't tell you just now, Margot, because I've work to do. Tonight, the shadow is going to force the murderer to strike again to cover up his tracks. <laughs> The murderer is known. One person in this house will reveal him to the police. <laughs> Mrs. Post, the conscience of the one person who can point to the real murderer will cause the capture of the killer. <laughs> hey, Sam. Who calls me from darkness to my room? It is. The shadow? You have returned? What do you wish of me? I have come to warn you, Faisan, that tonight an attempt will be made on your life. You know who the murderer is, and the murderer will attempt to silence the only one who knows. Well, yes, I know. It is my uncle Wulong. He has been here tonight. My mistress saw his face at window. He has vowed to kill his family and regain the jewel for the temple of Taela. He will try to kill me because I will not help him. No, Faisan. You're not telling the truth. It is not your uncle that you suspect. Yes. Yes, Shadow. No. And the person you suspect is not the murderer. Oh. Can I believe that what you say is true? You must trust me. The person you suspect is not the murderer. Will you help me trap the murderer? To apprehend the murderer is to protect the life of my beloved mistress. I am willing. We have waited at least an hour, Shadow, here in darkness, and no one has come. Quiet. Hey, son, I think our murderer is approaching your room now. <laughs> My friend, you will not kill again. That's better. Now, he's in. Turn on the lights. Yes. Let's have a look at the murderer. Oh! Mr. Post, my mistress. Oh, no. No, Shadow. You told me the person I suspect was not the murderer. You have deceived me. Weren't you trying to murder Face Hand to cover your crime forever? I don't know what you're talking about. Face Hand, you surely don't believe this. Oh, no. No, mistress. Face Hand, I promised you that the person you thought to be the murderer would not be the murderer. Yes. You really believed it to be your mistress? Yes. Then Mrs. Post is innocent. Mrs. Post is dead. Oh, no. And this is her twin brother, Thomas Miller, who killed her and proceeded to impersonate you her. You don't believe that, Face Hand? No. Now we'll just take that wig of yours, Mr. Miller. Oh! Thomas Miller! Yes, Thomas Miller. Oh, then it is my mistress who is dead. Yes, I killed her. Oh. All my life I've hated her. Oh, no. I would have had everything, everything that belonged to me if it hadn't been for you. Well, you're not turning me over to the police. I'll fix that. Drop that gun, Miller. <laughs> no! <laughs> 
So you see, Margot, Mrs. Post was murdered by her twin brother before we got there. Later, he destroyed her body in the fire. And it was really Thomas Miller posing as his twin sister who met us at the door when we arrived. Yes, Margot. That's why you get the cold reception. But I wasn't really suspicious until Mrs. Post, uh, or rather her twin brother, didn't know where the emerald was kept. That's right. It was right there in the library safe. And she, I mean he, didn't know about that burglar catcher either. No. Mrs. Post must have had it installed secretly and hadn't even told Faye San, whom she trusted. Oh, what a horrible bunch of people. I'll never ask to go on another weekend, Lamont. <laughs> Not even to write an article for Style and Fashion magazine? Oh, I forgot to tell you. I called the magazine on the phone just before we left to drive back to the city. And they don't want the article. Don't want it? No, they said it was too lurid for a woman's magazine. They said it belonged to some detective magazine. So I did. So you did what? Sold it to a detective magazine. Got more money, too. <laughs> Mario, you're wonderful. <laughs> In a moment, you'll hear an episode from real life proving that crime does not pay. But before we get to that, you'll be interested, I know, in what Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, Mr. John Barclay, has to say. Mr. Thank Barclay. you. Friends, the world is so complicated nowadays that often we make complications where none should exist at all. For example, the economical operation of a home heating plant is really very simple. That is to say, it's simple provided you get started right. That's the clue. Because when you don't get started right, you're quite likely to run into one difficulty after another. Soon you're discouraged, you know you're spending more money than you should, and worst of all, your house is uncomfortable, either too hot or too cold. Now, that's making complications where none should exist. Take pains to get started right, and you'll have no trouble. Now, here's my suggestion. Call your reliable blue coal dealer... And he'll send an expert John Barkley trained serviceman to your home at no charge. He'll check your heating plant thoroughly and start you on a comfortable and economical season. Call him tomorrow before cold weather is upon us. You'll be delighted to discover how much easier and how much more efficient it is to heat your home the easy blue coal way. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. Thank you. Today's program is based on a copyrighted story. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Direct from real life, we now bring you conclusive proof that crime does not pay. <coughs> New York City, New York. Lyman Fennell, tough, bold gangster gunman, hoped to make a big robbery hall in a prominent New York club. Yeah, this is the apartment I want. Hey, you, give me the key. No, no, Shut no! Up. <sighs> yeah, that'll hold you. You won't get away with a gun, Vanell. Death is waiting. They'll never catch me. Ah, here's my car. I gotta get away. Can't find the key. They're too close. I won't go back. I can't face prison. My gun. I gotta do it. So, by his own hand, Lyman Vanell paid the price of crime. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your neighborhood blue coal dealer brings you one of the strangest and most baffling of adventures in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your friendly blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. So don't forget, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. to hear our special guest at the end of today's program. And now, the thrilling adventures of the shadow are on the air. 
Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Get the jump on winter. Put in a supply of blue coal now, and you'll have a head start on cold weather. Don't wait until some of your family start catching cold before you tackle your heating problem. It's so easy to start the season off right with comfortable, economical blue coal. So place your order now. And remember, this year it's well to start the season with a big supply. The producers of blue coal expect no shortage of this finest of all hard coal, but present unsettled conditions make it wise to be prepared. Call your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow and order your winter supply of blue coal. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and powerful secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Hoodoo Ship. The date, 1850. The place, aboard the slave ship Raven, plying between Africa and America. Mr. Carway, sir. What is it now, Peters? What thunderation do you want? That ship, sir. What ship? The ship, sir, that has been following us since yesterday noon. Tell the first mate to pile on more canvas. We'll outrun her. Every piece of canvas we have is in use, sir. If we're caught with our cargo... We'll not be caught with our cargo. But the ship's a man of war and she's faster taking us. We'll not be caught with our cargo, mister. What do you mean, sir? I mean we're dumping those slaves overboard. But they'll drown. Without a trace. Ha! The man of war may catch us, mister... But she'll never be able to prove we carried slaves. Well, why are you standing there, Gate George? You heard my orders. Over the side with a lot of them. And when the man of war comes athwart us and asks our cargo, tell them we don't carry one. That we're just traveling for our health. <laughs> And that, Lamont and Miss Lane, is the history of this old ship, the Raven. A pretty gruesome history, Mr. Crowe. But how does the haunted story originate? On almost every voyage this old ship made after that, someone died. Finally, men refused to sail her. She's been harbored for the last 20 years. How long have you had this ship? Only a short while. You see, I was in something of a spot with the government taking over most of the merchant marine. And when I found the Raven for sale, it was a godsend. Well, uh, were you told about this legend of death concerning the ship when you bought it? Yes, but I thought it was just a story. A story such as any old sailing ship might have acquired in its long life. Something has happened to make you think otherwise? On its first trip from my plantations, the captain was murdered in his cabin. Oh, but that doesn't necessarily The door mean was it. locked from the inside and there wasn't a mark on his body. Frankly, Cranston, I too am beginning to believe this ship is accursed. I was watching the men taking the stuff off in that boat while I was waiting for you and Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston. Oh, hmm? were you Shrevey? Yes, sir. Ain't it too bad that the days of sailing boats is over, that they're over? Why do you say that, Shrevey? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because I read it somewhere. <laughs> I was just making with the conversation, like they say. You two have been so quiet, I was just making with the conversation. Like they say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See... I would like very much to be a sailor. Sailing on a briny deep and, and batting down the hatches and, and stuff. <laughs> well, Shrevey, I don't think you'd like that ship. Why not? I'm thinking to myself, that ship is beautiful. In a repulsive sort of way. Yeah, it certainly is. Shrevey, that ship once carried slaves from Africa to America. Is that so? Well, you can't blame the ship, you can't blame. No, but the taint of the men who indulged in that business still seems to stick to her. Well, that's quite understandable. 
What do you mean, Mr. Cranston? That ship is haunted. Oh, well, I... You mean it's got ghosts, it's got? Shrevey, watch where you're driving. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I thought for a minute you said the ship was haunted. She did. <laughs> oh, Shrevey, you're too excitable. Yes, ma'am, I'll keep reminding myself of that, I'll keep. Well, after all, it may be only a peculiar combination of circumstances. Come on, don't you believe what Mr. Carew told us? That the captain was found dead in his cabin? With the door locked on the inside? Margot, the captain may have died from natural causes. There were no marks of violence on his body, and as he was buried at sea... What about the wailing noises that were heard the night he died? What about that awful smell aboard ship? An odor of death? Was all that just coincidence? Yeah, how about that, Mr. Craston? Coincidence? Well, it hardly seems likely, but... What about all the trouble Mr. Grew had with the men being afraid to sail the ship again? Do you think you could scare all those men with a peculiar combination of circumstances? No, that's very true. Well, you've convinced me, Margo. Well? Convince me that I ought to accept Mr. Carew's offer to sail with him aboard the Raven. Sail? But Lamont will have to start shopping like mad for cruise clothes. Uh, Margo. Let me see. Margo. Hmm? You didn't hear me correctly. Mr. Carew asked me to sail with him. Just me. Oh, Lamont, you wouldn't... Margo, that's final. This is one time you're not going along. Well, Lamont, needless to say, I'm glad that you've decided to come along this trip. All right, then. Funny, but I've got a strange feeling about this particular voyage. A feeling that I may not come back alive. Oh, now, Carew. Well, Mr. Carew... We'll be sailing with the tide in about 20 minutes. Good. Uh, Captain Flanagan, this is our one and only passenger, Lamont Cranston. How do you do? Well, how do you do, sir? So you're the gentleman who's going to ferret out our spook, eh? Oh. You know the ghost legend? Captain Flanagan knows all about it. Mr. Cranston, I'm not a superstitious man. I've examined my cabin where this so-called murder took place from stem to stern and can't find a hiding place big enough even for a ghost. If a spook is going to clamber down that porthole tonight, I'll welcome him with open arms and buy him a spot of rum. He'll deserve it. (laughs) Now, gentlemen, I'm more worried about my crew than I am of any ghost. Never in all my years at sea have I seen a meaner or uglier bench of men. Well, they were the only men we could get, Captain. Sailors are superstitious about a hoodoo ship. Hey, Captain, look aloft. That man's going to fall off the rigging. Oh. Oh, don't worry about him. Even with one leg, he's more agile than the rest. Yes. That wooden leg of his doesn't seem to hinder him at all. That's Rock, the bosun, Captain. And he's the ugliest of an ugly lot. He's a good man. I don't know how I'd ever have a crew for you if he hadn't persuaded the men to sign on for another voyage. I hear you. Bosun, come here. Aye, aye, sir. Rock, this is our new skipper, Captain Flanagan. Welcome, sir. Welcome to the good ship, Raven. Haven't I met you someplace before, Mr. Rock? Not that I recall, sir. You look familiar to me. Not perhaps I'm mistaken. Yes, sir. Is that tobacco you're chewing, Mr. Rock? That it is, sir. I won't have any chewing or smoking while you're on duty. Yes, sir. Over the side it goes, sir. Good. Uh, Mr. Rock, I have been informed that discipline aboard the ship has been very lax. Oh? And I'll not tolerate that. As soon as we're out to sea, I want to talk to the entire crew. I'll see that they're assembled on deck, sir. Good. Now, back to your work, Mr. Rock. Aye, aye, sir. Don't you think you're being a little hard on him, Captain? Mr. Carew, I hope you won't mind my telling you this, but I'm the captain of this ship. You are the owner. But once we're out to sea, this ship is my responsibility. No offense, Captain. I quite understand. Uh, Captain Flanagan, for a moment you thought you recognized Rock. Yes. Who did you think he was? A man who used to work for me some years back. But I I must have been mistaken. And now, gentlemen, will you do me the honor of dining in my cabin tonight? Perhaps the presence of three men who don't believe he exists will discourage our ghost. <laughs> Well, Mr. Cranston, Mr. Carew, when we hit that typhoon, there weren't enough able-bodied men aboard her to bury the dead. Oh, yes, yes. Captain, is it all right if I clean the dishes away, sir? Yeah, clear away, Jess. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, you were saying, Captain, about the typhoon. Yes, that's a very interesting yarn, Captain. Well, for three days and three nights it blew. 
I lashed myself to the wheel with the waves breaking across the deck. Finally, the first mate relieved me and I crawled into my cabin more dead than alive. I didn't care whether the ship sank or not. I've gone through that same thing, Captain. You mean lashed to the wheel? Oh, no, seasickness. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Lamont, I'm afraid I have a touch of it myself right now. Oh, no, Carew. Yes, Cranston. So, if you'll both excuse me, I think I'll go out on deck for a little fresh air. Yes, yes, what's the matter with you? You've broken all the dishes. What are you staring at? Holmes, they've come. I know that he's looking at that locker over there in the corner. Yeah. I've seen the door move. Oh. Hear that? There's something in there. Well, there's only one way to find out. Come out. Yes, Lamont. Margot. Miss Lane. Uh, who is this woman? I'll explain, Captain. Margot, what do you think you're doing? A very bad job of stowing away, Lamont. But a very good job of being seasick. Oh! Margot! Margot! Here I am, Lamont. Oh. Feeling any better, Margot? Yes, a little, thanks. Well, you can go below now if you want to. Go to have my cabin. Carew and I are going to bunk together. Oh, thanks, Lamont. You're a dear. Wait till this voyage is over before you thank me, Margot. Things are brewing aboard this old ship. Things that may result in the death of any of us. Have you learned anything yet, Lamont? Not yet, Margot. But the shadow is going to Captain Flanagan's cabin tonight. Well, what can you gain by questioning Captain Flanagan? I'm not going to question him, Margot. Tonight, the shadow is going to be merely an observer. Because I think that an attempt will be made on the captain's life. And I'm going to prevent it, if I can. Who's there? Who's there? It's only me, miss. Yes, the steward. Oh, you frightened me for a minute. You pardon my saying so, miss. The deck of this ship ain't no place for a young lady to be alone this time of night. I'm beginning to think you're right, Jess. This ship is haunted. What? I got a feeling that something's going to happen tonight. Jess, you don't believe in ghosts, do you? Maybe yes. Maybe no. But I don't like to feel a death in the air tonight. Is that you over there? No. No, it's I, Margot. Where's Lamont? He didn't come back to the cabin. What? I don't know. What's the matter? There's something unearthly about. Miss Lane, do you notice that odor? What? Yes. Odor. The odor of death. The same odor that permeated the ship when Captain Rutherford was killed on the last voyage. Quick, we've got to find Lamont. Jess, you go around to the... Well, where is he? Who? Jess! I was just talking to him. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. He was right here a minute ago. I didn't see anyone talking to you when I came up. But he was here. I know it. What's that? That wailing I heard, too, when Captain Rutherford was killed. <laughs> that scream came from Captain Flanagan's cabin. Come on, Hurry! In a moment, our curtain will rise on Act Two. Meantime, let's talk about how you and your family can keep warm from now until next May. Heat your home with blue coal. You know, it's a fact that with blue coal, which is the finest of Pennsylvania hard coal, you can enjoy comfortable, even warmth throughout your house. Let the cold winter winds blow. You'll be snug and completely free of heating care. One reason it's so easy to heat with blue coal is that it's delivered to your home in exactly the right size for your heating plant. Another reason, and one you want to be sure to remember, is the new Deluxe Blue Coal Heat Regulator. Every home should have one. It's as easy to operate as an electric light switch. It automatically opens and closes the dampers on your furnace and keeps every room at an even temperature. You can let the weatherman do his worst. You're always comfortable. Ask for a free demonstration of the Blue Cold Heat Regulator in your own home. No obligation whatever. Get in touch with your reliable neighborhood Blue Coal dealer tomorrow. He's listed under the words Blue Coal in your classified phone directory. Remember the name, Blue Coal. 
Blue coal is color marked for your protection with a harmless blue tint. And now, back to the shadow. He's dead. Captain Flanagan is dead. Oh, Mr. Carew. His face is so contorted. He must have suffered horribly. Oh, Lamont. I heard the scream and came running. What is it? Look for yourself, Cranston. Captain Flanagan is dead. The same way that Rutherford got it. And not a mark on him. I think you're wrong, Carew. There's a slight scratch on his forehead. Let me see. So there is. How could a little scratch like that have caused his death? And where is the murder weapon? Mr. Carew, you've had plantations in the West Indies for many years. Haven't you ever heard of a native poison brewed from the roots of strange herbs called Maona Gua? It's known to cause instant death. I know. No, I don't know the poison. Why do you ask? Why? Because in some mysterious way, Captain Flanagan was murdered with that drug. Talk, Lamont. Seeing that you believe Mr. Carew had committed the murder. Perhaps he has, Margot. But you were there when it happened. You must have seen how it was done. Margot, I was right in the cabin when it happened, but I might have been in New York for all the good it did me. The shadow went to Captain Flanagan's cabin last night. The door was locked and bolted, so I knocked. When he opened the door to see who it was, the shadow slipped into the cabin. Then he locked and bolted the door again. But before I could... Hmm. I could have sworn I heard someone knock at the door. Uh, must be my imagination. Uh, well, to bed. Uh, hmm. Strange. What's that odor? Smells like it's coming from that ventilator. And the wailing. Just as Carew said he. Uh, 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 uh! Then he screamed and fell to the floor of the cabin. I heard you and Carew coming toward the cabin, and when Carew forced the door, the shadow slipped out. And you didn't see how it happened? No, Margot. I saw it happen, but the whole thing had me completely baffled. Come in. Begging your pardon, miss, but Mr. Carew wants both you and Mr. Cranston, sir, to come up on the bridge. Did he say what for, Rock? There seems to be some trouble, sir. The men refuse to go on. It looks pretty serious. I think you'd better talk to them, Mr. Carew. They look like they're in a pretty dangerous mood. Yes, they know how Flanagan died, and they want to turn back. Well, we can't sail the ship without them. I guess you'd better union them. But this is mutiny. It's unheard of in this day and age. Oh, please do something, Mr. Carew. All right, I'll do something. Something that may convince them. Let that action around here! Men, listen to me! We're going to continue our course to the West Indies. Not in this present ship, we're not. We want to turn back. What happened to Captain Flanagan? What happened to... Let me speak! What happened to Captain Flanagan? And Captain Rutherford, don't forget. This ship is hard. It was all an accident. There was nothing supernatural about it. This ship is cursed and we're not sailing. We want to turn back. And we're going to turn Men, back. men, please. Suppose I prove to you that there is nothing to fear on this ship. How are you going to do it? Then, oh, we want to know. if I sleep in the captain's cabin and nothing happens to me... Will you continue the voyage? Uh, that's fair enough. Fair enough it is. You do it, and if nothing happens to you, we'll go on. Aye, yeah, we'll go you'll on. prove it to us. Yeah, I've never on. asked a man working for me to do anything that I wouldn't do. I'm sleeping in the captain's cabin tonight. Now, have you got all that, Margot? Let's see if I've remembered everything. I'm to watch the porthole in the captain's cabin. And don't forget to stay out of sight. Right. When I get your signal... And uh, not my direct signal. The porthole slamming shut will be the signal. That's right. Then I'm to shoot the gun. And remember, just into the air to arouse the men of the crew. You're not to take a shot at the murderer. I'd like to take him alive. Who is he, Levant? Well, I'm still not sure, Margot. But I do know how the murders were committed. I spent the whole afternoon inspecting the captain's cabin again, and at last it came to me. You see, the victims were awakened by... Come in. Carew. 
I was looking for you, Lamont. I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Well, if I can. Do you want to speak with Lamont alone, Mr. Carew? No. No, thank you. It may sound silly to you, Lamont, but... Would you take care of this letter for me? A letter? What do you mean? It's to my wife. Just in case, you know. Oh, nothing's going to happen, Mr. Carew. Why, of course not. Of course not. I feel as though I'm taking that last long walk tonight. But it's something I've got to do. Nice evening, isn't it? it? Seems pretty fine to be alive. Well, I won't bore you with my emotions. Better have a go at that cabin. You will take care of that letter for me, won't you, Lamont? Certainly. So long. as if he were going to die tonight. And well he may, Margot. If anything goes wrong with the trap I've set for the killer. Well, let's get along. The shadow has work to do. Now to lock and bolt the door. There. Now there's nothing to do but wait. I could go to bed and wait. Huh? there. Who's there? Strange. I thought I heard someone knocking. Huh. Must be my nerves. <laughs> Mr. Carew. The voice. Maybe they're right. Maybe the ship is haunted. No, Mr. Carew. It is the shadow's voice you heard. But I can't see you. The shadow is invisible to your eyes. But let me reassure you, I am a man of flesh and blood, and I am your friend. I've cast a hypnotic mist over your mind, which makes me invisible. I don't understand. What do you want of me? I've come to help you, to save you from almost certain death. How can you save me? Be patient, Mr. Carew, and obey my orders, and we will outwit the killer. But I... That odor. The odor of death. The killer has come earlier than I expected. And now the moaning. Shadow, that awful smell. It seems to be coming from the ventilator. Mr. Carew. What is it? Don't move another step. You see the ventilator in front of the porthole? Yes. The murderer is just outside waiting for you to go to that ventilator. As you pass the open porthole, he will strike. Then I won't pass it. I'll be safe if I don't. You must pass it. What? If we are to catch our killer red-handed, please follow my instructions. Now... Count three to yourself and walk toward the ventilator. When I shout now, drop to the floor instantly. Ready? Ready. One, two, three. Now. Are you all right, Mr. Carew? Yes, yes, I'm all right. What's all that shouting about? Unless I'm mistaken, that means our killer's criminal days are over. If you'll examine the porthole, you'll find a sharp steel needle dangling from a silk thread. But be extremely careful of the way you handle it, as it's coated with a very deadly poison. That, Mr. Carew, is the murder weapon. Oh, Lamont, Mr. Carew is about the happiest man in the world this morning. <laughs> well, he should be. He came very close to following Captain Rutherford and Captain Flanagan as the killer's third victim. Oh. And Rock is in chains in the hole, Lamont? Yes. Carew's turning him over to the authorities as soon as we dock at Tocito. But did Rock finally admit why he had committed these murders? Well, Margo, it seems Rock had been hired by another concern to ruin Carew. Not only on this ship, but on any other ship that Carew might try to hire. You know, Lamont, I still don't know how Rock could do all those things. What things, Margo? Well, for instance, the wailing sound that we heard. Oh, that's simple enough. He rigged up some large tin drums on a rosin cord hung to the yard arm. When the wind whirled him about, it produced our moaning sound. But what about the odor? That terrible odor of death. <laughs> that was nothing more than a few basic chemicals placed in the ventilators. Our imagination supplied the so-called odor of death. Oh, that's simple enough. But how did Rock actually commit the murders? I knew, Margot, that the killer had used a blowgun and a poison dart. But what puzzled me was, what became of the dart? You remember, we couldn't find it. Oh, now, Lamont, that's not so simple. On the contrary, Margot. 
Rock merely slid down a rope to the porthole, shot his poison dart, and retrieved it by pulling it back on a silk thread. Huh, as simple as all that? Why, I could have figured that out if I'd had time enough. Well, of course you could, dear. Time and give you time enough and you could have figured it out, certainly. There's only one thing you overlooked, Margot. What's that, Lamont? A peculiar characteristic of our friend Carew. Really? What characteristic? He just doesn't like being buried at sea. Well, you can understand. <laughs> oh, Lamont! <laughs> we have a special announcement to make in just a few moments, but now we'd like to present to you Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, John Barclay. Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Friends, they say that well begun is half done. And I want to point out to you today the truth of that old saying as it applies to modern home heating. You know, there's really nothing complicated about the operation of a furnace. Although, as experience perhaps has shown you, there are seemingly simple things that can cause you trouble. Now, why do these troubles arise? Believe me when I tell you that most of them are caused by not starting out right. Well begun is half done. You'll find it pays you over and over again to take pains at the beginning of the season to start your heating plant off right. Now, here's my suggestion. Call your reliable blue coal dealer, and he'll send an expert, John Barkley-trained serviceman to your home. There's no charge whatever for this. He'll check your heating plant thoroughly and start you on a comfortable and economical fall and winter season. Call him tomorrow, before cold weather settles in for good. You'll be surprised and delighted to find how much easier and how much more efficient it is to heat your home the blue coal way. Phone your friendly blue coal dealer tomorrow. Thank you. It's our great privilege to present to you at this time Mr. Norman Weiser of Radio Daily. Mr. Weiser, as editor and critic, has long been regarded as a leading authority in the world of radio drama. Mr. Weiser. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen... Radio today is certainly a major influence in the field of drama. Radio dramatizations such as The Shadow are very carefully selected and are designed particularly to suit the listening tastes of an exceptionally discriminating audience. Today, I am representing Harper and Brothers in commemoration of their new book, Writer's Radio Theater of 1940-1941 which contains the ten outstanding radio dramas of that period. It is my honor to present one of the ten merit awards to The Shadow, as having contributed one of the best radio dramas of the year. It was called The Ghost Walks Again, written by Jerry Devine, produced by Wilson Tuttle, and presented over this network March 16, 1941. Thank you, Mr. Norman Weiser, and thank you, Radio Daily. Today's program was based on a copyrighted story. The characters' names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your neighborhood blue coal dealer brings you another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your friendly blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. So don't forget, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike 
that crime does not pay. The way to get in step with the times on home heating is to fill your bin with blue coal, that exceptionally fine home fuel. Yes, blue coal gives you comfortable economical heat, and it's effort saving on your part, too. Yes, it's easy as well as clean and healthy to heat your home the blue coal way. Order a supply of blue coal right now. The producers of blue coal foresee no shortage of this high-quality home fuel, but present unsettled conditions make it wise to be prepared. Don't put off ordering. Call your friendly neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow and get your winter's supply. <laughs> The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and powerful secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Devil's Hour. The ram's horn will summon Satan. <laughs> Help me, Satan. Alone in the forest here, I have sounded the devil's horn. I call on you to blot out the life of my enemy, Edward Heller, before the hour of this midnight has struck, and to blot out the life of his sister, Deborah, before the hour of this midnight has passed. <laughs> Is that you, Bedire? Yes, Miss Deborah. It's Bedire. Them farm people are having a fine time for their Halloween husking party. Oh, we shouldn't have done it, Bedire. Mr. Edvard is in no condition to be lying in his bed upstairs, tossing and turning. That infernal laughing and stomping goes on. Yes, ma'am. But they'll be leaving soon, ma'am. Now, Miss Deborah, I'm going down to the servants' quarter. Well, there's nothing else for you to do. But I... Miss Deborah. That sounded like... The devil's horn, Miss Deborah. Where is it coming from? Mr. Edward's room. Edward? Oh, get up there quick, Bedire. Yes, sir, Miss Deborah. But there ain't much I can do. You heard that horn. Yes, Bedire. I heard the devil's horn. Means Edvard is to die. But it isn't time yet. Midnight was the hour he always feared. Mr. Edward. Yes, Bedire? Mr. Edward is dead. Of course he is. What were them shots, Miss Deborah? Who are you to ask? My name is Jarkins, one of the farm folks, ma'am. What is it? Mr. Jarkins. My brother Edward is dead. Edward dead? Dead? Who? Edward Heller? Dead? How did you mean? Quiet, friends. Miss Deborah, who would kill such a man as your brother? I don't know that, Mr. Jarkins. But this I do know. Just before my brother was killed, we heard the devil's horn from up there in his room. Uh, oh, the devil's horn. Yeah, the devil's been here. Old Pratsman done it. Old Pratsman, the witch. He talks to the devil. Quiet, friends. 
Miss Deborah, did old Trotsman maybe have a grudge against your brother? Did he, ma'am? My brother knew Mr. Protzman. Only yesterday it was I heard them quarreling. Go on. And I heard Protzman saying as clear as though he were in this room right now. He said... I may be helpless, Edward Heller, but I can call on Satan to bring death and destruction... On the house of my enemies. <laughs> That's just what he said, Mr. Charkins. Now what are you going to do? Bury the witch with his victim, Miss Deborah. We're going to dig a nice deep grave for old Protzman. There'll be two bodies together in that grave tonight. <laughs> You know, Margot, we haven't yet passed a witch on a broom. <laughs> Strange, isn't it? Unheard of, Lamont, considering it's soon to be Halloween. <laughs> Can you remember what an exciting thing Halloween was when you were a kid? <laughs> oh, that doesn't require too good a memory, Margot. Oh, <laughs> oh uh, incidentally, I, uh, I didn't want to frighten you, but I'm afraid we've lost our road. Oh, oh, oh. well, I'm really too sleepy to care, partner in crime. Well, then, why don't we just pick out a little inn along the road and stay there until morning? This countryside is perfect for Halloween. So, why don't you just wave your wand, stop your car, and there you are. Well, you stopped your car, but where are you? You're in. I am. Oh, where? Well, doesn't that sign say in? Oh, yes, I see. Nailed up on the tree there. P-R-O... I think the name is Protzman. Yes, Protzman. Well, Mr. Protzman's in, a little dilapidated. But then so am I. <laughs> Hurry then, my lady, before you both fall apart. And I'm just in the mood to do that. <laughs> well, doesn't seem to be a creature stirring. But we'll take a chance. Serve us right if an old witch took us in and baked us both into gingerbread boys. A boy for me and girl for you, darling. You see, I... <laughs> oh, good evening. You've come to tell me he's dead, haven't you? What? Uh, what did you say? You've come to tell me. Oh, I thought you were someone else. Someone else? My name is Protzman. This is my house. What can I do for you? We'd like two rooms for the night, if you have them. Step inside. I'll try to... What was that? What? That you hear? Oh, some people on the road. After all, it's Halloween. Look, Lamont, coming over the hill. It's a mob. It's me they want. They're after me. Rotsman, Rotsman, where are you? Come what on, will I do? Rotsman. What will I do? Well, as a first precaution, I suggest you're ducking inside and locking the door, Mr. Rotsman. That wouldn't stop them. They'd burn the house down. Well, then I'm afraid we're in for a first class... This time they're going to kill me. Quiet. They'll kill Listen me. Listen to me, you men. Listen. I'd keep out of this if I was you, stranger. Rotsman, you ought to let me want to talk to you. What do you want with me, Mr. Jarkin? Funny you're asking that, you with your dirty witchcraft and spellcasting. So where are you taking me? We're taking you back to the Heller Mansion, Tutsman. We're going to bury you with Heller in a nice deep grave. Oh, no, no, bury me, man. No, you don't. Let me go. Tutsman, you ain't leaving us alive. Please, don't hurt me. I can move it past you. That grave is just going to pitch you. Did you hear what I heard, Margot? I'm afraid I did, Lamont. A witch, a murder, and a grave already dug? What were you saying about Halloween being exciting when we were kids, Margot? Quiet. Quiet. Do what we want to do let Plotsman talk. Please. Please, let me go. You're wrong about me, I tell you. Are we? I... Here's your witch, Miss Deborah. Got anything to say to him? I have. That's my brother's body on the bed there, Mr. Protzman. Not a pretty sight, is he? With those three bullets in his heart. <laughs> Don't make me look at the dead one. You'll I... look at it all right. It was the last night, please. Listen. Hear that? 
Someone coming up the stairs. Expect anybody, Miss Deborah? No one. Well, here we are, Margot. No trouble at all. To... Oh, quite a turnout we have here. Good evening, everyone. Well, I don't want to play, Margot. Now, my dear, we are at what is usually referred to as the scene of the crime. We must observe everything very carefully. Uh, for instance, the broken vase we see lying on this hearthstone may be connected with this... This fresh bullet hole in the mantelpiece here. Amazing, my dear Holmes. Elementary, my dear Margot. Now I wonder if these good people here have noticed that the dead man didn't so much as stir in his sleep while being killed. Listen here, stranger. I don't know who you are, but... Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm Lamont Cranston, and this is Miss Lane. We thought we'd help track down the criminal who killed Edward Heller. The devil himself killed Edward Heller. Really? Hmm, the devil must be having a rather tough season of it. What do you mean, miss? That empty watch case on the mantelpiece. Did the devil by any chance steal the contents of that, Mr. Jorkins? Edward's watch case. She's right. It's empty. His watch is gone. Ah, nice work, Margot. Was it a very valuable watch, madam? It was an heirloom. One of those old-fashioned watches that chimed a little tune on the hour. Oh, yes, I know the kind. Very popular in my grandfather's day. Still rather popular with the satanic majesty by the looks of things. What kind of nonsense is this? The devil has no need for the things of men. No? Well then, Mr. Jarkins, why did your devil use the revolver by this bed to murder Mr. Heller? Said Vart's own gun. He always kept it in his room. May I see it, please? Uh, yes. Miss Deborah, don't give it to him. Thank you, Miss Deborah. I'll tell Thank you, Mr. Jarkins, you and your mom. Uh, now then. All right, it's all right, men. He won't get away with this. And you better get old Protzman out of here, Lamont. All right, Margot. You. Me, sir? Badaya, sir? I'm only a servant in the house, sir. Get Mr. Prossman out of this room quickly. Hold him downstairs until the police come. Yes, sir. thank you, young man. We'll get thank you for this Prossman and you too, Cranston. Get him out, Badaya. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm sorry to interfere with your fun this evening, gentlemen. But no one is to touch that old man until the police arrive. Is that clear? Who says so? I do, Mr. Jarkins. Not to mention the revolver. And now we're going to proceed with a sensible investigation of this. Oh, yeah, what was he that? Killed He's gone. Protzman's got away. Badiah. He's a witch for sure he is. How did he get away? I turned my back for one second and he vanished. Oh, I can't stand this. I'm, I'm going going falling. To... Come on, help him. Here, here, Miss Deborah. Uh, take my arm. Uh, hold the gun, Margot, while I... I'll take that gun, Mr. Cranston. Yeah, there. Uh, uh, now, sir, you listen to me. You let Protzman escape. Miss Deborah. I want no explanations. He killed my brother. He threatened my own life, and now... Mr. Jarkins. Yes, Miss Deborah. You and the rest will take Miss Lane below and hold her until Mr. Cranston brings the murderer to me. If you fail to do that by one o'clock, Mr. Cranston, I will take the law into my own hands. You and Miss Lane have 30 minutes to live. <laughs> In a moment, we'll bring you the second act of The Devil's Hour. Recent weather predictions describe an especially severe winter in store for us. Be prepared to meet it with a plentiful supply of blue coal. This exceptionally fine home fuel will give you comfortable, even warmth, no matter how cold the winds outside the house may blow. And remember this, that it's especially easy to heat your home with blue coal. Blue coal is delivered to your home in exactly the proper size for your heating plant. It's carefully prepared to give you safe, efficient, and economical heat. And you'll enjoy added ease when your furnace is equipped with our new automatic blue coal heat regulator. What a truly wonderful improvement this is. It's as easy to operate as your electric toaster. It automatically opens and closes the dampers on your furnace and keeps every room at an even temperature at all times. Call your reliable neighborhood blue coal dealer right away and ask for a free demonstration of the blue coal deluxe heat regulator in your own home with no obligation whatever. Your neighborhood dealer is listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Blue coal, you know, is color marked for your protection with a harmless blue tint. Get in touch with your blue coal dealer tomorrow. And now... Back to the shadow. (laughs) 
Jarkins and his men are holding Miss Lane outside. And your time is passing, Mr. Cranston. I hope to give you a definite clue soon, Miss Deborah. Now, let's see. This was Edward's library. Hmm. An art collection. Egyptology, metaphysics. Uh Aha. Look at this. Who's that? Witchcraft. A volume on witchcraft. And what's this in the pages? It's a letter, Mr. Cranston. Uh, So I see. It seems to begin at the middle. The... Must be another page somewhere about. What does it say? You were taken away, my own. I will leave no stone unturned to bring misery and death on him who stole you from me. Signed, Edward. Strange. I don't... Ah, look, here it is. The first page. To whom is it addressed, Mr. Cranston? To beloved Elsa... Dated the 25th. Well, that's yesterday. Elsa! Oh, no. Miss Deborah. Oh. Are you ill? Don't, don't worry about me. There's no time to waste. You must go to Badaya at once, Mr. Kynston. Badaya? He will know the truth. Ask him why my brother went to see Dr. Fennings last night. Dr. Fennings? If only you can make him talk. There are ways to do that, Miss Deborah. Miss Deborah. Oh. Deborah. I'll have to go out this window. You can tell Mr. Jarkins I'll be back soon. Deborah, you hear me in there? Where is he? First Proxman disappears, and now... Mr. Jarkins, there's been a mistake. You'll find out what a mistake there's been if you're Proxman's next victim. Where's Cranston? Why did you let him go? I had to, Mr. Jarkins. There was a mistake. Miss Deborah, I believe you're in league with your brother's murderers, with Cranston and Proxman. No, Mr. Jarkins. You are. And now, if it's the last thing on earth I do, I'm going to... No! No, Mr. Jarkins! Mr. Oh! Oh! She's dead. Adaya, Cranston has escaped, but my men are still holding Miss Lane. She has only a short while to live. Meanwhile, I don't want you to tell anybody I talk to you. I won't tell, Mr. Jarkin. Good. From here on, I'm going to shoot on sight. Make sure your aim is good, Jarkins. Very good. (laughs) Who is that? I am the Shadow. But I can't see you. No. I've cast a hypnotic spell over your mind, Badaya. What do you want with me? Why did Edward Heller visit Dr. Fennings last night? You know that? The Shadow knows. Why, Badaya? Because... Because Mr. Edvard's heart was bad. Dr. Fenning said he couldn't live out the month. I see. Why did you keep that visit a secret? Because I was scared of Mr. Edvard. Death always seemed to be close to him. And that horn we heard... Very interesting. One thing more. Your master, Edward Heller, wrote a letter to Elsa. Who is Elsa? Elsa? Why, that was Mr. Protzman's wife. Mr. Protzman's wife? She's been dead these ten long years, she has. I see. I'm leaving you now, Badaya. But remember, I'm always near. The shadow will be watching you. <laughs> <laughs> For Jarkins. Yeah, it's almost one. With. Why don't we kill Cranston's friend, Miss Lane, here? We've uh, still got five minutes left. Miss Deborah Miss Palmer's... Deborah's dead. I'm in charge now. Men? Yeah, what is uh, That uh, grave Edvard Heller's lying in is waiting for a companion. If we can't get Cranston, we've got Miss Lane. But Lamont won't go back on his word. He'll be here any minute. Any minute won't do, Miss Lane. He should be here now. Uh, but I am here, gentlemen. Oh, Lamont. Oh, Put down that gun, Jarkins. Yeah. My time's not up yet. I promise to deliver the murderer before one o'clock, and I will. All right, but you'd better do some fast talking, Cranston. Gladly. Now listen to me. First, that broken vase was shattered by the bullet that made this small hole here in this mantelpiece. What's your point, Cranston? Just this. We know there were three shots heard when Edward Heller was killed. It's unlikely that the murderer would have missed after getting his range. 
Therefore, the shot that missed and broke this vase must have been the first shot fired. Right, Mr. Jarkins? Well, yes. Yes, I guess so. Well, what's that got to do with it? Just this. If you'd been in bed asleep and someone had fired a gun in your ear and knocked a vase to the floor, what would you have done? Frankly, I would have jumped up and tried to... Of course you would have, Margot. But Edward Heller didn't. See how smooth his bedclothes are? Heller didn't move because he knew he was going to be murdered. Murdered as part of his own plan. Just a minute, Cranston. This bullet hole of yours in the mantelpiece hasn't left a trace of lead. No? Well, let's see that, Jarkins. Oh. It's just possible that this mantelpiece isn't exactly what it appears to be. I'd say... Uh Ah! Quite an interesting little device, eh, Mr. Jarkins? That's right. The mantelpiece open. Yeah, what do you suppose is inside there? I'm not sure, but I've got a good idea. I wouldn't go in there, Cranston. I'll take that chance. Stay here with your men, Jarkins. Come on, Margot. All right. Careful, Lamont. I'll be careful. It's only a question... Lamont, isn't that a figure huddled there in the corner? It is, Margot. It's Protsman. Protsman. Crossman, are you all right? Here, let me help. Please, don't hurt. He's almost Please. delirious. Leave him alone, Cranston. Please. I'll tend to him. Please. Come along, Cranston. Oh, no, you don't, Jarkin. This gun says I do. Please, don't. Come on, come on. Please. Come on. Please. Well, Lamont, this is a fine pickle. Haven't you found out who killed Edward Heller yet? Almost, Margot. There's only one piece missing from the puzzle, and that's the little stolen watch that plays a tune on the hour. Do you think you'll find it before they kill Protsman? Perhaps the shadow can find it, Margot. Please don't hurt me, Mr. Jarkins. Please let me live. Shut up, Frenchman. I was... Who's there? It's Bedire, Mr. Jarkins. Well, why don't you come in, Bedire? We're killing a witch in here. Oh, no. No. You... You're killing him, Mr. Jarkins? We're killing him, Bedire. <laughs> Not yet, Jarkins, not yet. What's that? Who was talking? It was I, Mr. Jarkins. The shadow. But I I can't see you. You're just a voice. You cannot see me, but I'm here in this room. As is our murderer, Mr. Jarkins. Who, who is the murderer? You have but a moment to wait. The devil's hour is over. Well, what are we waiting for? Yeah, where is our murderer? Right there, gentlemen. It's Edward Heller's watch. Mr. Jarkins? Yes, voice. Why don't you ask Badiah the time? Why ask me the time? Reach in your pocket, Badiah, and take out Edward Heller's watch. All right. What if I have Mr. Edward's watch, Shadow? Just this. You killed Edward. Then you kidnapped Potsman to make us believe the devil had a hand in this night's crime. Yeah, and why did I do that, Shadow? For a sum of money. You mean my master paid me to kill him? That's exactly what I mean. You were the only person who knew Edward was going to die within the month. And Edward wanted someone to kill him tonight. And why would he want that, Shadow? Revenge. He never forgave Potsman for marrying Elsa, the woman he loved. And because of this, he paid you to kill him. So that he could use his death to frame Potsman. How do you know all this? And Edward almost succeeded... He was only defeated by your stupidity. You couldn't resist stealing your master's watch. (laughs) Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to do plenty. Look out, Jarkins. He's got my gun. Yes, and I'm going to use it. No, you're not, Bataya. Give me that gun. No, Shadow. Your job is done. You found your murderer. But I'm robbing you of the privilege of taking him alive. And this time, the first shot won't miss its mark. Goodbye, Mr. Cranston. Miss Lane, I I have to thank you for giving my life back to me. And I have thank to you. thank you for humoring an old fool. <laughs> Glad we happened along, Mr. Jarkins. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Protsman, I'd uh, give up experimenting with witchcraft if I were you. Oh, believe me, I will, sir. I will. <laughs> believe me. <laughs> Goodbye. 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 Goodbye, Mr. Protsman. Goodbye, Mr. Cranston. <laughs> ah. All right, Marco? Yes, I... I think so. Only, you know, there's... There's one thing I don't understand. Oh? 
What's that? Well, as Mr. Protzman told us, he asked the devil to kill Edvard Heller before midnight and his sister before one. Miss Deborah's death, Margot, was due to apoplexy, brought on by the realization of what Edward had done. But still, it all turned out exactly the way Protzman asked the devil to arrange it. You see what I mean, Lamont? Margot, one really mustn't ask too many questions on Halloween's Eve in a strange countryside. In a moment, we'll bring you an episode from real life proving that crime does not pay. First, however, I know you'll be interested in hearing from Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, John Barclay. Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Many people already have started their furnace fires. In the changeable weather we're having, it's nice to have warmth in the chilly mornings and evenings. But it's certainly no fun to have to get up on a cold morning and go down to rebuild a fire that's gone out during the night. You won't have to do this, you know, if your furnace is equipped with the proper dampers and if you have a modern thermostat. Any blue coal dealer will be glad to send an expert John Barclay trained serviceman to your home to show you how easily you can regulate your furnace to give you heat just when you want it. Heat during the cool mornings and evenings and fires bank during the day and night. Let this expert serviceman help you at no obligation whatever. Simply call your friendly neighborhood blue coal dealer and you'll soon settle down at ease free of heating worries. He's listed in the yellow section of your classified telephone directory under the words blue coal. See how much easier and more efficient it is to heat your home the blue coal way. Thank you. Today's program is based on a copyrighted story. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Direct from real life, we now bring you conclusive proof that crime does not pay. (coughs) New York City, New York. Irving Levitt, 38 years old, spots a well-to-do victim for robbery. He quickly approaches. You got $145 in that handbag. No! Give me that. No, I... <laughs> run. Run as hard as you can, Irving Levitt. You won't get to spend that money. It profits you nothing. Last week in Kings County Court, Irving Levitt heard the price of his attempted grand larceny. Four to five years in Sing Sing Prison. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. (laughs) Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember... Keep the home fires burning with blue coal. Thrilling Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Don't blame the weatherman when a sudden unexpected freeze catches you unprepared. Your home insufficiently heated. Guard against that happening. Fill your coal bin right now with blue coal. The quality home fuel of low cost. With your bin filled with blue coal, you're prepared for any kind of weather. 
order a supply of blue coal right away and get a whole bin full when you order. So there won't be any chance of being caught by a possible shortage. Today, there is a plentiful supply, but who can say what changes the future may bring? Put in your winter supply of blue coal right now and be safe. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and powerful secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Organ Played at Midnight. A knife. What an instrument a knife is. (laughs) <laughs> Have you ever watched a knife in the hands of a skillful surgeon? And did you shiver a little, then turn your eyes away? Yes, so did I. I remember exactly when it happened to me. I was watching the knife in the hands of Dr. Alexander Gibson. Gibson was a surgeon of the highest caliber. Even Professor Dana Williams spoke of him as one of the three most capable men he had ever had the honor to teach thus ranking him with his colleagues, Dr. McGill and Dr. Nelson. How strange the thought of violence should have occurred to me. Stranger still, considering that it was the very next night Gibson burst into McGill's study. Heated words passed between the two, and then... This case was to have been the most startling in my surgical career, Dr. McGill. You forget that the patient asked to have me in attendance, Gibson. I never agreed to a consultation. I presumed on our friendship You and... presumed on our friendship for the last time, McGill. That's the way you want it, eh? Yes, that's the way I want it. Then you'll get the truth. You were bungling the case like a schoolboy. Old Williams would have fired you out of class for the job you were doing. Oh, so I'm to gather that you saved the situation. Exactly. So the credit is yours, eh? Belongs to you. Every bit of it. Well, doesn't it, Gibson? Well, can't you speak? I haven't anything else to say. Oh, you agree with me then? Good night, McGill. I've tried to be reasonable with you. I said good night. All right. Good night then. But remember, we are not parting as friends, Gibson. And we're not parting forever either, Dr. McGill. Well, I'll have something to say about this at the medical board. Oh, no, no, I shouldn't let myself go like that. Nerves don't stand it well, not at all. I said it is what I need. Yeah, what's that? Oh, the shade. Hmm. Jumpy, jumpy, unsettled. If I were my own patient, I'd... Someone at the door. Well, who's there? Well, who is it? Can't you hear me? Well, didn't you... Oh, you. Oh, I thought that you were... You have a knife there. Did you know you had a knife in your hand? Oh, it's some kind of a joke, isn't it? You're playing a joke on me, aren't you? Aren't you? Answer me. Answer me. Well, what are you going to do? No. No, don't come any closer. Well, what are you doing? Stop it. Stop it. Oh, oh you fool. You're cutting my arm. Ah! <laughs> a knife. What an instrument a knife is. Now a tool. Now a weapon. But its point goes deep, and a knife is always thirsty. And after the shrieking thrust in the dark, there is silence and a shroud, and the black drapery of the march of death hangs heavy in the startled air. Lamont. I want to get away from the sound of it. Of what, Professor Williams? The funeral march. It depresses me. You can understand what a shock Dr. McGill's death has been to you, Professor Williams. A deep shock, Miss Lane. I won't forget it soon. Is there anything we can do, sir? Thank you, Cranston. Thank you. You always were one of the kinder fellows. (laughs) You were never too interested in my classes, I'm afraid. But you were always a good chap. So was poor McGill. A fine, bright boy. Yes, Professor. But that anyone could kill him and not be content with that. Go to the horrible extreme of amputating his right arm. I I can't bear to think of it. Perhaps we'd better not, sir. 
Yes. Yes, you're right, you're right. After all, my life goes on. There'll be new men for me to teach. I'm glad of that. And I'm glad to have you beside me today, Cranston. Thank you, Professor. It would be good, too, to have Gibson and Nelson with us. They're all that's left of McGill's famous triumvirate. Well, I'm sure they're here, sir. We must have missed them. Gibson isn't, I know. He called me. Couldn't come, he said. Oh, but see here, I, I've been rather gloomy company, I'm afraid. Uh, how would the two of you like to take the five o'clock train back to the college with me? Oh, nice of you, Professor. The homecoming football game is being played this afternoon. And if victory is ours, we should be just in time for the bonfire celebration. Well, we'd like to very much, but it's rather a long trip, and uh, where well, we hadn't planned on it, Professor Williams. If we'd known... I only thought that we should be together on a day like this. Professor Williams! What was that? Well, someone called my name. Professor Williams! Oh, it's uh, Dr. Nelson. Uh, good morning, my boy. Uh, you know Mr. Cranston. Professor Williams, I think I deserve an explanation. What's that, Nelson? I don't understand this wire you sent me, sir. The wire I sent you? I haven't had any reason to wire you, Nelson. One never has a reason for such a thing as this. Listen to what it says. Take a good look at Dr. McGill and his coffin, Nelson, for you'll be the next to be wept for. What? Signed, John Smith. You don't know a John Smith, of course. Of course not. But you thought I had sent that, Nelson? Why? The postmark. It was sent from the college telegraph office. It was? What time? 8.45 this morning. I've been in the city since 7. Well, of course, sir. Someone else sent this little love note, and they didn't mean it for a joke. Well, what do you think, Lamont? I think that if Professor Williams' invitation to go back to the college with him is still open, the three of us would be very wise to take it. Well, here we are, sir. From the looks of things, victory was ours. I'll take care of the cat. Oh, it's Professor Williams. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Who won the game? We did, sir. Well, we're building a swell bonfire, sir. Yeah. You should have been at the game, Professor. You'd have enjoyed it. I would have very much, Tompkins. But there was something I had to do which I didn't enjoy at all. I want to congratulate you men. I want you to know that I'm proud of you. Hey! Things haven't changed much, have they, Nelson? They haven't changed at all, Cranston. He's still the idol of every boy here. Shall we go inside now? I think Anna, my housekeeper, will have a cup of tea for us. Uh, goodbye, gentlemen, and let the flames leap high for the conquering hero. Hey! There isn't much for you younger folk to do in a little college town like this, but... I am going to perform quite an interesting post-mortem examination for my anatomy class tomorrow, and I thought perhaps you'd like to be in the amphitheater. Well, uh, Yes, Professor, of course. On, on second thought, I, I realize that Miss Lane and you might not find it altogether to your taste. Why, Margo and I would like very much to come, wouldn't we, Margo? Why, well, yes, yes, we, yes, I'd love to. Well, how about you, Dr. Nelson? I? Why, Cranston, the day will never come when I won't be able to learn something from Dana Williams. Thank you, Nelson. You're welcome to my home. Thank you, Professor. Anna. Anna. Oh, oh, you're back, Professor. Uh, yes, Anna. What about a pot of tea and some biscuits? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, ready in a jiffy, sir. Oh. What is it, Anna? Uh, well, I, I was just wondering what it was you wanted done with it, sir. Uh, was it left out to be sharpened? What is that, Anna? Uh, your knife, Professor. My knife? Why, all of my knives are in my kit in the laboratory. But when I come in to clean up just after you left, there it was shining up at me plain as day. Uh, where is it, Anna? Uh, right in the study on top of the desk, sir. Professor Williams, do you mind if I have a look at it? Why, no, no, of course not. Uh, come along, Nelson. Right. Here we are. I don't understand it. Anna's right. There it is, just as she said. Uh, may I see it, sir? Of course, Cranston. Hmm. Professor Williams... Yes, my boy. Look here, on the back of the blade. Initials. Why, they're A.G. A.G.? Why, Nelson, that's... Alexander Gibson? Oh, no, no. M Miss Lane, would you answer that for me, please? Yes, of course, Professor. Hello? Hello? Oh, yes, he's here. It's for you, Dr. Nelson. Oh, thank you. Hello? Yes? Uh, what? What? How long? I see. Thank you very much. Professor Williams. Yes, Nelson. That was my office in town. They've been phoning all day about Gibson. He's been missing, it seems, ever since the night poor McGill was murdered. Well, gentlemen, looks like the bonfire's begun. Gee, this 
half is hit is cold. Yeah, sure is. I wanted to sleep this morning anyhow. If you miss his postmortems, old Williams will never forget it. Uh, not losing your nerves, are you, Margot? Well, not yet. I can't say that the sheeted form there on the table is helping me very much, though. After all, it's just an examination, Margot. If you keep remembering that it's all in the interest of science, you won't get uneasy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wonder where Dr. Nelson could be. Well, he must have overslept, I guess. I thought doctors had to be punctual. <laughs> Old Williams will be punctual. <laughs> See? Oh, what did I tell you? <laughs> <clears throat> Gentlemen... Good morning. Precisely according to schedule. <laughs> the subject for our post-mortem this morning is the cadaver of a man of middle age in an excellent state of preservation. Uh, Jennings, will you remove the sheet? Uh, yes, Professor Williams. It will form a most satisfactory subject for our investigations. Jennings. Jennings, I'd like the sheet removed from the entire body, not just the head. Oh, Jennings. Oh, Professor Williams. What are you staring at, man? Oh, no, Professor Williams. What is it, Jennings? What is it? Margot, what's happening down there? I can't quite see. Jennings has the sheet halfway down, but he's leaning over the table. Jennings, what's happened to you? Williams is pulling him away. Margot, look. Oh. On the table. Oh, oh Lamont. It's... Dr. Nelson. Nelson, my boy. In a moment, we'll bring you Act Two of The Organ Played at Midnight. Meanwhile, here's an idea that has no mystery to it at all. Order a supply of blue coal, and you'll enjoy comfortable, even warmth throughout your home, no matter what fiendish tricks the cruel winter weather plays. Let the icy winds whistle and blow all they like. You'll be warm and snug and at your ease when you heat with blue coal. Yes, sir, at your ease is just right. Because blue coal takes the effort right out of home heating. You see, blue coal is delivered to your home in exactly the right size for your heating plant. Then on top of that, the new automatic blue coal heat regulator saves you all those damper adjusting trips. Just naturally cuts them right out. Because you see, it automatically opens and closes the dampers on your furnace and keeps every room constantly at an even temperature. You'll agree when you see how it works that every home should have one. Get in touch with your reliable neighborhood blue coal dealer right away. Tell him you want him to come out to the house and talk over your heating situation. You'll find him courteous, up to the minute, well-informed. A world of improvement over the ordinary, old-fashioned type of dealer. Your blue coal dealer is a heating expert and a businessman. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Call him tomorrow. And now... Back to the shadow. Oh. Oh, Cranston. Miss Lane. Where are we? It's all right, Professor. You're at home. You've been delirious. Oh. Oh, yes, I remember now. I see it all. Oh, Cranston. Yes, Doctor. Can you... Is it possible for you to conceive the monster who could murder both McGill and Nelson in the space of a few days? Uh, uh, Margot, will you get that, please? There's an extension in the next room. Yes, Lamont. Well, Professor, was it necessarily the work of the same man? Lamont, with my last consciousness before I fainted, I realized that Dr. Nelson's body had the right forearm off the elbow, just as it was with poor McGill. You're quite right, Professor. Obviously, the... Same hand held the knife. We must stop that hand, Cranston. We must stop Easy it. Easy now, sir. You, you must try to relax. What can we do, Lamont? Well, uh, tell me, Professor, who exactly had access to the room where the cadavers are kept? Who? Oh, why, only myself. Uh, that is, except for old Jennings. Professor Williams, old Jennings has disappeared. Oh, no. He's nowhere to be found. Oh, now, he, he had nothing to do with it. Jennings has been with me for 20 years. Besides, I examined the body carefully in the morgue before I had him wheel it up to the amphitheater. And it wasn't the body of Dr. Nelson? Oh, no, I'm sure of that. I'm absolutely sure. Then it means that the murderer substituted the body of Dr. Nelson somewhere between the morgue and the amphitheater. Lamont, that phone call. Oh, what was it, Margot? I don't know. You don't know? No. It 
was a strange voice. A voice I'd never heard before. And it sounded muffled, far away. I said, hello, and whoever it was said that... Oh, it doesn't make sense. Miss Lane, what did they say? Well, they said, if the organ plays tonight at midnight, the lost will be found. Nothing more than that? No. They must have hung up or been cut off. That was all. What could they mean? If the organ plays at... Go on, Professor. What was that? That noise. I heard it, too. There's something banging outside the window. Oh, only a loose blind. There are no blinds on those windows. No? Lamont, my boy, be careful. Yeah, there it is again. Oh, Lamont. Lamont. Don't excite yourself, Professor Williams. Margot, don't look out here. What is it, Lamont? Professor Williams. Yes, Cranston. It's... Cranston, tell me, tell me. A human forearm. Human? Oh, oh. Oh, no, no. What earthly reason could there be for such a horror? Wait a minute. There's a note tied to the index finger. Rather a garish way to post a letter, but I think it's the reason for this ghastly tableau. A note? What does it say? Just a moment. It says... It says the gates of death will open for you in an hour. The gates of death? And this was written here. It's meant for me. No! What was that? It's Anna. She's downstairs in her room. Something's happened. Easy now, Professor. I'll tend to it. Ah! All right, Anna. I'm coming. Ah! Anna! This is Mr. Cranston. Let me in. Oh, Mr. Cranston. I saw him. I saw him. You saw who, Anna? Who did you see? Him. What done the murders? Who? Gibson. I just raised my window and I looked out him. Uh-huh. And there he was coming across the lawn. There's no one out here now. Oh, he must have run when I screamed. Do you know what, Mr. Cranston? I thought I saw him the day... The day after poor Dr. McGill was murdered. Where? Standing there just as plain as day. And, and I said to myself, I'll bet he's up to no good. That Anna, time. this is very important. Now tell me, where did you see him? In front of the gates of death. What did you say? I said I saw him in front of the gates of death. He was the standing... The gates of death? Oh, oh, that's new since you've been here, isn't it? Well, uh, that's what some of the students started calling that big pair of iron gates at the back of the morgue. Uh, the ones they bring the corpses through. You see, I was on my way to do some I'm sorry, shopping. Anna. I'll talk to you later. Oh, Margot! Margot! Yes, come on. What is it? The light is breaking, Margot. Come on, my girl. We've got work to do. What time was the note delivered, Margot? It was just 10.30, Lamont. Uh, 11.25. I think we're just on time. On time for what? To see the gates of death open. Lamont, are you out of your head? Here. Duck down behind the wall here. You see those huge gates at the rear of the morgue building? Yes. The students call them the gates of death. The gates of... Why, then that's what the note meant. It said they would open it. Look. They are opening now, Margot. There's someone standing there. Why, it's... Old Jennings. That's where he's been hiding. Listen. He's signaling somebody. Now someone should turn up. I hear somebody walking. There he is, coming down the path. He's going to the gates. Who is it? I... I can't quite see, Margot. But this I do know. Jennings and his friend are going to receive a visit from the shadow. Uh, You follow me, and we'll go inside together. I sent you the note I had to. They think I done it. I know they does. Why shouldn't they think you did it, Jennings? Hey, uh, what's that? Uh, why, you're not. I'm Dr. Gibson, Jennings. Oh, I thought you... Was... I've come to look at Dr. Nelson's oh, body. Oh, no, no, you ain't alive. I to... warn you, Jennings, there's enough on my head. Now, don't interfere with me. All right, all right, don't hurt me. I won't do nothing. Where's the body? Uh, right in through the door there. And come along. Oh, you go first. All right, I'll go first. But I warn you, if you try any... Oh! You want me to tell. You want to know all about what happened. But I ain't going to tell. Not ever. Not ever. <laughs> yeah, what's that? Jennings. What have you to hide? Oh, who's that? Who's there? I don't see nobody. I am the shadow, Jennings. I've cast a hypnotic spell over your brain so that you cannot see me. But I'm here, Jennings. Tell me. 
What have you to hide? Oh, I can't tell you. They put me in prison if anybody found out. He told me they would. Who, Jennings? Professor Williams. Williams? Jennings, tell me what happened. Tell me. Oh, I didn't mean no harm. You see, I put an explosive in one of his test tubes by mistake. Explosive? Yes. And the next thing I knew, there was a loud noise and he screamed. And there he stood with his arm hanging loose. That was 20 years ago. And he'd have been a great doctor all this time if I hadn't done what I did. Why did you send that note tonight, Jennings? Because he promised to help me if I did as he always said. And I always have, I have. Oh, now what am I going to do? He hurts him every time he looks at the students. And sometimes he used to whisper to me, they all have two arms. Tell me this one thing more. Which arm was it, Jennings? His right arm. His right forearm. It looks all right, but it's dead from the wrist to the elbow. Jennings, take care of Gibson until he regains consciousness. Then let him go. And remember, the shadow is watching you. That's the answer to the note. Old Jennings. But Lamont, there's still... What? That phone call. If the organ plays at midnight, the lost will be found. Remember? Of course I do. That's why I've walked you over to the chapel. The chapel? Unless I'm mistaken, the organ they meant is the big pipe organ in the loft of the chapel here. And if it plays at mid... Midnight. Hurry, Margot. We don't want to be late for the concert. I'm coming. Look. The chapel door. It's open. There's someone here. See? A light. It's coming from the organ loft. Margot, I think we've come to the end of the trail. There it is. The funeral march we heard at the church yesterday. The one old Williams said depressed him so. I'm going up there, Margot. The killer hasn't quite finished his work, I'm afraid. The organ... It stopped. I think trouble's coming. No! <laughs> Lamont, I think it's arrived. It has, Margot. You wait here. There's work to be done up there in that loft, and only the shadow can do it. Let me go. I know you killed Nelson and McGill. You stole my knife out of my office to pin your crimes on me. But you won't get away with it. <laughs> won't I, Gibson? Who's going to stop me? I will. I telephoned you about the organ because I knew you'd fall in the trap. I knew you'd come to kill me, too, to get rid of the last of us to feed your insane lust. Right again, Gibson. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Why should you little men live while I, the genius of my time, rot here, crippled and deformed? I've had only my left arm these 20 years, but it's strong now, and I've used it well. It's too strong for you to stop the knife, Gibson. <laughs> oh, I can't. I can't stop it. Please. Please don't. Uh, Gibson, the point don't. is on your throat. Oh, you no. dropped that knife, Professor Williams. <laughs> Who's there? Who's there, I say? I am the shadow. I am invisible to you, but I have come to put an end to your killings, Williams. Oh, no. No, you haven't. Not until I've finished with Gibson. Not yet. Help. Help. I want you, Williams. My arm. Something's holding it. Let go. Let go. Drop that knife. And now, Williams, we'll see what a court of justice has to say about your crimes. <laughs> court of justice? No court would convict me. I've had a right to do what I've done. I lost my arm, didn't I? An eye for an eye, an arm for an arm. You see? That's just a shadow, and no court would find me guilty. <laughs> Dana Williams, this jury has found you guilty of murder in the first degree. And I, by virtue of the authority vested in me, sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. A knife. What an instrument a knife is. The treacherous implement that turns to a weapon in the hands of murder. When it's a thing of good and when it's a thing of evil, none can say. But this we know. A knife is sharp. Its point goes deep. And a knife is always thirsty. In a moment.
moment, we'll bring you this week's real-life episode proving that crime does not pay. First, I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing from Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, John Barclay. Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Friends, I've been receiving quite a few letters lately that indicate some of you are making the operation of your furnace a much harder job than it should be. Harder, did I say? Well, I should say hard, because really it's easy to operate a furnace properly if you know how. Yes, of course, that's the catch to it. In these days especially, with the weather so changeable, it's necessary to know how to regulate dampers and bank a fire the right way. Now, here's an answer to your heating problem. Call your neighborhood blue coal dealer and ask him to send a John Barclay serviceman to your house to show you all the ins and outs of managing a furnace. No obligation. In fact, you might tell him that you heard me personally extending the invitation. This is his program, you know. Your blue coal dealer, so it's really the same as getting an invitation directly from him. Tell him you heard the program. Make a note now to call him tomorrow. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Find out firsthand how much easier and more economical it is to heat your home the blue coal way. Thank you. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by the D.L. and W. Coal Company, producers of Blue Coal. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Direct from real life, we now bring you conclusive proof that crime does not pay. At 2 a.m. in a hotel room hideout, police waited one day last week for Joseph Miller, wanted for two murders. At last came the long-awaited knock on the door. Joseph Miller. Remember, boys, he's dangerous. If he pulls a gun, shoot fast and straight. I'm going to open the door. Halt! Halt! He's on the fire escape. Call headquarters. i got to hide. Quick. What's behind this window? Ah, big dining room. It's black. They'll never find me here. <laughs> Your crimes have caught up with you, Joseph Miller. One hundred police are closing in on you right this instant. No. I ain't gonna let them get me. I can't stand it. I'll kill myself. So, in the wide, haunting blackness of an empty banquet hall, Joseph Miller, criminal, died by his own hand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows that... Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. Thrilling Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. This country's war supplies cannot wait. Everything else must be sidetracked. For this reason, it's wise to lay in a full supply of coal right now. Call your neighborhood blue coal dealer... And tell him you want your bin filled clear to the top. Better be safe than sorry. Today, coal transportation facilities are adequate to take care of all requirements. But who knows what sudden change tomorrow might bring. Your reliable blue coal dealer is ready to serve you quickly. Serve you with all you want of this tested, superior home fuel. So please order without delay. Be prepared.
The Shadow, a mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, a wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, Death Imported. The time, 11.30 at night. The place, the warden's office of the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Come in. Warden 7809 wants to talk to you. I'll bring him in. Yes, sir. Go in, Piran. Thank you. Now, what is it, Piran? I want to talk to you alone, Warden. All right. Leave us alone, guard. Yes, sir. Now, what do you want, Piran? I want to get out of here. Guards told me you were having one of your spells. Now, you know that's impossible. Maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. Where did you get that knife? Never mind where I got it. I got it, and I know how to use it. Now, listen to me, Piran. Don't reach for that alarm if you want to live. What are you going to do? I'm going to get out of this place, and you're going to help me. I'm going to give you no help, Piran. Yes, you are, Warden, or you die. There's a supply truck coming into the grounds in exactly seven minutes. I'm leaving on that truck, and you're helping me. You'll have to kill me before I give you any help. You'll feel the cold blade of my knife on your throat, Warden. It would be so easy just You'll never to... get away with this, Piran. Oh, yes, Warden. When a man has something to do, he does it. And I have several bits of unfinished business. <laughs> Come on. Let's go. Now, look, Cranston, Miss Lane, it's getting late. Why don't you two go on home? I've got my reports to check. I tell you, Judge Emery is perfectly safe. Perhaps he is perfectly safe, Commissioner. But with George Perrin still loose and the police unable to find him... I tell you, you're making a mountain out of a... a... Molehill. Thanks, out of a molehill. Well, Perrin escaped three weeks ago and there's been no trace of him. Just call Judge Emery, Commissioner, and if he's all right, we won't bother you anymore. Cranston, Judge Emery asked us to keep his whereabouts secret. Then he is worried. Well, of course he is with that, that nut running around loose saying that he's going to murder him. Hardly a molehill, Commissioner. Now listen, Cranston, this is not a problem for amateur sleuths. Okay, Margo, let's go. You better double lock your door tonight, Commissioner. Yeah, thanks, I will. It's a... I don't get it. So long. Goodbye, uh, Commissioner. Wait a minute. Come back here. Yes, Commissioner? What did you mean by that double lock your door crack? Well, after all, you were the man who finally caught Perrin, and he said he was going to get all the people responsible for his being sent to prison. And if I remember correctly, you were to be victim number two on his murder parade. He did? I mean, I am? Yeah, yeah, well, <clears throat> maybe I had better phone Judge Emery just to, uh, just to, uh... We'll see if he's all right. Yeah. Uh, hello? Hello? Number, please. Uh, get me... <clears throat> it's that cold of mine. I mean, uh, get me Valley 7904. Valley 7904? Yeah, that's right. One moment, please. Of course, this is all very silly, calling him up like this. Piran is just a bluffer. He can't get away with a thing like this. Here's your party. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, Hello? This is Judge Emery's residence. Yes. Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Weston calling. I want to speak to the judge, please. I'm sorry, but Judge Emery is indisposed. He can't come to the phone. Oh. Well, tell him that I called. It's nothing important. I'll do that, sir. Everything's all right out there. Oh, yes. Perfect. Uh-huh. Uh, who's this speaking? The butler? No, Commissioner Weston. This is George Perrin. <laughs> Can't he get more speed out of this car? We're doing 65 now, Crash. How far does Judge Emery live from here? About 10 more miles. He's at his country home. Well, we've got to make that 10 miles in a hurry, Commissioner, or Judge Emery hasn't got a chance. Okay, Cardona, give us all she's got. Right, Commissioner. Oh, 
now to get rid of these bundles. Oh, Father. Father, I'm home. Where are you? Father. Father. Well, that's funny. The lights are all on. He said he'd wait up for me. Oh, Dad, are you upstairs? Perhaps he's going to bed. Dad, I was just... Strange, he's not in his room. Dad! Dad! Oh, don't frighten me. Tell me where you are. I guess I'd better look on the third floor, but there's no reason for him to be on the... What's that? Dad, are you playing games with me? <laughs> oh, you're in that room, aren't you? Now, Dad, wasn't it rather... Su oh, no. Come. I take you to your father. Take me to... What have you done with him? You'll see. Stay away from me. Don't come any closer. Master say bring Chuch's daughter too, he Stay say. away from me. Stay away. I got you. <laughs> Judge Emery's estate much farther, Commissioner? About another mile or so. Turn left, Cardona, when you come to the old mill. Right, Commissioner. Well, Lamont, what do you think Coran is likely to do to Judge Emery? Better not think about that, Mark. What I'm worried about is the judge's daughter, Jane. She's living there at the Emery estate, too. Yes, Coran is not the kind of man to spare even... Look. The... Huh? What's Whoa. that? What is it, Mark? Well, I thought I saw something running through the trees there. Stop the car, Cardona. Yes. Now, where did you see it? Back there. Just a flash of white for a minute. Well, I don't see anything. Well, I'm sure I saw something. It may have been some animal, Margo. It's pretty wild around here. Look there, do you hear that? That was no animal. That was a woman's scream. Come on, Cardona, let's go. I'm I... coming too, Commissioner. Well, I'm not staying here in the car alone. Okay, come along. Stay close behind us. Remember, this isn't going to be a picnic, Margo. Paran is a very dangerous killer. Uh... I'm certain this is where I saw something, Lamont. Uh... Well, there's nothing here now. Oh, by the way, Commissioner, how big a man would you say Perrin was? Oh, I don't know. Five foot six or seven. Not very big. Then he could hardly have made this footprint here in the soft earth. What footprint? Holy jo What a foot! Why, it must be a size 17 or 18. This footprint was made by a giant. Now, wait a minute. Here's something else. It's a woman's locket. Looks like some kind of inscription on it. Can you read it, Cranston? Yeah, hold your flashlight up here. There you are. There. It says, To Jane from Dad on her 18th birthday. Commissioner, you said Judge Emery had a daughter named Jane. Uh-huh. Well, do you suppose it was she who screamed? Uh, what do you make of it, Cranston? I don't know, Commissioner. But I don't think we're going to find anything out here in the darkness. Let's get to Judge Emery's home and see exactly what's happened. Commissioner. Commissioner, Judge Emery's house is just around the next bend in the road. Every light in the house is on. All right, let's go. Something tells me, Commissioner, that we may have gotten here just a little too late. Yeah, this is Judge Emery's home, all right. Didn't you say that all the lights were on, Cardona? They were, Mr. Cranston, just a few minutes ago. That's strange. Well, let's go on in. Now, Cardona, you go around to the back of the house, and we'll go in the front. Right, Commissioner. Now, don't take any chances, Cranston. Just watch this. It's the body of a huge watchdog. Judge Emery's dog. His head has been bashed in. Oh, Lamont. Mm, it's a nasty wound. Poor fellow. He probably died trying to protect his master. Come on, Mogo. Up the stairs. Well, you better knock. The door's open, Commissioner. Yeah, so it is. Now, wait a minute. This may be a trap. Flash your light in there. I don't see anything. Here's the light switch. Nothing's wrong in here. Everything seems to be in place. Yeah. Let's take a look around. I'll take the upstairs. Uh, you search here. I'm going to call headquarters and get a few more men down here. If we're going to make a thorough search of the grounds, we'll need more than just we four. Okay. Come on, Marco. We'll see what's upstairs. All right, Lamont. I'm afraid I'm not going to like anything we find. No, Miss Lane, I don't think you are going to like what we find. But I don't think you'll find it upstairs. I think whatever it is, it's right down here. Now, here's the phone. Hello? 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 Number, please. 
What's the matter, operator? Did I disturb your nap? Sorry, sir. What number do you want? Get me police headquarters. Police? Oh, yes, sir. All right. How did they ever let that guy Piran escape in the first place? Is that you, Cardona? I'm in this room here, telephoning. Come in. I want to talk to you. I'm sorry they don't answer. They don't answer. They've got to answer. It's police headquarters. I'll try them again, sir. That will be awfully kind of you. Oh, Cardona, did you find anything around? Say, who are you? I come to get you. Now, wait a minute. You better come. If you make noise, maybe I kill you right away. If you kill me, you won't get very far before the police get you. I get you. No, you don't. You want to fight with Brewer. You think you are strong like Brolo. Maybe I kill you now before I take you to Master. No, no. He's got better way for you to die. In a moment, our play will continue. Here's new. Over 180,000 mystic shadow rings have been requested by our listeners, some of which are still being sent out. If you send for it right away, you can still get this unique ring which has made such a sensational hit. Of course, it's no wonder the mystic ring has made such a hit, because it's so extraordinary, so exotic, such a rare kind of ring. The mystic shadow ring, you know, is no ordinary gold or silver ring. It's a white ring, and there's a peculiar and exotic magic in its whiteness. When you slip this ring on your finger, hold it near a light, and then go into a dark room. You discover to your amazement that your finger is encircled with a weird and ghostly ring of light. Yes, the mystic shadow ring is a light eater. It's hungry for light. It holds the light and glows in the dark like the unsleeping eyes of a jungle cat. Who knows what weird creatures of the night may be summoned by this ghostly torch? Send in today for your mystic shadow ring. Simply send ten cents, one dime, with your name and address, to The Shadow, Madison Square Station, Post Office Box 5, New York City. Here's the address again. The Shadow, Madison Square Station, Post Office Box 5, New York City, New York. This offer is limited to the United States only. Send for your mystic shadow ring right away. Now, back to our story. Cardona. Cardona. You want some more water, Lamont? Yes. Here, Cardona, drink this. What happened to you? Uh, I don't know. I was around in back of the house, according to orders, and I thought I saw someone lurking in the bushes. That was the last thing I remember. You're lucky you can remember anything, Lieutenant. Yes, I get... Where's Commissioner Weston? We don't know, Cardona. When we came downstairs, the phone was off the hook. And Commissioner Weston was gone. Gone? I'm going up. No. Oh. Stay right oh. where you are, Cardona. You're still groggy from that blow on the head. I'm going after Commissioner Weston. Margot, you stay here with Cardona. But Lamont... Margot, there's only one place near here where Peran may be hiding. That's the old mill about a mile from here. I'm going there and take a look around. ropes off my hands and my feet. Then I'll be able to help you. It's useless to try, Jane. How would we get out of this old mill into the stream without Piran or that halfway giant of his seeing us? Well, I'm going to try anyway. Oh, someone's coming, Dad. <laughs> well, well, I see that you both regain consciousness. That's good. Piran, you've got to let us go. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do now, Judge Emery. For three long years, they made me do things I didn't want to, but now I give the orders. Mr. Peran, why don't you be reasonable? When my father sent you to prison, it was his duty. Yes, and I made a promise then to make him pay. I don't break my promises. That's my duty, Miss Emery. What are you talking about? Don't be impatient. You'll soon see. First, I open this trap door. <laughs> My beauties are asleep down below there. Oh. An amazing thing about crocodiles, Judge Emery, they sleep most of the time. Except when they eat. 
Have you ever seen them eat, Miss Emery? Oh. Well, you're soon going to have the chance. <laughs> what are you going to do? Need you ask? I'm going to feed my little pets, Miss Emery. They haven't eaten now for several days. Their former owner was the last one to feed them. You mean Grogan, the man who lives here in this old mill? Lived here, Judge Emery. I fed his body to his own crocodile several days ago. You... you madman! <laughs> no need for melodrama, Miss Emery. You see, he had just what I needed, so I took it. Just what I needed to even accounts with you, Judge Emery. Oh, no! You can't do this to my father, Perrin. Oh, yes, Miss Emery. No. It's going to be a most interesting spectacle, I assure you. Spectacle? Yes. First, I must wake up my sleeping beauties. This rock ought to do it. Wake up, my pretties! Oh, oh no, Perrin. <laughs> Listen oh. to them. They're hungry. Oh, it's going to be over much too fast, Miss Emery. I don't care what you do with me, Perrin, but don't harm her. Her time will come later. Oh, Dad! Dad! Come, Judge. You're going down into that pit. No! no. Please, Perrin! If you have an ounce of human decency left and you can't do this... Can I? Down he goes! No! Dad! <laughs> See, master, I do what you say. I bring him here. Good work, Prolo. Put Commissioner Weston down. Yes, master. You didn't kill him, did you, Prolo? No, master. He tried to fight, but he is not strong like Prolo. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, still unconscious, Commissioner Weston? Don't worry. You will know who to thank for your murder. Somebody knocking. You want Brolo No, to... wait. Carry Weston into that room there and lock him up. I'll handle our visitor myself. But, Master... Do as I say. Yes, Master. I take him. I do what you say. I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes? I beg your pardon, Mr. Grogan. Grogan? How did you know my name was Brogan? I saw it on the letter box outside. I I was under the impression that this mill was deserted. Well, now you know that it isn't. What do you want? I was talking to Judge Emery about... Judge Emery? The... Well, yes. Do you know him? He has that uh, big house about a mile or so from here. He was saying... When did the... you see him? See him? Why, Judge Emery's an old friend of mine. Uh, may I come in? Huh? Oh, yes. Yes, come in. Thank you. You were saying something about talking to Judge Emery? Yes. Uh, he told me that this old mill was deserted and I was thinking of renting it and fixing it up for a summer home. I see. When did you last see and speak with Judge Emery? Uh, I don't believe I caught your name. Cranston. Lamont Cranston. Cranston, eh? Name sounds very familiar to me. Does it? But as I was saying, Judge Emery must have been mistaken about the availability of this place of yours. Yes. Well, I think I'll run right over and tell him so. Uh, wouldn't you think it strange, Mr. Cranston, if someone came to your door at two o'clock in the morning and asked you whether you wanted to rent your home? Good heavens, is it that late? Yes. Well, I, I guess I'd better be running along, and I'm <laughs> so sorry to have disturbed you. Don't mention it, Mr. Cranston. Perhaps we shall meet again. Perhaps. Good night, Mr. Grogan. Perhaps we shall meet again. Sooner than you think. Rollo. Yes, master. There was a man just here. He can't have gotten very far. Go out and get him. Yes, master. I go. Yes. We shall meet again, Mr. Cranston. And my little pets will have another meal. Very soon. <laughs> Oh, dear. Jane Emery. What? Who called my name? The Shadow, Miss Emery. There's so little light in here, I can't see you. The light wouldn't help you to see the Shadow, Miss Emery. No one has ever seen me. What do you want of me? I want to help you escape from here. Oh, no, Shadow. Let him kill me, too. There's nothing left for me now. 
Now that my father's dead, I just want to die now. The Rand killed him? Yes, he, he threw him to those beasts to be eaten alive. He made me watch. Beasts? Crocodiles. They're in a pit under this room. Oh, yes. There seems to be a trap door here. Oh, please. Please close it again. Close it. Close it. How did Peran obtain these crocodiles? The man who lived here in this old mill raised all types of tropical animals to sell to zoos. I see. And Peran used them to accomplish his revenge on your father. Yes, he did. Well, the shadow will see that he pays for his crimes. Oh, please. Please don't do that to me. Quiet, Miss Blaine. Jane Emery, I'll be back for you in a few minutes. Right now, there is someone who needs my help more urgently than you do. What have you done with them? I know they're here. Suppose I were to say that they were here, miss. What would you do? I'd go to the police. And... Yes, I see. But I'm afraid you won't be able to go to the police, miss. Because you won't leave this place. A giant. Brollo, didn't you find him? No. I know. Find him. He get away. You fool. Now he'll have the police swarming over this place like ants. Come, miss. I have a little surprise for you. Take your hands off me. Oh, <laughs> so you won't come, hmm? Huh? Brollo, carry her into the other room. Yes, master. No, stay away from me. No, stay away! No. What? Fainted, miss? I'd expected to take a little more time with my revenge, but now they'll all have to die together. Jane Emery, Weston, and this girl. <laughs> no, Peran. I will stop you. Who said that? The shadow, George Peran. Order your giant to put Miss Lane down. I can't see you, but if you're so powerful, shadow, you order him. <laughs> Rolo, put her down. Hmm. What? Where, where voice coming from? Brolo, do as I say. You must obey me. I am your master, Brolo. I order you to take her into the room with the trap door. We feed our beauties well tonight. <laughs> yes, master. I do what you say. Brolo, listen to me. He is not your master. The things he has made you do are evil. He has made you do them. Don't listen to him. I am your master, Brolo. You must obey me. Here, go down here. Stop, Rolo. Stop. I must obey you, master. I must obey. <laughs> yes. Yes. See who's strong in our shadow. Rolo, you must not do this. I will protect you from him. He has twisted your mind. He makes you kill. <laughs> You've lost, shadow. Into the pit with a Rolo. Rolo, no. Put her down. Safely. Yes. Yes. I put her down safe. No. Like voice say. No, Brollo, I am your master. I order you to... No. You make me kill. No, Brollo. You make me do bad things. No, Brollo. No, you go into pit. No, Brollo, listen to me. Don't come any closer. Don't I command you? Stop, Brollo. No, no, voice. He is I... bad. Now he no. is going to die. No! Go right into the commissioner's office, Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston. The commissioner will be in in a minute. Well, thanks, Cardona. Right, thanks. Now, what do you suppose Weston wants to see us about? I haven't the faintest idea, Margot. The Paran case is all settled. Oh, uh, incidentally, I talked to the DA the other day about Brolo, and he's going to take my recommendation and place him in an institution. Oh, good. He's just a poor, well, big, hello, misguided... Hello, Miss Lane. Cranston, sit down, sit oh, down. thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. <laughs> uh, I, uh... I... Well, why did you send for us, Commissioner? Yes, I, um... <clears throat> well, it's, um... Well, I have my report to make out on the Paran case, and, uh... Well, I need your help. What? You need my help? Why, Commissioner, this is remarkable. Remarkable? This is history-making. Yes, well, uh, you see, it's this way. I, uh, <clears throat> when I got the crack over the head, I... I don't remember anything that happened till the next morning. Could have happened to anybody. Anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and so at last, Commissioner Weston comes to Lamont Cranston for help. Yes, and I hate myself for doing it. 
Immediately following John Barclay's message, we'll bring you a dramatic view of your part in the war effort. First, here's Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Friends, a gift you'll find most welcome this year is the practical kind. And I have a suggestion for you. This is for Dad or for Mother. I suggest that you get one of the new automatic blue coal heat regulators for your home. It's certainly a practical present, but it's even more than that. It's a present that will mean the whole family will enjoy more comfort and ease. Especially if you have children in the family, you need controlled temperature throughout the house. And that's just what the automatic blue coal heat regulator gives you. It automatically opens and closes the dampers on your furnace so that when more heat is needed, you get more heat. No overheating, no underheating. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer and ask him about the automatic heat regulator. It'll pay you to find out about it. You may have a free demonstration in your own home. Thank you. The Shadow Story is copyrighted by Street and Smith. The characters' names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. In Hawaii and the Philippines, American soldiers are fighting and dying for you. How much are you doing for them? Give them a hand. Back them up. Do your bit. Buy United States Defense Savings Bonds and Stamps. And you can consider every dollar a bullet sent flying straight at the enemy. Go to your nearest bank or post office. Buy a bond. I want a United States Defense Savings Bond, please. Here's the money. Buy a bond so that on the firing line, your soldiers can say this. Is the ammunition running low? No, sir. New supplies just arrived. Out a boy. Now we'll make them sorry they ever started this war. Do your part. Every week, buy United States Defense Savings Bonds or stamps. On sale at every bank or post office. Let's teach aggressor nations the truth of the warning. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen. And be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story produced by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of blue coal. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air, brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. One way that you can help your country's war effort is to put in all the coal you'll need for home heating right away. It's a patriotic thing to do because transportation facilities are needed for war supplies. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer, who at present has reserves of blue coal on hand. There is no shortage of blue coal today, and suppliers should be adequate to meet the needs of every user. However, circumstances may change, and it's wise not to take chances. There's a long stretch of cold weather ahead of us, so don't delay. Fill your coal bin now and be safe. Call your friendly blue coal dealer tomorrow. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. 
Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, Death Pulls the Strings. They call me Goro. Don't ask who I am or where I came from. Just let us say, there is a man called Goro. A man? (laughs) Can you call a freak of nature, a twisted monstrosity, an evil, ugly thing a man? No. I am Goro, nature's bizarre caricature of a man. I'm not pleasant to look upon, and I am strong enough to compel fear. The weakness of my withered limbs is compensated by the strength of my arms. Is it not strange that I, with my almost useless legs, should want to dance? Is it not amusing that I, who could have been the greatest ballet master in the world, should play with puppets, with articulated dolls which I dangle on the ends of strings? Is it not strange that I should hate all those who move gracefully, beautifully? No, my friends. It is not strange. But Diane... Tomorrow you are giving another dance concert, and this requires your immediate approval. All my plans for the charity review depend on it. Well, then I can guess it has something to do with your wonderful marionettes. <laughs> uh, so far you are right. The rest is the surprise. Oh, is it? Ah, here we are. This is my studio. Oh, it's very charming, Rico. Well, shall we go in? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Oh, yeah. You'd better go first, Rico. It's so dark. Afraid of the dark, my dear? Then we shall have light. What is it? Oh, those... Those shrouded figures hanging from the ceiling. For a moment I thought they were... they were people hanging there? Oh, no, my dear. Merely my life-size puppets. That is all. Now. Now for the surprise. Uh, Rico. Don't think me silly, but... You won't be gone long. No, I am just going into the workroom. This room seems so eerie, with all your puppets hanging from the ceiling. Perhaps if you turned on more light. I am sorry, my dear, but there is no more light. Now, you must close your eyes. I will tell you when to open. All right. You're making a great mystery of this, Rico. I I want to see your face when I bring back the surprise. Strange. That's my music. My music for my dance macabre. Oh. Oh, Rico. I've got my eyes closed. When may I see the surprise? Uh, How much longer, Rico? Rico! No longer. Oh, no. No! So, Goro's twisted body offends you, eh, Miss Childer? Who are you? And the brother of Rico, puppeteer extraordinary. Brother? Yes, Miss Childer. The handsome Rico is my brother. Or should I say the handsome Rico is my face? I don't understand. I am Rico's genius. My brother is without talent. I make these puppets and I make them dance. Even Rico dangles from my strings, obeys me. You... I revolt you, Miss Childa, eh? Unfortunately, my ugliness has always done that. I'm so sorry, and now I... I must leave. Not yet. Uh, I've seen you dance, Miss Childa. Your muscular control and coordination are magnificent, but... Where is Rico? But you lack imagination. I'm, I'm sure you're quite right. Now, please, please let me go. I will make you the greatest dancer in the world. My arm. You're hurting me. Yes. Yes, I must not hurt your arm. I must not bruise the muscles or sinews. For then, then you will be spoiled for my purpose. But I am strong, am I not? If I wanted to, I could crush the life from you with my hands. Please, please, Goro, I must go. I I really must. Oh, no, Miss Charlie, you must not go. What do you want of me? Some must be the puppets. 
and some must pull the strings. I have no choice in that matter. Oh, no. Now, look, Miss Lane and Cranston, I'm perfectly willing to buy a ticket for the charity review. But why do I have to go and see that stupid Punch and Judy show and be bored? Punch and Judy show? Why, Commissioner Weston, Rico is probably the greatest puppeteer in the world. And I still say it's a Punch and Judy show, and I still don't like it. I'm too old for that kid stuff. <laughs> oh, why, Commissioner, Rico's puppets are a work of art. Work of art? Well, they can stay out of my cab, they can stay out. What's he talking about? What did you say, Shrevey? I am thinking about a sad experience my bosom friend and companion, Big Charlie, is having one time with puppets. As fortune is having it, he is driving a thoughtful dog act from here all the way to Boston in his cab he's driving. Well, what's that got to do with Rico's puppets, Shrevey? Well, up to the time of this horrible experience, he is uh, having with this now thoughtful dog act, he is liking dogs immensely, he is liking. Shrevey, I don't get it. Big Charlie did. Right in the back of his cab, he got it. One of the dogs in the vaudeville act is picking this time to have puppets. Puppets? Oh, Shrevey. <laughs> well, it's not so funny to Big Charlie, I can tell you. Shrevey, you mean puppies. That's what I'm saying, Mr. Cranston. Baby dogs, little puppets. <laughs> yeah. Little puppets. In case anyone is interested, that stoplight has changed. Yes, sir, it certainly has. What? Oh, golly. If we have to go to that Punch and Judy show, let's get there in time for tonight's performance. Commissioner, you can stop applauding now. Yeah? Amazing, isn't it? Oh, that, that man Rico does uh, um, amazing things with those, those life-size puppets. Mm, so you don't like the Punch and Judy show, eh, Commissioner? Now, now, spare my feelings, Miss Lane. You know, there were times when I almost forgot that those puppets were just things of wood and wire. They seemed so so natural, so so lifelike. There's the curtain. What's the next act, Lamont? Uh, I believe it's the Dance Macabre. Dance Macabre? Isn't that the number that the dancer Diane Childer has made so famous? Diane Childer? Quiet, uh, quiet, Cranston. Annoy the people. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Lamont, that puppet is wonderful. Yes. It's beautifully made. Why, it looks exactly like Diane Childer. The dancer who disappeared. Oh, yes. So it does. I remember reading a... Diane! Diane! Lamont, that woman! What's the matter with her? Now, Doctor, where is this woman who made the disturbance in the theater? She's in the inner office, lying down, Commissioner Weston. What seems to be wrong with her, Doctor? Oh, nothing. A simple case of overwrought nerves. You see, her sister, Diane Childer, has been missing for two or three days. And the puppet, she says, looked so much like her sister that... Why, Lamont, I said that very thing. Yes. So you did, Margot. Where is this woman who ruined my performance? Ah, who are you? The man asks who I am. I am Rico. Uh, Mr. Rico, the woman who, as you say, ruined your performance happens to be Diane Childer's sister. Oh, yes? Oh, I know Diane Childer very well. I am a great admirer of her dancing. Diane Childer's been missing for several days, Mr. Rico. Would you know why? Oh, Cranston, relax. You're making a murder case of this business. Murder? Oh, don't get upset, Mr. Rico. If you'll step into the inner office with me, alone, and we'll ask Diane Childer's sister a few questions. You'll forgive us, I'm sure, Cranston, Miss Lane. Well, I like that. Well, so do I, Margo. Because now we can go backstage and have a look at Rico's puppets without being disturbed. Backstage? Margo... I have a feeling that the puppet used in the dance macabre is not a puppet. Why, Lamont, Rico wouldn't have to stoop to tricks to win his public. He's the world's greatest puppeteer. He'd have to be, Margot, because I believe he was making a human body dance on his puppet strings. <laughs> We'll continue with Act Two of Death Pulls the Strings in just a moment. 
Meanwhile, let's talk about your kind of weather, the private weather inside your home. Nowadays, with the help of blue coal, you can have just the kind of weather you like, comfortably warm and yet not too hot, because blue coal burns evenly and smoothly. In fact, this tested superior home fuel is especially prepared, sized, and carefully graded for home use. Yes, it fits the requirements of your furnace. It's tailor-made for your home. That's why you're sure of complete satisfaction when you heat your home with blue coal. What's more, it's easier than ever to operate your furnace when you not only use blue coal, but also have the automatic blue coal heat regulator. This remarkable fuel saver is rapidly becoming a must in home heating. It's easily and quickly installed, and man, the work it saves will be a real eye-opener to you. All you do is set the indicator of the temperature you want and let science go to work for you from then on. Ask your neighborhood blue coal dealer for a free demonstration of the money-saving blue coal heat regulator. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Call him tomorrow. Now, back to the shadow. Here's the stage door, Margot. Let's go in and find out exactly what our friend Mr. Rico was up to. All right. Doesn't seem to be anyone around. No. Stage doorman must have gone around to the front of the theater to see what the commotion was. Come on. Let's go on stage. Now, this way. Come on, I've got a feeling that someone's watching us. We've got to be quick about this. Rico will be coming back any minute now. There's not much light on back Margo. here. Margot. There's the puppeteer's bridge. That's where they stand above the stage. Oh, I see. They're up above and they dangle the puppets on wires. Oh, here they are. What? These shrouded figures hanging here behind the scenery are the puppets. Well, which is the one used in the dance macabre number? No, no, no. That's not this one. Maybe it's this one here. No. Come on, suppose Rico's hidden it. He hasn't had time, Margo. Oh, yes, of course. What? It's still on stage in front of the scenery. I should have thought of you that. You should have thought that you have no right to be here. What? What? <laughs> Lamont! I'm not very pleasant to look upon, am I, miss? Now, will you please explain? Well, you see, we, uh, we're very much interested in the puppeteer's art, so we just thought we'd... Uh... Have a look around. Yes. Yes. You're very convincing, Mr... Uh... Uh, Cranston. Lamont Cranston. Uh, this is Miss Lane. They call me Goro. Rico chooses to call me his assistant. Lamont, I think we'd better go. Not yet. Exactly what were you looking for? I would like very much to see the puppet used in the dance macabre number. That is not possible. Well, it's your privilege to refuse to show it to us. Yes, that is right. And what would you think if I refused to show it to you? What I think is my privilege. Yes. <laughs> that also is true. You have heard that old saying, Mr. Cranston, curiosity once killed a cat? A cat is hard to kill. A cat has nine lives. A curious man has but one. Are you threatening me? I'm warning you. Well, let's go, Margot. There are other means of seeing this puppet. Meaning you will go to the police, Mr. Cranston? Take it any way you please. Come on, Margot. Yes, come on. Wait. Wait, I will show her to you. Here. Lamont. It's... It's... Just a puppet. Made of wire and wood. What did you expect to find, Mr. Cranston? A human body? Hello? That you, Cranston? Yes, Commissioner. What is it? Cranston, I want you and Miss Lane to come to Pier 19 on the East River immediately. But we can't, Commissioner. We're going to... I don't care where you're going. This is important. Come to Pier 19 East River. I'll be waiting for you. Okay, Commissioner. We'll be there. Well, Commissioner, I suppose you know you ruined our evening. Now, what's so important? Cranston, I want you and Miss Lane to identify a body. A body? We found her floating in the river. When was the body found? About an hour ago. She's over here under this tarpaulin. Why do you ask us to identify her? Because you know her. Or rather, you know her. Okay, Cardona, pull the tarpaulin off. Right, Chief. Diane Childer. Yes, Marco. 
Oh, Lamont. All right, Cardona, put the tarp back. Sorry to call you here for this sort of thing, but we needed your identification for the death warrant. You see, we couldn't locate her sister. And you won't locate her sister, Commissioner. Why not? Because I found out that Diane Childer never had a sister. Oh, Cranston, I talked with her myself last night at the theater. That woman was an imposter. Uh Uh-huh. Still playing detective, eh, Cranston? Still playing hard to convince, eh, Commissioner? I presume you noticed Diane Childer's hands just now. What about them? Take a good look, Commissioner. Well, Margo, I don't believe our services are needed here any longer, so good night, Weston. Yeah, go home and read a mystery book. Good night. Lamont, what about Diane Childer's hands? Margo, they looked as though they'd been attached to wires. Wires? Then you were right about Rico using a human puppet. Perhaps. But I think he holds the answer to that question. And the shadow is going to pay a call on Rico, puppeteer extraordinary. You've got your money. Now what do you want? Rico, I read in the papers that this Diane Childer is actually missing. So much the better for Rico's publicity. Perhaps now Goro will realize that I have wit and that I am clever. What? Oh, nothing. Now, Rico will be greater than ever, and he will have to admit that I did it without his knowledge, that I thought of it myself. Rico, listen to me. Where is this woman? What have you done with her? Oh, I do not know. I thought this was just a stunt for the papers, but if you... I do not know where she is, I tell you. Now go. All right. I'm leaving. Do you know, when I screamed last night in the theater... It was only partly an act. There was something about that puppet in the dance macabre that was lifelike and yet... Of course. I am the great Rico. And yet deathlike. What do you say? What are you blabbing about in here, Rico? Oh! Who is this woman? What is she doing here? Oh, I can tell you now, Coro. I hired her to pose as Diane Childer's sister. So it was you who concocted that stunt for the papers, you stupid, blundering fool. You... You woman, Me? get out of here. Yes. Get out before yes, I... Yes, yes, I'm going. I'm going. I ought to kill you. Oh, no, no, Goro. I am your brother. I wanted to help. I thought it you would be thought. good. Since when have I allowed you to think? Since when have I allowed you to do anything but be my face for the world? And so, Goro, you are betrayed by your own brother. What? Who said that? I heard a voice, Goro. <laughs> it is the voice of the shadow, Rico. Where are you? I can't see you. Where are you hiding in my studio? The hiding place of the shadow will never be found, Goro. No man has ever seen me. I am not afraid of you, unseen one. Uh, What do you want? Why did you come here? Rico, the puppet used in the dance macabre was not a puppet, but the body of Diane Childer. I don't know. Shadow, I do not work with puppets. He does. Shut up. You're a fool, my brother. Goro... You murdered Diane Childer, didn't you? I defy you to prove that voice. There is no proof. The shadow will prove it, Garo. Oh, no, shadow. Never. Other criminals have thought themselves a match for the shadow and have paid for their crimes. Not Goro. Never Goro. We shall see. We shall see. Here we are, Rico's studio is just around the corner, Marco. Remember what you're to do? Yes. I'm to give you five minutes, and then if you don't come out, I'm to phone Commissioner Weston and get him here quickly. Right. <laughs> I'd hate to wear those big hands of Garros as a collar very long. Oh, Lamont, don't joke about it. You know how strong he is. All right, Margot. Everything's going to be all right. What do you want? Why am I always... I want to see Rico, Goro. Oh, Yes. Yes, you are the curious man, the man who is interested in the art of puppeteering. Come in. Come in. Thank you. How fortunate that you came tonight. I want to speak with Rico. Yes? Well, I'm afraid that's impossible. I demand that you take me to him. But I have... He's here, in the studio. What? Ask him your questions if you wish, but I'm afraid he'll prove to be a rather unresponsive conversationalist. He was stupid in life. He looks even more stupid now, hanging there from the ceiling. You've killed him. And strung him like a marionette. All his life he's been my puppet indeed. Now he is, in fact, you madman. And now you are going to join him, my dear. Oh, no, you don't. My hands are strong, my friend, even though my legs are weak. Uh. (laughs) And 
another human puppet for my collection. Huh? Or oh, somebody knocking. Ah, too bad you'll have to wait, Mr. Cranston, while I answer the door. Come into this room till I'm ready for you. There. I am coming. I am coming. What have you done with him? Oh, my curious friends are all visiting me at the same time. That is good. Come in. Now, we shall have a complete cast for my puppet show tomorrow night. What do you mean? My brother Rico was going to have our puppets perform tomorrow night. Unfortunately, he won't be able to work the puppets himself because he is one of the performers. And you also, my dear. Where is Lamont Cranston? Oh, he's here. Don't worry. And he, too, will perform with you tomorrow night. Can you dance, miss? I... Let me go. It doesn't matter. I can make you dance. <laughs> I can make you the greatest dancer in the world. I said that to her, too. But after a little while, she couldn't dance at all. And death had made her ugly. So I gave it to the cold river, as I shall do with you when I'm through with you. No! 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 I want to bring the police down upon me? Yes, yes, now you are much quieter. Now I can work. Now I can prepare my human puppets for my last great performance tomorrow night. You will never give that performance, Goro. What? Are you here, Shadow? <laughs> I said I would stop you, Goro. The police will be here any second now. Police? Oh, if I could get my hands on you, Shadow or not, I could crush the life out of them. That is not to be, Goro. Your days of crime are over. Not yet, Shadow. You're not strong enough to end them yourself. Open this door. Open up, I say. You're trapped now, Goro. The police are outside. Open up. There's places surrounded. They can't hold me. I'm too strong for them. Open the door or we'll break it down. Yes, I'll open the door. And you shall see. You shall see. Now. Look out, Weston. What? Stop him. Yes. Yes, my life was begun in pain. Now it ends in pain. Now I will no longer hate those who move gracefully and beautifully. For now I too am free. You know, Lamont, it's lucky that I didn't wait five minutes before I called Commissioner West. Yes, Margot. I owe my life to that. When you knocked on the door, distracted Garo, and gave me a chance to regain consciousness and come back as the shadow. You know, Commissioner Weston thinks you escaped from Rico's studio before he got there. Oh, yes. Mm. <laughs> I wish you could have seen his face when Garo lunged at him. <laughs> Ooh, I know just how he felt. I'll get him. Shrevey, you're early. Yeah, I know, but something has happened to Big Charles again. Something has happened. Oh, what now, Shrevey? Well, I told you about the experience he's having with the vaudeville dog. Uh, you guy. did, Shrevey, you did. Well, what do you suppose happened this morning to him again? What do you suppose? Uh, tell us, Shrevey. A lady is getting in his cab with a big box, and she says, rush to the hospital immediately. So Big Charlie is rushing, he's rushing. Hey, Shrevey. Wait, this is rich. She don't want to go there for herself. Hot dog, which is in the box. Yeah, she take the... How did you know? <laughs> I'm psychic. Go on. Well, this now dog is sick. Is and... this one of your now long tail, Shrevey? Okay, so I'll cut it short. I'll cut. Hey, <laughs> you get it? Cut it short. Cut the tail short. <laughs> you get it? Yes, we get it. Uh -huh. Shrevey. And so this dog is it's having puppets in Big Charlie's cab too. He's yeah, having. Yeah, yeah, little puppets. Big Charlie says that what happened to him shouldn't happen to a dog. Oh, Shrevey. <laughs> a real-life drama proving that crime does not pay will be presented immediately after a message from John Barclay. Here he is, Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Friends... There's a hard battle ahead of us in war work. None of us can afford to spend energy needlessly. It's time to cut out waste of all kinds. For example, waste motion and waste fuel in the operation of your furnace. I urge you to think about this because it's serious. Find out how to operate your furnace most efficiently, with the least possible effort on your part. Your blue coal dealer will be glad to help you in this with no charge, no obligation, whatever. 
He'll send a John Barclay trained serviceman to your house to give your heating plant a thorough inspection, to demonstrate proper furnace operation, and to tell you, too, about the remarkable Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator, a really great work saver. The regulator is easy to install, and you'll find it's economical. It'll pay for itself in fuel savings, and if you rent your home, you can take it with you when you move. Get in touch with your friendly blue coal dealer tomorrow. I promise you'll be well pleased with his services. Thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Stephen Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Today, at the start of a new year, we bring you last year's biggest crime-busting case. Proof that crime does not pay. <coughs> Louis Lepke Buckhalter, one of the most powerful racketeers in the country's criminal annals, sits in a room alone, waiting. Several miles away, two of his henchmen walk into a small candy store. We got a message for you, Joe. Yeah. A message from the boss, Joe. Oh, no. No, don't do it, boys. Don't do it. You're a double-crosser, Joe. No! no. Hey, got me wrong. Back in his room, Lepke looks at his watch. <laughs> ah, it's done by now. That's another one the cops will never pin on me. <laughs> don't be so sure, Lepke. The law never forgets. November 30th, 1941, in Kings County Court, Lepke and his two trigger men all met the same fate. Sentence of death in the electric chair. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This program was produced by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of blue coal. Thrilling Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Planes, guns, tanks, and other supplies must be rushed to American troops without delay. One way you can help is to lighten the transportation load by ordering all the coal you'll need this season right now. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow. Fill your bin with blue coal. This splendid home fuel will give you comfortable, dependable heat with real economy. At present, there is no shortage whatever of blue coal, but in these days of rapidly changing conditions, it's wise not to take chances. Be prepared. Fill your coal bin now and be safe. Call your friendly blue coal dealer tomorrow. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Drums of Doom. (laughs) 
You won't tell anyone I spoke to you, will you? You people out there. I'm not supposed to talk to anybody. But when the wind is like it is tonight, I have to tell my story to someone. There's so much to tell. And the wind is so lonely. So lonely. There might have been no story. No. And I might not be where I am tonight had there not once lived a man called the Black Judge. The most relentless criminal judge to sit on the bench in a score of ugly years. Even once, when the hangman refused to execute a prisoner whom he had sentenced to death, the black judge himself took command in the prison yard, had the condemned man escorted to the gallows by a corps of rattling snare drums, and then, with his own hands, sprang the trap and sent his victim dancing into eternity. Oh, yes. He was well named, was Black Judge Henry Arthur Cole. And he lived long, this man. He died, in fact, less than a year ago, hated and deserted by all, save his three children. And then, a month after his death, five months ago this very night, the horror began. Miss Jennifer Cole, the eldest daughter to the deceased judge, came home one evening and ascended the familiar stone steps of the Cole mansion. As she inserted her key in the front door, she noticed there were no lights burning in the house. It was too early for her brother Edward to be home. But where were the servants? Where was her sister Norma? Alarmed, she flung the door open and... <coughs> Oh, yes, she screamed, and so would you, and so would I. The house was empty, everything gone, every rug, every picture, every stick of furniture. What had happened? Where was everyone? Where was Norma? Where was she? Norma. Norma. Where was old Daniel, her brother's valet? Daniel. Daniel, where are you? And then... From upstairs came a sound. Fearful, chilling. It brought back the sudden picture of her father. The dismal prison yard long ago. It was the rattling of snare drums. Ghostly, mocking. The drums of doom. Bewildered, she ascended the wide, uncarpeted staircase. Suddenly... There was a groan. Oh. What was that? Then she saw what it was. At the head of the stairs lay old Daniel, the servant, stretched out in a dazed coma. His eyes turned glassily down the hallway, and there... <coughs> Miss Jennifer saw a room where no room had ever been before. The drums ceased. Miss Jennifer stared, unbelieving, into the strange, dismal room at the end of the hallway. And there she saw... Norma! Yes, Norma. Miss Jennifer felt her senses leaving her. For in the blue dimness she saw the stark, grim form of a black scaffold. A gallows. And on it, deathly white, stood her sister. Eyes open and pleading, and around her neck... A noose. Jennifer. Norma. Norma. I've been sentenced to death, Jennifer. Sentenced? Who? The black judge. Norma. Our father's been dead for a month. You're wrong, Jennifer. Look. Emerging from the shadows there. Father. You see... Father isn't dead. Norma Cole, you have been sentenced to hang by the neck until you are... No! You're dead, Father. You can't harm her. Norma will die and your brother Edward too in his time. Go, Jennifer. You can do nothing here. Father. Father. Silence. I have found you guilty, Norma Cole. 
And now I execute my own sentence. Oh, don't. Have mercy. Mercy. You look on the world for the last time, my daughter. My hand is on the cat. Father, stop. And heaven will show no mercy to your soul. The horror had only begun for Miss Jennifer. She fled the house. Frantic and hysterical, she reached the highway where she sank to her knees, fainting. Lamont, look. A woman lying across the road. You're right, Margot. You suppose it's been an accident? You better save the guessing games for the parlor. You coming? Yes, dear. <laughs> no, no, no. Lamont. No. Is she hurt? I'm delirious. Oh, can't we do something? Edward will be next, he said. Who said? But tell us, what happened? She... She's been killed. What's she talking about? I don't know, Margot. Who's been killed? Where did it happen? The Cole Mansion. I'm Jennifer Cole. Oh, won't you try to be calm, Miss Cole? I can't. I saw it. My sister Norma. What did you see? I saw her... hang. This is the coal mansion. Your home, Miss Jennifer. Oh, no, don't make me go in. I'm afraid. Come along, Miss Jennifer. The lights are all out, Lamont. Of course they are. Just as they were when I came home tonight. It's a strange story, Miss Jennifer. <laughs> Silly of you to knock. You see, there's no one here. They've all been murdered. Good evening, Miss Jennifer. Daniel. Yes, Miss Jennifer. You... You're all right. Why, yes, thank you, ma'am. And you, ma'am, we were worried about you. Miss Norma was just saying... Norma? Norma? Where is she? Who, sir? Miss Norma. Why, she's having dinner with her brother Edward in the dining room. Daniel, is she alive? Alive? Why, ma'am, she... Hadn't you better see for yourself, Miss Jennifer? Oh, oh, yes, yes. This way, this way. Norma! 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 Edward. Where have you been, Jennifer? We dined without you, my dear. You were late. Listen, we Jennifer, didn't... I thought... Did you bring guests, Jennifer? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Good evening, sir. Good evening, miss. You're friends of Jennifer's? Well, in a way. You see, we found your sister lying on the highway. She said something terrible had happened here. Norma. There's just one thing I must know. Was father here? Father? Father? No, Jennifer. Father wasn't here. Norma, why don't you take Jennifer up to her room? Yes, Jennifer. You come along with me now. I thought it all happened. It seems so real. So real. I don't know what's wrong with me. My sister isn't quite herself, I'm afraid. No? That question about father puts a rather plain face on the matter. I'm afraid I don't quite follow you. Father has been dead for over a month. Dead? Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. I hope she'll be all right. She'll be all right. Norma will take care of her. Norma, what's wrong with me? There, there, dear. I'm so glad you're really here, Norma. I never knew how much I loved you until I saw you about to die. Please, Jennifer. You never know how much you care for a person until you think you're going to lose them. I've asked you, Jennifer. Norma, it's a pitiful thing to see a person's mind go, isn't it? No, no, your mind is... Now, see here. Your mind is not going, Jennifer. Listen to me. But those doors and that room where there isn't a room at Jennifer, all. Jennifer, you know Father's death mask. The one that hangs at the end of the hall out there. Yes, I want you to come with me. I'm going to show you what... Oh, no. No. Jennifer! What was that? Norma! Norma, what's happened? We'd better get up there and see. Yes, hurry. Which room did it come from? Jennifer's. Where? The one here at the head of the stairs. Come on, Margot. Come on! Jennifer! What have you done? What have what you is, done? What is it? She's killed Norma. You killed her? Yes, look. There's the knife on the bed. No, 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 no. Miss Jennifer. 
She's fainted. I'll tend to her. Mr. Cranston, will you will you please go downstairs and phone the hospital? Tell them Miss Jennifer is ill. Terribly ill. Oh, all right, sir. I'll be back in a moment. And if you see Daniel, tell him to get the car ready. We may have to take her ourselves. Right. No, no. Miss Jennifer. Miss Jennifer. Is she coming around? Yes, I think so. No, no. Norma, what were you saying about the mask? What was it, Norma? Norma? This isn't Norma. No, Norma's dead. You killed her. You killed Norma with this knife. I killed her. There she lies on the floor, do you see? Oh. Oh, Norma. Mr. Cole. What is it? Look. Where? There, around Norma's throat. It's the mark of a rope. The mark of a noose. Oh. Yes. Yes, there is, isn't there? But but don't you see? It means... Like I said. Like I said, she was on the gallows. I know it. I know it now. It was true. She was right. It must have really happened. Yes, yes, I, I, I'll i go and stop, Mr. Cranston. Perhaps we won't need that call after all, eh? Imagine we may not need it after all. Jennifer, listen to me. What were you saying about a mask? Oh, oh yes. Father's death mask. Norma was just about to tell me something about it when when I saw the knife in the doorway. Where is that mask, Jennifer? At the end of the hall. Why, I, I never thought. It's hung just where I thought I saw the gallows room. I wonder... Listen, listen do you hear it? Drums. Ah, you see, it was real. That's exactly the way I heard it before. Yes, I see. Quiet now, just be still. Where are you going? I want to see that death mask, Jennifer. Oh, no. no. At the end of the hall, she said. Now, let's see. It should be about... Oh, here it is. Well, it's just a piece of plaster. Nothing unusual about it, except it needs straightening. It's hung a bit crooked. Then... Now... The wall, it's open. It's the room Miss Jennifer saw. The gallows, the drums. And myself, Miss Lane. Oh, oh, let me go. Oh, let me Come in. Court is in session, Miss Lane. The black judge will see that you get justice. Justice! Ah! Act two of The Drums of Doom will continue in just a moment. First, consider what your answer would be to this personal question. Would the heat in your home be just exactly the same as it is now if you could adjust it perfectly to suit your own comfort? If you say no, then certainly you need blue coal. You see, blue coal is tailor-made for your home. It's carefully sized and graded to fit the requirements of your furnace. That's why it gives even, comfortable, dependable warmth. On top of that, this tested superior home fuel is a money saver. It burns so efficiently that you enjoy real economy with blue coal. Add to all this the new blue coal automatic heat regulator, and you have the modern home heating setup that has given genuine satisfaction to thousands upon thousands all over the country. The blue coal heat regulator is easily and quickly installed. It's a cinch to operate. With a flick of the finger, you can set the temperature in your home just where you want it. Ask your neighborhood blue coal dealer for a free demonstration of the money-saving blue coal heat regulator. He is listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Call him tomorrow. Now, back to the shadow. You people out there must never let anyone know who told you this story, for I'm supposed to be silent. But it's a tale that must be told. It was really half over, you see, when Mr. Cranston at the phone downstairs heard Miss Lane scream. I heard Miss Lane call for help, Mr. Cranston. So did I call. And just before Margot screamed, I heard a sound. The same sound Miss Jennifer said she heard this evening. You did, Cranston? It was the sound of snare drums coming from somewhere... Miss Raymond! What was that? Look! It's Daniel, my servant, there at the top of the stairs. (laughs) He's fallen. Come on, Cole. Yes. Daniel! Daniel! What's happened to him? Oh, I... I went into Miss Jennifer's room 
and it was empty. Empty? When I came out into the hall, there was something waiting in the dark. I tried to run. It struck me. Oh. Is he hurt badly? I can't tell. We'll tend to him, but first we've got to find Jennifer and Miss Lane. Chances are they're still somewhere on the second story here. I'll take this hallway, Cole. You go through the bedroom. Right. And if you need any help, sing out. I will. Margot! Miss Jennifer! Can you hear me, Margot? Oh, telephone right off the hallway here. And I was sent all the way downstairs to phone. Very interesting. Hello? Hello, this is Artisan, Cole's lawyer. Yes? I'd like you to tell Mr. Edward Cole that I'll be at his house at 11 o'clock. Is he expecting you? I'm coming to read his father's will. It's completed now. I'm afraid there's nothing in it that he wants to hear, but I must follow the legal procedure. All right, I'll tell him. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. Uh, a will he won't like to hear, eh? Who was that on the phone, Colonel? Oh, I, uh, Mr. Otterson said he'd be over at 11 o'clock to read your father's will. Oh. Uh, did you find anything in the bedrooms? No, but I, uh, I did find something interesting, Mr. Cranston. Do you see my father's death mask hanging there? Death mask? Oh, yes. Here it is. Turn it, Mr. Cranston. Turn it? Well, what do you mean? Just try it and see. Well, I'll try it, but I... Look, Mr. Cranston. The wall is opening. And what have we inside? Well, the gallows. The mud! Margot! And Miss Lane with the noose around her neck, all ready for the trap to be sprung. Margot! No, Lamont, don't come in here, don't! What do you mean, Margot? I have to. <laughs> yes, Mr. Cranston. I thought you'd have to. I hope you two find it comfortable in the gallows room. Daniel. Daniel, get up from there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent performance, Daniel. You quite took Mr. Cranston's mind off the drums he heard. That was the idea, sir. Good. Where's Miss Jennifer? She's locked in the small room adjoining the library, just as you ordered, You've sir. You've done well by me, Daniel. By you? Huh. I've done it for my share in the will. Don't you go forgetting. Oh, no. No, I won't forget. But first, there's a little matter of cancelling out the two rather annoying young people in the gallows room. You mean another murder? There, that's Otterson now. Get a grip on yourself, Daniel. Miss Lane is completely prepared on the gallows. All you need to do is spring the trap. But the man... You've got a gun equipped with a silencer. It's not a bad job for the price we're getting. Ah, uh, Daniel? Ah, <laughs> uh, Daniel? <laughs> Coming, Mr. Otterson. Coming. Hurry, Lamont. Stand still, Margot. I'm trying to get the noose from around your neck. Lamont, didn't I see a window in the rear wall? Yes, Margot, but it's a sheer drop to the ground. Break any mortal back to try to... Lamont, the wall's opening. Steady, Margot. Just tell the gentleman who comes in that I went out through that window. What are you going to do? We're going to rely on the services of our old friend, the Shadow. Ah, Miss Lane, how pretty you look on the gallows. And as for your friend, Mr... Where is he? Where's Cranston? He's gone. Gone? Out of the window. But, but, but that can't be. Well, he's gone. You can see he's gone. All right. All right, so he got away. But you, you'll pay for the both of you. No! No, don't! You see what a neat thing a gallows is? Here's the spring. When I push it, the trap will open. No! Yes! And for a little, little while, you'll dance on air. And then... <laughs> what was that? You are near the gallows, Daniel. But you'll be nearer yet before your days are over. Who's talking? I, I can't see anyone. But there's a voice. It is the voice of the shadow. Now give me the keys that unlock these walls, Daniel. All right. No point in arguing with a voice. It's here in my pocket. Oh, shadow, he's got a gun. So I see. Oh, my arms. Something's holding me. Drop that gun. Drop it, Daniel. Oh, let me out of here. I can't fight something I can't see. Let me go. Let me go. All right, Daniel. I'll let you go. Uh, someone i got to talk to about this. Someone i got to talk to. Run, Daniel. Run. Your crimes are close at your heels. Good of you to have come out here, Artisan. May I give you a brandy? Uh, no, Mr. Cole. I'm just here to make you acquainted with your father's will and... Mr. Edward! Mr. Edward! Daniel! How dare you come in the library? Oh, I... oh I'm sorry. I'd, I'd quite forgotten about Mr. Otterson. The man, the man's as pale as a ghost, Cole. Here, Daniel. Drink this brandy. It'll steady you. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Now, get on with the will, Otterson. Yes. Well, sir, there's only one paragraph that would be of interest to you and... 
According to your father's letters, he had told you of his intention of making it in the main article. Right. And that paragraph states in effect that you are to divide his fortune among deserving charities and present each of us, his three children, with the sum of one dollar. That's correct. And you agree to accept the will, Mr. Cole? I do not. What? I most emphatically question it. On what grounds, sir? On the grounds of my father's sanity. His sanity? But there was a witness to his sanity, Mr. Cole. Who? My sister Jennifer? Yes, Miss Jennifer. She was the only one of you in town at the time he remade his will. I question Jennifer's ability to judge anyone else's sanity, Utterson. What do you mean? I mean that if I can prove that she is insane, the law will not recognize her testimony, nor the will. Am I right? Uh, Yes, you are right, but... Good. Daniel, open that door. Yes. Jennifer, come out, my dear. Miss Jennifer. Oh, Edward. Edward. Jennifer, did you or did you not see our father in this house tonight? Answer me. Yes, I saw him. I saw him. Did you see a room on the second floor where we all know there is no room? Yes, yes. And did you see a gallows in that room and our father hanging Norma on that gallows? Yes, I did. Good. I did. Good. Well, what do you say to that, Mr. Anderson? I suppose this case... uh... This had better be reconsidered. I'm afraid you're right, Mr. Cole. <laughs> what was that? It's the voice. The voice again. No, Otterson, he's not right. Miss Jennifer is sane. But Edward, Norma, and Daniel here conspired to drive her out of her mind to invalidate this will. It's a lie. It's a lie. They built a gallows on the second floor of this house, and Edward, impersonating his father in his black judicial robes, pretended to hang Norma. No, no. They cleared the lower floor, stripped it of its furnishings, then restored it all in Miss Jennifer's absence with the deliberate plan of persuading her she was insane. However, poor Norma was too soft-hearted to carry it through. And for this, they killed her and tried to pin the guilt on Jennifer. It's the truth. The shadow's telling the truth. Quiet, Daniel. Right. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter anymore. Help him. Look, he's fallen. Here, let me help. Stand back, Addison. Haven't you done enough, Edward? I'll take that gun, Cole. Ed- Something's holding my arm. Drop that gun, Cole. Drop it. No. I've got the gun, Shadow. Give it to me. Give it to me. Stand back, Mr. Cole. I'm warning oh, you. Oh, no, you're... Your killings are at an end, Edward Cole. <laughs> Look, Lamont. It's Daniel lying here. And Mr. Edward. Uh, What's happened? I, I shot Mr. Edward. He had threatened to kill me. Is he dead? Walter. Walter. Hey, let me see. It's only a shoulder wound. Here, Miss Jennifer, give me that brandy. Oh, yes, Mr. Cranston, here. No, no brandy, no. Drink, Cole, drink. All right. Phone for the ambulance, Margot. He's going to live. So I was going to live, was I? No. They were wrong. You see... There wasn't a chance. The drink they gave me took care of that. It was what was left of the brandy I had prepared for Daniel. Poisoned. Poisoned so I wouldn't have him blackmailing me for the share of my father's estate I promised him. That was the bitterest twist of the whole bitter tale. But now, you must promise me you'll never repeat what you've heard. For it's been told to you from the tomb... Told by the lips of a dead man. Ah, but you'll keep quiet. For if you ever tell anyone and tell them the truth, they'll only say you're insane, you know. They'll only say you're insane. An important real-life drama of America at War will be presented immediately after a message from John Barclay, Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert. Mr. Barclay? Thank you. Friends, as we all realize, it's more important than ever now to save fuel. Let me give you a few tips that you may find useful. First of all, insulate doors and windows. Use window strips or storm sash. Another thing... Close bedroom doors at night so you can keep the rest of the house at a comfortable temperature. The new blue coal automatic heat regulator will be a great help to you in this. 
The regulator will automatically adjust the heat for night and for day. You'll save a good deal of fuel that way. And what's more, you'll save effort. You won't have to rush down to the basement several times a day to adjust dampers. Your blue coal dealer will tell you all about this remarkable automatic heat regulator. And besides that, he'll be able to go into more detail than I can here about how you can save fuel without sacrificing comfort. Call your friendly blue coal dealer tomorrow. There's no charge, of course, and no obligation. He'll be glad to help you as part of his regular service. Thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Red Cross today desperately needs your help. This valiant organization is struggling against tremendous odds and meeting both civilian and military needs on all fronts. Listen and remember. In a small village in the war area, far across the sea, a wounded man and his wife remain alone. All other civilians have fled. The enemy is quickly approaching. The woman speaks. Oh, Manuel, Manuel, they will soon be here. What can we do? You must go. Go quickly while you can. No, no, no. I will stay with you. Shh. They're here. It's too late. Red Cross. Anybody here? Oh, help us. Help us. You bet your life. That's what we're here for. We'll have you out in two shakes. Hey, stretcher. Double quick. Where there's danger, trouble, and suffering, there you'll find the Red Cross. Send your contribution to your local Red Cross headquarters today. Help save both civilians and soldiers so they can fight on. The United Nations must prove to criminal aggressors that... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story is produced by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of blue coal. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air, brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. This is no time of the year to let your coal supply get low. Sudden changes in temperature and war conditions may delay transportation and keep your order of coal from getting to you when you'll need it most. Fill your coal bin now and help relieve transportation facilities for war supplies. Your friendly blue coal dealer is able to take care of you now from supplies on hand. But this condition may change at any time, especially since this fine home fuel is so rapidly gaining new users. New users who have found you get more dependable heat plus real economy with blue coal. Yes, it's wise to be prepared. Call your friendly blue coal dealer tomorrow. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Thing in the Swamp. <laughs> this is a tale of greed and hate. 
was created by the belief of 10 million radio listeners. For if the story had not been told, the thing would never have risen out of the swamp to reach out with blood-red tentacles and thrice to murder. What is it? Who's there? It's I, Hugo. How many times have I told you not to sneak up behind me like that? Oh, Hugo, don't be angry with me. Fools. Fools. I'll never find it. Uh, never. What did you say, Hugo? Huh? Uh, nothing. Hugo. What? How much longer must we stay here in this houseboat on this dismal swamp? As long as I want to stay here. But, Hugo, I'm frightened. I'm afraid of this place. Those strange noises we've heard in the swamp. Do you think it's true what that man Nestor said on the radio? That there's a monster living in the depths of Pearl's swamp? Well, how <laughs> else can one explain those unearthly noises that come from the swamp? Don't be a fool. If it's money, Hugo, money. if that's the re... Money. Yes, Hugo. What? Do you mean money? Oh, oh! What are oh. you trying to find out? Nothing, nothing, Hugo. I, I only wanted you to tell me what it is that, that keeps us here on this houseboat away from everybody. Oh. No, Amy. No. Not even you. Now go to bed. Let. Might help you to tell me, Hugo. I said go to bed. All right, Hugo. All right. No. No, not even dear Amy. No one will know. I'll have it all. All to myself. The death laugh of the loon sounds lonesome tonight. Sounds almost... That's not a loon. That's not a loon. That's not a loon. Oh. What? what are you? What do you want? Stay away from me. You're not a real person. You're a... An animal. A thing apart from ordinary men. Your huge, ugly head... I'm sure body. you don't find me pretty. Now tell me, Hugo. Where is the money? Where have you hidden it? No, no. I won't tell you. No. You'll tell me, Hugo Mankino. You'll tell me. No. Amy. Amy, come here. You've talked enough, Hugo. I thought I heard you call me, Hugo. What? Oh. Now, Miss Lane and my good friend Cranston, will you two please explain why you dragged me to this broadcasting station? Well, Commissioner, Lamont and I were talking about that poor woman. Uh, what woman? Uh, Mrs. Menkino, Commissioner. The woman whose husband was carried off the houseboat into the swamp by that, uh, that monster. Oh, that. Uh, she's out of her mind. Well, don't be too sure of that, Commissioner. Miss Lane, not only am I sure, but several of the state's best psychiatrists are sure also. But we're not sure, Commissioner. Uh, I hate to tear myself away, Cranston, but I'm sure you'll understand. Leaving before Mr. Nestor comes? Nestor? Oh, yeah, now, what's heaven's gift to radio commentators got to do with my being here? Well, you remember the story Mrs. Menkino told of that uh, thing in the swamp? You just mentioned that. Phony story. Very phony. Well, Peter Nestor, radio's teller of strange tales, told of this exact monster living in the same swamp in his broadcast six weeks ago. Even the description that Mrs. Menkino gave the police of that monster tallied perfectly with Mr. Nestor's story. Uh -huh. Coincidence. And, uh, by the way, Commissioner... Isn't Menkino the missing cashier of the National Bank that was robbed of so much money about five years ago? Well, it does happen the police have been looking for Menkino for questioning for some years now. But that has absolutely nothing to do with this monster story. Lamont, let's hear what Mr. Nestor's saying on his broadcast. Okay, Margo. I'll turn on this radio. You won't hear much. The program's just about over. And that is the story, ladies and gentlemen. 
The statue, carved in granite and silhouetted against the sky, may be seen to this day. Well, the program's over. And now, a preview of next week's program. You may recall that my strange tale for my program just six weeks ago dealt with a legend of the thing in the swamp. Lamont, he's talking about it again. If you have read your newspapers lately, you know that a woman has reported that her husband has been carried off by a monster who exists in the murky waters of Furrow Swamp. And next week on my broadcast, I'm going to the exact spot where the monster is reported to have struck and attempt to give you an on-the-spot description of him. Don't forget to tune in next week. You have an appointment with danger. An appointment with a thing in the swamp. Good night. At the end of the broadcast, turn it off, Lamont. Right. Well, Commissioner, what do you think now? Well, I think I'd like to talk to this Peter Nestor. Hey, How about a story, Mr. Nestor? Nestor? Yeah. All right, all right. I'll give you a report of the story later. Thank you. Uh, pardon me, the page boy said you wanted to see me? Mr. Nestor? Yeah? I'm Commissioner Weston. This is Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston. How are you? How, How do you do? do? I can guess what you're here for, Commissioner Weston. It's that story of mine that came true, right? The first time. What I'd like to know, Mr. Nestor, is where you got that story. Why, it's an old legend of the swamp. But the thing happened just as you described it. Don't you think that's strange, Mr. Nestor? Yes. How can you explain that? Uh, believe me, I was as surprised when I read about it as you are. As far as I knew, it was just a legend. Well, what about you going to Furrow Swamp and doing an on-the-spot broadcast? Next week, I'm going to that houseboat and wait for the monster. If it comes, I'll describe it over the air to my audience. Mr. Nestor, do you mind if I come with you? Not at all, Mr. Cranston, but I'm very much afraid we'll find the monster's a myth. That the woman who reported her husband's death had listened to my broadcast and that her unbalanced mind had seized upon the idea. I'm not so sure, Mr. Nestor. Because I believe that the so-called legendary monster is more than imaginary now. Well, here I am, bound to a chair on the houseboat, gentlemen. And I'm ready for what may come. One more picture, Mr. Nestor. All right, all right, one more. Thanks. Thank you. Well, my broadcast will begin in just eight minutes. That'll give you all enough time to get back the half mile to the truck containing the portable radio equipment where you may listen to my program. Well, uh, I thought, Nestor, that I was to be allowed to remain here. I'm sorry, Mr. Cranston, but if you stayed, all these reporters would want to stay, too. If there is such a monster, it would certainly scare him away. He's right, Lamont. Yes, I suppose he is. By the way, Cranston, where's the good police commissioner? Well, to use his own words, he had other more important things to do. Mm. Perhaps he'll be sorry he didn't come along. Perhaps. Well, good luck, mister. Yeah, thanks. And now, gentlemen, yeah, uh, yeah. it's time to go. What's on your mind? I have an appointment with a thing in the swamp. Lamont, I wish we'd gone inside the transmitter truck with the others. It's not too cheerful out here in the car. Well, if anything should happen to Nestor, we can reach him quicker from here, Margo. This car radio takes quite a time to heat up. A nester should Here be... I am, alone oh, on the haunted houseboat of the missing Hugo Mankino, bound to a chair, waiting for our monster to come. It's not too comforting to remember that Hugo, living with his wife on this very houseboat where I am now, met his death by this monster just ten days ago. His body is supposed to be at the bottom of the swamp. Tonight... I shall attempt to describe this monster to you. Now, the police have claimed that this thing doesn't exist. I not only say that it exists, I say it will visit this houseboat tonight. Now, remember, listeners, I'm tied from head to foot. My only contact with the outside world is this microphone propped up beside me. In front of me is the open door of this doomed houseboat where I could see the swamp in which our monster is supposed to live. Nothing has disturbed the waters of the swamp up to... Wait. Wait, I see something. Lamont, do you think... I something think we ought to hear what he has to say. Rising from the waters outside the door. Oh, 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 oh no. Oh, no. Lamont. The laugh's on me. Do you think he sees anything? Really He's a good monster. storyteller, Margo. You've Let's got to believe me. Now, wait a minute. Strategy. Good as Nestor is, he thing. couldn't make up the sounds of those head, chains. Claws, covered with seaweed. And I can't get away, I can't. 
No, no, stay away from me. Stay away. Come on, what is it? That's what we're going to find out. Act two of The Thing in the Swamp will continue in just a moment. First, consider this important fact. You need proper heat in your home just as you need proper clothes and proper food. And you can only enjoy that sort of heat when you have the right fuel. Blue coal, you'll find, is right because it's prepared especially for home use. It's delivered to your home in exactly the right size to give you the most efficient heat. That's why this superior home fuel keeps your home warm and comfortable at all times. Every room at the right temperature. Add to all that the new Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator, and you're sitting on top of the world. The Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator saves climbing up and down stairs. It automatically makes the adjustments that increase or decrease the heat according to your needs. It's easily and quickly installed. You can take it with you when you move. And what's more... It saves money. Ask your neighborhood blue coal dealer for a free demonstration of the blue coal heat regulator. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Call him tomorrow. Now, back to the shadow. Now that we've gotten rid of the reporters and everybody else, Cranston, Miss Lane, what is this all about? Well, Commissioner, we were listening to Nestor's broadcast in my car. About a half mile from here. Well, everything was going fine on the program until... Miss Lane, I heard the broadcast. What I want to know is, where is Nestor now? I told you over the phone, Commissioner, he's gone. Gone? Now, look, Cranston, I was there when Nestor told you that he didn't believe any monster was going to show up. Weston... That monster really appeared. Nestor was tied to this chair here. You can see for yourself that the cords are broken. He couldn't have done that himself. So what? He hired a guy to cut him loose for publicity. I don't think so, Commissioner. And that doesn't explain this clump of wet seaweed here on the floor. <laughs> the wind could have blown that in. Personally, I'm going home. I think you've been taken in by Nestor's legend. And personally, I'm going home. Do you want to go home, Lamont? Uh-uh. Do you? Uh-uh. You're not afraid because everybody's gone back to town and left us here? <laughs> I should say not. Good. Because I think that if we stay here aboard the houseboat, the thing in the swamp may pay us a visit. Cops and the reporters are gone now, Rocky. Yeah? Give me those glasses. I want to take a look across the swamp. Yeah. We'll soon see. Gone, eh? There's still a car parked near the houseboat across the swamp there. That guy Cranston and his friend Miss Lane are still hanging around. What do they want? Suppose we row across and find out. Hey, Rocky, what about this this thing in the swamp? Forget it. Yeah, maybe this ain't such a safe hideout after all. I said forget it. What's the matter, Nick? Are you turning yellow? No, no, Rocky, no. I don't think Cranston and Miss Lane are going to stick around long if the monster shows up. I don't like this, Rocky. I don't like it at all. You'd like a cut of the National Bank robbery money, wouldn't you? Yeah. Now with Mankito dead, we'll never find that, though. It's still where he hid it, and we'll find it. Rocky, who killed Mankino? How did you find out about it? What difference does it make? When I came in this with you, I told you I didn't want nothing to do with no murder. Now, if Keep you... your shirt on. I only heard about it on the radio. The monster is supposed to have done it. Look, Nick, I ain't gonna double-cross you the way Menkino double-crossed me on that bank stick-up. For five years, I've been waiting my chance to get my hands on that dough, and nothing's gonna stop me now. No. Not even that nosy guy Cranston and that dame poking around. What are you gonna do, Rocky? We're going across the swamp to the houseboat and give Cranston and his girlfriend a little surprise. Lamont. Yes? What time is it? You just asked me that five minutes ago. Well, it seemed like five hours ago. How much longer will we have to wait for... for that thing? There's no telling, Margot. It's the suspense of waiting that's so deadly. You're right, Margot. I think I'll take a look over this houseboat. Perhaps the answer to this whole mystery is right here. I'm not sure I'm going to like the answer if we do find it. What's this? What? This door here. I didn't notice it before. Ah. 
Seems to be a flight of steps going down into the hold of the boat. I can't see much. It's so dark down there. Here, I'll flash a light down there. I don't see a thing. Let's go down. All right. Seems to be a lot of water down here. What is it, Margot? Rats! The place is full of them. Let's go up again, Lamont. Hey, you go up, Margot. I want to take a look around. All right, Lamont. I'll wait for you on deck. All right. There. I wonder if I'll find what I'm looking for here. Let's see what's under this sacking here. Good heavens. Those claw marks on his throat. I could almost believe that legend about the monster. Margo! Margo! I found Nestor's body. Margo! What is it? Margo! Here, open this door. Open, I say. All right, pound all you want, mister. You'll never get out of there alive. I don't like this, Rocky. I don't like it. Just keep her on and let me manage this. What about this dame here in the boat? What are you going to do about her? Maybe you killed her. Maybe I have. Rocky, I told you I don't She's want... only unconscious. She's okay. Yeah. When she comes to, she's going to start yelling. we got to let her go. She won't yell. That guy you locked in the hold of the houseboat. He can break out of there, Rocky. The wood is so rough. Look, I'm getting sick of your griping. I tell you, he won't break out. Before we left, I opened up the seacock. He's probably drowned already. Look back. You see how low the boat sunk in the water? We're going back, Rocky. What are you talking about? When I came in with you, I said no killing. And we're going back and save him. Yeah? You're looking into the barrel of a gun, Nick. I think you've been around me long enough to know I'll use it if I have to. Okay, Rocky. You win. That's better. Just do as I say and we'll get along. Uh, uh, He's coming too. Uh, Lamont, I... Look, lady. I mean business. One sound out of you and... Where's Lamont? What have you done Shut to up. Him? Rocky. Rocky, what's that? Where? There. Those waves in the water. Looks like someone's swimming, but there ain't nobody there. Just waves. A shadow. What did you say? Nothing. That's funny. I'd have sworn you said the shadow. No. No, no, I've I didn't. I've heard of him. I always wanted to meet up with the shadow. Let's see if a bullet will stop those no, waves. No, don't. No. Hold her neck. No, let me go. Still coming no. toward us. No. Oh, no. Now it stopped. No. Stopped no. good. I always wondered if a bullet could stop the shadow. Now I know. <laughs> Oh, what do you want? What are you going to do with me? Come on, lady. Come with me. No. No. Don't you understand? I'm going to let you escape. Escape? This wasn't my idea. I don't want no part of it. I was after some easy money, but I realize now I was wrong. But I... Don't stop to talk now, lady. Rocky will be back here in the hideout any minute now. i got to get you out of here safely. We'll have to work fast. <laughs> What's that? Shadow. Shadow? Well, I thought... You thought the shadow was dead. That your friend Rocky killed me in the water. I saw the waves. Stop. The shadow cannot be killed, Nick. Uh, what are you going to do to me? I'm going to let you go. You're not evil, Nick. You've been misled. I'm going to give you a chance. The chance to go straight. Rocky's come back. Well, if Rocky's come back... No! No, it's the monster! The monster! Come Come with me. You're going to the bottom of the swamp, and no one will ever find your body there. Just as they'll never find Mankino. No. no, no, don't come near me. Stop. What? Who said that? The shadow. The shadow's dead. The shadow is not dead. The shadow can see through your disguise. No. No, stand back there. Let go of me. Now I recognize this voice. It's Rocky. So you're the thing in the swamp. You killed Mankino. Uh, now you know there's no reason for this disguise any longer. Off it comes. So, Rocky, that explains the monster. A diving helmet and a rubber suit covered with seaweed. Yes, Shadow, now you know. What are you going to do about it? You must pay for your crimes, Rocky. Oh, no, not Rocky. I'm getting out of here and you're not stopping me. I've got my gun trained on Miss Lane here in one false move and she died. <laughs> Double-crosser. You killed 
killed him. Yes, just as I killed Minkino and Nesta. Just as I'll kill you if the shadow tries to keep me from leaving here. You won't try to stop me, will you, Shadow? You can't escape justice, Rocky. Oh, yes, Shadow. I'm clever. You'll have to admit that. Not clever enough to find the money stolen from the bank. The money that you and Mankino stole together. You're wrong, Shadow. I found the money, and I have it outside. Mankino couldn't hide it from me. And now, Shadow, Miss Lane and I are leaving. Tried to stop me, and she'll... <laughs> Well, you saw what happened to my double-crossing friend, Nick. Come on. No, you don't, Rocky. Oh, my gun! You knocked it out of my hand. What's the matter, Rocky? Lost your courage and bravado? Uh, you I... lost your gun? Uh, Shadow, give me back my gun. Give it back no, to me. No, Rocky, you'll never have the opportunity to use it again. You'll never kill again. But you don't understand. I had to kill Mankino. He tried to cheat me out of my share of the money. I had to do it. The money which you and he had stolen from the bank? I helped him steal it. It belonged to me, too. You have a twisted sense of right and wrong, Rocky. There is only one place for men such as you. The police will see to it that you pay your debt to society. Your days of killing are over. <laughs> Rocky made a complete confession of the whole thing this morning. Well, Lamont, I still don't understand where Rocky got the idea for his monster disguise. Margot, strangely enough, he got it from Nestor by listening to the tale of the thing in the swamp on the radio. He procured a diving helmet with a portable oxygen tank, covered himself with seaweed, and brought Nestor's legendary monster to life. Well, what purpose did he have in doing that? He's been trying for five years to find out where Mankino hid the money. He knew that Mankino was almost stubborn enough to die rather than tell. And Rocky thought that he might scare it out of him. But why did he kill Nestor? He wanted to build up the story of the thing in the swamp so as to scare people away from the hiding place of the money until he found it. He thought Nestor's death would do that. Oh, one thing led to the other. Yes, Margot. You know, I've just had a weird thought. What? In a way... Nestor was killed by a monster that he himself brought to life in the minds of ten million listeners. So actually, he created a monster that destroyed him. A real-life drama proving that crime does not pay will be presented immediately after a message from John Barclay, Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Friends, an important part of furnace operation is refueling, fixing the furnace. Now, here's the way to do it right. First, shake the grates gently until you see a red glow in the ash pit. But don't allow red coals to drop through the grate. Second... Take a hoe and pull the live coals to the front of the firebox so the fire slopes downward from the front to the rear. Then put the fresh coal to the rear of the furnace. But don't cover all the fire. Leave a spot of live coals in the front. You need these to ignite gases arising from the fresh coal. Finally, remove ashes from the ash pit and set the dampers. Close the check damper and open the ash pit damper. Of course, with the Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator, the dampers are automatically adjusted for you. Yes, folks, the right way is the easy way, and the easy way in this case is the economical way. Your Blue Coal dealer is always glad to help you with your home heating problem at no charge, no obligation. I know you'll be pleased with the friendly help you receive. Call him tomorrow. Thank you. Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by the Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. We now bring you an episode from real life proving that crime does not pay. November 1939. It is late at night. 
two cars are speeding along the road. Suddenly, the second swerves ahead and forces the first car into the curb. Hey. Hey, what's the big idea? Why don't you watch me you're driving? Get out of that car, you hear me? Get out of there. Put away that gun. Get out of there with your hands in the air and quick. Okay, I'll get out and I'll teach you not to point guns at people, too. <clears throat> oh, so you're tough, eh? Well, how do you like this? Dead. Dead. That's how Albert Gatti handles wise guys. The dead will haunt you, Albert Gatti. And all the guns in the world can't save you. In a cell in Queen City Prison, January 12th, 1942, Albert Gatti hanged himself with a twisted sheet. The dead were avenged. And once again was proved the truth of the warning. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen. And be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story was produced by the DL and W Coal Company, distributors of blue coal. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Think about your coal supply now, and you won't have to worry about it later. Order the coal you'll need for the rest of the season right now. Fill your coal bin to the top, and then you'll be protected against any possible delay or interruption in deliveries. Your blue coal dealer is able to take care of your needs immediately. He has a good supply of this superior home fuel on hand. But war conditions, plus sudden changes in temperature, may quickly change this situation. So it's wise to play safe. Ask your blue coal dealer to fill your coal bin right now... And be safe. Telephone him tomorrow. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and powerful secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, Dead Man's Revenge. Mr. McPhail, 20 minutes. There it is, boys. Sorry. The interview's over. Ah, oh, now, Mr. McPhail, you promised us a story for our paper. Look, Mr. McPhail, a leading theatrical director like you is news. Give us something. Something about your career, maybe. Oh, you heard the call, boys. I've only 20 minutes you before... You theatrical people are always in a hurry. Couldn't be that you're getting nervous, could it, Mr. McPhail? <laughs> no, it couldn't. Not after all my years on the stage... This is old stuff for me, boy. Ah, then give us a break. We're trying to get a lead-off for the morning edition. You've got the time, Mr. McPhail. All right. 
All right, I haven't got the time, but I'll give you your lead off just the same. That's the way to talk. I guess you all know something about this story anyway. It happened while I was rehearsing a new three-character play in the old John Carter Theater. Uh, just a second. Uh, John Carter Theater. There hadn't been a play to open in that theater for 20 years. Not since the great John Carter, the actor for whom the place was named, had passed away. I begged the backers not to rent it. Why, McPhail? The theater was jinxed, people said. Yeah, something about a curse. A curse of 20 years standing. But the backers ignored me, rented the place anyhow. I didn't like the idea, but I... I had Miss Morty Stilwell for the star. The play was shaping up beautifully. Then, the night before the private dress rehearsal, the trouble began. Well, how did it begin? What happened, Mr. McPhail? Well, there was a night watchman, you see... A man who'd worked around the theater ever since old John Carter himself was alive. That night, he was making his rounds in the dark, musty cellars of the place. Later, the police established that it was just about midnight when the strangest occurred. There ain't nothing down here. Everything's all right. Uh, uh, I guess I'll go up and doze off and... What was that? There is something down here. Who's there? I heard your cane tapping. Come on now. I got a gun here, and if you give me any trouble, I'll... I won't give you any trouble, Jason. Jason? Nobody's called me by that name for years. I knew you long ago, Jason. Who are you? I've heard there's going to be a play done in this theater, Jason. Yes, that's right. Have all of you forgotten old John Carter's dying wish? His dying wish? Let me remind you. He asked that this building which bears his name never again be used as a theater. Yes, he did. I remember he said it the night he died. It isn't wise to trifle with the wishes of the dead, Jason. Yes, I... I suppose you're right. But... It don't make any difference now, eh? He's been dead 20 years. Ain't much he can do about it, eh? That's what the living think, do they? The living? Why do you say the living? What are you? Just an old friend of yours, Jason. Well, come out. Come out where I can see you. I'll come out, Jason. I'll come out. Oh. No. You see who I am, my friend. Oh, it ain't true. It can't be. You recognize me. What are you doing here? What is it you want? A dead man's revenge. Dead man's revenge. Mr. McPhail, 15 minutes. Well... I'm not going to have time to finish this. Oh, sure you will, Mr. McPhail. Why don't you tell him to stop calling you every five minutes? Oh, I'm used to that, boys. There's always a five-minute call in the theater. Well, then go on while you can. Tell us what happened next. Next? Why, some workmen found the old night watchman around dawn that day. Before he died, he told this fantastic story. The papers got hold of it, and you remember... It was headlined in the noon editions of every newspaper in town. When I reached the theater that afternoon, Lamont Cranston, an old friend of mine, was in the theater green room. There was a young lady with him. Cranston. Hello, McPhail. Uh, you remember Margot Lane, don't you? Oh, yes, of course. How are you, Miss Lane? Well, we're just a little bit upset, Mr. McPhail. You see, we... Well... You saw the headlines. Yes. Is that why you came in, Lamont? Well, not exactly. Uh, that is, we... No, it's my fault, really. We just noticed the headlines, or we certainly wouldn't have come here to annoy you. Annoy me? You see, Lamont told me that you were producing a play with only three performers in it. And I thought it was so unusual. And, and... Uh, to come to the point with appropriate blushes... Margot thought we might be able to see the dress rehearsal tonight. Oh. And it's not going to be a dress rehearsal. What? Oh, Humphrey. Come in, Humphrey. I am in, McPhail. Uh, Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston, this is Mr. Humphrey, one of the members of our cast. Oh, well, how do you do? How, how do, you do you do? McPhail, 
You must call this play off at once. Do you hear me? What? What's the matter with you, Humphreys? Last night's tragedy was nothing compared to what's in store for us if we attempt to carry on with this play. What does he mean? I don't know. The night watchman is strangled in the cellar, so he wants me to toss up a whole production. Now, who do you think it was strangled him, McPhail? Well, I don't know. The police are on the job. They'll find the man. Not this man, they won't. Oh, I think the police are quite capable of tracking down a murderer, Mr. Humphreys. This murderer, Mr. Cranston, was the phantom of old John Carter. John Carter? You're out of your mind. I tell you, the play must not go on. Miss Stilwell and Mr. Graves will want to go on even if you don't. Your crazy ghost stories won't stop them. Well, if the stories don't stop them, I warn you. All right, you, Humphreys, but... you warn me. Now get out. Very well. But remember, whatever happens will be on your head, McPhail. Well, you don't suppose there could be anything in what he says, Lamont? I don't know, Margot. Who was it said, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy? <laughs> Well, in that case, this might be the very best time for us to uh, be Ms. on Miss our... Lane. Yes, Mr. McPhail. I'd like you and Mr. Cranston to be the only two guests tonight at the first dress rehearsal to be held in the John Carter Theater in 20 years. In 20 years. Well, go ahead. What happened then, Mr. McPhail? That night at the dress rehearsal, Miss Lane, Cranston, and I were the only people in the audience play was going well. The last act was almost over. And then came that scene where the leading woman, the part Miss Stilwell played, is supposed to be accused by an aging composer of stealing his symphony. Oh, it was a very tense moment in the play. I wrote that music. I wrote every note of it. You know I did. Yes, perhaps you did. But the world will never know it. They'll hear those melodies, and it'll be my name they'll remember. Listen, I'll play them for you. No, don't. Come away from that organ. <laughs> I can't bear to hear you. The world will love me for my music. Listen well, old friend. Forever after, these notes will belong to me. No! No! The next time I hear them, there will be no you. I've killed you. I've killed you. And my song is my own again. You like it, Margot? Look, I tore my program to shreds. <laughs> well, that's a very good oh, sign. You really? made no mistake producing this, McPhail. You've got a hit on your hands, I'm afraid. Oh, well, thank I, you. I'm going to applaud until they open those curtains oh, again. Oh, there yeah, yeah, it's opening now. <laughs> well, Miss Stilwell doesn't seem to appreciate Margot's applause. You're just sitting there at the organ without taking a bow. Oh, maybe she's tired. Oh, what does she keep holding that note for? Enough to drive you out of your mind. We've heard that note, Miss Stillwell. It's very, very pretty, but that'll do now. Oh, Miss Stillwell, please, let up. Stop it. Uh, Graves, Humphreys, one of you make Stillwell cut it out. It's not funny anymore. Who's that coming out on stage? Well, that's Mr. Graves. He's the third member of the cast. Oh, will you make a stop, will you, Graves? I'll try, Mr. Pale. Miss Stillwell... Miss Stilwell, why don't... Miss Stilwell! Oh! Lamont, look! She fell! She's lying on the stage! What's going on? What is it, Graves? What's happened up there? I think Miss Stilwell's dead! Mr. McPhail, ten minutes. Go on, McPhail. Don't waste any time. <laughs> I believe you boys would hound a man for a story... On the brink of the grave. <laughs> well, naturally, the thought of John Carter's ghost flashed across every one of our minds. The next minute, Miss Lane, Cranston, and I were hurrying up onto the stage. Don't let anyone touch Miss Stilwell's body till the medical examiner gets here. Now you better get everybody up on stage, McPhail. Well, there's only one member missing. It's Mr. Humphreys. Yes, where is Mr. Humphreys? Graves, where's Humphreys? He's up in his dressing room, Mr. McPhail. Oh, shall I tell him you want him? Would you please, Miss Lane? And you, Graves, phone for the police, will you? Yes. Which one is Mr. Humphreys' dressing room? Hmm? Uh, it's right up on the staircase there, Miss Lane, number three. Oh, number three. All right, Mr. McPhail. And you can tell him for me, Margot, that it looked very much like he was right after all. Yes, I shall, Lamont. Number two. Number three. Here it is. Mr. Humphreys! Mr. Humphreys! The door's open. Oh. I wonder if... Mr. Humphreys! 
Mr. Humphreys, where are you? Mr. McPhail said to... Who closed that door? I did, young woman. Who are you? Where's Mr. Humphreys? Mr. Humphreys is regrettably no longer with us. No longer with us? What do you mean? What are you doing in his dressing room? There was something here I had to get. Stand back now. Don't come any closer to me. No, leave me alone. Let me out of here. Ah! No. No. Let's not call for help. You're well beyond helping, young woman. Yes, there was something here I needed. Something most important to me. Revenge, young woman. Revenge from the tomb. Dead man's revenge. <laughs> Act two of Dead Man's Revenge will continue in just a minute. Right now, let's relax a bit and get comfortable. You know, comfort is very important in the blue-coal scheme of things. Your comfort, that is. It's not just a matter of heating your house. Heat by itself doesn't mean comfort. You might be extremely uncomfortable right now, for example, because your home is overheated. Comfort means that you get the right amount of heat at the right time. And that's just exactly the case when you heat with blue coal. Know why? I'll tell you. It's because blue coal is prepared especially for home use. Now, that means a lot. It means, for example, that blue coal is delivered to your home in exactly the right size for your heating plant, which results in more efficient heat, even economical heat. When, on top of that, you have the new blue coal automatic heat regulator, well, a king couldn't ask for more. The regulator saves you thousands of steps up and down stairs, gives you added comfort plus money saved on fuel. The blue coal regulator, you see, automatically adjusts the dampers on your furnace so you get comfortable, even heat in every room. Ask your blue coal dealer for a free, no-obligation demonstration. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Call him tomorrow. Operator. Operator. Operator! Mr. McPhail! Mr. Cranston! Yes, what is it, Graves? What's the matter? The phone, Mr. McPhail. The wires have been cut. Huh? Uh, Phantom is making a thorough job of this, McPhail. I beg my backers not to rent this theater. McPhail. Yes? Margot. Hasn't she been gone a long time? No, no, she's all right. The dressing room is all the way back at the end of the upstairs corridor. She and Humphreys will be down in a minute. I'll give her just about that long and I'm going up after her. Perhaps I'd better go for the police, Mr. McPhail. Yes, go on, go on. Tell them to hurry and get back yourself as soon as you can. Yes, sir, I'll do that, Mr. McPhail. I'll do that. Uh, just a moment, Graves. Yes, Mr. Cranston. You took the part of the old composer in the play, didn't you? Yes, that was Graves. He was the one who shot Miss Stillwell at the end of the play. Hmm. Miss Stillwell was shot, wasn't she? And right before our eyes. If you're implying that I... You don't happen to have the gun on you that you used in that scene, do you, Graves? Yes, sir. Here. Here it is, sir. Thank you. Hmm. Five cartridges. Blank cartridges, if you'll notice, Mr. Cranston. Blank cartridges? Five blank cartridges, Graves. But that sixth cartridge, the one you fired at Miss Stillwell, how do we know that one was blank, eh? It was. It was, I tell you. But if it wasn't, If Graves, it wasn't, it's in Miss Stillwell's back right now. Maybe we'd better look and see, Cranston. Perhaps we'd better. Particularly before we let Mr. Graves leave the theater. I'm sure the medical examiner will forgive us. The lights! They've gone out. Stand where you are, Graves. Who said that light switch? Who did that? Turn them on, McPhail. Right. Trying. Let's see where I'm going. Oh, here it is. There. Okay now? Okay, McPhail. The lights are on, Mr. but... Mr. Cranston! Graves, what is it? Miss Stillwell. Miss Stillwell? Look! Her body, it's... It's disappeared! What? What did you say, Graves? He's right. Our corpse has vanished, McPhail. But I was standing right behind. Yes. Beside it. Yes. You bet you were. And we were just going to take a look to see if that six cartridge was in the body when the body conveniently disappears. Mr. McPhail, you don't think I'm not I... thinking anymore, Graves. I see it all now. McPhail, what do you mean? Give me the gun, Cranston. Yes, thanks. I'll show you how it all happened. Now, I'm Graves, you see. 
It's the last few minutes of the play. Graves? Yes, sir? Stand where Miss Stilwell was standing in that last scene. Mr. McPhail, you can't believe it. Go on, I... do as I tell you. All right. Yes, that's right. Just about there. Now, what did she do, Graves? She walked over here to the organ and began to play. All right, do it. What, sir? Sit down and play the way she did. Uh, I'll try, sir, but... Do it! Watch, Cranston. Now, I'm Graves. I point the gun at her. She keeps playing. I say, no, no, and then I fire. You see? You see, he fired just at this level. The shot would have... All right, Graves, that's all. Get away from that keyboard and stuff. Cranston! McPhail! That's the same note that Miss Stilwell was playing when she died. It was the organ. That's what killed her. The organ? You stand back. Don't touch it. That particular key is charged with enough electric voltage to bring instantaneous death. Graves! Graves! Is he... Yes. He's dead. Oh, I, I don't understand it. I... What's happening here tonight? What is it, Cranston? <laughs> Dead man's revenge. Did you hear that? Dead man's revenge? Yes. Where'd it come from, McPhail? I couldn't quite tell. It must have meant poor Graves here, or... Lamar! Lamar, help me! That was Margot's voice. I could tell where that came from. Hello. Yes. McPhail, is there a cellar under the stage? Yes, but I've never had occasion to go down well, there. we've got occasion now, McPhail. Come on, follow me. This is directly under the stage, isn't it, McPhail? <laughs> yes, it's just about. Well, there's an artfully concealed trap door up there somewhere. Ten to one, Miss Stilwell's body was yanked through it from below here when the lights went out. I think you're right, Lamont, but let's take it easy. We don't know what we might be running into down here. This is no time to proceed with caution, McPhail. Still, it won't do any good for us to get... Listen. There it is. There, see? Coming down the corridor towards us. The Phantom. It's Carter to the life. As like him as I'm like myself. Watch. He's turning off. See? He's going into that room. If you ask me, we'd better... <coughs> Margo's in that room. Hurry, McPhail. Margo! Margo! Lamar! Lamar! They'll never help you, Miss Lane. Lamar! Let Miss Lane go or I'll... If there's anything you can imagine you can do, Mr. Cranston, you may try it. I will. Come on, McPhail. Take warning. Look out, Lamar! Margo, I... Oh. Ah, good work, McPhail. Excellent. Excellent work. Out of Miss Lane. She's fainted. All right, get her out of here, Humphreys. Take her up on the stage. Yes, McPhail. What about Cranston? I'm turning on this gas jet, Humphreys, and leaving him here in unconscious bliss. Ah. <laughs> I hope you like your new home, Cranston. You're staying here a long, long time. <laughs> Lamont. She'll be coming oh. to in a minute, McPhail. All right. Get Graves' body off the organ bench, Humphreys. And take off that makeup of yours. I don't like looking at the replica of a dead man. Oh, no, you don't need to be scared of me, McPhail. There. That takes care of Graves. Now disconnect the organ voltage switch. I will. I will in a minute. Good. You did a great job, Humphreys. I wouldn't be surprised if that impersonation of John Carter wasn't the best acting of your whole career. You were a success, McPhail. The dead bodies the police will find here were killed by the ghost of John Carter. This theater... Why, after tonight, nobody would ever touch this theater for fear of their lives. <laughs> and we can buy it for peanuts. And then we can sell it to the bus company for a terminal oh. at our own price. I hope so. Uh, I didn't go through this for nothing. Lamont. Uh, come on. Uh, Sit in that chair over there, Humphreys, and pull your collar up around your uh, face. Uh, what's the idea? The last act, pal. The last uh. act. You're a detective, and Miss Lane uh. is going to give us a little organ recital. Oh, I see Lamont. what you mean. Lamont. You're all right, Miss Lane. Oh, Mr. McPhail. Where is Lamont? There, there now. Everything's all right now. The police have arrived. Commissioner Weston? No, no, he'll be here in a minute with Lamont. But there's a detective over there who wants you to show him just what Miss Stilwell did before she was murdered. A detective? Yes. Over here, Miss Lane, with a coat all around me. Oh. Why don't they keep these theaters warm? Uh, now, Miss Lane... Right over to the organ, please. Uh, yes, yes, that, that, yes, that's right. All right. Uh, now, what did Miss Stilwell do just before she was killed? Before she was killed? Well, she... Oh, yes, well, she played the organ. Uh, could you play what she played, Miss Lane? Well, I think so. Let me see. It, it went something like this. I think... 
I think it was like this. I, I can't remember. Then what came next? Next? Oh, let's... Yes. It was like this. Just like this. Stop. Huh? <laughs> Who said stop? McPhail. What is it? What is it? It is the shadow, my friends. The voice of your doom. Shadow? Well, I can't see anything. There's just a voice. I am here with you, McPhail, Humphreys. Your plan has failed. It'll not help you to kill Miss Lane. I've already informed the police. They'll be here at any moment. Police, let me out of here. Stand back. Oh. Back, McPhail. You'll wait in this room for the justice of the law. All right. All right, but, but you'll tell them the truth, won't you, voice? What is the truth, McPhail? That I didn't kill anybody. It was Humphreys did it all. You're a liar, McPhail. He wired the organ. He killed Miss Stillwell and Graves. He did it all, I tell you. And he will pay for it, McPhail. And so will you. Oh, no. You may have McPhail, but not me. Stop him, Shadow. Don't let him get to the organ. Humphreys, not until I'm dead. The penalty for your crimes was inevitable, Humphreys. Fate has given you her own bitter justice. <laughs> But Lamont Cranston didn't die, McPhail. I've seen him since then. No. The blow wasn't as heavy as I thought, you see. Yes, he came to in time to stop the gas jet and find his way out of the cellar. <laughs> well, boys, I said I'd give you a lead-off for the morning edition, and I've just finished in time. Ah, Mr. McPhail. Are you ready, McPhail? Sure. Sure, I'm ready. All right, you newspapermen. Outside. We're taking the prisoner from his cell to the chambers. Okay, warden. We're going. Uh, don't fold up, McPhail. Uh, I'll be over soon. Oh, don't worry about me, warden. I won't crack. Thanks for the story, McPhail. Anything you'd like for a last request? Yes, no, I... Yes. yes. No. Wait a moment. I... Could you just print... Bill McPhail, dramatic director was excellent last night in his final and farewell production. In a moment, we'll describe a real-life crime taken from police annals. But first, here is Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, John Barclay. Mr. Barkley. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hear some homeowners complain that they burn too much coal and get poor results. Well, the chances are they're burning the wrong size coal. And remember, it's just as important to use the right size coal as it is to use a good quality coal. You see, anthracite comes in four domestic sizes. Egg, stove, chestnut, and pea. Now, we all know that any of these will burn in the average furnace. But if you want to get your money's worth in clean, even, trouble-free heat, there is one size or combination of sizes best suited to your particular heating plant. And if you're not sure which is the right size for your furnace, take my tip and call your blue coal dealer. He'll send a John Barclay serviceman who'll measure up your furnace and tell you exactly which size coal you should burn for the best heating results. And folks, while the serviceman is there, ask him for a demonstration of that great little time, trouble, and fuel saver, the blue coal heat regulator. This simple device automatically controls the furnace dampers from upstairs. It keeps your home at a normal, even, healthful temperature at all times without any attention from you. And besides, it quickly pays for itself in fuel savings. Thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. We now bring you an episode from real life. Proving that crime does not pay. James Woodward was rough, tough, reckless. A hold-up man afraid of nothing. Early one morning, he walked down 119th Street in New York City, 
spotted a likely victim, drew his gun and shoved it into the man's ribs. Not a squawk out of you. Keep your hands down. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Oh, tough guy. <clears throat> Give me that wallet. You made a bad mistake, James Woodward. The man you robbed is a plain clothes policeman. Halt! Halt or I'll shoot! Oh, my head! My head! Inside the hospital with a head wound and a charge of attempted robbery against him went Amateur Hold Up Man Woodward. A bloody warning that the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story produced by the DLNW Coal Company, distributors of Blue Coal. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Protect yourself against the quick weather changes that are so common this time of the year by heating your home with blue coal. You'll find this fine fuel gives you new and greater satisfaction because it's especially prepared for home heating. It's delivered to your home in just the right size for greatest efficiency. That means warmth even on the coldest days. It means money saved, too, on fuel costs. Remember, when you buy blue coal, you save money by buying the best. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow and have him fill your bin with the always clean and dependable blue coal. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, Death Gives an Encore. <laughs> As the surgeon knows, the phenomenon called life is a delicate balance. To tamper with that balance is to upset it, and to upset it is to create a monster, neither living nor dead. A creature with no conscience, no mind of its own, but obeying the will of its bloodthirsty master. This is the story of a scientist who walked a road no mortal man dare travel. And in conclusion, gentlemen of the Biologist Society... May I say that I have actually seen cases of this living surgery in the Orient. I have seen whole parts of bodies transplanted successfully. Vital organs removed from one person and grafted onto another. Well, I rather... Professor Gando, Professor Gando, may I say you leave so much to the imagination. Are you implying that I... I lie, Professor Wallace? I'm not implying. I say that you're a fraud and have no business here addressing a group of scientists. Oh, yeah, right. I quite agree with that, yes. Well, Gondo, 
Where is the proof of your statements on living surgery? For ten years, Wallace, you have attempted to ruin me. I have given you no reason, no cause for these unjustified attacks on me. Proof? Where's your proof? You have seen my collection of photographs of actual cases. Six, every one of them. You'll pay for this, Professor Wallace. I might add that you're a much better photographer than you are a man of science. <laughs> yes, you'll pay for this, Professor Wallace. You'll pay <laughs> Read all about it. Knifer Williams dies tonight in chair. Knifer Williams to be executed tonight. Read all about it. This is the end of the road for you, Williams. Have you any last words? Any last requests? Yeah, Warden. Free my hands and give me a knife. I see, Williams. Still unrepentant. May the Lord see fit to pardon your sins. All right. Knifer Williams is dead. Hello, Commissioner Weston speaking. Hello, Commissioner Weston. This is Warden Sloan of the state prison speaking. Yes, Warden, yes. Commissioner Knifer Williams' body was placed in the prison morgue and... Did you call me at four o'clock in the morning to tell me that? No, sir. What then? His hands, Commissioner... His hands have been amputated. Amputated? They're missing. Good Lord, missing. Why? I don't know, sir. It looks like the job of a skilled surgeon. In some way, someone got into the morgue and mutilated William's body. Mr. Bartolini's not in his dressing room, Mr. McManus. Hey. I went in to check on his costumes. Not there? No, sir. What does trapeze act as a star act on the bill? Now, what can we tell the audience? Well, that's your business, well, sir. Well, you know they only come to see Bartolini's triple somersault in midair. Everything's gone from his dressing room, sir. Clue the coupe. I don't know, sir. There's only a large wooden box there. Box? Well, let me see it. Come on. You know, Mr. McManus, I have a strange feeling about this. There's been a man... Oh, here it is, Mr. McManus. Hmm. Sort of looks like a small coffin, don't it? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I'm going to open that box. Oh, wait a minute. What's this? There's a note attached to the side. Uh, it says, Bartolini won't need these anymore. It's unsigned. Well, I don't get it. Open the box. All right. <gasps> oh! Just his arms. Bartolini's two arms in the box. Amputated at the shoulder. I don't suppose you remember me, Mr. Cranston. I met you several years ago in the Orient. Well, as a matter of fact, Professor Wallace, I remember you quite well. You were doing research work in tropical diseases at the time. Yes, that's quite right. And if I'm not mistaken, you are something of a student of criminology. Oh, why? Well, it's for that reason that I've asked you here tonight. Well, criminology is just a hobby, Professor Wallace, but I am very much interested in the subject. That's a masterpiece of understatement. <laughs> what was that? Oh, nothing. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Please go on. Oh, yes. Well, to come to the point, what would you say, Mr. Cranston, if I were to tell you that I have for the last several years been driving a man systematically insane? What are you saying? Wait, please, hear me out. First, hear my reasons before you condemn me. Please go on. I assure you my motives are above censure when judged in the light of medical science. Drive a man insane? Well, do you think that by doing that that you're helping mankind? Yes, I do, Miss Lane. See, this man's brain was warped before he ever crossed my path. I immediately recognized the danger in allowing this man to continue with his diabolical experiments. Experiments with living bodies. Oh, Lamont. I don't believe I quite understand, Professor Wallace. Experiments with living surgery, Mr. Cranston. The grafting of arms and legs and vital organs from one body to another. Oh. The man's name is Gondo, a brilliant biologist whose intense work in the field of biological research twisted his mind. Mm -hmm. There's no telling what horrible crime he might not commit in his effort to prove his theories. Oh, why wasn't some effort made to cure him? Cure is out of the question, Miss Lane. That horrible obsession is beyond medical aid. I see. So my sole purpose was to make Professor Gondo commit some act of violence toward me. Then I could have him sent away to some institution where he'd be safe. And at last, I think I have succeeded. Read this note I just received. Mm -hmm. What does it say, Lamont? My brain against yours, Professor. The body of a skilled gymnast, and in a murderer's hand, cold steel thirsting for your blood. Tonight, 
Uh, it's unsigned. It's undoubtedly from my friend, Gundo. Well, you don't seem very much upset by that threatening note, Professor Wallace. Well, Miss Lane, my apartment here is 22 floors off the street, and the halls are guarded by private detectives. Lamont, look. Where? Look out the window over there. I saw someone on the window ledge of the building across the court. Why, that's impossible. There's not enough ledge on those windows for a cat to walk on. Well, I can't see anybody. It's too dark. Anyway. Well, I'm sure I saw someone for a moment. Probably your nerves, Margot. I can't say. I blame you after hearing that. What was that? It came from my study. My assistant, Peterson, is going over some notes of mine in there. Come on. Yes. Yes, of course. Oh. Oh, no. Don't look, Margot. Peterson. He's dead first. Stabbed through the throat with a knife. No, Wallace. Not stabbed. The knife was thrown. And look, the window was slightly open at a level with his head. Thrown? Miss Lane was right about seeing someone across the way. Uh, careful, Wallace. The killer may still be there. Look out! What was that? Another knife. There's a note attached to it. Read it, Francis. Yes. Fear festers like an evil disease. The first knife was to plant the infection. The next to drain your life's blood. <laughs> Card owner. Call me back here at Professor Wallace's apartment. Well, Commissioner? It seems Miss Lane was right about seeing somebody across this court. My men have found a good set of fingerprints on the ledge of that window across there. Uh-huh. They're checking through the files now. We were sure of that before you found the prints, Commissioner. Well, of course. Valdemir Gondo's fingerprints. And how do you know this guy Gondo sent Professor Wallace the note? It wasn't signed. He threatened me before. Oh, wait, wait. Step by step, Professor. Step by step. Now, while you're all sitting in here, Miss Lane sees somebody across the court, 20-some stories off the street and hanging on the ledge. Hanging on a ledge, mind you, like a fool monkey. Why, it'd have to be another Bartolini to do that. Bartolini? Yes, that's the name I was trying to remember. Bartolini, the great trapeze performer. So you think it's Bartolini, huh? It could have been, Commissioner. Yeah, yeah, it could have been, Miss Lane. However, it seems that somebody bumped Mr. Bartolini off some three weeks ago. Yes, that's it. And sent his arms back in a box. That mutilation slaying, do you remember it, Professor Wallace? Yes, his arms were severed at the shoulder. The rest of his body hasn't been found. Cranston, do you think there's a possibility that Gondo succeeded in his experiment? Now, wait, I, I'll answer. It's probably for me. Hello? Yes, yeah, speaking. Oh, yes, Cardona, you checked the prints. All right. Well, whose are they? Whose? Uh, check them again. You heard me check them again, and if you give me the same answer, you're fired. Ridiculous. Whose fingerprints were they, Commissioner? Dope, in a fish. I'm going to clean out that whole fingerprint department. Whose prints were they? He said they were Knifer Williams' prints. And Knifer Williams died in the electric chair four weeks ago. Act two of Death Gives an Encore will continue in just a moment. Meanwhile... Here's a reminder to get in touch with your blue coal dealer so you'll be prepared for anything the weatherman has in store for you. You can keep your home at just exactly the temperature you want with blue coal. Comfortably warm and yet not too hot because blue coal burns evenly and smoothly. In fact, this superior home fuel is especially prepared, sized, and carefully graded for home use. Yes, it fits the requirements of your furnace. It's tailor-made for your home. That's why you're sure of complete satisfaction when you heat with blue coal. You not only get comfortable, dependable warmth, but besides that, this tested superior home fuel is a money saver. It burns so efficiently that you enjoy real economy with blue coal. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Now here's a special announcement about the Mystic Shadow Ring. This is an exotic white ring that holds light and afterward glows weirdly in the darkness. You can get this ring simply by sending 10 cents with your name and address to The Shadow, Post Office Box 5, Madison Square Station, New York City. Send in right away for your mystic shadow ring. Now, back to The Shadow. <laughs> earth you make of this whole business? Margot, I don't think Bartolini is dead. Everything points to the fact that Gondo was successful in his experiments. Well, then the creature I saw on that window ledge... May have been the trained acrobat Bartolini with the grafted arms of the Knifer Williams. Oh, but how could Gondo control the brain of his monster? I don't know that, Margot. 
But the shadow is going to interview Professor Gondo in his laboratory. Perhaps he will find the answer there. Soon. Proof you want to, there? Well, proof you shall have. <laughs> huh? Professor Gondo. What? I heard something. There's nobody here. You're wrong, Professor Gondo. The shadow is also here. Where? Where? I don't see anyone. The shadow cannot be seen by your eyes. Why did you come here? I want to know about your experiments in living surgery. Living surgery? Why do you want to know? An attempt was made on the life of Professor Wallace tonight. You are under suspicion. Suspicion? Do you admit, Professor Gondo, I you... do not admit anything, Shadow. But I can tell you frankly, I would like to see him dead. I hate him. And you tried to kill him? No. No, Shadow. If I were to kill Professor Wallace, mind you, I say if, it would be with these two hands. And not the hands of Knifer Williams grafted to the body of Bartolini, grafted by you as an instrument of your revenge? You speak in riddles, Shadow. I do not understand. Perhaps you find it convenient not to understand, Gondo. What's that? Someone is tapping on my window. Gondo, stay away from that window. I must see what it is. <laughs> there is no one here. Come away from that window. <laughs> Gondo! Dead. Killed by a thrown knife. Extra paper, read all about it. No knife slaying. Professor Gondo, third victim of fiendish knife murderer. Police request anyone with possible clues to identity of murderer to come forward. Police request anyone with possible, with possible clues, clues to identity, to identity of, murderer of murderer to come, come forward. forward. Commissioner Weston stated this morning that, in his opinion, the killings have not reached an end. The murderer said he will attempt... attempt to cover his tracks by killing anyone whom he believes can reveal him. Reveal him? Yes, yes, of course. Hello? Operator, get me police headquarters. Immediately. Oh, I hope it isn't too late. Hello? Police? I must speak to Commissioner Weston. Hurry, please. I think I can identify the knife murderer. Yes. Well, I'm the wardrobe mistress for Romero Brothers Circus, and I remember the man who was last seen with Mr. Bartolini. And if I'm in danger because of that... What? Oh, yes, I'd know him in a minute. He knew Mr. Bartolini and was always around. He seemed to take an unusual interest in Mr. Bartolini. Mr. Bartolini! You... You are going to die, Mrs. Donner. You are going to die. Mr. Bartolini, that knife. What are you going to do with that knife? I must kill you. No. You must be put out of the way. Oh, Mr. Bartolini, what have I ever done to you? Oh, please. No! No, don't throw that knife! Ah! I tell you, Cranston, I was talking to the woman on the phone when it happened. She was just going to give me a description of the murderer when she met her death, a knife in her throat. Now, uh, what I can't understand is her calling out Bartolini's name. Bartolini? Well, Lamont, then you were right about his not being dead. It begins to look that way, Margot. Not dead. Bartolini's amputated arms were sent back in a box. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's dead. Now, don't try to tell me my business. I say that there have been four murders. Bartolini, Peterson, Gondo, and now Mrs. Dorner, the wardrobe mistress at the circus. You're leaving out something very important, Commissioner. Yeah, you fascinate me, my amateur sleuth. What is it? Not it, Commissioner. Knifer Williams. Knifer Williams was executed four weeks before Peterson was murdered. Fingerprints don't lie, Commissioner. Well, somebody is. Have you ever heard of living surgery, Commissioner? <laughs> Look, Cranston, Professor Wallace told me all about that business of grafting arms and legs from one person to another. He says it's the bunk. Still doesn't believe it, eh? Of course not. Tell me, Commissioner, since Gondo's death, has Professor Wallace asked you to have the police guard removed? Uh, yes, he just called about an hour ago and said he wouldn't need them anymore. And you called them off? Certainly. Why shouldn't I? Because, Commissioner, I have reason to believe that the murderer will strike again tonight. Well, Mr. Cranston, Miss Lane, you've searched my apartment and laboratory from one end to the other. You're satisfied now there's no one lurking here? Satisfied isn't the word. I'm relieved. Well, surely, since Gondo's dead, Mr. Cranston, there's nothing for me to fear. Well, don't forget that Mrs. Dorner, the wardrobe mistress, was killed after Gondo. Mm -hmm. And by the same murderer. I, uh, 
I can't help admiring your bravery, Professor Wallace. But aren't you overlooking the facts? Yes, yes, that is quite true. On the mind of this monster, the hypnotic thought may still be implanted to murder you. Yes, that's very true, Mr. Cranston. Well, in that event, is there anything else here in my apartment you'd care to examine? Any place where the killer may be hiding? Mm, well, come to think of it, I did notice a fire escape off one of the back rooms. Do you mind if I look it over? No, no, please go right ahead. Now, wait here, Margot. I'll be back in a few minutes. All right, Lamont. Don't be gone too long. I won't. A very clever young man, Miss Lane. Very clever. Well, he has a way of tracking down a criminal, no matter how brilliant or how cunning. Yes, I suspected as well. You'll pardon me, Miss Lane, but I've been looking at your hands. You're a musician, aren't you? <laughs> well, I'd play the piano after a fashion. Just after a fashion? Well, that's too bad. With your hands, you should play magnificently. Uh, yes? Well, thank you. And don't thank me yet. What do you mean? I'm going to give you the name of a very fine piano teacher. See, I think I have his card right here in the desk. I'm oh, sure I have it someplace. I... Oh, hello, look at this. Well, what a strange-looking bottle. It's carved jade, isn't it? Yes, I picked it up in my travels in the Orient. It contains a very rare and exotic perfume. <laughs> I've forgotten all about it. It must have been in a drawer here. Here, it's yours. Oh, no, I couldn't accept it. Oh, please, it. I insist. I haven't any use for it. You may find it very interesting. Well, how nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Smell it. It has a very delicate, very wonderful scent. Mmm. Mmm, it's wonderful. I... Uh, it's wonderful. I neglected to tell you, my dear Miss Lane, that it is a powerful hypnotic drug as well. Now, Miss Lane, you're going to aid me. Yes, aid me to get rid of your friend Lamont Cranston. Now listen to me and obey. You must obey every command. Yes. Yes, I must obey. Well, the drug is working well. Now to release my killer... The I press the button, and the panel slides open. Your clever friend Cranston overlooked that when he searched this apartment. Bartolini, come. I have another little job for you. I hear you, Master. Good. Now for the final ironical touch, the final sardonic gesture. Miss Lane, you will send this monster after Lamont Cranston. No. You will command him to destroy him. No. Command him. Uh, you... We'll go to the fire escape. Yes. Yes. You will find a knife in your hand. Yes, the knife. Then you will... You will... Kill him. Uh, you will kill him. <laughs> good, good. You hear your orders, Bartolini? I hear. I hear. Then carry them out. Yes, master. <laughs> think you could escape punishment for your crimes, Professor Wallace. What? Who said that? The shadow, Professor Wallace. You can't see me because I've cast a hypnotic mist over your mind. Shadow? It was a brilliant plan of yours, Wallace, to accuse Gondo of the murders, to make it appear that he was the creator of this monster with the body of Bartolini and the arms of Knifer Williams when it was you. <laughs> then to make it look as if you were the target of the attack rather than the attacker. And now you know, Shadow. I ordered my killer here to murder Gondo and Peterson and then Mrs. Dorner, yes. My tracks are well covered, too. Not well enough to deceive the shadow. Don't you understand, shadow? You are to be the last link in the chain, the last one to die. Professor Wallace, this is the end of your criminal career. Let's drop this pretense, Mr. Cranston. Cranston? Yes, I can see you quite well. You forget that I, too, know something of hypnosis. You're my prisoner. You're going to die along with your friend, Miss Lane, here. All except her hands, which I shall use again. So... It is to be a contest between the power of darkness and light, Professor Wallace. And the dark shall win, Mr. Cranston. I'll make the first move in our mental chess game. Bartolini, grab her. Hold her. Yes, Master. Margo. There, Master. I've got her. Margo. Make one move and she dies, Mr. Cranston. Up on the window ledge with her, Bartolini. Yes, Master. Uh, you see how helpless you are, Shadow? One move from you and I'll order Bartolini to plunge from that window with her. Twenty-two stories to the street. Bartolini, come down from that ledge. There's a cloud over your mind. <laughs> this man is evil. He has made you do evil things. Who speaks to me? I speak to you, your master. I command you to hear only my voice. Yes. Obey only my commands. Yes. Bartolini, yes. listen to me. Uh. You are a man, not a slave. Uh. I speak to the man, Bartolini. Uh. Not to the monster created by Professor Wallace. Bartolini. Rebel. Rebel against him. Yes. Yes, I will try. No. Try. No, you cannot disobey me. I will help you, Bartolini. Come down from that ledge. Yes. Put Miss Lane yes. down safely. Yes. 
I must fight. So, Bartolini. Yes, I will put her down safely, Shadow. Bartolini! I have broken your power over his mind, Wallace. The power of good will. Not yet, Shadow. You may control his mind, but the hands of Knifer Williams will act for me. Bartolini, the knife. Hmm. The knife in the hands of the knifer. Kill the Shadow. You can see him. Throw your knife. Yes, a knife in my hands. But these are not my hands. They feel strange to me. Kill him, Bartolini. As if they had a life of their own. Kill him. The shadow can be seen by you. I can't see anything but you. You. You taught me to use these hands to kill. Now I use them to kill you. No, no, no. Don't throw that knife. Stop, Bartolini. No. I've killed him. These hands have killed him. Bartolini, listen to me. No. I have no control over them. They don't belong to me. They're killer's hands. I must get away. I am Bartolini, the great Zapisa. I can escape. Stay away from that escape. lake. Escape. Look out. Escape. You're telling two stories about the streets. Escape. Bartolini. <laughs> the phenomenon called life is a delicate balance. To tamper with that balance is to upset it. And to upset it is to create a monster. This was the story of a scientist who walked a road no mortal man dare travel. In just a moment, we'll bring you a special feature of America at War. But first, we present John Barclay, Blue Coal's home heating expert. Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Most of you folks drive cars, I take it. But I'll wager that you wouldn't think of driving any car unless you were sure the accelerator and brakes were in good operating condition. That's common sense, because they control the speed of the car. Well, in heating your home, the dampers on your furnace should be operated correctly, for these dampers control the burning speed of your fire. So if you aren't sure how to set the dampers for best results, and if you're not getting your money's worth in real heating comfort, call your neighborhood blue coal dealer. He'll be glad to send his John Barclay service man around to inspect your furnace. And remember, friends, this man has been trained in economical home heating. He'll look your furnace over and tell you frankly if adjustments are needed to improve its operation. What's more, he'll show you how to regulate your dampers properly. You see, he is genuinely interested in your getting satisfactory results and using the smallest possible amount of fuel. And folks... This is an exclusive blue coal service. If you have any heating problem, call your friendly neighborhood blue coal dealer. You'll find him courteous and anxious to cooperate. I thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Somewhere off the east coast of the United States, a ship is creeping forward in darkness. And with good reason. Like assassins in the night, enemy submarines stalk the merchant ships and close in for the kill. All the torpedo tubes ready. Stand by to fire on order. Ach, Himmel, what's this? Coast Guard approaching. Dive. Dive, you hear me? United States Coast Guard ship is almost over us. They're trapped. United States Coast Guard patrol reporting, sighted submarine, submarine sunk. The United States Coast Guard packs a deadly wallop, and the Axis knows it. Like to take a good crack at the Axis yourself? Then join the Coast Guard. You'll have plenty of action, plenty of thrills, and the sure knowledge that you're doing your bit for your country and the front lines of defense. If you are qualified as a machinist, carpenter, cook, or yeoman you may get immediate petty officer rating. See your nearest Coast Guard recruiting station right away. Teach the Axis that for nations, justice for men... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadows' daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen. 
And be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story was produced by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of blue... of the shadow, the hard and relentless fight of one man against the forces of evil. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The Office of Defense Transportation has asked all coal dealers to reduce mileage of their delivery trucks 25% below the mileage of last year. This means fuel deliveries will have to be carefully planned. Duplicate trips into the same neighborhood eliminated whenever possible. Yes, every ounce of rubber, every gallon of gasoline, every transportation factor must be conserved. You can help by advising your fuel dealer of exactly what your fuel requirements are for the entire winter. This will enable him to work out a schedule of deliveries so that valuable time rubber, and gasoline will be conserved. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Lady in Black. Will not consider any motion picture author for my new play... Until... Yeah? What is it? Oh, I see. Uh, put it down over there. Yes, Mr. Price. Where are you going? Get away from that picture. How dare you draw the curtain that covers it? What? What's that you've got in your hand? Keep away from me. There's a gun in this drawer and I'll use it. I give you time. Let go of me. There. There. Now we'll take this gun of yours, Mr. Bryce, and... Lamont, look here. Yes, Mom. Did you notice this painting? No. But it's certainly the strangest one in the whole picture gallery. That's such an odd, morbid quality. Is it signed? No. But judging by the odd hook-shaped brush strokes, I... I'd guess it was painted by Albert Gurner. Albert Gurner? I don't think I've ever heard of him. Oh, he wasn't widely known as a painter. He was really a chemist. Painting was a hobby. Oh? There aren't more than half a dozen of his pictures in existence. What a shame. It's a great talent. Yes, Gurner was a genius in a way. Poor fellow. Why, poor fellow? Well, when he was young, Gurner married Diane Morrow. Fifteen years ago, she was one of the most beautiful young actresses on the stage. Gurner was madly in love with her. And one evening, a servant standing outside her door heard him talking to his wife as he sketched her. He was saying, I'll finish this drawing in a minute. I know it's almost time for dinner. Yes, you told me Norman Bryce is coming. Darling, he's done so much for your career. As much as a manager could, so you must make a good impression. 
I'm glad you decided to wear black. You're exquisite. Your eyes are such a deep blue looking at me with that half smile on your face. I must do this picture in oils. Oh, my darling, I love you so much. So very much. Oh, that's Walter, my dear. I rang for him a moment ago. I'll speak to him outside in the hall. Yes, Walter. You rang, sir? Uh, yes, those flowers in Mrs. Gurner's room. While we're at dinner, move them out onto the terrace. I'm afraid the heat of the room will wither them. Yes, sir. And uh, there'll only be three of us for dinner. Mr. Bryce is coming along. Uh, what was that, sir? It sounded like a shot. In here. Oh. oh. Diane. Good heavens. Look. There's the revolver she did it with. Killed herself. Killed herself. Oh, no. I was talking to her only a moment ago. And now... Now she's dead. Diane. 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 So that's the story, Mongo. And I wonder why she would kill herself. A girl who had so much. Well, there was some talk at the time of murder. But our room was on the second floor, and no one could have gotten in and out of the windows that quickly. The only other entrance was the door. And Gurner himself and the servant were standing outside of it in the hall when they heard the shot. Yes. Gurner went to pieces after that. Completely broken. He went to the Orient and died there about four years ago. Huh. Well, it seems so. Why, Commissioner Weston. Well, uh, hello, Margo. Hello, Lamont. Hello, hello Commissioner. Fancy beating you of all places in an art gallery. I'm here on business, not to look at a lot of silly pictures. Oh? Norman Bryce has been killed and I... Bryce? The theatrical producer? Yeah. Why, Lamont just mentioned him. And we saw his new show last night, a big hit. Yeah, I know. I'm taking personal charge of the Investigation? Investigation? You, you mean he'd suicide, or so the circumstances seem to point. But, Commissioner, does a man kill himself after one of the biggest hits of his career? This man did. I've just discovered something else. Bryce was here at the art gallery this morning, bought a lot of stuff and ordered it delivered. Not to his home, but to an apartment downtown. Oh, you don't say. Yeah. Well, i got to be going. Things to attend to. See you soon. Yes. Goodbye, Commissioner. Well, Lamont, are you going to stand there all evening staring at that painting? Mm hmm? Oh, no. Come on. Let's get out of here. Where are we going? Out to the home of the late Norman Bryce. <laughs> Aren't you going to ring the bell, Lamont? Oh, yes, yes. Well, this tragedy ends the story, Margo. You mean Mrs. Gurner killed herself? Gurner died and now Bryce. Exactly. Oh, hello, Cardona. Oh, hello, Mr. Cranston. Oh, and Miss Lane. Hello, how are you? Well, come on on in. The commissioner's in the dining room making out papers. Uh, in this way. Look who's here, Commissioner. Well, hello, Lamont. Miss Lane. Hello, Mr. Commissioner. Again, eh? Well, what do you want? I was interested in Bryce's death, Commissioner. This plain case of suicide. A piece of papers to fill out and then we'll close the case. The body's been taken away? Yeah. Want to take a look at the room where it happened? Oh, yes. Will you come, Margo? Yes, I'd like to. Uh, you're welcome to go in that room. Well, what do you mean by that, Cardona? Cardona says he feels as if somebody was watching him in that room. Really? Well, there is something about the room. Go on, take a look. Here's the key, Margo. Thanks. Right down the hall, that way. What's the matter? Doesn't the key work? Margo, what is it? There's someone in there. <laughs> there is. Somebody's holding the door shut. Well, how could anyone get in there with the police guarding the house? Here, let me have the key. I want the door's unlocked. But there's someone inside putting his weight against it. Here, I'll open it. <laughs> you see? Well. Yeah. Wait till I turn on the lights. <laughs> you may come in now. We're quite alone. Oh, just the same. There was something holding that door shut. Margot. Why, Lamont, look at the flowers. The room's filled with them. Yes. Yes, so I see. And they give off quite a fragrance. Mm. Now, careful, don't touch them. Why? All we're permitted to do is look. Ah, uh -huh. that door, the only entrance to the room. Small window and alcove open, but too small for an intruder to crawl through. These other two windows? Yeah. 
Both locked and... <laughs> Only the door, my dear. But, but it closed all by itself. I think our donor was right. You do feel that there's someone in here. Someone besides ourselves. Lamont, hmm? why should there be curtains on that wall? Let's see what's behind them. All right. Oh, a picture of a lady in black. How horrible. And yet it's beautiful, too. Margot, it's a painting of Diane Morrow, Mrs. Gurner. Gurner must have painted it. And I suppose Bryce bought it after Mrs. Gurner's death. Evidently. Lamont, it's this painting that gives you the feeling that someone's in this room. Oh, it's creepy. The eyes seem to be watching you. With that queer half smile on her face. Margot, what else do you notice about the canvas? The background. Very dim, but it, it's filled with flowers. Yes, so it is. But what I meant was this. Here in the lower corner, someone started to slash this canvas with a knife. Why, yes. A picture of Diane Morrow in black. I wonder when Gunner painted it. Just before she died? Or just after? Lamont, what do you mean? Well, all right, Miss Lane. Cranston, you through? Uh, not quite, Weston. Look, uh, did you notice this picture? I know. Uh, it's sort of strange thing, isn't it? Yes, especially the smile on her face. Wait. The corpse. Mr. Bryce was smiling. Same sort of a smile. I see. Commissioner... Don't declare Bryce's death a suicide, hmm? because it was murder. In a moment, we'll return to the shadow. But first, here's a brief little drama that directly concerns you. Listen. Hello? Hunter Coal Company. Uh, this is Mrs. Smith, 202 Main Street. Uh, will you please send over 10 tons of blue coal immediately? Well, Mrs. Smith, I'm afraid we can't send you that much right now. Uh, how much do you have on hand? Oh, I don't know, but it's not a very big pile. Well, we want everyone to have enough coal for immediate needs, you know. Oh, I need 10 tons. Uh, Cash deliver it to me now. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, but the Robinsons next door to you also need coal. And the Joneses down the street are in need of coal, too. Now, we're making a delivery at both places soon. We'll stop at your place, too. But not ten tons. You realize we must make sure that everyone has some coal in the bin. I know you won't want to deprive your neighbors of heat. Oh, of course not. I, uh, I just didn't realize, that's all. Well, do what you can, then, will you? I certainly don't want my neighbors to be entirely without coal. Let's all cooperate. Share and share alike, and we'll all be warm this winter. Now... Back to the shadow. I'm relying on this hunch of yours that it's murder, Cranston. Cardona's rounding up the three people who found Bryce dead. Who are they, Commissioner? A neighbor named Carter, the gardener, Muller, I think his name is, and the widow. Now, if you get any ideas, Lamont, speak up. I will. Tom? Oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Miss Lane, Mr. Carter, Mr. Cranston. Hi, Mr. Carter. Tom, please. Oh, thank you. You were with Mrs. Bryce when she found the body, I believe. Why, uh, she called him in, asked me to come over. You, uh, live nearby? Uh, next door. I just happened to be standing, talking over the hedge with Mr. Bryce's gardener when she called. And you both ran to the house? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Bryce said she'd heard something that sounded like a shot from the library. Uh, did you yourself hear that shot? No, uh, I can't say that I did. All right, sir, that'll be all. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Carter. Yes. Yeah. Aren't you an actor? Uh, yes, I am. Weren't you supposed to play the lead in Bryce's show, which opened Thursday night? Well, uh, I read that you were in rehearsal, and then that Bryce had dropped you at the last moment. Is that true? I resigned. I wasn't fired. I... That's all. You may go. But don't leave town, understand? But uh, that's all. Very well. Uh, it could be a motive for murder, being fired. It was a good part, and his successor made a hit. I see. Um. Come in, Muller. Where were you, Muller, when Mrs. Bryce called to you? Why, uh, in the garden, working, sir. 
and uh, talking to Mr. Carter. How far is the garden from the house, Mr. Muller? It's different in different places. Uh, the lot is an odd shape. My cottage is at the back. I see. I've uh, just been sketching a ground plan of the house and gardens. Uh, will you check on it and see if it's right, please? May I see it, sir? Yes. Uh, no, no, that is wrong. It should well, go... Uh, take my pencil and correct it, if you will. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, now, it, it goes like this, uh -huh. and... Uh, Did you hear that shot, Muller? Huh? Oh, oh, the shot. Pardon me, I was absorbed in this drawing, and... No, I, I heard no shot. But I was some distance off. At this spot in the plan. I see. Was there any difficulty about opening the library door? Well, uh, yes and no. Yes and no? What do you mean? Well, Mrs. Price was in the house when she heard the shot, and she ran to the library, but she couldn't get the door open, and then she came and called to Mr. Carter and me. Did you and Carter have any trouble opening it? No, sir. What time was it when Mrs. Price called to you and Carter? About four o'clock, because I noticed the clock in the library said five minutes after four. We have a common interest. A common interest. Flowers. Those from your garden are magnificent. Oh, yes. This year the garden was particularly lovely. And I don't think there's ever been a time when we've had such beautiful geraniums. Yes, sir. Geraniums? They're a common flower, but Muller grows such beautiful ones. I see. Mrs. Price, how long has Muller been with you? Since April. Did Muller and Mr. Bryce get along well? I doubt if they ever spoke ten words to each other. Mr. Bryce was away a good deal? Yes. Mrs. Bryce, I understand you've been away on a visit and returned this afternoon. What time did the train get in? At 2.40. You came directly home? Yes, sir. Now, when did you hear the shot? Just as I opened the front door. Mrs. Bryce Muller told me that you didn't call him until a few minutes after 4 o'clock. Well, I don't see... It would see. take a taxi about 20 minutes to cover the distance from the station. So if your train arrived at 2.40, you'd be entering the house about 3 o'clock. Yes, but I... Why, after hearing the shot, did you wait an hour before you called the Carter? I, I wasn't sure it was a shot. I, I thought it was a door slamming somewhere. I thought my husband was at home. Oh, so you didn't pay much attention to it then? No, sir. I, I decided it was just... Uh -huh. And then about an hour later, you went to the library. Yes, I... I I found the door was stuck, so I, I called to Mr. Carter. Why didn't you call your husband? I didn't know he was at home. A moment ago, you said you thought he was home. Yes, but I... Mrs. We... Bryce, isn't it true that you and your husband have been separated for the past six months? Hasn't he been living in an apartment downtown? Yes, but... He does come home occasionally. He comes when I'm not around. He has a picture in the library. He comes to look at it. A picture? A painting of a woman... A woman all dressed in black. He used to sit there at his desk sometimes and stare at it for hours. He was in love with it. He was in love with that woman just the same as if she were a real flesh and blood person. That's what caused our quarrel. <laughs> Mrs. Bryce, you're nervous and upset, naturally. We'll postpone this talk till some other time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. West. Well. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Bryce. Goodbye. Hey, what kind of a nitwit does she think I am? You were right, Lamont. It's murder. And she's the one who killed him. No, Weston. She's telling the truth. Lamont, Mrs. Bryce is really jealous of that painting. And yet she doesn't know that it's a picture of Diane Morrow. Miss Lane, Diane Morrow and Albert Gurner, too, are dead. Yes, the lady in black is dead, Commissioner. But sometimes the dead don't remain in their graves. <laughs> This room now. The smell of the flowers. Oh, Norman. Norman, what made you kill yourself? If only the dead could speak to us. Norman. Norman, why did you marry me? And all the time you loved the woman in black? I hate her. What? What a canvas. The canvas is cut already. Here at the bottom. Why, the frame moves. There's a space behind it. Sort of closet. And what's this? It, it looks like a gas mask with, with a tank attached. Who's there? 
What do you want? Give that to me. What are you doing here? Is this gas mask yours? Give it to me. I see now. Norman didn't kill himself. He was murdered, this mask. You killed him, didn't you? I killed him. Let go of me. What are you doing? Take that away. Oh, oh. What time is it anyway, Lamont? Two o'clock, Mother. Two o'clock in the morning. It's a fine hour for a country drive. You didn't need to come out to Bryce's. Well, I'm too curious to stay at home and be left out of it. Lamont, this case haunts me. There's something evil about it. That smile on the face of that painting. Now, what about the smile on Bryce's face? A smiling corpse, Margot. Yes. A horrible criminal is loose and doing murder. And the murderer may strike again. Oh, here we are. Uh, quiet now. Uh, don't talk. Let's walk in the grass beside the walk. Come along. Who's there? What do you want? It's Cranston, Cardona. Oh, Miss Lane. What in time are you doing here? Has anything happened? Perfectly quiet. The actor next door went up to bed at 11. Light in the library a few minutes ago. Mrs. Bryce, I guess. But didn't you make sure? She's the only one in the house. Must have been her. How about Muller, the gardener? Light's been out in his cottage for a couple of hours. Everything's serene. How was that? A shot from the library. Come on in there. Hurry. Mrs. Bryce. Shot to death. Oh, and that smile on her face. It's the same smile as in the painting. Oh, it's horrible. Suicide again. Hey, look, Mr. Cranston. This gun ain't no new kind. Must be 15 to 20 years old. Yes, I know. Bryce's gun was at headquarters, so he had to use this one. What do you mean, he? The woman shot it off. I don't want to go phone Weston quickly. Yeah, I'd better. Mont, what does it mean? Margot, don't leave the house. I won't be long. Where are you going? The shadow has work to do. Who's there? Who is it? I must have imagined someone knocked. My nerves are playing tricks on me. This won't do. When they come to tell me I've got to be calm, I'll go to bed. Wait a moment, Albert Garner. What? Who spoke? <laughs> Where are you? It's no use to try to locate me with your flashlight. I am the shadow. Huh? You cannot see me, Gurner. Why do you call me Gurner? My name is Muller. I work here. I, I'm the gardener. Yes, a gardener with a remarkable knowledge of chemistry. You were a chemist, Gurner, as well as a painter, weren't you? I'm no chemist or painter. Then why did you slash the picture of the lady in black to pieces? Mrs. Price did that. She was jealous of the lady in black. How did you know that the picture was slashed unless you were there? I... I won't stay here and... Get away from that door. No, you don't. Get back. No. Let me alone. Let me alone. That face in the picture has haunted you all the years. Albert Gurner, the lady in black, was your wife. You murdered her. Yes. Yes, I am Gurner. But I didn't kill Diane. She committed suicide. You murdered her with a poisonous gas that you invented. It leaves no trace except a horrible smile on the faces of its victims. I tell you, she shot herself. No, you shot her, Gurner. Then later, when you and the butler heard the explosion, it was a time bomb you had set. And someplace in this cottage, you have a mask for administering gas. You're very strong. You clasp it to the victim's face. And when they become unconscious, you shoot them and leave a pistol by them. And the murder is called suicide. But I love Diane. Why would I kill her? Because you suspected her of being in love with Bryce, her manager. You knew Bryce loved her. And you couldn't be sure of her any longer. All right. All right. It drove me mad, the uncertainty. And you killed her. Yes, I did kill her. Then Bryce saw the picture. I told him once about my experiments. He suspected me. He was going to the police. So I ran away. Then as years passed, you wanted to return and kill the man you thought had ruined your life. The man you were jealous of even after Diane Morrow was dead. Yes. And I did kill him. No one can take that away from me. But tell me, why did you kill Mrs. Bryce? She had done nothing. She found the mask. I had to kill her. Well, Gurner, Commissioner Weston will soon be here. 
You will take the mask and give yourself up to him. Very well. I'll do as you say. I'll go. Kara, wait. Put that down there. No. No. Take off that mask. Take it off, I say. He's gone. Dead from the gas. With that same smile on his face. This table suits you, Margot? Mm, very nicely. Thanks. All right, Louis. We'll order later. Very good, sir. Lamont, what I want to know is how you solved this case. Where did you get your first clue? Why, you gave it to me. I did? Yes. You called my attention to the fact that the background of the painting was composed of flowers, of geraniums. Well? Well, when Diane Morrow died, her room was filled with geraniums. Oh, and you thought that those... And the geraniums in Bryce's library had some connection. Precisely. And the ventilation of Bryce's library. The ventilation? Yes. It had been worked out so that quite a strong draft swept through the room. Why, of course. It was the draft that held the door shut. Yes. And it also caused the door to slam shut so violently when that Mrs. Bryce thought it was a shot long after Bryce was dead. Oh. And the draft also cleared the room of the gas, which smelled like geranium. Well, then the geraniums were there to explain away whatever traces of the gas might be left. Exactly. Only, Lamont, how did you know that Muller was really good? <laughs> that was the simplest part of the case. He helped draw a map of the house and gardens, and he used the same queer, hook-shaped strokes that identify Gurner's work anywhere. Oh, there you are. Oh, hello, Commissioner. I'm sorry I'm late. Well, there's no hurry. We've loads of time. Well, well I am. Uh, we're merely going to drop in at the Pan American Art Exhibit this evening. Uh, the Art Exhibit? Pictures? Oh, uh, why don't you take up something practical? <laughs> You know, folks, there are three ways in which you can help yourself and help him. First, don't order more than enough coal to keep your home comfortably warm for 60 days in advance. Second, don't waste heat. Don't waste coal. Ask your blue coal dealer for the free John Barkley firing chart. This will give you many valuable hints on correct firing methods and how to save money on fuel bills. The third way you can help your dealer is to accept delivery of the available home sizes he recommends. You see, friends, tests have proven that any of the home sizes, egg, stove, chestnut, or pea, may often be interchanged with perfectly good results. In fact, it's a good plan to always order one ton of pea coal to three of your regular size and use the more economic pea coal for banking. This holds down the fire, helps save coal. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you will cooperate with your blue coal dealer in these three ways, I'm sure you'll have enough coal to keep your home healthfully and comfortably warm all this winter. And so will your neighbors. I thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Freedom Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Again next week, the shadow will demonstrate that... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen. This story produced by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of Blue Coal. This is Mutual. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs>
Blue Coal presents The Shadow, the mystery man who strikes terror in the very hearts of sharpsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Ladies and gentlemen, when you hear The Shadow's blood-curdling laugh, you can be sure that exciting entertainment will follow. And here's something else that you can be sure of. When you buy Blue Coal, you're getting the finest of Pennsylvania hard coal. The harmless blue coloring that identifies blue coal is your guarantee of clean, even, safe, dependable heat all winter long. So don't take chances. Insist on blue coal. Ask for it by name. Phone your order to your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. And be sure to hold on for John Barclay's important message at the end of this program. The plot murder announced for today has been postponed. Today, the circle of death. Oh, Jack, what a delightful show. What a wonderful way to start our honeymoon. Darling, when it comes to shows and girls, I'm a swell picker. Now watch me pick a nightclub. Oh, taxi. Hey, taxi. Darling, I think you're wonderful. I've never had such a marvelous time in my life. Hop in, honey. Things are pretty quiet around the theater district tonight, Bill. Yeah, pretty thin crowd. I don't blame folks for staying away. After those three bombings and 15 people being blown to pieces, I wouldn't be here myself if it wasn't the commissioner's orders. Same here. Boy, has this town got the jitters. Commissioner Weston's hopping around like a cat on a hot stove. I hear the Midtown Association is going to ask for his resignation if he don't catch the nut that's scattering bombs around here like confetti on New Year's Eve. A guy that's pulling these jobs sure must have it in for a lot of people. Eh, he's a real screwball, if you ask me. Look at the way he's always sending warnings to the newspapers before he blows another batch of pedestrians to Hades. Yeah, and have you noticed? He always ends his notes by saying, I hate crowds. Yeah. Now, this is the time that crazy goof warned he'd set off another blast. Maybe his, his watch is slow. Things are going to pop if he pulls another job and kills any more people. Well, maybe... Maybe all the cops have him scared off. Maybe. Maybe not. Bill, look at that car. Blown to smithereens. First killer strikes again. Five more dead. Get your paper here, paper. Read all about the mad maniacs later in It's horrible, Lamont, horrible. It's senseless and insane, Marco. Crimes like this always are. Turn on the radio. It's time for a news bulletin. There's a switch on the dashboard. All right, Lamont. Back upon the inefficiency of the police department. Tonight at Midtown Hall, a meeting of businessmen of the entertainment world and property owners is in progress. Police Commissioner Weston has been asked to defend his department and produce results or resign. Oh, that's enough, Marco. Washington, D.C. Now, listen carefully. Yes, Lamont. I want you to go to that protest meeting right over there at Midtown Hall. Commissioner Weston is speaking, and the crowd is pretty certain to heckle his explanation of the failure of his department to catch this fiend. I'm sure of it. Now, here's what I want you to do. Keep quiet and watch your chance. Then I want you to cry out that Shadow could solve this crime without half trying. Aren't you flattering yourself? Never mind that, Margot. I have a very definite reason for doing this. A lot depends on your getting the crowd to take up your suggestion. I'll do my best, Lamont. But where are you going? I won't be far away. Hand me that leather case on the floor. Right. Here you are. Am I permitted enough womanly curiosity to ask what's in it? <laughs> Just a little wire-tapping device. Telephone? No. No, Commissioner Weston will be talking over the loudspeaker system in Midtown Hall. Don't be surprised if the shadow interrupts his speech. Now, remember, Margot, cry out at the psychological moment. Hundreds of lives depend on it. We don't want alibis, Commissioner! We want action, Weston! Crazy man's making a fool of you, Weston! Gentlemen! As I have explained to you, every available resource of the police department has been thrown into catching this fiend. Our bomb squads have cold the city. Every known criminal with psychopathic tendencies has been rounded up and questioned. 
Not one fragment of a bomb has been found. No buildings have been damaged. No one person has been singled out for death. This is not an ordinary crime. We are not dealing with an ordinary criminal. Oh, alibi! Alibi! We've had enough. Fifteen people dead. Fifty injured. You talk. Talk. Business is at a standstill. We're being ruined. The whole city's in a panic. Get this killer or resign, my son. Get out. Let the mayor appoint somebody to the phrase and let the Texas made the action. Before he strikes again. Yes. The shadow could solve this crime without half trying. There's an idea. The shadow. Yes, the shadow, but get him. He's cracked cases for you before, Weston. Why don't you call him in? He wouldn't have to do much to do a better job of it than the police have. Get the Shadow, I said. What about a commissioner? You've done nothing in two weeks. You're a victim. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. What makes you think this man who calls himself the Shadow is interested in law and order? He's helped to crack plenty of criminals, hasn't he? Yes, he's tipped us off occasionally, but it may have been to get rid of rivals. We have no assurance he isn't a criminal himself. What of us? A thief can catch a thief. I don't run my department that way. You're not running it at all. That's a matter of opinion. You're not running it. I was asked here to tell you what we've been doing. You seem to think my department works with the shadow. We don't. We never have. And as for the shadow and you reporters can spread it all over the front pages, I challenge him to uncover one single scrap of evidence that my men have overlooked. I challenge the shadow... To find this maniac. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I am the shadow. I accept that challenge. Commissioner Wesson, I am working on the case. Gentlemen of the press, it will not be necessary for you to print the commissioner's challenge, but you can print this challenge to the arch fiend behind this reign of terror. Print this, gentlemen. The shadow will trap the mass killer if he dares walk through the central arcade during the rush hour between five and six tomorrow night. Remember, the central arcade between five and six tomorrow night. I dare him to come to walk through the central arcade <laughs> Mystery papers celebrate the meeting. Challenges mass killing central arcade. Bring him out the rush hour rendezvous. Hey, yeah, boy, boy, center. boy, Let boy, you here, here. Give me a paper. Give me a paper. That's two cents, mister. Uh, Here's your two cents. Well, thanks. Here's the paper. No, no, no. Not that one on top. People, crowds have seen it. So what? They're all the same. No, no, no. Give me that one underneath. Okay. The customer's always right. Hey, the mass murder challenged by the shadow. That's your extra paper. (laughs) The Central Arcade tomorrow. Mm, So he's daring me, the shadow fellow. He knows I hate crowds. Crowds and people pushing and getting in my way. Voices talking and shouting. I hate them. I hate them. And I'll show them. I'll show the shadow fella, too. I'll fool all of them. I'll accept his challenge. I'll be there at the Central Arcade. And the shadow fella will know I was there. <laughs> the whole world will know. <laughs> After I've gone... Orders have been carried out, Commissioner Weston. Good. There'd better not be any slip-ups. 200 patrolmen are stationed in the neighborhood of the Central Arcade. 50 picked men of the plainclothes and bomb squad will be in the crowd. If there is a crowd... There'll be a mob after all the publicity. If I could get my hands on the shadow, I'd wring his neck for this. Uh, what time is it? A little after four, sir. We'd better get down there pretty soon. Yes, sir. Shall I take that call, sir? No. I've been waiting for this. And if it's who I think it is... Hello. Hello. <laughs> listen to me, Shadow. No, Commissioner Weston. You listen to me. I'm listening. Quick, Connors, trace this call. Yes, sir. Don't bother, Commissioner. You can't trace this call. I tapped a line. Just as I tapped the Midtown loudspeaker system last night. So that's how you pulled that crazy stunt. You're a fool, Shadow. 
Don't you realize you've endangered the lives of thousands of people? Nothing will happen if you do not interfere. I don't take my orders from you, Shadow. You're not running the police department. I'm not giving orders, but I need your help. Just do one thing for me, and you and not the Shadow will get the credit for the capture of the mass killer. Oh, yes? Well, what do you want? Just keep the crowd moving through the narrow arcade. Just keep them moving. Keep them moving. Everything depends on that. What are you trying to do, Shadow? To find a needle in a haystack. A man in a million. You will have a chance. The maniac won't come. You overlook the fact that a dare is a powerful psychological magnet that no egotistical crazed mind can resist. Just keep that crowd moving, Commissioner. Keep them moving. <laughs> When you start figuring ways and means to save money for Christmas gifts, fuel is probably the last thing that comes to mind. Naturally, you don't want to jeopardize the health and comfort of your family, but did you know that you can actually have better heat for less money simply by burning blue coal? Here's why. Blue coal is a rich Pennsylvania anthracite, the fuel that furnaces, space heaters, and cooking ranges in this part of the country were especially designed to burn. And while other fuel prices are advancing, the cost of anthracite is not. No wonder thousands of homeowners are switching back to anthracite. No wonder anthracite is the fuel that is used for cooking purposes on the nation's cracked passenger trains. They have tested all kinds of fuel and found that anthracite is far more economical because it burns long, steadily, evenly, with minimum drafts and less attention. Now, the cream of all Pennsylvania anthracite is blue coal. It comes from the mines of the famous Glen Alden Coal Company. It's tested and retested for purity and uniform sizing. Blue coal is prepared especially for home use, and it comes in all domestic sizes, egg, stove, chestnut, and pea. So if you want clean, even, dependable heat at lowest cost, always order blue coal. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. You'll find his name listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. Time's almost up, Commissioner Weston. Yes. Two minutes to six. Oh, this is the longest hour I've ever spent in my life. Can you beat it the way people have flocked here on the chance of seeing somebody else blown to bits by this maniac? It looks like the shadow is right. The way they've been swarming through this arcade. Yeah, and watching each other like a bunch of wild animals. You see what happened to that poor guy with the Christmas box? I nearly killed him before we got him out. All he had was a doll for his kid. I saw it. Well, the time's up, Commissioner. Yes. Thank heavens. Any orders, sir? Just keep the men on duty till this crowd thins out. They'll be going home now. Commissioner! Commissioner Weston, look. What is it? The maniac. He's been here. Look at this piece of paper. Where'd you get it? In the arcade. He must have dropped it. Oh, what's it say, Commissioner? Tell that shadow fellow I'll kill me a lot more people at 11 o'clock tonight. Oh, I was afraid something had happened something to Something has. I found the maniac. Thank heavens. Have you notified the police? Margot, this man is a fiend. If I notified the police and they bungle things, he might kill hundreds of people. This is a job that the shadow must handle alone. But Lamont, he's dangerous. You might fail. He might kill you. The shadow won't fail, Margot. But if he should, it's far better that one die than hundreds. Oh, Lamont, please. There must be a safer way. Perhaps, there. Margot, but this is the only sure way to end the career of this mass killer. <laughs> Goodbye, my dear. Lamont. Oh, Lamont. <laughs> Lively, Connors. Here comes the headquarters car. Yeah, it's Commissioner Weston's car. 
He's plenty worried about this maniac threatening to kill another batch of people at 11 tonight. Well, he'll sure have to go out of the theater area to kill him. They won't let anybody in the district here without a police permit. Wait a minute. Here comes a guy. Hey, you. You. Who, who, me? Yeah, you. Where do you think you're going? Me? I, I'm going to work. That's where I'm going. You got a permit? You got a badge. See? <laughs> Says I'm a night watchman. I got to go to work. What do you watch? Where do you work? <laughs> I watch things in the ground, down there. Down where? D down under the street, D down under the planks. Oh, I get it, Bill. He's a night watchman down on the new subway they're building. Oh. Yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> I go down them steps. Every night I go down them steps and watch. Well, why did you say so? Get on with you. Get to your watching. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Joe Tonetti is waiting for me so he can go home. Every night at 10.30, I take from him the job of watching. <laughs> now, that's a job I wouldn't want any part of. Me neither. I'll find my be honest. Oh, uh, Joey. Joey Tanetti. Joey, you can go home now. I'm here to watch. Hey, what's the matter? You're half a big speak about Kelly. You're five minutes late. I want to go home. Here's the keys to everything now. You watch out. You don't you go to sleep. <laughs> The police don't want to let me come to work. But I show them the badge. <laughs> you can go home now, Joey. I'll, I'll watch everything. Okay. See you in the morning. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, all those people. So many people always pushing. Pushing me. But I'll show them. I'll fix them good. I'll kill them. That shadow fellow, I'll show him too. Now, now, now I, I'm alone. All alone. Not quite, Anton Spivak. You are not quite alone. I am with you. Huh? Do you hear my voice, Anton? Uh, sure, sure. I, I always hear voices in the dark, on the street, and, and here under the street where I watch every night. Yes, Anton. But you've never heard my voice before, have you? Well, maybe. I, I, I don't think so. What's different about your voice? It's the voice of the shadow. Oh, <laughs> you're a pretty smart voice. <laughs> How'd you find me? Hey, where's that shadow fellow the newspapers talk about? I am more than just a voice, Anton Spivak. I am... The shadow. You, you the shadow? Yes. Where are you hiding? I am hiding under the cloak of invisibility. You cannot see me because I have clouded your mind. So you cannot see that which is here. How did you get down here in this subway excavation? I followed you down the steps. Hmm. How did you know where to find me? I picked you out of the crowd. In the central arcade. <laughs> how did you know I was the one? Your eyes showed me. I knew then how much you hate crowds. My, my eyes show you? Yes. You passed close to me as I stood in the shadows. Hmm? The arcade is narrow. You didn't see me. Hmm. No one saw me. But I saw you. How'd you find out my name? I followed you to the place where you live. I found out you work here, in the tunnels. Oh, then then, then, then you, you followed me here from my home tonight? Yes, Anton Spivak. All the way. Hmm, good, good. <laughs> You're a very clever shadow. But, but, but you must go now and let me do my work. My work. I, I, I ain't got much time. Now, now go quick before I get mad. You know, you're plenty smart. <laughs> I'm glad to know you, Mr. Shadow, but, but no, 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 you have to go. Yes, I'm smart. But you're smarter. <laughs> you bet. Let me stay. I want to learn. You can teach me things. Then maybe we can work together. You hate people, too? Yes. I hate crowds. Let me watch you and learn. All right. I'll let you watch. What are you going to do? Yeah, no, you, you just watch. 
What's in this shed? You see? Dynamite. Sticks and sticks of dynamite. Is this what you use to kill people with? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. (laughs) My precious dynamite. They kill the crowds I hate, see? (laughs) Now, look here. Here's a stick of dynamite already fused. There's one, two, three, four, five, and six. Six sticks of dynamite to go with it. (laughs) Now, you watch. See, Shadow, I, I, I tie them in a bundle. But how do you take that dynamite? to the place where you killed all those people. It's a block away. How do you carry it? <laughs> that, that's where I'm smarter than you, Mr. Shadow. Show me. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> now, look, look, see, it, it's almost 11 o'clock. Now, here, here. You, you see this little hook? I, I hook the dynamite to it. Then what, Anton? Wait, wait. You, you, you hear that car overhead on the boards? Yes. Well, if, if the light is red, it will stop right over our heads. Now, now, now listen. There, there, you see? The light is red. Now, now, now I take this crowbar. I go up this ladder. Come on, come on, you come with me. Yes, I am still here. Although you cannot see me. Now, now you watch. I, I, I pry the end of this plank back, see? And I, I, I hook the dynamite on the brake rods. I strike a match. And, and I light the fuse. And, and, when, and when, when, when the light changes, the car takes the dynamite with it. And when the dynamite explodes a block away, I'm still here. While the... Pl- oh, no, 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 no. You, you put out the fuse. You've tricked me. And here is the dynamite. No. Oh, you took it off the car. It, it's gone without the dynamite. And I promised I'd kill a lot of people tonight. Now I have to wait. Tomorrow the crowds will be still pushing me. You're scaring me. You tricked me. That's what you did. You you tricked me. Where, where are you, Shadow? Shadow. Come here, Shadow. Nice, Shadow. Nice, Shadow. I'm here. Anton Spivak. Yes, yes. I, I hear you. <laughs> nice, Shadow. <laughs> Come. Come close to me. Put down that dynamite, Anton. No, no, Shadow. I light another match. If you touch that match to the fuse, you'll die too. But I'll kill you, and I don't care. You wouldn't let me kill people, and I don't want to live. I want to die. I want you to die too, Shadow. Wait, Anton. No, 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 you blow out my match. Yes, I have a plan. Those thousands of people waiting up the street. Yes? You can kill all those people. Wouldn't that be better than just killing the two of us? (laughs) How? How? Tell me how. Take your dynamite and come with me. Up the steps. Up to the street. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, there, there, there's policemen out there. I saw them. But they won't see you any more than you can see me. No, 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 no. They will see me. Hypnotize them. Huh? Hypnotize them. Look straight at them. Stare at them. And then they won't be able to see you. No, no, no. I'm afraid. Think of all those people... Waiting to be killed. Come. Just a few more steps. I am with you. You'll be safe. I'll try. I'll try. (laughs) All those people waiting to be killed. (laughs) I'll try it. But but don't you leave me, Shadow, or I'll light the fuse. I'm here, Anton Spivak. Look, there are the two policemen. Uh-huh. Just stare at them hard as you pass, mm. and they won't see you. All right, I'll, I'll try, I'll try. Well, it's past seven, Congress. <laughs> Looks like a false alarm this time. Hey, wait a minute. Here's that night watchman. Hey, what's the matter with him? What's he staring at? Look, look what he's carrying. You can't see me. 
You can't see me. Dynamite. Grab him. Oh, no, no. Take it away from him. Let me go. Hold it. No, I said no. Yeah, I no. got him. It's a mask killer. No, no. no. Oh, he, he lied. He fooled me. He said you couldn't see me. Oh, no, no. Give me my dynamite. I want to kill all those people. Hold him. No. Here's Commissioner West. Go. I got him. We got him. We got the maniac, Stop Chief. Look, 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 here, let me look at him. Oh, no, no, he, he, he tricked me. He, he said you couldn't see me. Where'd he come from? About a subway excavation, Commissioner. He's a night watchman. No, no, he, he tricked me. The, the shadow tricked me. Oh. It was the shadow. Yes, Commissioner Weston. The shadow. I found the killer. But the glory is all yours. <laughs> Before we tell you of the shadow's next exciting adventure, here's John Barclay, Blue Coal's famous heating expert, with an important message I promised you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barclay. Friends, there are just two more days left in November. That means that homeowners have only two more days in which to phone their blue coal dealers and get the full details on how they may have a blue coal heat regulator installed in their homes for a free trial period of two weeks. To me, this is the most unusual offer ever made. The free use of a blue coal heat regulator for two whole weeks without any obligation on your part to buy. Believe me, friends, until you've used one of these marvelous thermostats, you don't know what real comfort is. Imagine having your home warm and cozy from morning till night without once having to make a trip down to the furnace. And that's not all. You'll find you burn far less coal with this regulator, too. But don't take my word for it. See for yourself. Phone your blue coal dealer tomorrow. I thank you. Friends, for your own sake, do as Mr. Barclay suggests. Phone your blue coal dealer tomorrow and get full details of this amazing free trial offer. Prove to yourself what thousands of satisfied owners already know, that with a blue coal heat regulator, you get more uniform heat, more economical heat than the most expensive oil burner can give you. But don't wait. Phone your blue coal dealer tomorrow. The story you have just heard is copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters in this story are entirely fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Shadow, the mystery man who strikes terror into the very hearts of shopsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Today, the Society of the Living Dead. In just a moment, the Shadow's exciting adventure will begin. Meanwhile, I have an important message for all you homeowners. We are now in the midst of the most treacherous season of the entire year. But you can protect your family's health during this danger period by burning blue coal. For blue coal gives you clean, uniform, healthful heat all winter long. And its harmless blue coloring is your guarantee of better heat at less cost. So when you order fuel, insist on blue coal. It's Pennsylvania's finest anthracite. Your nearest blue coal dealer will be glad to send you a trial ton. Phone him tomorrow. <laughs> Classic City Desk. Yes, go ahead, Turner. Mr. and Mrs. Smith are being held in Holly Military Prison as spies. The Smiths are believed not to be American citizens. What? Yes. 
The Prime Minister was handed a note by America's ambassador this morning. Yes, go ahead. American State Department reported investigating circumstances under which the Smith passports were issued. Good work, Turner. Keep feeding it. Yes, sir? Hold the presents for a new front page story. London correspondent is on the wire. This phony passport racket is being uncovered. More news on the Smith case. Mr. and Mrs. Smith are not citizens. A fake passport and identification ring is suspected. The name Schwartz was taken from tombstones to secure passports. More startling disclosures are promised by federal agents and local authorities who suspect widespread crime. Well, All right, Margot. Well, this fake passport and identification record interests me. It's Scotland Yard in England, the State Department in Washington, and a whole New York police force working on that fake passport racket. Do you have to get mixed up in it? You see, Margot, it, it, it ties up with a case that interests me. You mean the suicide of your broker, Henry Adams? Yes. But Lamont, what possible connection could there be? I, I don't see it. Well, I didn't see any connection either until today, although Adams never struck me as being the type of man who would commit suicide. His body was found two weeks ago, and they buried him right afterwards in the family vault in Kingland Cemetery. Seems to me that's what you might call a closed case. Well, I don't agree, Margot. I noticed in one of the gossip columns the other day a remark that interested me very much. What is that? An item that said that Irene Adams, the orphan daughter of Henry Adams, was being courted by Ray Kelvin. Oh, Ray Kelvin was Henry Adams' partner, wasn't he? Yes, he was. But what interested me even more was another item which said that Ray Kelvin was very friendly with a man named Berger, who, according to all reports, is a very questionable character. I don't see the connection, Lamont. Uh, but much of the evidence points to Berger being mixed up in his business. Oh! fake passport and identification ring that we just heard about on the radio. Yes. Margot, I want you to call on Adams' orphan daughter. Her name is Irene. Pose as a reporter. Mm -hmm. Ask her about the rumors of her coming marriage with Kelvin and find out if she actually saw the face of her father at any time after his death. All right, Lamont. Where will you be when I get back? I'll phone you at my office. Are you going to visit Berger as Lamont Cranston? No, Margot. I... I rather think Berger will be more impressed if I visit him as a shadow. I'm so sorry, Miss Adams. I, I know it's hard to talk to a stranger about such personal things so soon after your father's tragic death. Yes. Yes. It's true that my father didn't want me to marry Mr. Kelvin. It seems so unfair. Ray Kelvin was his own partner in business. But you are going to marry Mr. Kelvin. Yes. I wanted to wait. This was soon after Father's death. But Ray has to go away. To Europe. He may be gone for years. It'll be a quiet place. Oh, I see. Mr. Kelvin's leaving the country. But isn't he indicted on a stock swindling charge? Yes. Oh, but he says we'll soon have proof that he didn't have anything to do with it. Miss Adams, don't you realize that Mr. Kelvin can only clear himself by proving that your own father was a swindler? No, oh, no. Bray wouldn't do that. Did you ever see your father after they found his body in the river? No. No. Mr. Kelvin said I shouldn't. He said it would only upset me. Do you believe your father committed suicide, Miss Adams? No. I can't bring myself to believe that of that. What does Ray Kelvin think about your father's death? Ray said it was suicide. But Dad was worried over what would happen when they tried him on that stock swindle charge. But don't you see, Miss Adams, Kelvin, your fiancé, has been implying all along that your father is a swindler. That he's going to clear himself by pinning the guilt on your father. No, no, I can't believe that. That's why your father opposed your marriage to Kelvin. No. Why are you saying these things? You have no right. Please go. Yes, I, I am going, Miss Adams. I'm so sorry if I've hurt you, but I... I believe you're going to thank me for keeping you from marrying a treacherous thief. Perhaps even a murderer. What do you mean? Who are you talking about? Your dead father's partner. Your fiancé, Ray Kelvin. <laughs> Kelvin, 
What's on your mind? Now listen, Berger, I want action. I won't be safe till I get Adams to sign a confession taking full blame for that stock swindle. Yeah. I see you got the confession all ready for Adams to sign. Yes. Stated the day he was supposed to have jumped in the river. Hmm. How are you going to account for not having produced the confession until now? That's easy. I'll just tell the authorities that in going over his papers, I've just found it. Mm. <laughs> the government will have to dismiss the charges against me when I produce this confession signed by Adams. What are you going to do with Adams after he signed? That's where you and your man in the morgue come in. Hmm? You've got the papers that were on the man who was buried in Adams' place. All you have to do is put those papers on Adams when we dump him in the river. What? That's murder. I've never gone that far before. And you've never been paid $10,000 before either. Now, come on, quit stalling. Get your hat and coat. We're going to finish this job now. Now, wait a minute, Calvin, wait a minute. I'll give you back that money. Every cent of it. No, no, I'm afraid of this. (laughs) Burger, what was that? Somebody laughs here in this office. Yes, Calvin. It is the laughter that has echoed through the mind of many a killer. During his last hours in the death house. Who is that, Berger? Calvin. There's nobody here. Yes, Mr. Berger. The shadow is here. The shadow? Calvin, did you hear that? The shadow. He knows. He's not everything. You can't go through with it now. Yes, Calvin. I know everything. Yes? Well, I've heard about you, Shadow. The man who has the power to make himself invisible. (laughs) I know how you do it. Hypnotic suggestion. Hindu mesmerism. Oriental trickery. Well, you don't scare me. Your murderous scheme is doomed to failure, Kelvin. Give it up before it is too late. Yeah, listen to him, Kelvin. Adams is still alive. We haven't murdered him yet. No, but we've kidnapped him and we'll burn for that if we're caught. Only we're not going to be caught, shadow or no shadow. Come on, Berger. You're coming with me. No, no, don't make me go through with it, Kelvin. Come on. Don't. I'll show you what I think of the shadow. Come on, or I'll drill you where you stand. And the shadow if he tries to stop me. You've had your warning, Kelvin. Remember. Come on, Berger, get going. And as for you, shadow, here's a warning from me. If you follow us, I'll find a way to kill you. Remember that. Hello, Margot Lane. Lamont, I talked to Irene Adams. She never saw her father after he died. Henry Adams isn't dead, Margot. Oh, Lamont, are you sure? Where is he? I don't know, but Berger and Kelvin are on their way to the place where they're holding him, and I'm following them. Lamont, Kelvin is planning to marry Irene Adams and leave the country in a few days. Much can happen in a few days, Margot, even in a few hours. Lamont, let me meet you. Go with you. Maybe I can help. You can help me most by standing by with a shortwave radio. Keep it tuned in on the band the shadow always uses. All right, Lamont. But now you've discovered that Mr. Adams is alive, why don't you let the police handle it? As far as the police are concerned, Henry Adams is dead. Buried, a closed case. I guess you're right, but what about Berger and Kelvin? Do they know the shadow is on their trail? Yes, and Kelvin has dared the shadow to follow him. Lamont, it may be a trap, a trick to get you someplace where all your powers won't save you, where you'll be helpless. Lamont, please don't go. Please. Margot, I must follow Berger and Kelvin. If they lead me to Adams, I may need help. Stand by, Margot. Stand by until you hear from the shadow. The shadow will return in just a moment. But first, I have a word of warning for you homeowners. Throughout this dangerous winter season, don't subject your family to needless colds and illness resulting from uneven on-and-off type heating. Thousands of careful homeowners are taking steps to avoid this risk. They're playing safe by ordering blue coal. For instance, blue coal sales in the city of Rochester for the current winter season are 20% ahead of last year's figure, and numerous other cities show similar increases. Here's why blue coal is preferred by so many people. Blue coal is a selected Pennsylvania anthracite the fuel that gives off cleaner, more uniform, more dependable heat than any other coal. What's more, 
Furnaces, parlor stoves, and cooking ranges in this part of the country were especially designed to burn anthracite. And the cream of all American anthracite is blue coal. The harmless blue coloring with which blue coal is tinted is your all-time guarantee of better heat at less cost. Blue coal is mined by the Glen Alden Coal Company, and every carload is tested and retested for purity and uniform sizing before shipment. What's more, blue coal is especially prepared for home use. You can get it in the four popular domestic sizes, egg, stove, chestnut, or pea. So be guided in your fuel selection by Rochester families. For health and economy, too, insist on blue coal. Ask for it by name. Order a trial ton from your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. You'll find his name listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. Let's get this over with. What's the matter with you, Berger? You're jumpy as a cat. I know. It's the shadow. I'm scared. If you had any sense, you'd be scared, too. Oh, forget the shadow. Yeah? Well, suppose he's trailed us here, to Kingland Cemetery. Now, listen to me, Berger. Your job is to make Adam sign that confession. The shadow has developed superstitious fear in the underworld by means of his magician's tricks. He's dealing now with intelligent people who don't believe in Hocus Pocus. Why, there isn't one chance in a thousand the Shadow's been able to follow us here. Uh, what'll you do if he has? Huh? What can you do? You leave the Shadow to me. I'll deal with him if he comes. Uh, it's the Adam's grave vault just ahead, isn't it? Yeah. It's that underground vault on the left. You got the keys to the vault? Yeah, right here. I'll get the vault door open. Yeah. Give me, give me a hand with this door. Ouch. Wake up. Come on, Adams. Come on. Wake up. Hey, snap out of it. What? What? Who are you? Never mind who I am. Come on. Sit up. Are you going to take me out of this tomb? Are you? Yeah, you're going to get out. All you have to do is sign your name to a piece of paper. Huh? Water. Give me a drink. All I've had for days is the moisture on the stones. And nothing to eat. Nothing. Here. I got something better than water. It's like this brandy will set you up. Oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> How did you find out they'd locked me up in this grave vault? I thought they were going to leave me here till I died. And then... Put me in that coffin there, in place of that corpse that's supposed to be me. Never mind about that now. You're going to have a chance to get out of this grave alive, if you do as you're told. Listen, Berger, quit wasting time. Here's the confession on the pen. Make him sign it. Kelvin, you... I couldn't see you with flashlight in my eyes. You, my own trusted partner. You're behind this... You've done this to me. You stole those securities. Framed me. Sure. Sure I did. You're innocent. But if you want to get out of this family vault of yours, you'll take the blame. Sign this confession. I won't. I'll never sign it. Oh, yes, you will. Oh, oh. Cut it out. Cut it out, Kelvin. You can't stand much of that in the shape he's in. Do you want to kill him? I won't sign it. I won't. A confession for me would play you, Kelvin. Put the blame on me. Leave you free to marry my daughter, Irene. You made her think I'd drown myself. I'm innocent of the swindling charge. You're the guilty one. You sign that confession or I'll break every ball in your body. Oh. I told you to go easy. Yeah. Adams is out cold. Shut up and help me bring him around. The shadow on our trail, there's no time to lose. Yeah, I know. And I give plenty to know where the shadow is right now. <laughs> what would you give, Berger? Kill me. He's here. The shadow's here. The ball will... Berger, turn off that flashlight. Quick. <laughs> now you 
think we're on even terms. Don't you, Kelvin? You can't see me in the dark of the tomb. And you think I cannot see you? Yes. Yes, that's right, Shadow. Kelvin, what are you doing? Stay with me, Burger. And you too, Shadow. I may not be able to see you, but if you come close enough to try to stop me closing the door of this hall, I'll fill you full of lead. Kelvin, Kelvin, don't leave me here. You're no use to me anymore, Burger. You can thank the Shadow for that. You ain't going to leave me in here to die. You silly, double hunting man. All right, Burger, I'll do you one last favor. I won't leave you to die for thirst and hunger. You'll be luckier than Adams and the Shadow. Come on, Burger. Try to get out before I close this steel door. No, give me a break, Tommy. Adams, go give me a chance. Have the gun on me, you know that. Yes, Burger, I know that. Come on, I was just fooling. Oh, you mean I killed him? You mean you killed him? So, Kelvin. You shot Berger and added murder to your other crime. You'll never get out of this vault to tell about it, Shadow. You've cheated me out of a chance to beat that swindle indictment. You've ruined my chance of getting Irene with her Adam's money. Well, now you're going to have plenty of time to wish you'd never meddled in this. You'll have the pleasure of watching Adams die. He's almost dead now. And when he's gone, you'll have the company of three dead men. Three dead men waiting for you to join them. Goodbye, Shadow. You can lock that steel door, Kelvin. But somehow the Shadow will still get out. All right, Shadow. Let's see you try it. Shadow. <coughs> Shadow. <coughs> Kelvin double cross me. I'm done for all right. <coughs> what about you? Can you get out of this place like you said? The police will be here in a few minutes. You, you told them to come here, you mean? No, but I'm going to. Right now. Margot Lane. Margot Lane. Notify Commissioner Weston to pick up Ray Kelvin. Have him send a squad of men to Kingman Cemetery. Have them open the gray vault of Henry Adams. Adams is alive. But in the critical condition, Margot... Don't come into the cemetery yourself. Kelvin is at large. Notify Police Commissioner Weston at once. So, Shadow, you're calling the cops. Shadow, it's Kelvin. He's in that air vent at the top of the vault. <laughs> he heard you calling the cops. Yes, I heard you, Shadow. And if you think the police are going to get here in time to save you, you're mistaken. Every minute you waste in closing brings you nearer the electric chair, Kelvin. Don't waste your sympathy on me, Shadow. <laughs> I wonder what you'll look like when the cops find you with Berger and Adams. All of you drowned like rats in a trap. Because that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to drown like rats in a trap. Listen. Louder! He's going to fill the boat full of water, Shadow. Yes, right up to the top. And it won't take long. Too bad for you. I found a fire hose in the groundkeeper's shed. Now let the police come. They're welcome to anything they can get out of any of you when they get here. So long, Shadow. Let's see you get out of that spot. Shadow. He's gone. Water. Water. Here's water. Water. The Shadow. The water's an inch deep on the floor already. Yes, and it's rising every minute. Our only hope is that the police will get here in time. Use that radio of yours. Tell them what's happened. Tell them to hurry. The radio transmitter is wet, useless. Except the last appeal for help. Help me, Shadow. Help me. You deserve no help, Berger. You left Adams here to die. Oh, Calvin made me do it. I never did anything like this before. I ran a fake passport and identification record, that's all. I never killed anybody. I swear to Shadow. Water. It's getting deeper. Deeper. Water. Water. There's only one high place Water. in this tomb. One high place. On top of the casket. The casket of the man you buried and made the world believe was Henry Adams. Who me up there? Who's down here on the floor? I read. No, Berger, no. Help me. I won't lift you up. Adams is too weak to stand. There's only room for one on top of that coffin. And if anyone is to have a few extra minutes of life, Adams will get it. 
Well, what are you going to do? Put Adams on top of the coffin. His life is worth a dozen like yours. Irene. Irene. Forgive me. I was afraid you were going to marry Kelvin. I knew he was treacherous. A thief. Coward. Shut up. In God's name, help me up. Help me on my feet. Leave me again. Oh, oh do that much for me. Yes, Burger. I'll do that much for you. It's all I can do. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Shadow. <Sheldon. laughs> Here I am, trying to save myself from drowning so that I can die of bullet wounds. <laughs> Here I am, being lifted by a man whose hands I can feel on my arms, but I can't see. <laughs> Maybe... Maybe it isn't happening. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe this is death. No, Burger, this is not death. This is real. You're still alive, and I am here, and Adams is here. The water is rising all around us. Up to our waist now. What about you, Shadow? I heard queer things about you that you couldn't be killed. Can't you get out of here, huh? Even though I have the power of invisibility, I cannot walk through solid stone walls. No windows, no other opening but that door. Try it. Try it, just home. Maybe it didn't lock when Kelvin closed it, huh? Maybe. Oh, try something, Shadow. Try anything. Yes, yes, Burger. There might be a chance. A big chance. Uh, there's only a chance. I'm going to try to break down the door. Ah, useless, Burger. You mean you can't even save yourself? No, I can't even save myself. Help doesn't come soon if this vault fills to the roof. The shadow will die as quickly as you, Burger. No, no. <coughs> Not quite as quick. I'm finished, Shadow. <coughs> Thanks to Kelvin's bullets. <coughs> I won't drown. You were lucky after all, Burger. Irene. Irene, help me. Help me. Listen to me. Listen to me, Henry Adams. Listen. Help is coming. But it will be too late unless you help yourself. Kelvin. Kelvin is filling this tomb with water. It's up to the top of the coffin you're lying on. Listen to me, Henry Adams. You must get up. Hold on to me or you will drown. I, I can't. My strength is gone. You must. You must, for Irene's sake. Who are you? What are you doing here? I am the shadow. I came here to save you, but I'm afraid I failed. Shadow. A shadow. It doesn't matter who or what I am. Shadow. Shadow, are you still there? Still alive? So, Kelvin. The fascination of murder has drawn you back to the seat of your crime. I just wanted to make sure of you, Shadow. In that case, you'd better wait a few minutes longer, Kelvin. Who is that? Who is that talking? It sounds like Kelvin. Irene. Irene, don't do it. Don't marry Kelvin. He'll marry me. With you and Berger and the shadow out of the way, she'll never know, Adams. She'll never know. Kelvin. Kelvin, do you hear that? Do you hear that, Kelvin? It's the police. Run for your life, Kelvin, or better still. Fight them off. They're cheating you out of your triumph of death. They're going to drown like rats. The police won't get me. They won't get you out of there in time. You'll drown. Drown like rats. You will. Get that man. Stop him. Stop. You are a troop. Let him have it. You win, Shadow. I got him. Okay, come on. Come on, men. 
Get the door of that vault open and see what's going on here. Yes. Here are the keys I got from the watchman's the cemetery gate, Commissioner. All right. Get that door open. Right. Commissioner, there's water spurting out around the sides and bottom of the door. Good heavens. The hall's been flooded. Commissioner, there's a three flushing hose attached to the hydrant that's pouring water into that vault. Shut it off. Are right. you kidding? Sergeant, open that door. Yes, sir. Look out, Sergeant. Good heavens. The vault must have been filled with a roof. Quick. Throw your flashlight on the floor. Yes, sir. Commissioner, there's a man lying on top of that pasture. Come on, that man isn't dead. He's trying to get up. Yeah. Come on, here. Give me a hand with him. Right. Come on. This, this must be Adam. It is. Adam. Henry Adam. Commissioner Weston. Shadow. It's the shadow again. Yes, Commissioner, it's the shadow. You were just in time. So I see. What's back of all this? Henry Adams committed suicide two weeks ago. He was buried in this vault. If this man is Adams, who's in that sealed casket? Just one of the many unidentified men and women who find their way into the morgue, Commissioner. Foreign spies and secret agents pay big prices for passports issued in the names of those unidentified men and women. Good heavens, Shadow. But, Commissioner, the fake identification ring is smashed. And Berger, the leader, was killed. Commissioner, this is the end of the society of the living dead. Ladies and gentlemen, before the shadow leaves you, here's John Barclay, Blue Coal's heating expert. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts. Good evening, friends. Tonight I have some news for all you homeowners. When you buy Blue Coal, you're entitled to the free John Barclay service. At your request, a John Barclay serviceman will be sent to inspect your heating plant. No matter what your problem may be, he can solve it for you. And his valuable advice is yours, free of charge. Thousands of families are profiting by the John Barclay Heating Service. For instance, a woman in Roxbury, Massachusetts writes, I'm truly grateful for the valuable information given me by your John Barclay serviceman. I've learned more about saving coal and looking after my furnace this year than ever before. And friends, that's only one of the many expressions of satisfaction I receive every day. So for the very best results, I earnestly recommend that you burn blue coal in your heating plant and take advantage of the free John Barclay heating service. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. And here's another suggestion for you homeowners. Either write me in care of this station or send to Blue Coal, 120 Broadway, New York City, for my valuable free booklet, How to Reduce the Cost of Heating Your Home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barclay. And friends, write to John Barclay or Blue Coal, 120 Broadway, New York City, and get your free copy of How to Reduce the Cost of Heating Your Home. You have just heard a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. Next week, same time, same station, Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen, and be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. Ha, 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 ha.
the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, the shadow can never be sure of what lies ahead of him. But there's one thing every motorist can be sure of, and that's meeting plenty of wet weather driving before the year's over. Well, you can give yourself greater skid protection if you make sure your car is equipped with those new Goodrich Silvertown tires. The tires with the sensational lifesaver tread. This amazing tread has never-ending spiral bars that act like a battery of windshield wipers. They sweep the water from under the tire force it out through the deep groove, give you a drier, safer road surface for the rubber to grip. And when you're thus protected against the slippery hazard zone of motoring, you get the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had. Furthermore, Silvertowns are the only tires in the world that give you the famous blowout protection of the Goodrich Golden Fly. So why take chances with either skids or blowouts when you can get protection against both of these driving hazards in Silvertown? At no extra cost. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aid. Margot Lane. Today's story, The Mine Hunter. Zito, let me in. Come. Zito, why you make me come down here to the Panama waterfront in the middle of a foggy night like this? Why is Captain Bogart here? Captain Bogart is no longer satisfied to take orders, Varita. He wants to know why my men spend so much time taking soundings off the entrance of the Panama Canal. Why this fishing trawler he commands does not catch more fish. Aye, and what's the idea of contacting the Trump steamer that's been standing offshore? You are paid well to do as you are told and be silent, Captain Bogart. Not enough for what I think you're mixed up in. And what is that, Captain? Spying. Sounding out the defenses and laying secret mines off the Panama Canal, that's what. You know too much, Captain... Much too much. And the sharks that infest the waters of the shore of La Boca will welcome you. Who's there? Riker. Come in, Riker. We're glad to see you. Fix it up for me to get that deckhand job in the trawler? Yes. <laughs> it is all arranged. Say, what's the idea? Why the gun? Just this. We know you are not a deckhand. You are Lieutenant Cartwright of the Naval Intelligence Division. So, you found out about me before I could get the goods on you and your spy ring, eh? So sorry, Lieutenant. It is the fortunes of espionage. <laughs> Major Baker to see you, Commander. Sure, I'm right in. Yeah, uh, good morning, Major. Morning, Commander. I just heard one of your covers found the body of Lieutenant Cartwright washed up on the beach near La Boca. Yes, one of our best men. I beg pardon, Commander. Another message from the Navy Department. Mm-hmm. It makes the third today. Good grief. Now what? This message. The Navy Department sent two men down here a month ago. And they haven't reported in the last ten days. Oh, what use are our elaborate defenses of the Panama Canal if every potential enemy knows as much about them as we do? You're right. We've got to wipe out this spy ring, but how? Every intelligence officer we've put on the job has come back empty-handed. Yes, or dead. There must be some way, some man smart enough and nervy enough to deal with these spies, these killers... Valparaiso have one hour's 
stopover. Well, Margot, we're almost at our destination. Yes, Sir Mark. Any ideas yet as to how you're going to try and locate the leaders of that spy ring operating in and around the canal zone? Not so loud, Margot. No, I have no definite plan yet. But I thought it was time the shadow took a part in finding out who is at the head of this spy ring. Hope I can be of some help to you. You've always been a big help to Lamont Cranston, Margot. And this time, you may be helping our country as well. Si, senor. We have a check. Uh, si, senor. Pronto. Muy pronto. Lamont, I love the way these Panama natives say quickly and then take all day. <laughs> life, life moves very slowly in the tropics, Margo. Well, so does criminal investigation, it would seem. We've been here a week. Yes, and we've haunted every cafe in Panama. The best of the lowest dives along the waterfront. You know, Lamont, if, if these international spies are half as clever as you seem to think they are, they may be suspicious of us. <laughs> It's a very old axiom among hunters. If you're after a killer, whether he be a wolf, a tiger, or a man, if you can't find him, make it easy for him to find you. Oh, in other words, Lamont, we're just a couple of walking invitations for a shot in the dark or a knife in the back. Is that it? Mm, not quite. I do want people around here to get a bit curious about us. Why? Are you scared? bit. This waterfront sector gives me the creeps. Especially the people in this cafe. They look like they'd slit your throat for the fun of it. Uh, well, oh, yes, of course. Armand, who is she? Who? who? Who is who? That Spanish dancer you've been watching for the last ten minutes. Uh, that's, that's Verita. She owns this cafe, and according to rumor, she's one of the most notorious characters in Panama. How did you find that out, Lamont? Well, after Lamont Cranston, the amateur criminologist, has seen his assistant safely to a room in the hotel, the shadow has been prowling the back streets of Panama. Careful, Lamont. The waiter's coming back. Mm, it's about time. Your bill is two dollars fifty cents, American, senor. Here you are. Keep the change. Gracias, senor. Gracias. Uh, you will uh, be back again, senor? Maybe. Why? Make you ask. Only that for three nights now you have come. Senor, you like the cafe of Senorita Varita, see? You have a very interesting place, yes. I think we will be back. Along, Margot. Get out of here. Buenos noches, senor, senorita. Buenos noches. Manuel. Senorita Varita, yes. Tell Senor Zito here what the Americans say. He say you have a most interesting place. He come back again, Senorita. You hear, Zito? Yes. That will be all, Manuel. Go back to your table. See, si, see, si, Senor Zito. Zito, what have you learned of this man and his pretty companion? Very little, Varita. At the hotel, they are registered as John Hardy of New York and Miss Martha Adams of Boston. The rooms, you have had them searched? Yes, the head porter. He's one of our men. Mm -hmm. He found nothing. No suspicious papers. Then what makes you think they're government agents? I have good reason to suspect this man, if not the young woman, Varita. So? Why is it so? Each night, he has seen the young lady to her room, and then he has left the hotel again. Where does he go? Three nights now, my men have followed him, but each night he has walked into the shadows and vanished. You talk like a fool. Men do not vanish in Panama unless we see to it. But this man does. Last night he came to the waterfront, walked out on the fisherman's wharf. Three of my men thought they had him cornered, but when they searched the wharf, he was not there. <laughs> Perhaps he had wings and flew away, or jumped into the water and drowned himself. And it is ghost we saw here tonight. No, he was there. He spoke to my men, but they could not see him. Could only hear his voice and his laughter. Laughter such as you might hear from the devil himself. Do not invent lies to cover your stupidity. It is not a lie. This man can move into the shadows, become as a shadow itself, <laughs> unseen. <laughs> Do not laugh, Varita, it is the truth. There is such a man. I have heard of him and of his powers. To those in our profession, he is the most dangerous man alive. And he is here. 
here in Panama, I tell you. Who are you talking about? Perhaps you too have heard of him, Varita. He is the terror of the criminal world of America. He succeeds where police and secret service and agents of counter-espionage have failed. He is a man all men fear, yet no one has ever seen. And his name, Varita, it is The Shadow. The Shadow, huh? Yes, The Shadow. And he is here in Panama after us. And unless we find a way of trapping him, he will trap us. And do you think this John Hardy of New York is The Shadow? Or an accomplice. Vito, the trawler Vendetta it puts to sea tonight, yes? In one hour. This girl, it uh, might be well if she went along. <laughs> I see. You think she will make fine bait for a trap to catch the shadow? It can be arranged. It will not be difficult to get her out of the hotel. Good. And um, on board the trawler in the open sea after dawn, there will be no shadows. Get her. Bring her to the trawler. I will meet you there. You go to sea with us? <laughs> see. If the shadow appears, it will be interesting to see if his powers are strong enough to save him from the tiger sharks that swarm the waters of Panama. You know what you are to do? Si, sí, Senor Zito. When you have taken the girl away, I am to run quick to the room of Senor Hardy, her friend, and tell him some men take her to the steam troll of Vendetta. Yes. Wait five, now ten minutes. Then warn him. I understand. Good. Now, which is the Senorita's room? There. I have a key to that open door there to the patio. Unlock it. My men will do the rest. Si, sí, Senor. Pedro, Manuel, quick, bring the girl. Do not let her cry out. Si, sí, senor. She will not cry out. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, many perilous things may happen to the shadow. But do you realize that just two dangerous things can happen to a tire? A blowout? or a skid. Unless the tires you ride on give you protection against both of these dangers, you may be heading for trouble. The shadow knows. Beware. Literally millions of American motorists right now are gambling on their tires, taking chances on a dangerous blowout or a car-wrecking skid. Make sure your tires are safe. And the best way I know of to do that, motorist, is to replace smooth, worn tires with the new Goodrich Safety Silver Towns. The only tires that give you the skid protection of the lifesaver tread. Remember, this tire won hands down in road tests conducted by Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory, the nation's largest independent testing laboratory. The engineers of this famous laboratory found that no tire tested came up to the Silver Town in resistance to skid. And the tires tested against this silver town were regular and premium priced tires of America's five other leading tire manufacturers. Some of them priced as much as 40 to 70 percent more. When you can get silver towns at no extra cost, you really get the skid protection of the lifesaver tread and golden ply blowout protection free. Put these life saving Goodrich silver towns on your car now. The sooner, the safer. Zito, what have you learned? Nothing, Verita. It is strange he does not come, this shadow. We cannot wait much longer. The trawler must put to sea. 
What are you going to do with the girl if he does not come? What we did with Captain Bogart, with the lieutenant from the Navy Department and the others. Mm. Where is the girl? In the next cabin. Perhaps you can make her talk. You know so many ways, Zito. I will try, but women are difficult. They can stand much more torture, more pain than a man. Come, senorita. We talk to you now. Maybe you will talk to us. You can talk all you like. I have nothing to say. Do not be too sure, senorita. This is Mr. Zito. He has had experience in loosening the tongue of those who will not speak freely. I can imagine. Senorita, among my people there is a saying that the tongue is for speech. And those who will not use their tongue for speaking have no need of it. And they will not feel its loss if the tongue is taken away. I really believe you would, Mr. Zito. It has been necessary on occasion. But what good would it do you to have my tongue cut out? None. Therefore, we would both lose if your stubborn courage should force me to go so far, senorita. What do you want to know? Well, this friend of yours, this man John Hardy of New York. What is he doing in Panama? I don't know. Where is he now? I don't know. You lie. You know who he is, what he is, why he's here. I tell you, I don't... Quick, tell me this one thing. They're choking me. Is it not true this friend of yours is the man the whole world knows as the shadow? I tell you, I don't... <laughs> I will answer that question for you, Mr. Zito. The shadow, he's here. He has walked into our trap. No, Zito. It is I who have set a trap for you. Pedro! Manuel, quick! Watch the door! Let no one out of this cabin! <laughs> it will do no good to ring for your cutthroat, Zito. I have disposed of them one by one. Zito? It is true. They do not answer. You are cornered. Trapped, Zito. Trapped! Zito, do not stand there staring. He's here, somewhere in this cabin. We have got the girl. Don't let go of her. What is the matter with you? Surely you've heard of the power of hypnosis, senorita. Look at him. He can't move, can't speak. Listen to me, Zito. Listen to me. Take your fingers from that girl's throat. Release her. Release her. Release her. Zito! It is useless, senorita. So, you have caught him, Shadow. But you will never get me. Never! Never! Lamont, thank heavens you got here in time. I'm sure he meant to kill me. I know. Quick, get off this trawler. Put it in the water. <laughs> Why did you let Verita get away? Because she will show me the way to the real leader of this spiring bent on destroying the defenses of the canal. <laughs> what about Zito? Go on, hurry. I'll join you in the wharf. After I make Mr. Zito tell all he knows to the shadow. <laughs> going in the speedboat? Straight out to sea. Eight miles south-southwest. You better hope I haven't forgotten how to read a compass. I thought you were going to trail Varita. Yeah, it won't be necessary. She'll be where we're going. Did you get that from Zito? Yes, and many other things, Margot. There's a ship out there. And that's where the trawler was going. Yes. Lamont, you're not going to board that ship alone. I must, Margot. It's the only chance of getting the real leader of the spiring. But what can you do against the whole crew of a ship? Why don't you turn your information over to the Navy Patrol? Let them deal with it. They can't without creating an international incident. The ship is beyond the 12-mile limit, carrying the flag of a supposedly friendly country. What kind of ship is it? Mm, a tramp steamer, but actually it's a disguised tender, loaded with mines and capable of converting fishing trawlers like the Vendetta into mine layers in a few hours. Good heavens. Just what are you going to do, Lamont? What can I do to help? Margot, all I want you to do is take the wheel of this speedboat. I'm going to jump overboard and swim to that ship. And get near enough. You turn back toward the coast a couple of miles, cut the motor, and wait to hear from me over the shortwave band the shadow always uses. But suppose they hear us and send a boat out. We're running without lights. You stop the motor, they never find you in the dark. All right, Lamont. Only I hope you know what you're doing. You're taking a terrible risk. Even for the shadow. No, don't worry about me. Only one thing more. The wind springs up and the sea gets rough. Head back to the coast. This boat won't ride a storm. And leave you on that ship? I will not. You will. I want your promise. We turn back now. All right. I promise. Lamont, look. There's a ship dead ahead without lights. That's it, Margot. Take the wheel, quick. There's a smaller boat alongside. Smaller. I thought there'd be one. That means Verita's on board ship ahead of me. Lamont, wait. Let me swing closer. No, this is close enough. Now, remember, Margot, 
Stand off until you hear from me. So, Zita is caught and you, Senorita Verita, become so afraid of the shadow that you dare disobey my command that you shall never come aboard this ship. But, Dr. Muller... Wait! By coming aboard this ship, you have linked me with the activities of our spies in Panama. You are a fool and a coward, Senorita. And I have no use for those who cannot obey my orders. But you do not know this shadow. You have not seen as I have what he can do. I know all about this shadow. It is my business to know everything about those who may sooner or later stand in the way of my plans. You are very clever, Dr. Mola. But how do you know the shadow is not on board this ship? If he has followed you here, I shall deal with him. That speedboat we heard half an hour ago was not cruising around for nothing. I tell you, it is dangerous to stay in these waters after what has happened. We are beyond the twelve mile limit. We are safe here. You are not safe from this shadow. Not anywhere. Yes. Come in. I had the ship searched from bow to stern as you ordered, Dr. Marlow. I don't believe anyone boarded us from that speedboat. Now, what about the speedboat? Well, I had the trawler cruise around. No trace of it, sir. Must have returned to Panama. Very well. Go to the bridge and wait orders from me. Yes, sir. Now, senorita, I shall consider your case. I... I cannot go back to Panama. It is too bad. For Panama is the only place you are of any use to me. But I have done nothing. I have not betrayed you. You could put me ashore down the coast until it is safe for me to go back. I have a better plan. With this gun. It is easier... Quicker. No. No. You would not shoot me for one mistake. I have been valuable to you. I have found out many secrets for but you. But no more. <laughs> Do not be afraid. Do not cower like an animal. I am not going to shoot you. I am merely going to give you a chance to do it yourself. No, no, no. I won't do it. I will do anything but that. And why not, Senorita? You and Mr. Zito have killed many men. No, I won't. Very well. Then you give me no choice. <laughs> Wait, Dr. Moloff, before you shoot. The shadow. He's here. Yes, I'm here. I warned you, Dr. Moloff, but you would not listen. So you dare to come even here, Shadow? Yes, Doctor. I've come for you. Then you are a fool. There is no one here you can call upon to help you, and this ship is beyond the 12 mile limit. But you are going to leave this ship, Dr. Moloff. You are going to leave this ship before 10 minutes have passed. Or you will never leave alive. Save your bluff for fools like my agent, Shadow. This is not bluff, Doctor. I've not been idle in the half hour I've been aboard. I know the whole of the ship is filled with high explosive mines. Think what will happen when a time bomb goes off in that cargo of death. A time bomb? Ten minutes? Less than ten, Dr. Moloff. Think fast. You still have time to get your crew aboard the trawler alongside. I don't believe you, Shadow. Why should you warn me if this is true? Because the trawler flies our flag, and once aboard, you are subject to the laws of our country. The naval patrol will pick you up after the explosion. Oh, that's it? Yes. You have nine minutes left to decide. Prison for espionage or death. I don't believe you, Shadow. You are a fool if you stay here, Dr. Muller. I believe him. I'm going. Captain this gun. Quick. Get your crew on the trawler. I cannot take a chance that you have not planted a time bomb in the hole, Shadow. But if you have... I am going to give you your choice. Try to come through this door before I lock it, and I'll shoot you down, even if I can't see you. Or stay in this cabin and be blown up with the ship. I, I have another choice, another choice, Dr. Moloff. And it... Margo, Margo Lane, Margo Lane, I've left the ship and safe aboard trawler Black Girl. Return to Panama, return to Panama. The mystery ship will blow up any minute now, but disregard explosion, disregard explosion. Return to Panama, disregard... Radio message, Commander. Came through just now. I don't know what you make of it, sir. The sender wouldn't identify. Let me see. Steam trawler Black Girl, six miles south southwest La Boca. Dr. Moloff and agents subspiring aboard intercept. That trawler's been under suspicion for some time, sir. Yes, and this may be the break we've been waiting for. The destroyer K-17 is in that vicinity, investigating a mysterious explosion. 
Notify your commanding officer to proceed to the position of the trawler Black Gull and search her. How did he get off the ship before it blew up? I don't know, Verita. We found him on the deck of the gull. Like this. Unconscious. Is he... Nah, he ain't dead. But he took an awful beating from somebody. Uh, it's too bad the shadow did not kill him. Shadow? What are you talking about? What the... Destroyer! Get ahead! The shadow said we would be stopped. We have got to get away. We can't. They blow us out of the water. Stop the engine! Yes, sir. They're sending a boat to board us. And my black doll... They cannot stop us. We are beyond the 12-mile limit. <laughs> You're wrong, senorita. This trawler flies our flag. Shadow. You. You saved Dr. Moloch. You won the Navy patrol. Yes, Morita. Your spy ring is broken. Your minds have exploded harmlessly. Like your theories. You led me to Dr. Moloch, the chief of this spy ring. You and he will suffer the extreme penalty. An example to all spies who seek to discover the secrets of our country's defenses and endanger the safety of our territorial waters. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine... Now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental.
waiting for the first act of the Shadow's latest adventure to begin, I'd like to ask every motorist to do this. Take a ride on the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown tire. See for yourself how it grips wet, slippery roads like you never felt a tire grip before. That's because the amazing Silvertown Lifesaver tread acts like a battery of windshield wipers. Sweeps wet roads so dry you can light a match on its track. For the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had, equip your car with Goodrich Silvertown tires. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids those in distress and helps the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice belongs. The only one who knows the true identity of that master of other people's minds, the Shadow. Today's story, The Man Who Murdered Time. Mr. Cranston, on behalf of all the employees of the club, I wish to thank you for your generous New Year's gift to the personnel. That's quite all right, Stuart. Happy New Year. The same to you, sir. And may I thank you, too, Mr. Hughes, for your gift. You're very welcome, Stuart. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, too. I wish I could have made it more, Cranston, but it hasn't been a terribly good year for me. Well, I'm sorry to hear it, Hughes. Oh, by the way, how is Mrs. Hughes feeling these days? Poorly. Well, the doctors at the sanitarium say she may pull out of it next year. That's why I'm looking forward to the New Year so eagerly. Well, use it. Uh, there's anything I can do in the way of financial assistance. Thanks, old man, but it won't be necessary. I expect to be out of debt very shortly. Business improving? No, a trust fund is coming due in two weeks. Inheritance from my Uncle Matthew, you know. Well, I'm delighted to hear it, Hughes. Uh... It's four o'clock. Well, only eight hours to a brand new year and new hope for all of us. Amen to that. Uh, you're coming to my New Year's Eve party tonight, aren't oh, you? Oh, I meant to tell you, Cranston. Uh, I'll be late. I got a call this morning from a second cousin of mine. He wants me to come to see him this evening. Brilliant scientist, but I suspect he's losing his mind. Oh? <laughs> know what he claims to have invented? A time machine. <laughs> a, a time machine? Yes. It's fantastic, isn't it? Well, come, Hughes. Is anything really fantastic in the modern world of science? Thirty years ago, the notion that a human voice could circle the Earth without the aid of wires would have been called not only fantastic, but impossible. Radio, electric light... Airplanes, all were called fantastic in their time, but today they're accepted facts. Why not the time machine? Well, I'm from Missouri. Anyway, I'm really going to see my cousin, not because of his alleged invention, but, well, because he's dying. Well, that's too bad. Yes, the poor chap's got an incurable heart condition. He uh, told me his doctors don't give him more than a few days to live. Well, I've got to be off. See you tonight, then, Hughes. Only a miracle will keep me away, Cranston. A miracle like... Like the time machine. <laughs> <coughs> uh, here, Willem. Drink uh, this water. There. You better now? Yes. Yes, better use. Perhaps you'd better get into bed, Willard. <sighs> Frankly, I, I didn't expect to find you up and about, dressed to kill. Dressed to kill. Very good. Such an apt phrase. Well, why not? This is probably the last day of my life. Well, I'm sure it's not as bad as all that, will it? If you take care of yourself... Come, come, use. I'll never see the new year. That's what you're really thinking. Know what I've done today? What, will it? The things I've wanted to do all my life. Packed them all into this one long, glorious day. I've smoked two-dollar cigars, eaten the finest foods, bought thousands of dollars worth of completely useless things just for the fun of indulging myself. Well, Willard, I thought that... <laughs> that I'm broke? I am. Then how did you... Borrow, dear cousin. Spent other people's money, incurred enormous debts. <laughs> Payable next year. Next year, which will never come. I'm sorry, Willard. Oh, what are you sorry about? I'm not. Matter of fact, I've just begun to celebrate. And you must join me, Hughes. Absolutely insist. I bought a marvelous sherry today, a rare vintage. You rang, sir? Uh, well, you needn't bother. The sherry, John. Yes, sir. I have it here, sir. Fine, fine. Put it on the table. Shall I pour, sir? No, I'll do it myself. That's all, John. Very good. Hey, you are used. Drink hearty. Thank you. How do you like it? Nectar. Ambrosia, huh? It has a peculiar flavor, hasn't it? Oh, it'll grow on you. Finish it, Hughes. Drink 
to my last day on Earth. Oh, no, no, Willard, not to that. To my last day on Earth. And yours, my dear cousin, to my last day. Hughes, I told you that today I meant to satisfy every ambition I ever had. Well, I've left for the last my greatest ambition of all. To kill you. To kill me? Why, why you, you're joking. Think so, Hughes? But, but why? What have I ever done to you? What haven't you done to me? You've been a bone in my throat ever since we were boys together. I believe you're, you're really serious. If it hadn't been for you, I'd have been Uncle Matthew's fair-haired boy, his favorite, his pet. He would have raised me in luxury instead of you. You quarreled with him. You were he a... would have left me his money, not you, you Judas. You had everything while I starved, scraped, suffered. I brooded over that, my fine cousin, a whole lifetime. And now, this wonderful day, this last day of the year, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you not once, but a thousand times. You see that machine in the corner? I see, Willard. Calm down. That's my time machine. Your your time machine, yes. yes. I remember your saying... You know what this machine can do. It can prevent the future from happening. (laughs) The future from happening? Oh, now, now, look, Willard, look. Let me call your physician. I'll be a fool. I'm as sane as you are. That's a scientific machine, not a madman's toy. Do you know how it works? Of course not. I'll explain it in simple terms. Use... What is time? Why, time is... Time Time is is like a railroad track. A straight railroad track, Hughes. And the world is a train running along that track. On the track behind us lies yesterday, December 30th. Today, we're traveling along that section of track we call December 31st. And at midnight tonight, the train, you, I, the whole universe, is scheduled to plunge straight ahead into January 1st of the new year. You follow me so far, Hughes? Yes, What has this to do with your so-called time machine? Just this. By using a revolutionary principle of physics, my own discovery, my machine bends the straight track of time, curves it, curves it, so that the time track forms a perfect circle. (laughs) You fool, it's a scientific fact. I've done it. Mad, I say, mad. Listen to me, Hughes. At midnight tonight, when I turn on the switch, time will instantly be curved back on itself, so that instead of continuing into January 1st, We'll go back 24 hours. We'll live December 31st over again and again and again like a phonograph needle caught in a groove. You expect me to believe that this day will never end, that you can make December 31st repeat itself forever? (laughs) Laugh, you fool. (laughs) You won't laugh long. Today I've been especially careful to make it the fullest, happiest day of my life because I'm going to live this wonderful day forever. I'll catch time in that groove and hold it there. The future will never come. I'll never have to pay my debts. Despite my bad heart, I'll never die. I'll have to be as insane as you to believe that. Would you like a demonstration? Playing the farce out to the end, are you? Well, go ahead. Demonstrate. That's the proper scientific spirit, Hughes. I'll set the machine to affect merely this house and ourselves. What incident of the last half hour do you want me to make repeat itself? Choose. Oh, the butler and the sherry. John and the sherry, eh? Very good. And I want you to bear in mind... That just as time will be repeated here in this room for the next few moments, so can I repeat time throughout the whole world, not once, but again and again. Now, let me adjust my machine. There. Now to close the circuit. Sir? Really, well, let me uh, in, The butter. sherry, John. Yes, sir. I have it here, sir. Fine, fine. Put it on the table. Shall I pour, sir? No, I'll do it myself. That's all, John. Very good, sir. There. The automatic circuit cut us off, and we're back in ordinary time again. Convinced, use. It can't be. It's impossible. It's a trick, a dream, a nightmare. <laughs> You'll be saying that for all eternity. I'm getting out of here. Are you, cousin? Try it if you can. <laughs> I can't. I'm paralyzed. I, I can't get out of this chair. You feel <laughs> pain now, don't you, you? Yes. Yes, horrible pain. You shouldn't have drunk the sherry, you. 
Your glass contained the slow poison, you see. No! No, help! Help! There's an antidote on the table. You see that little green bottle you is just beyond the reach of your fingers? Isn't it ironic? If you could only move your arm five inches. Try. Oh, you can. Dear me, how very, very sad. All you can do is look at the antidote while you die in agony. Please, please, will it help me? Help me! I don't want to die! Just a little <laughs> while now, cousin, a little while. It's almost midnight. You'll die just before midnight. And then I'll turn on my machine. Set it to affect the whole world forever. And time all over the world will snap back 24 hours. Everybody in the world will live December 31st over again and again, forever and ever. <laughs> you too, you. No, no. You'll visit me again. Drink the poison cherry again. Die again. Live again. Die again. Oh, the Martin party of yours is the loveliest New Year's Eve party I ever attended. Margo, you danced beautifully. <laughs> Thanks, Lamont. I wonder what's happened to yours. He said he'd be late, but I didn't think... Hold it, everybody! Here comes the new year! Happy New Year, Lamont. Not yet, Margo. Eight, nine, ten, eleven... Lamont, where are we? I'm still in your arms dancing with you, but it, it's not the party, the, the New Year's Eve party in your apartment. How could that be? I, I don't know, Margo. What? What was that awful crash? I don't know. But look around you, Margo. We're dancing in the Honolulu Club. But we were dancing in the Honolulu Club right here last night. Last night at midnight. I, I mean, 24 hours ago. Oh, I, I don't know what I mean. Keep dancing with me, Margo. I've got to figure this out. Seems like a dream, and yet... That's it, Lamont. It's a dream. I dreamed through the whole day, December 31st, right up to midnight. Then that crash, and I woke up here in the Honolulu Club. Margo, it wasn't a dream, I tell you. Then what was it, Lamont? I don't know. I don't know. But something's gone wrong, Margo. Something's gone wrong with the whole world. But everything seems all right, Lamont. Margo... Hold on to me. Don't let go. Let's walk back to our table. All right, but I don't understand. Keep holding on to me. Margo, do you remember last night, just about this time as we were dancing, a waiter accidentally dropped a whole tray full of dishes? Why, yes, that's, that's so, Lamont. <laughs> Lamont, it's happened. He dropped it just as he did last night. Yes. I see it all now, Margo. We actually lived through December 31st. We, everybody, the whole world... But just as the last stroke of midnight came, something happened to time. Time? Yes. Time snapped back 24 hours. Instead of going on to January 1st, the world went back to the first moment of December 31st. But nobody else seems to realize what's happened. Yes, that is strange. Apparently everybody's forgotten that they lived through the last day of the year. Why do we remember? Margot, I believe that the same power that makes me invisible to others has something to do with this. What do you mean, Lamont? Years ago in India, I was studying with the yogi priests. I developed my powers of concentration, my power of will, to such an extent that apparently this accident of time doesn't affect me. How long I'll be able to fight against it, I don't know. But I haven't your power, Lamont. Why do I remember, too? Margo, because at the instant time flashed back, you happened to be dancing with me. You were in my arms, within the aura of my will, my influence. No. Just so long as you're touching me, you'll remember, too. Oh, Lamont, I can't believe it. I can't. Well, then try it. Let go of me. Go on, let go, Margo. Well, all right. You're right, Lamont. You remember the Higgins, don't you? Margo. Yes, that's the family. Margo, stop. Well, they're very Margo, anxious that me. you and I go south Margo. of the beach. Uh, what am I saying? What happened? Oh, Lamont, you're holding me again. Margo, the instant you let go of me, you said exactly what you said 24 hours before. When I grabbed you, you snapped back. Free of the new time spell. Then it's true. 
Oh, Lamont, I'm afraid. Don't let go of me. Steady, Margot. Oh, but it's horrible. People will go on living through December 31st to eternity, never knowing, never realizing. Lamont, there'll never be a new year. You're absolutely right. Unless this can be stopped. But how can anyone stop it? Nothing human could have caused a thing like this to happen. I'm not so sure, Margot. Hughes told me that a cousin of his, a brilliant scientist, claimed to have invented a time machine. That cousin of Hughes may be responsible for what's happened to time. But who is this man? Where did he live? Hughes didn't say. I'll have to find him some way. And when I do, Margot, it'll be as the shadow. Perhaps the shadow will be able to switch time back to normal. Bring the new year to a world doomed to live a day which never ends. In just a minute, the curtain rises on Act Two of The Shadow's Adventure. Meanwhile, a word to you motorists. Do you slow down passing a school? Do you pass other cars on a hill? Do you come to a full stop at street intersections? The shadow wonders. The terrific toll of deaths and injuries indicates that too many motorists fail to exercise caution, fail to consider the other fellow. Play safe. It pays. And motorists, here's one thing more. If you only realize the importance that safe tires, too, play in safe motoring, you wouldn't hesitate a minute to put the new Goodrich Safety Silver Towns with the Lifesaver Tread on your car. For remember, this new Silvertown is much more than a new tire. It's a new kind of tire safety. On the inside, it has the famous blowout protection of the Goodrich Golden Ply. And on the outside, it has the amazing new Lifesaver Tread. The tread that sweeps wet roads so dry, you can actually light a match on its track. Yes, sir, that's plenty dry. So it's hardly surprising that Silvertowns will give you the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had. Margot, keep holding on to me. I will, Lamont. We can walk. My apartment isn't far. Oh, why don't you let me come with you? No, Margot. This is the shadow's job. It may be dangerous. I want you to be safe. Safe in a world gone mad? Uh, oh. Well, watch yourself. The streets are slippery with ice. Here, hold on to me more tightly. Uh. We'll cross here. Yes, Margot. And it'll happen all over again every 24 hours from now until doomsday. Oh, it's frightening. Look at that woman over and over. Unless I can put time back on its track, Margot. I must. I'm sorry. Oh, look at that poor man shivering in the doorway there. He hasn't even an overcoat. He looks hungry, poor devil. Margot, remember last night? In a moment, he'll step out of that doorway and ask me for a dime. Excuse me, mister. Could you give me a dime for a cup of coffee? I'm so cold, I'm freezing. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Mr. There's one thing I'm glad of, Lamont. He doesn't know. He doesn't know he's doomed to shiver and freeze and starve like that forever. And millions like him. Millions of unfortunate shivering and starving all over the world tonight. That machine. I must find that machine. Well, here we are, Margot. Don't bother to take me up. There's so much for you to do. So much, Lamont. The doorman will let me in. It's exactly the same time we got home last night. Good evening, Miss Lane. Bad night, ain't it? Hurry, Lamont. Find Hughes' cousin. Since time's repeating himself... Well, I always say when... Hughes will meet me in the afternoon at my club. Just as he met me yesterday. We'll talk as we talk then. Perhaps he'd be able to tell me... Lamont, what's the matter? You're so pale suddenly. It's funny. I felt weak just then. I... If my strength, the strength of my will were fading away, could it be that Lamont, I too... you mustn't. You've got to be strong. The world needs your strength. Well, Let go of me, Margot. All right. Fast. You're draining my power, my strength away. Let go. The wind is very biting, Miss Lane. Yes, it is. Fred, will you take me up to my apartment? Please? Yes, sure, Miss Lane. Gone. Safe upstairs. 
Goodbye, Margot. Until tomorrow. Tomorrow, Heba comes. Mr. Crank. Mr. On behalf of all the employees of the club, I wish to thank you for your generous Stuart, New Year's gift to the listen personnel. Listen to me. Can't you hear? Don't you the understand what I'm saying to you? Sir. And may I thank you, too, Mr. Hughes, for your gift. You're very Stuart. welcome, Stuart. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Stuart, stop. I wish I could have made it more, Cranston, but it hasn't been a terribly good year for Hughes, me. Hughes, let me take your hand. You're merely repeating what you said 24 hours ago. Poorly, though the doctor say she may pull out of it. Who is your cousin? That's why Who I'm looking he? forward does he to live? the New Year so eagerly. Oh, hopeless. He's not attuned to my will. I'll have to follow him. Make him lead me to this cousin of his. Expect to the be out of debt very shortly. I must concentrate. My willpower seems to be failing. I must hold on until Hughes visits his cousin. Convince Hughes? It can't be. It's impossible, Willard. It's a trick, a dream, a nightmare. You'll be saying that for all eternity. I'm, I'm getting out of here. Are you, cousin? Try to, if you can. I can't. I can't. I'm paralyzed. I can't get out of this chair. Hughes, you can. You You're not paralyzed. Now, yes. don't you, Hughes? Yes, horrible pain. Hughes, there is no pain. You but shouldn't turn. have drunk. You hear me? Hughes. Your glass is seen to slow poison. No, see. no, help, help. I have helped you, Hughes. You were not poisoned. I substituted this antidote for the poison in the glass of Sherry Willard handed you. You're not poisoned, I tell you. Exert your will, attune it to mine. Try to get out of that chair. Yeah. Hold me. Hold me. Now try. I've broken the grip of the time spell a little. I made something happen that didn't happen yesterday. You did something just now you didn't do then. You drank the antidote instead of the poison. Try. Try yours. I, I heard a voice. A voice. But there's no one here. No one but... but... Try. Try it, said. Chair. Out of the chair. Ah. I'm standing. I'm free. Free. Thank the Lord. Hughes, can you hear me now? Who are you? Who are you? I, I see only Willis. I don't think he sees me. I, I feel someone holding me. Who are you? Never mind who I am, Hughes. Get out of this house at once. Go to the home of your friend, Lamont Cranston. Yes, yes. You are to attend the New Year's Eve party there. Yes. Remember? Yes, yes. I, I seem to remember. Go now, Hughes. You don't need me to hold you now. I will you to go. Yes, a little while yes, yes. now, cousin. A little while. It's almost midnight. You'll die just before midnight. <laughs> I... Where am I? Who is that? Ah, uh, you feel my power now, Willard. I'm holding you fast. Fast, do you hear? I will. Submit to my will. It dominates you. Snatches you from the feel of that evil time spell you cast over the world. I'm powerless in the grip of some invisible force. And it speaks. Who are you? Who? I am the shadow. The shadow? Dr. Willard, you are guilty of the greatest crime ever perpetrated against mankind. You thought to condemn the rest of the world to an eternity of cold and darkness and suffering. No, no, I didn't mean to do that. You wanted an eternal life of pleasure, of evil. You tried to stave off forever. The death that hung over you like a sword. I don't want to die. To satisfy your selfishness, you tried to, you did break the laws of nature. And so you must be punished, Dr. Willard. Punished? How? In a moment, I shall smash your devilish time machine. Reduce it to sprinters and scrap. And the instant the machine is smashed, time will snap back to normal. Instantaneously, time will take up where it left off. When you put the machine into operation. And so will come what you thought to destroy forever. The new year. The blessed new year. That means new hope and happiness for the good and the innocent people of the world. While for you, it will bring what God decreed for you. Death. No. No, don't smash the machine. Give me one more day of life, just one, and I'll smash it myself. Not one hour, not one oh. minute, not one just second. Don't let me die. Stop. Yes, Margot. The new year. At last. Why, 
Hughes. Oh, I'm sorry to be late, Francis. I, I don't know what happened to me. I feel as if I as if I just woke up from a bad dream. I, I, I found myself running, running up here. Mr. Hughes, you're ill. No, he's all right, Mongo. You are all right, aren't you, Hughes? Oh, I, I guess I, I am. Uh, what time is it? It's just past 12 o'clock, Mr. Hughes. Happy New Year. New Year? Yes, yes. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, Hughes. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. As a matter of fact, Lamont, it seems to me I had a dream, too. The strangest sort of dream. Perhaps you did, Margo. Well, anyway, Happy New Year, Lamont. Happy New Year. program is based on a story copyrighted by the Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is now on sale at your local newsstand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> The thrilling adventures of the shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. On old time sundials, a favorite motto was this. It's later than you think. Winter has a way of sneaking up on us and striking hard at those who are unprepared. Cold weather all around us will be here any day without notice. Are you prepared? It's later than you think. Safeguard your family by ordering a supply of blue coal right now. You know, blue coal is the finest of Pennsylvania hard coal. It will keep every room in your house at a comfortable, even temperature at all times. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow. And listen, in a few minutes, I want to tell you about a strange and exotic token, a unique piece of jewelry that blue coal has for you. So listen carefully. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and powerful secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama... The Ring of Light. I 
I should like to review the Gengar murders for you, Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston. I assure you it will require no longer than we will take to finish this cup of tea. I'm glad you left me out of that tea business, Shan. I know all I want to know about the Gengar murders. They've kept me up all night long. But I'm afraid you cannot know very much about the real reason for the killings, Commissioner Weston, without some knowledge of the history of the Ring of Light. It's history? Yes, Mr. Cranston. Well, what about the history of the Ring of Light, Mr. Shan? Many centuries ago, according to ancient legend, there was a merchant bearing this name of Genga, who dwelt in the sacred city of Lhasa in my native Tibet. This Genga of olden times was a good man and beloved of the gods. One night, it is told, he was returning from market to the sacred city when he was pursued by a host of his enemies mounted on horseback. Fleeing across the eastern bridge to the city walls, he found the great gates of the city locked before him. In despair, he flung himself at the feet of the luminous statue of Buddha which guarded the gate. As he did so, there was the sound of thunder, and from the glowing ear of the phosphorescent image, a ring fell to the ground. Quickly, Genga the merchant picked it up, and the statue of Buddha miraculously spoke. Oh, Genga, merchant of Lhasa, I have given to you this night the ring of light. Unto the thousandth generation it will bring good fortune and safety, so long as there be no blood upon the hands of its owner. Treasure it well, O oh, Genga. But great Buddha, my enemies are almost upon me. Behold, Genga, where your enemies are crossing the eastern bridge. Look well... the legend has it that the vast bridge collapsed, destroying every man of Genga's enemies. Well, it doesn't mean much to me. Does it to you, Cranston? I'm afraid it means quite a good deal, Commissioner. And was this merchant the ancestor of the modern Gengas, Mr. Shan? Yes, Miss Lane. Many centuries have passed since, bringing wealth and glory to the Genga family, which eventually immigrated to America. One of the Gengas of the present generation was my partner in the firm of Genga and Shan of this city. Importers of precious gems. Our business prospered, and my partners, Mr. Genga's son, Ali, was heir to many millions of dollars. All went well until one night when Mr. Genga, alone in the vault room of our huge building, heard the automatic elevator ascending. Who can that be? I didn't want to be disturbed at this of all times. Yes? I wish to see Mr. Genga. I am Mr. Genga, young woman. No one is allowed in my vault room without credentials. I have proper credentials, Mr. Genga. Then show them to me. What do you have, some letter? No. This is my credential. You see? A revolver. A revolver. It is the only credential I can show. Oh, no. Hassan, help me! Please! Your servant Hassan is on the first floor. He wouldn't even hear a pistol shot. I see. You're aware of that. Well... What is it you want? The key to your vault. I rather thought so. And if I refuse? The key, Genga. You're a most determined young woman. I am. Then here, take it by all means. Take it. You're very gracious. Now to proceed with your vault. Of course. How calmly you accept this, Mr. Genga. Ah. My jewels, dear lady, are in the left-hand compartment. I know that. But my interest happens to be in this very ordinary copper box right here. No. No, that you cannot touch. Really? I will not let you have the ring of light. I shouldn't be rash if I were you. I have nothing to lose by killing you, you know. I only know you cannot have what that box contains. Sorry, but I must, Mr. Genga. I... Your life, Mr. Genga, for this copper box. <laughs> of course you didn't really give your life for this silly box. You died for the ring of light, the chicken. Where is it? No. No, this can't be. Genga! Genga, don't die. No. No, you're dying for nothing. The ring of light, it, it's gone. The 
rest of the story of the Ring of Light you remember, Mr. Cranston? Mm, very well, Mr. Shannon. Well, he should. He and Miss Lane came to my office, and Miss Lane was saying... Mr. Weston, I don't give a hang if your criminals have a new union and are working in 24-hour shifts. We are all three going to the theater tonight. No, no, Margot. No? The commissioner is a very busy man. That's right, Lamont. I am a vet. Oh, I see. You're being smart, huh? Well, let me tell you, every time I try to leave this office early, somebody knocks on the door. But it never happens when you two are around. Someone just did knock on the door, Commissioner. Now, just a minute. I was talking to Mr. Cranston before you entered. Now, wait a second. I thought I heard a knock on the door. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Commissioner Weston, is he in here? Yes, he's in here. Matter of fact, I'm Weston. I am Ali Genga. The small world. My father, you have heard of, I think. He was Mr. Genga of Genga and Shan. Was? Isn't Mr. Genga still in business? My father is gone. Gone? Dead? I do not know, but last evening he vanished from the vault room of our building. Vanished? Did you say vanished? Yes. His old servant, Hassan, phoned to me the news this morning. He phoned to you the news, did he? Well, that's just great. And where was his partner, Mr. Shan, all this time? Mr. Shan has been for some time ill in his home in the mountains. Well, was anything stolen? Yes. There was something stolen. What was it? It is difficult to say. I should like this kept in strictest confidence. You see, my father was in possession of a ring. Who slammed that door? The lights have gone out. Stay where you are, everybody. Don't move an inch. Lamont, look, there against the window. What is it? Why, it's a perfect circle of light. Look out, Whistler. What was that? We'll need the lights to see. Look, it's a knife. Sticking up in your desk. There is a note pinned to it. Could I see what it says? We'll all see. Yeah. Listen to this, Weston. Yeah? It says, let those with blood on their hands remain silent. That's strange. It is most strange. I must go to the Gengen Shan building immediately. It is most important that I reach my father's vault room as quickly as possible. Magnificent lobby. Well, lobby or no lobby, that young guy, Ali, is keeping us waiting down here a long time, isn't he? Well, I don't I know. I beg he may your be... pardon. My name is Hassan, servant to the house of Genga for many years. Young Master Ali will be down from the vault room presently. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Oh, Hassan, you were Ali's father's devoted servant. You must know something about his disappearance. This alone, I can say. Even in this far-off land... The hand of the Buddha of Lhasa has stuck. What was that? Sounds like young Ali. Let's get up there. Something tells me that that vault room is a very unhealthy place right at this moment. So, so this is the vault room. Where is he? Yes, where is Ali Lamont? The room's empty. He was here right enough, but... What is it, Cranston? Look. Over there in the shadows by the vault. A body. Master. Master. Is it Ali? If it is, he's aged 30 years since he left us downstairs. Oh, look. Look. It isn't Ali, is it, Hassan? No. It is Mr. Genga, Ali's father. He who vanished has returned. Returned with a bullet in his heart. Hassan. Yes? Open this vault. No. Master, no want me to open vault. Take the keys off the dead man's watch chain and open it. Open the vault. All right. But you have heard my warning. Come on. Look, who is it? <sighs> this time it's the son, Alley, all right. That killed him too, Weston. I had an idea there'd be something in this vault worth seeing. In a moment, our play will continue. Meanwhile... Here's the information I promised you about the strange and exotic talisman that Blue Coal has for you. It's a replica of the mystic ring that plays so large a part in today's story. There are many strange and fascinating things about this ring. To begin with, it is not gold or silver as ordinary rings are. It is white. In India, white is considered a sacred color. The rare white elephant is worshipped in India. Mysterious power is said to reside in things white. Certainly, when you see this ring, you'll agree there is something uncanny about it. You'll say that because you'll soon discover that this ring is greedy for light. Like the wild jungle orchid that eats live meat, this ring sucks up the living light. It holds the light and glows in the dark with a weird and ghostly radiance. 
Yes, you actually can see in the dark with this ring when it's gorged with light. Now listen, here's how to get one for yourself. Simply send ten cents in coin, coin, one dime, to the shadow. Post Office Box 5, Madison Square Station, New York City, New York. Include on a slip of paper the words Mystic Ring. M-Y-S-T-I-C, Mystic Ring. And also, of course, your name and address in full. Be sure to print or write your name and address clearly, so it will be easy to read. Drop the envelope in the mail, and soon you'll have a mystic light-eating ring for yourself. Take care of that today, because the supply of rings is limited. Now, back to the shadow. Hassan, no stay. He no stay here. Mr. Kinga come back dead. Now young Master Ali dead too. Mr. Shan will be next. Hassan is afraid. He no stay. Wait a minute, you. Hassan. Let him go, Weston. He won't go far. Look at this, Weston. The killer used a knife this time. What about it? Nothing. Except it's a perfect match of the dagger that was sticking in your desk. What? Look it over. I'd like to wander around a bit. Come on. Oh, yes, Margo. Look at this. I found it over there in the corner. It's a girl's handkerchief. A girl's handkerchief? Yes. Well, let me see that, Margo. And it's monogram, too. You see, K.I. K.I. Now, I wonder... What's that? What, Lamont? I smell something burning. Listen. That's fire, all right. We better get out of here. In just a minute, Weston. Whoever set that fire doesn't want us to find something in this room. We've got to work fast. But we can't let them scare us away. Cranston, sometimes I... Uh, say, what's this? What? Letter in Alley's billfold. Addressed to Miss Kara Iltat, 421 North Set Road. Kara Iltat, eh? That would be our initials, K.I. Oh, the light is breaking through. And so is the fire, Miss Lane. I tell you, we're going to get out of here. All right, you two leave by the fire escape. I'll meet you in the car. What are you going to do? I think our friend Hassan is still in this building. And if he is, we two have something to talk over. This is Hassan speaking. I am phoning you from your building, Mr. Shan. It is on fire. Yes, on fire. There is nothing you can do to save it. But I can tell you all you want to know about it. Yes. Meet me at 421 North Set Road in one hour. Yes, that's right, Mr. Shaft. Goodbye, Mr. Shaft. <laughs> now, if nothing goes wrong, we will soon have... <laughs> what was that? It is the shadow, Hassan. I'm standing beside you, invisible to your eyes. Well, why have you come to Hassan? To get the truth from you. I, I know nothing. Nothing. You know there was a woman here on the night old Mr. Genga was murdered. Don't you, Hassan? Answer me. Uh, yes, this much I know. And her name was Kara Iltut. Who is Kara Iltut, Hassan? I, I do not know. Let me go. The flames are spreading. Let me get out of here. I set this fire to get Mr. Cranston and Weston and Miss Lane out of the building, but it will get me and you too, boys, if we don't hurry. The fire is spreading, but you will not leave until I have the truth. Tell me, Hassan. I will tell you. I will tell Kara Iltat was secretly engaged to young Master Ali Genga, but his father knew nothing of her. She came here the day of the murder. She paid me well to let her up to the vault room, and when she came down, she left orders with me to set fire to this building if the police ever tried to examine that room upstairs. That is all. All I know. I see. You have kept this from the law, Hassan. I warn you that the shadow will be watching you. I must go now. I will let you escape from the fire you set. But next time, Hassan, you will not escape. <laughs> Where are we, Lamont? Look at the towers on that house. It's like a palace out of the Arabian night. It's 421 North Set Road, Margot, and I only hope we won't be too sorry we came. Come on, help me. I think we're creating a wonderful yarn to spin to our grandchildren. Well, you have to keep alive, you know, to have grandchildren. We'll see if we can manage to do that, my lady. Say, look at this. What? The door was open. I'm not too sure I like that, but in we go. It's pitch dark in here. I've got a feeling something's watching every move we make. What's that? Someone's in trouble. Where's it coming from? This way. Come on, follow me. Come on, look. The lights have gone on. What was that, Alfie? Where are we? Seems we're in a small room without a sign of a window. Look, those copper doors are closing. Uh, we better get out of here. Uh, a little late now. Looks as if we're trapped. You are trapped, my friend. Look. Up there on that little balcony. 
Oh, yes. Miss Kara Iltut, I believe. I am Miss Iltut. If I'm not too hospitable, you must understand it's because I'm concerned in a rather dangerous business. I murdered Mr. Genga. You see, I'm in love with his stepson, Ali. Stepson? Yes. Ali is his stepson, and old Genga was not too fond of him. As a matter of fact, he was going to leave his most priceless possession to his business partner, Mr. Shan, because he distrusted Ali. That is why it was necessary to rob him, and as it happened, uh, to kill him in the process. And now, for Ali's sake, it is necessary to kill you. Hold him on. Easy, Mongo. It will be a painful death, but the most convenient I can afford you just now. No, you'll never get away with it. Oh, yes, I will. It will be quite simple, you know. Beneath the floor on which you're standing is a bat, brim full of boiling water. It is an old Tibetan way of ridding the world of troublesome people. No, you wouldn't. I tell you, I will. See, all I need to do is pull this lever. Come on. Come on, the floor is opening. Come on. Come on. Back toward this wall. What are we going to do, Lamont? Wait a minute. The floor is opening slowly. Keep backing away from the opening. I think I've got an idea. What's that? She evidently hasn't heard what happened to Allie. Huh? Have you got that letter, Weston? Yes, yes, I have. There it is. Yeah, give it to me. Miss Hilltouch! Miss Hilltouch! This will do you no good to plead with me. You must die. I know you don't mind boiling us alive, but I don't think you'd want to boil Allie's last words with us, would you? Allie's last words? This letter. It was found on his dead body. Dead? Wait, I'll stop the machinery. There. Now listen to me. I have a gun here. I'll come down outside and open the door. You can hand the letter out to me. If you try to leave that room, I'll shoot you as surely as I killed old Genga. Do you understand? We understand, Miss Hiltut. Hand me the letter. I will not open the door another inch. You hear me in there? Where is the letter? I'll take that gun, Miss Hilton. Oh. I will grab a crash. Oh, no, not quite as quickly as all that. Lamar, she's getting away. I don't think she'll get too far. Unless I'm badly mistaken, she still has another victim to deal with before she leaves this house. And we've got to stop her, Clancy. Just as fast as we can. Oh. Uh, where'd that come from? Up there from the towers of the house. Someone's in agony. I think I see it all now. Weston. Yes. I want you to stay here with Margot for a few moments while I see what occupies our murdering lady friend. Don't kill me. Hold him, Hassan. He will not get away, Miss Kara. Mr. Genga was very fond of you, wasn't he, Shan? I knew when I opened the copper box and found the ring missing that Ali's father had already given it to you. It was mine by right. Genga wanted me to have it. That doesn't interest me, Shan. Ali is dead now. And I will take from you the thing he wanted if I have to kill us all. It was very clever of you to have Hassan trick me into coming here. I think so. And now, where is the ring, Shan? You shall never learn from me. Mr. Sean doesn't believe that we'll throw him from this tower. He doesn't believe it, Hassan. Pull him over to the ledge. Oh. Yes, Miss Cara. Come over the ledge. Help. Help. Oh. Obey me, Hassan. Yes, Miss Cara. I try. I try. But he's an old man. Surely you could push him over. I cannot move him. It is as if someone were holding him. There is nothing I can do. Someone were holding him. Someone does hold him, Carrie Tut. <laughs> you speak. The shadow. Your days of murder are over. And you, Hassan, I warned you once. Now you will pay for your crime. No. No. It was she. You lied. She made me do it. She made me do her bidding. She would have had me throw old Chang to his death, but you came in time. And now, now she goes off the tower. She would have had Chang go. No. Stop, Hassan. Stop. <laughs> So my life was saved, and Hassan is now imprisoned on charge of murder. There, I told you it would not take long to tell my story. And you'll see we have scarcely finished our cup of tea. But still, still I don't understand who killed poor Ollie. That is very easily explained, Miss Lane. Yes, yes, very easily. By the way, Mr. Shan, your drawing room is quite charming. But I think it rather spoils the symmetry to have those two daggers... Missing from the weapon rack over the fireplace. You know where those two daggers are, don't you, Mr. Clint? Yes. One of them is sticking in Weston's desk, where you threw it to warn Allie not to report the theft of the ring to the police. The other? It couldn't be sticking in Allie's back, that other one, could it? You. You killed him, Mr. Shan. Yes, Miss Lane, I killed him. And now, Mr. Cranston, will you switch off the light? No tricks now. There will be no tricks. 
There, Mr. Shen. Thank you. Please, now, will you open the door of the little shrine on the table? Yes, Mr. Shen. The ring of light. So it is. Yes, the gift of Buddha to the house of Genga. It was mine by right. But I realized that Ali would never let me keep his father's gift in peace, so I killed him. When I opened the vault to put his body in it, I found my partner there shot to death. And I was content that I had killed the evil son who had plotted old Genga's murder with Kara Iltot. It was still murder you committed, Mr. Shan. You know that? Oh, yes, I know. I did it to keep the ring. But the ways of Buddha are wise, Mr. Cranston. Too late did I remember the legend. What do you mean, Mr. Shan? The ring is in my possession. But it will bring me no good fortune. I own the ring, but there is blood on my hands. I am lost according to the words of Buddha. You know what the police will do to you for this, Sean? No. I have already paid for my sins, Weston. Your cups of tea were not as mine. Mine has the poisonous smell of bitter almonds. The smell of prussic acid. I will account only to my ancestors. Commissioner. Turn on those lights. Mr. Sean. Mr. Sean. He's dead, Weston. And he's smiling at the ring of light. Now, you see, Commissioner Weston, you couldn't have understood the Genga murders without knowing about the power of the ring of light, could you? Oh, power poppycock. Where's the confounded thing now? Lamont is the custodian of the ring at the moment, I think, Commissioner. Well, give it to me, Cranston. I'm going to throw it out of the window. It's caused me enough trouble tonight. Well, I'm not so sure I'd do that, Commissioner. It might... Look out! Oh, what? <laughs> Well, from now on, we're living on borrowed time, eh, Commissioner? How did we ever come through that one alive? Now, don't go making something out of it. Why, I'd have sworn there wasn't room for two cars to pass each other back there. All right, all right. We're both doing around 50, Weston. Maybe the ring of light saved us. Oh, from... now, don't start any of that stuff around. Well, Commissioner, didn't you notice what was in that other car? Oh, he couldn't have, Lamont. Otherwise, he'd well, have... What was it? A ghost? No, Commissioner. It was a woman driver. A woman driver? Uh-huh. By the way, here's the ring of light, Commissioner. Do you want to throw it away? Uh, well, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's a pretty little thing. It doesn't take up any room, does it? And uh, besides, I could use a little luck when I try to explain to the missus why I've been out all night. <laughs> In a moment, we'll bring you again the easy directions for getting a mystic ring. So have paper and pencil ready. First, I know you'll be interested in hearing from Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, John Buckley. Mr. Buckley. Thank you. Friends, the other day I ran into a chap I know, and he was somewhat annoyed with me. He said, why do you keep insisting it's so easy to operate a furnace? Probably isn't the hardest thing in the world, but it certainly isn't easy. <laughs> well... And that only shows that even your friends don't always listen carefully to what you say. I say it's easy to operate a furnace if you know how. Now, that latter part is very important. For example, in the changeable weather we're having now, it's a nuisance to have to run down to the basement constantly to adjust the furnace dampers. Well, all that trouble is eliminated when you have an automatic blue coal heat regulator. As easy to operate as snapping a light switch automatically opens and closes the dampers on your furnace and keeps every room at an even temperature at all times. Now, here's my suggestion. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow. Ask him to send a John Barkley trained serviceman to your home to demonstrate correct furnace operation for you at no charge, no obligation. Your neighborhood dealer is listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Call him tomorrow. Thank you. Characters' names, places, and plot of today's story are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The mysterious East beckons to you. Here is your chance to get the mystic white ring that has the secret power of retaining light. Once this ring is held near a bright light, it absorbs part of the radiance, and afterward, in the dark, it shines with a grim, eerie glow. 
Get one of these rings for yourself by sending 10 cents in coin to The Shadow. Post Office Box 5, Madison Square Station, New York City, New York. Be sure to include your name and address, printed or written clearly. Do this at once, because the supply is strictly limited. Send one dime in an envelope with your name and address and the words Mystic, M-Y-S-T-I-C, Mystic Ring, to The Shadow. Post Office Box 5, Madison Square Station, New York City, New York. Do that today. This ring will be a bond between you and the shadow who says... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. (laughs) Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by the DL and W Coal Company, producers of Blue. Thrilling Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. It's not patriotic to hoard food or money, but it is patriotic to put in a good supply of coal right now. You'll be helping your government out of possible future transportation problems and also helping and insuring yourself by keeping the full supply on hand. Get enough to last you until summertime. Place your order of coal now and insist on blue coal because this superior fuel is especially prepared for home use, especially prepared to give you dependable home heating with real economy. Be prepared. Call your blue coal dealer tomorrow morning. Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama... The Return of Anatole Chevenik. Great jewel robbery. Read all about it. All clues point to Anatole Chevenik. Police sure of arrest in 24 hours. All right, Chevenik. Your little game is over. Really, Commissioner Weston? Yeah, Chevenik. Those notes with your name on them, warning us that you were going to steal the jewels, the white gardenia that you always leave, you won't wiggle out of this. There are just two things you have overlooked, Commissioner. Yeah, what? Point number one, you have not been able to find the jewels which you say I I purloined. Point number two, at the time this robbery occurred, I was 3,000 miles from here. And I can prove it. Something has got to be done about Anatole Chevenik. Three times he's struck in 60 days. The police must do something. But my jewels, the police are helpless. Warns victims in advance. Police are powerless. What can we do against him? He always has an alibi. Eh? Who is he? Who is there? You. Why have you come here? Put that in your hand. No, no. No. Stay away. No. Oh! And so murder closed the book on Anatole Shevenik. 
But is that all? Can the elusive Shevenik solve the mystery of that last great darkness? Who can say what faint line divides the quick from the dead? And once having crossed that line, is it possible to return? This is the case of Anatole Shevenik, which strangely enough begins with the end of Anatole Shevenik. There, gentlemen, on that slab here in the morgue lies the mortal remains of Anatole Shevenik. At last, we know where he is. No thanks to you, West. Your police would never have caught him. Ah, listen to him, Cranston. You'd think that he, the great one and only special investigator Devlin, had been personally responsible for it. As a matter of fact, gentlemen, neither of you came anywhere near catching him. Well... Shevenick even sent notes telling the police where and when he would strike next. And what about the white gardenia, his signature? Some police force. He always had a perfect alibi. And for that matter, what did you do for the insurance companies that pay your salary? All you ever did was pass the buck to me and my men... Some special investigator. Now, just Mr. a minute. Mr. Devlin, uh, Commissioner, please remember where we are. That body lying there. Oh, quite so crazy. Well, yes. it's foolish for us to argue, Devlin. Our troubles are over now, anyhow. I'd say they were just beginning, Commissioner. Shevenick was murdered. Who did it? We don't know yet, Cranston, but we're working on it. Not much to work on, Commissioner. Shevenick was found stabbed to death in his apartment, killed by a sharp-pointed instrument. I believe your police report reads... A gem cutter's tool. Well, they probably used it to cut up the stolen gem so they couldn't be identified. Gem cutting is too delicate a job for a one-handed man, Commissioner. One hand? Yeah, Shevenick's right hand's missing. Severed at the wrist. We discovered that when we found his body. Why, I can't believe it. Now look for yourself. I will. Hmm, so it is. Then that's the reason he always wore those gray suede gloves. Yeah, to conceal his artificial right hand. This only proves how little anyone really knew of Anatole Shevenick. No accomplices, no friends. He was the man nobody knew. Anatole Shevenick, the great jewel thief, had only one hand. One hand, two hands. What difference does it make? Difference, Commissioner. I can't help thinking that if his right hand hadn't been cut off by a bandsaw when he was a child, he might never have turned to crime. What's that? Somebody just came in the morgue. Can't see who it is. The light is so dim. Not me, gentlemen, but... Uh... Am I right in assuming that this is the body of Anatole Shevenick? Who are you? I'm George Gilroy. May I ask who you are? I, I'm Police Commissioner Weston, and I left strict orders that no one was to be admitted to the morgue while Shevenick's body was here. Indeed, Commissioner. I have a court order giving me the body for experimental purposes. Huh? You see, Anatole Shevenick willed his body to me. Oh, then you're Professor Gilroy, the man who... who brings back the dead as the sensation-seeking press would have it? <laughs> Let me reassure you. I have not been successful in my experiments. Yet. Shevenick returns from the dead. Police baffled. Daring jewel robberies continue. Shevenick returns from the dead. Everything all right, Commissioner? Oh, hello, Cranston. Oh, stop worrying, Devlin. Shevenick had better not show up here tonight. Commissioner, I... Come into this room here, will you? I can't talk over this din. All right. Can't blame Devlin for worrying about this wedding reception tonight, Commissioner. Oh. Mrs. Porter's jewels are insured with my company for fifty thousand dollars. Oh, now look, Devlin, Shevenick is dead. You saw his body lying in the morgue. I know, Commissioner, but that no telling us that he was coming here tonight. If Mrs. Porter's jewels are stolen, Devlin's right, Commissioner. Even with the fresh gardenia left with a warning note of Shevenick's signature. Cranston, I tell you, somebody is masquerading as Shevenick. Shevenick's in his grave, not grave, Commissioner. Remember, Professor Gilroy. Hey, that's right. Yes, Gilroy did take the body of Shevenick to his laboratory. Well, just a moment. Commissioner Weston. Yes, Mrs. Porter. This note was just thrust into my hands in the ballroom. Note? Let me see it. What? There's another gardenia wrapped up in it. Gardenia? What does the note say, Cranston? Jewels were made to be worn, but not by such as you. Signed merely with the initial C. C. And you think Shevenick is here? Oh. Commissioner, what'll I do? Mrs. Porter, if Shevenick got in here tonight, he won't get out. I'm going to call Cardona and his men on the grounds and give the alarm. Oh, uh, by the way, Mrs. Porter, it was very wise of you not to wear your jewels tonight. Not wear my jewels? Why, I am... Oh, 
My jewels are gone. Shevenick has stolen my jewels. And that's the story, Margot. Note, flower, and theft all point only to one man. You know, this whole business has Weston talking to himself. Oh, I can't say I blame him, Lamont. It is pretty weird. My bosom friend and companion, Big Charlie, used to talk to himself. But he quit. Why, Shrevey? He didn't like the answers he gave himself he didn't like. <laughs> oh, Shrevey. <laughs> That's the truth, Miss Lane. <laughs> Why, he got so sore on himself one day for something he said that he wouldn't speak to himself for days he wouldn't speak. <laughs> oh, Shrevey. Stop. Shrevey, sometimes I think you make these stories up. <laughs> Why, Mr. Cranston, are you putting the third degree to my veracity? Are you putting... <laughs> Shrevey, watch for your driving. Yes, sir, I always do. Oh, oh. Oh. Shrevey, for a moment there, I thought you were going to hit that other car. Yeah. Don't we live dangerously, though? Mm-hmm. Hey, what's this? What? It's wrapped up paper. I just noticed it. Let me see it. Here, Mr. Cranston. Thank you. Lamont, a white gardenia. Wrapped up in this note. Addressed to you, Margot. To me? Read it. It says, I have stolen no jewels from you. Instead, I give you a pearl. A pearl of wisdom. Your friend Lamont Cranston pursues a dangerous game when he pursues Anatole Shevenick. Lamont. Shrevey, go after that car that nearly ran into us. Well, it ain't nowhere in sight now, Mr. Cranston. He turned the corner up ahead. He was going like a shot he was going. Okay, Mr. Shevenick. We'll see about you later. What are you going to do, Lamont? Margo, you're going home. I'm going to see Commissioner Weston. You know, I've been rather lukewarm about this whole case up to now. But Mr. Shevenick has just aroused my sporting blood. I'm perfectly safe here in my own apartment. Now, go back to your cab, please. Must that be definite, Miss Lane? Mr. Cranston said... Definite. I'll be all right here alone. Well, well, okay, Miss Lane. I'll go right back to the Commissioner Weston's office and pick up Mr. Cranston I'll pick. Goodbye. Goodbye, Shrevey. If I needed a bodyguard, for goodness sake. What's this? A note, another one. Evidently, you don't take my written warning seriously, Miss Lane. So the next time, I shall have to give you my warning... In person. Oh. Yes, Miss Lane. Anatole Chevalier. But you... You're... Was is the correct tense, Miss Lane. I was dead. But as you see, I have even tricked death. <laughs> oh, what do you want? Merely to prove to you that Anatole Chevalier is alive. And to warn you, for the last time, not to allow Mr. Cranston to interfere with me. If he does... Ah, that is Mr. Cranston now, Miss Lane. Calling from police headquarters. Well, why don't you answer it? Hello? Margot? Yes, Lamont, I... I... You may tell him I'm here, Miss Lane. Lamont Anatole Shevenick is here at my apartment. What? Can you hold him till I get there? Well, I'll try... He wants me to stay here until he gets here, does he not? Margo. Margo, answer me. Unfortunately, I have urgent business elsewhere. Remember my warning. Lamont, he's just gone. And I'm shaking. Gone? Well, no matter. Shevenick and I shall meet sometime soon. Right now, I'm going to Professor Gilroy's laboratory and ask a few important questions. But Professor Gilroy has already been interviewed by the police. Yes, I know, Margot. But somehow, people have a way of talking when their interviewer is the shadow. In a moment, we'll continue with Act Two of The Return of Anatole Shevenick. First, a word about your health. This is the season for head cold. And among contributing causes are drafty rooms, poorly heated houses, and frequent quick changes of temperature. You'll find that heating your home with blue coal is a great help toward overcoming these dangers. You see, blue coal is especially prepared for home use, and that is very important. It means, for example, that blue coal is delivered to your home in just the proper size for your heating plant. The right size to give you even, dependable, comfortable warmth. You won't find the rooms too hot, You won't find them chilly. You'll find them at just the right temperature for comfortable, healthful living. Then, on top of that, when you install the new Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator, you immediately free yourself from the work and worry of adjusting furnace dampers. Goodbye to that. 
Goodbye to running up and down stairs, adjusting various chains and levers several times a day. You save effort, you save fuel, and you save money with the new Blue Coal heat regulator. Ask your Blue Coal dealer for a free demonstration tomorrow. He's listed under the words Blue Coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Now, back to the shadow. <laughs> stupid, stupid. They laugh at me at my experiments. Well, they shall see. <laughs> Professor Gilroy. What? That laugh? But there's nobody here but me. You're wrong, Professor Gilroy. The shadow is also here. Where are you? I can't see you. Are you a spirit? A spirit from the beyond? No, Professor. I am a man of flesh and blood as yourself. But don't look for me. No one has ever seen the shadow. What do you want of me, Invisible One? I want you to tell me the truth about your experiments with the body of Anatole Chebenik. What more can I tell you than that they're not completely successful, but we are progressing. Progressing? Suppose I were to tell you, Professor Gilroy, that Anatole Chebenik has been seen alive. Alive? Well, that's not possible yet. Shevnik's body is still here. Then, Professor Gilroy, you have no objections to my viewing the body, have you? I don't see what you'll gain by that, Shadow. It will remove any doubts I might have about your connections with the jewel thefts of Shevnik. Thefts committed since his supposed death. All right. If you must be convinced, come with me. You will see that I speak the truth. Here and here. This is my dissecting laboratory. Shevnik's body is lying in here. In this box. Mm. Yeah. Why? Why is... Yes, Professor Gilroy. Shevenick's body is gone. Yes, Governor. Uh, no, Governor, but uh, there is still no trace. Yes, uh, Shevenick's alive, all right. Uh, no doubt of it. Uh, yes, Governor, I... Uh, I know you want some action on this case. Now, I'll tell you the way I've got it all figured, Governor. I uh, have got it all... Uh, hello? Hello? Uh, it must have been cut off. It's a busy man. Very busy. Commissioner, that was the governor on the phone, wasn't it? <laughs> Very funny. Very funny. My job here is hanging by a thread because of this crazy Shevenick business, and all you two can do is make bad gags. All you have to do is give us your permission to enter Shevenick's house. For the 20th or... time, Cranston, the answer is no. Why? Miss Lane, I... For the 20th time, my reasons are the same. That house was sealed by the police after Shevenick was murdered so that the place could not be tampered with and possible clues destroyed or concealed. Well, then, Commissioner, now that you believe Shevenick to be alive... Who said that? You did, just a moment ago. Yeah, I saw it. Well, doggone it, he must be alive. Everything points to it. You say you saw him and then his body disappearing from Professor Gilroy's laboratory. So you see, there's no longer any reason to keep that apartment sealed. Well, I don't know, I don't know. Suppose the murderer should get... What murderer? What murderer? Anatole Shevenick's murderer, of course. But you just said that Anatole Shevenick was alive. If he's alive, he's not dead. So? There is no murder or murderer. It's obvious. Oh. Now, look, I... Uh, here. Here are the keys to Shevenick's apartment. Now get out of my office before I lose my mind completely. Thank you, Commissioner. Come on, Margot. Hold on, I don't think we're very welcome here today. <laughs> yeah, busy man. Very busy. Will you two get out of here? <laughs> this is it, Mr. Cranston. 7720 River Street. All right, Sweetie. Come on, Margot. Let's see what we can find in Shevenick's house. I hope it's not Shevenick. You could say that again. You could say it. Afraid, Shrevey? Uh, uh, you want I should wait for you here, Mr. Creston? <laughs> okay, Shrevey, I understand. You wait here. And if we're not out in ten minutes, call Commissioner Weston and have him come here. Yes, sir, I'll do that. Take good care of yourself, take. Up the steps, Margo. All right. Miss Lamont, this old house seems to hang right over the river. Yes, Shevenick must have picked it because it would be so easy to escape from. Come on. Oh, Shevenick really is inside. Well, this is apparently the only door to the house. And the police seal across the door is still intact. You... you go in first, Lamont. All right, Margo. Goodness, it's so dark in here. Yeah. Seems to be a long hall. Come on. Lamont, there's someone here. Where? I can feel it. Lamont in there. Look, Lamont. The shadow of a woman against the windows. Yes, Margot. So it is. Feel along the wall for the light switch. All right. Got it. You, Anatole? Anatole? Yes, Anatole. 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 Anatole
Anatole. Come on. Quiet. Anatole, is that you? Switch on the lights, Margot. Oh. Who are you? May I ask you the same question? I am the wife of Anatole Shevenik. I suppose you are from the police. His wife, but I thought that... You thought that Anatole had no wife. But you are wrong. He fooled everyone. No one knew I existed. Well, when we came in here, the door was sealed. How did you get in? There are more than one means of getting in and out of Anatole Shevenik's house. Mrs. Shevenik, your husband, if he is still alive, will be brought to justice eventually, so if I... If he is still alive? You say that very strangely. Well, you know, of course, that your husband was murdered. Oh, no. No, he is not dead. I can prove it. It is this newspaper. Here. Read it. What does it say, Lamont? It's an item in the personal column. It says... Rene, come to the apartment tonight, signed A.C. You see? It is a signal we had agreed upon. Does that prove to you he is alive? He will be here tonight. Uh, but you will not catch him. He is too clever. Mrs. Shevenick, this may be a trap to get you. Oh, no, no. There are only two other people who know my husband. There is no... What's that? It sounds like someone's in the other room. I will see who that is. Wait, I'll come with you. No, run! Stop! Stop, I say! Run in there and lock the door. Shevenick must be there. Well, if he's in there. Go, Rennie. You will to the police, eh? Lamont, that Shevenick, I couldn't forget that boy. I'll have to break this door down, Margot. Look out. Lamont, he's gone. Yes, must have escaped through some secret passage the way she got in. I, I wonder where she... Lamont, there, behind that sofa. Oh, Lamont, she's dead. He stabbed her. Yes, Margot. Wait a minute. This is very strange. What, Lamont? This woman was stabbed by a right-handed man. Anatole Shevenik didn't have a right hand. Yes, I'm sure of it, Margot. It couldn't have been Anatole Shevenik who stabbed her. But she called his name. She must have believed it was he. And I recognized his boy through that door. No, it doesn't add up, Margot. There's some vital piece in this crazy puzzle that's missing. Oh, Lamont, what do you suppose it is? Missing? Missing? Somehow the missing hand is the solution to the whole mystery, Margot. Now, what is the connection? Well, why don't you talk it over with the Commissioner Weston and Mr. Devlin? Maybe they can... Devlin? That's it, Margot. If no one knew anything about Shevenick, how could Devlin know that Shevenick's hand had been cut off by a bandsaw when he was a child? It was just a slip, but I hear... Well, when did Mr. Devlin say that? That day we viewed Anatole Shevenick's body in the morgue. I see it perfectly now. Margot, call the police and tell them to surround the house of Peter Devlin. The shadow is going to pay him a call. And if I'm correct... The case of Anatole Shevenick will finally end tonight. You will continue on with me, Peter Devlin. You have traveled too far along the road to turn back now. I never knew about the murder. Not until it happened. This gem-cutting tool in my hand is sharp. I can use it. I have used it before for other things besides changing the shape and sizes of stolen jewels. And if I go to the police... Oh, no, I tried to go to the police tonight, and she is no longer able to talk. Think it over. I can do both jobs. You've seen that for yourself. For now, Anatole Shevenik will have two hands. I can steal the jewels and cut them as well. No. Your share will be bigger now. No, Shevenik. You are the only one who could reveal me to the police. He is dead because he tried to withhold some of the gems. Rene is dead because she could not be silent. And you are the only one left. Why, it would be so easy no, to... No, no, please. Don't kill me, please. Fool. Coward. I don't need you. I can work alone. <laughs> Shevenik. What? Who calls my name? The Shadow. Shevenik, the Shadow. Yes. I've heard of you, Shadow. You are the one I feared most. So, Jacques Shevenik. Your brother Anatole had an identical twin. That explains the so-called return of Anatole Shevenik. You took his place. His twin brother. Yes, my brother is dead. I killed him. You also murdered your brother's wife. She knew too much. And you, Devlin, yours is the greater crime. You worked for the insurance companies as a special investigator. And you were informed of all plans to protect the jewels from the Shevenick brothers. The plans which you gave to them in return for your share of the loot. Shadow, I was wrong. I, I see it now. What can I do to make up for my crime? You can testify against this murderer here. Perhaps the court will be lenient with you. Testify against me? No, Devlin. If you are dead, no one will know. There will be no proof. Look out, Devlin, that knife! Uh, You've killed him. <laughs> yes, Shadow. His tongue is silent. Now the law can never get me. Jacques 
Jovanich. You have been tried and found guilty of murder in the first degree by a jury of your peers. All through this trial, you have been silent. Have you anything to say before this court pronounces sentence upon you? Your Honor, it is true that I have not spoken. I believed I would be wiser not to speak. But now that the trial is over, I realize what I have done. I know what a fool I was ever to believe that I could break the laws and not pay. I know now that my life would have been happier and would have come to a better end if I had stayed on the right side. That is all. Jacques Chevenich, it is the sentence of this court that you be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. A real-life drama proving that crime does not pay will be presented immediately after a message from John Barclay. Here he is, Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, Mr. Barclay. Thank you, and good evening, friends. Most of us have our hands pretty full these days, not only with our regular daily work, but also various war defense jobs, such as air raid wardens, volunteer fire auxiliaries, and so forth. This leaves us less time to pay attention to our own personal comfort. A large portion of every family's comfort these days is naturally derived from the home. Home heating, for instance, is an important function towards affording us complete relaxation. And one advantage you folks have in home heating is the John Barclay serviceman. He's at the beck and call of any hard coal user. Now, while there isn't a great deal of difficulty generally encountered in the regulating of your heating plant, there are sometimes little things that keep it from operating properly and economically. It takes on your part just a telephone call to have a John Barclay serviceman inspect your heating plant. He'll give you many little tips on adjusting your dampers and also tell you, which is very important, the proper size coal you should use. You'll find your John Barclay serviceman a courteous, businesslike, and helpful individual. He represents a service offered only by your neighborhood blue coal dealer, and it is his job to see that you get the best results from your heating plant. So, folks, tomorrow morning, call your neighborhood blue coal dealer and ask him to send over a John Barclay serviceman. At no cost, no obligation to you. And remember... This service is offered exclusively by your Blue Coal dealer. Thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Berlin, Germany. A stormtrooper, revolver in his holster, calls it a German home. He knocks on the front door. Yo, what is it? I have come for the regular victory drive collection. It is being doubled this week. Oh, no. No, I can't afford it. Are you trying to tell me you want to sabotage the great war, Abbott? Oh. Get some money. Oh, I'll get it. I'll get it. Please don't hurt me. That's one way to collect money. The dictator's way. In America, the free man's way is different. Nobody comes to your house with a gun in his hand. You must go of your own free will to your nearest bank or post office and buy defense bonds, buy defense stamps, buy as many as you can. Buy them regularly. That's the only way to prove to the Nazis that for nations, justice for men... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows... <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story was produced by the DLNW Coal Company, distributors of blue coal. Oh, uh-huh.
thoughts of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, Death Speaks Twice. <laughs> Framed. Framed. You were framed, Paul. Shut up. Shut up, will you? You yeller. You were framed and you know it. And you're afraid to do anything about it. What is there to do about it? I won't be out of here for two more years. Maybe yes. Maybe no. Meaning? Meaning I found a way out of this cracker box pen. No. No, I told you before, I, I'm not going to break out of here. So you want to do your full time, huh? Just an honest embezzler. For the last time, I'm telling you I had nothing to do with any embezzlement. Sure, Paul, sure, I know. Your Uncle George Bartow framed you, and you're too scared to do anything about it. But I'm going to do something, something to pay him back for the life rap he gave me. Now, oh, talk is cheap. Yeah, you're right. But once we're outside... Sorry, Marty. I said I wasn't interested in escape. Okay. Have it your way, then. Good night, kid. Good night. Ah, prison beds are hard, ain't they, kid? Yeah, yeah. Say, uh, it's too bad about that good-looking dame whose picture you got on the wall there. Peggy Sanders? What about her? Suppose I were to tell you that I know she's Judge Bartow's ward. Where'd you find that out? Oh, there's ways, even in prison. Suppose I told you that I heard that your girlfriend, Peggy, is going to marry your stepbrother next week. Going to marry Edwin? Oh, no, no. Oh, she wouldn't. She, she loves me. Maybe your uncle, the good judge, used some pressure. Maybe he's forcing her to marry Edwin. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be too hard now to talk her out of marrying a jailbird. Shut up, Marty. Shut up. Okay, okay. So I'm talking too much, eh? <laughs> uh, good night, kid. You know, you, you're a fool to try to make that prison break, Marty. <laughs> Strictly. Yeah. You think you can make it? I told you it was a cinch. All right. I'm going with you, Marty. There's something I've got to attend to outside. All right. All out, men. All right, kid. Everything's set. When it starts, we head for the far wall under the watchtower. I see how we're going to get away with it. And I watch it. The screws keep moving. Right. Now, here's the way we work it. We're going to get a little help, help from the boys. When I give them the signal, they're going to start a little commotion down at that end of the yard. Yeah. That's our cue to head for the watchtower. We won't even be noticed. The guards will be busy with that phony fight. Uh-huh. Now, this is it, kid. I'm going to give it to them. All right, boys. Keep it. Hey, you'll keep your hands here. Ah, <laughs> Not too fast, kid. That guard there's got his eye on us. He's suspicious. He's coming towards us. Keep moving, keep moving. If he tries to stop us, I'll take care of him. Where'd you get that knife? Never mind. Just a moment, you two. Oh, anything on your mind, guard? You heard the whistle. Now get back to the exercise field and line up. Sure, sure. You killed him. I'm a little out of practice, but judging by my past experience, I think I've done just that. Murder. Sure, sure. Come on, kid. Let's get moving. Now, here. Here, help me lift this stone. Come on. Give me a hand. Don't stand there. Oh, oh all right. Uh, all right. Uh, it covers the entrance to an old water main. Leads into a stream outside the ground. Once we're out, we're in the clear. Here. Now, there's the hole. Come on. In you go. No. No. Hey, I've changed my mind. Ah, uh, it's too late to rat on me now, kid. You're going through with this. Now get in there. No, Marty. I'll wait. If I get out of here and find my Uncle Judge Bart, I'll explain that marriage. I'll get him then. I said you were yellow before, and I say it now. You're going through with this, kid. Right into my arms, Junior. 
Now I'll drag you through that tunnel. And when you come to, I'll flip you to see who kills the judge. The two convicts who today escaped from the state prison through an abandoned water main after having killed a guard have not yet been apprehended. The men are Lifer Marty Lagort and his cellmate, Paul Bartow, who, ironically enough, is a nephew of Judge Bartow, who sentenced them both to prison. Nothing new on the radio. Both men were wearing convicts. And there it is, Margot. That's the reason for the urgent phone call from Edwin to come to Cliff House. Why, on account of the prison break? Uh Uh-huh. They fear that Paul has broken out to avenge himself on his uncle, Judge Bartow. I'm trying to believe that all three secretly fear that they're in for danger. All three, Lamont? Mm. Judge Bartow is Ward Peggy Sanders and Paul's stepbrother, Edwin. You know, Margot, this whole business puzzles me. I knew Paul Bartow before he was sent to prison... He's not a killer. Not the criminal type at all. Well, Lamont, wasn't there some talk at the time of his trial that his uncle deliberately sent him up to prison to get him out of the way? Mm-hmm, but even so, I still can't believe Paul would do anything to his uncle. Well, from a little bit I've seen of dear old uncle, I figured him to be rather an unpleasant person. Well, perhaps a better word would be hasty, Margot. You see, five years ago, his verdict against Paul on the embezzlement charge was... I don't know. Somebody right up ahead signaling with a flashlight for us to stop. Well, do you think we'd better, Lamont, at this time of night? Oh, don't worry, Margo. That you, Lamont? Yes. Oh, hello, Edwin. Edwin? Paul's stepbrother? Right. Good to see you, Lamont. Hello, Margo. Hello, Edwin. Lamont, Paul is up at the house now. Oh, I see. Is your uncle in the house, too? Yes, Uncle John is there with Peggy. Oh, how is Peggy? I haven't seen her later. She's fine, Margo. Lamont, things are very serious. Paul has accused Uncle John of trying to force Peggy to marry me. Of course, that's ridiculous. Well, knowing your uncle as I do... Well, Lamont, you know me, too. Think I'm the kind of a man who'd double-cross someone I like as much as I do Paul? Believe me, Peggy loved me now. Even if Paul never had been sent to prison, she'd still love me. I see. But Paul doesn't understand that. Well, if that's true, it shouldn't be hard to make him understand it. Margot, four and a half years of prison can do a great deal to warp a man. Uh, Just what did you want me to come here for, Edwin? Well, I thought that you could reason with him, Lamont. You could persuade him to go back to prison and finish his term. That's a big order. You can do it, Lamont. He knows you and he respects you. Well, I'll see what I can do, but... Uh, meanwhile, Edwin, uh, what about Marty Lagort? Who? Uh, Paul's cellmate who made the break with him. Oh, I don't know anything about that. As a matter of fact, Lamont, I haven't spoken directly to Paul. I've just heard him talking to Uncle John in the library. Well, let's get up to the house, Edwin. See what we can do about this problem of yours. Peggy! Oh, Peggy! She's probably locked herself in a room. She said she didn't want to face Paul again. Can't say I blame her. Paul must still be in the library with Uncle John. It's right this way, Lamont. Uh, just a minute, Edwin. Wouldn't it be better if we told Paul that we're here first? Very well. Just a moment. You keep quiet. I don't want to hear any more. I won't keep quiet. You, you seem to be it. arguing. Yes, I, I don't think it'd be advisable to go in now. Don't raise your voice in my presence, Paul. I'm sick of listening to your lies. You've done enough to me already. You hear? You're not going to do it. I swear you won't do it. Stop shouting. I'll shout to the rooftop that it pleases me. Get I out think of we'd room. better go in Get there. Get out of this house. This is the last time you threaten me. Oh, what are you doing? Oh! Come on. Come on, those shots. Come on. Let's go in. Where are they? Paul must have gone out through that open window. <gasps> the on. Here, Cranston. Here on the floor. All right. Oh. Just a minute now. Better let me examine him, Edwin. Uncle John. Your uncle is dead, isn't he? Paul's murdered him, Lamont. I knew he would. No, no, no. Get hold of yourself, Edwin. Just get hold of myself. All right, now. Go downstairs. Phone for the police. All right. All right, Lamont, but it's a little late for that. Oh, things you were wrong, Lamont, about Paul. Yes. Looks like I was, Marco. Say, here's something interesting. What is it, Lamont? This window is at least three feet from the ground. If Paul jumped through here... He should have left footprints in the soft earth outside. I should think so. Well, there are no footprints out there. All of which means he's still in the house. What was that? That's Edwin calling. I guess you were right after all, Margot. Paul must still be in the house. Come on. I thought you'd never find me way down here in the cellar. Are you all right, Edwin? Yes, I'm all right. Oh. Well, what happened, Edwin? Paul tried to kill me. As I was calling the police, I heard a sound down here in the cellar, and I came down to investigate. 
Call fired at me. Well, where is he now? I don't know. He could have escaped by that open window there. Well, Edwin, I'm convinced now that your stepbrother, Paul... Oh, oh. Down, down, one of you. He's still here. Lamont, you've been shot. I'm all right, Mark. Go on. I'm all right. Lamont! Lamont! He's dead. Paul killed him! <laughs> Now, just lie still, Lamont. Uh, where's Edwin? Is he all right? Yes, he's going to get the doctor. And Paul? He's escaped. Uh, how did I get up here? Edwin carried you up here to Peggy's room. Oh. What's that? Oh, uh. son- sounds like he's coming from that closet. I'll see. No, don't try to get up, Lamont. I'm all right, Margot. Lamont, please. Oh. It's Peggy. Oh. Here, here, quick, Margot. Untie her. I'll take that gag out of her mouth. All right. Wait a minute now. I can get this untied. There. Oh, oh Lamont. Margot. Oh, thank heaven. Lamont, she's going to faint. Here, Peggy, may I? No. I'm, I'm all right now. You, Lamont, you've been shot. Oh, it's nothing, Peggy. Just a flesh wound. How did it happen? Paul fired at him. Oh, no. No, he... Yes, Peggy, I, I think he did. I was afraid. I was... Oh, Peggy, you better sit down. Thank you. There, now. How do you feel? Well enough to tell us what happened? I don't remember much. I was downstairs. There was a knock at the door. When I opened it, Paul was standing there. And another man. An ugly, terrible-looking man. Did Paul call this man's name? I... I don't remember. Marty Lagort? I don't think he called him my name, Margot. Paul asked where Uncle was. He was acting so strangely. He hardly recognized me. I was afraid to tell him that... He hurried Uncle in the library and forced his way in. Did this other man go with him? No, he didn't. He clamped his hand over my mouth and started choking me. I, I guess I must have fainted because that's all I remember until you found me in the closet. Well, Peggy, did you know that your uncle was murdered? No. No, that can't be. Who would want it? It wasn't Paul. No. No, it couldn't have been Paul. You hear me? <laughs> Well, Cranston, we checked the gun against the bullet we used to kill Judge Bartow, and this is the murder weapon, all right? There's no doubt in my mind, Commissioner Weston, that Paul did it. No. Uh-huh. No, Edwin, you mustn't say that. Well, it's true, Peggy. Uh, Commissioner, I think that... Cranston, he... this is an open and shut case. Paul Bartow murdered his uncle, and that's that. Uh, now, we can just... paying attention. I did two clubs. Oh, I'm sorry. I did two things. What's that? Oh, no, no, it's I'm, a I'm sorry, thing, but... I'm so nervous I must have switched on the recording machine by mistake. Those voices on that record are very familiar. Well, they ought to be, Margot. They're yours and Lamont. What goes here? Oh, it's just a little hobby of mine. I have a recording machine. I like to catch fragments of conversation and play them back later just as a joke. Oh. I made that record of you and Lamont over a year ago, Margot. Aha! Uh-huh. Keeping a permanent record that I don't pay attention when playing bridge. Well, this huh? isn't getting us any place. Miss Sanders, you've known Paul Bartos since he was since childhood. Now, where do you think he might hide? I know he's still somewhere in the neighborhood. Hide? Well, he... Well, I wouldn't know. Uh, Commissioner, if you'll forgive me, you do know that Marty Lagord escaped with Paul Bartow. That I do. Well, it may have been Lagord who murdered Judge Bartow and took that pot shot at me. After all, Lagord had equal motive to kill Judge Bartow. Now, look, Cranston, I'm convinced it was Paul Bartow. I'm going to send out an alarm and I'll have him here in 24 hours. Margo. Keep watch at that window, will you please? I'm sure that Peggy Sanders will try to leave this house tonight. And I'm going to follow her. She knows where Paul would be hiding. So that's why she acted so strangely when Commissioner Weston questioned her this afternoon. Well, it was obvious that she was covering up. Well, then you think that she's still in love with Paul. I'm sure of it. In spite of what Edwin says, she's... Wait a minute. Lamont, you're right. Peggy's just slipped out the side entrance. And she's taking the path that leads down to the ocean. I... I'm going to follow her. Oh, no, you're not. The doctor said you're not to leave this room. But I've got to follow her, Margo. Suppose I follow her, Lamont. Oh, it's too dangerous for you. If I were afraid of danger, I wouldn't pal around with you. I'm going out. Now, Margo, you... And you're staying right where you are. You know, Marty, my... My head hurts. I told you, Paul, you hurt it when you fell down. Ah... How did how did we get here? You brought me here. Funny, I I don't remember anything after we made that prison break. Funny though, 
this place. It's a cave. This cave and this beach look very familiar. To... Yeah, they ought to. We grew up around here, back up there in the cliff is your uncle's house. Oh. I, I remember now. Peggy and I used to play here when we were kids. Hey, now look, we haven't eaten for 17 hours. I'm going to go and get us some grub. Oh, they'll spot you in a minute in those prison clothes. Not if I stay out of sight. I'll be back in an hour. Huh? Oh. My head hurts. Everything's so jumbled up. Paul. Huh? Paul. What was that? Paul. Oh, Peggy. Oh, my darling. I waited until that man left. Paul, you look ill. Uh, it's just my head. Marty said I fell. Did he bring you here? Yeah. No, no, he... No, I brought him here. I I don't remember. It's, a, it's so hard to think, Peggy. Paul, you've got to get away from here. They're going to arrest you for Uncle John's murder. Uncle... Uncle John's murder? Yeah. I don't remember. I wanted to. He was forcing you to marry Edwin. Paul, did you kill him? Oh, I don't know, Peggy... Maybe I did. I. Who's that? Who did you bring with you? Well, I didn't bring. Margot Lane, you followed me here. Peggy, forgive me for spying on you, but I want to help you. You can help me by not mentioning this to anyone. Well, what will you do? I'm going to help Paul get away from the police. Oh, running away won't help. He'll be caught eventually. She's right, Peg. It's useless. We can't stay in this cave forever. Margot, Judge Bartow tried to poison my mind, make me hate Paul, make me marry Edwin. I can't. That's a sad story, Miss Sanders. Oh, Marty. Yeah, Paul, your old friend Marty. It was nice of you to invite Cuffy to our hideout cave while I was gone. Too bad you're not going to be around to enjoy it. What do you mean? I mean that I just called Commissioner Weston on the phone and made a deal with him. If I bring you in, they'll go easy on me when the case comes to trial. What? You're no. clever, aren't you, Marty? Sure I am. My story that I told the commissioner on the phone was that I tried to keep you from breaking jail. And when you did go... I went after you to bring you back. <laughs> simple enough? Just a little too simple, Marty LaVorte. Oh, so you got a gun. Why, you don't think that I'm going to be afraid Stop of... Stop coming toward me. Or I'll fire. A dame with a little pop gun. I warned you. And your little pop gun won't work, eh? That's too bad. Now I'm boss around here. I give the orders and my revolver works. <laughs> what? Marty LaVorte. Hey, who said that? The shadow, Marty Lagarde. Don't look for me. The shadow cannot be seen. What do you want of me, shadow? I want to commend the leopard who changed his spots. So you're working for the police, eh, Marty? Uh, sure. Sure, that's right. Good for you. Shadow, you don't understand. I understand perfectly, Miss Lane. Come, Marty. We're all going back to Cliff House where Commissioner Weston and Edwin Bartow are waiting for you. Hey, now wait a minute. I... Don't you understand, Marty? Bring your prisoner back to the police and receive the reward for your efforts. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Shadow. After all, I am working for the police. But, Shadow... This should be interesting, Miss Lane. And quite surprising. Marty Lagarde promised that he'd be here in 15 minutes. And he said he was bringing Paul with him? Yeah, I don't get it. Here's this lifer, Marty Lagarde, turning straight and helping the police. All right, get in there, you. Well, Marty, I see you brought Paul Barto with you and Miss Lane and Miss Saunders. Hey, Commissioner, here's your prisoner. Why don't you say something, Paul? Defend yourself. Oh, what's the use, Peg? I haven't a chance. <laughs> Not a chance, Paul Barto. The law gives every man a chance. Shadow, what are you doing here? The shadow. Thought I might be of some assistance, Commissioner. Well, you're too late. I've already solved this crime. Sure of that, are you? I've got a corpse, witnesses, and the murderer. What more do you want? Who is the murderer? This fellow here, Paul Bartow. That's where you're wrong, Commissioner. Now listen, Shadow, this is an open and shut case. I agree with you. You do? Well, that's very nice. You agree. The murderer is right in this room. But he isn't Paul Bartow. Now look, Shadow, my witnesses heard Paul Bartow threaten to shoot his uncle, and they heard the shots. Did it sound like this? But I'm sick of listening to your lies. You've done enough for me already, do you hear? You're not going to do it. I swear you won't do it. Stop, stop. Turn that off. Turn it off. Stop with the roof. Stop with that sleep at me. You can't stop me. Get out of this room. Get out of this house. This is the last time you'll threaten me. Paul, what are you doing? Paul! <laughs> is that what your witness heard, Commissioner? What was that? A recording. 
played from that loudspeaker concealed in the wall. A recording that was devised by the real murderer, Edwin Bartow, to make his stepbrother, Paul, look guilty. No, no, I don't want to know anything about it. Edwin, with the aid of his accomplice, Marty Lagarde. Edwin, you... Stop Lagarde, Commissioner. He's trying to get away. Stop or I'll fire. I kill him. No, Commissioner. He'll live to pay his debt to society. As for our friend Edwin Bartow, I think you'll have no trouble getting a confession out of him now. of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> Once again, your neighborhood blue coal dealer brings you the thrilling adventures of The Shadow, the hard and relentless fight of one man against the forces of evil. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Friends, here's a very important way that you can help the war effort. You know, it's coal that keeps our war plants humming. Coal that keeps our trains moving. Coal that heats our soldiers in army camps. Yes, coal that supplies vital power and heat to countless wartime activities. So you can make an invaluable contribution to the war effort this winter by cutting your coal consumption to the absolute minimum. Start your personal coal conservation program this simple way. Hold your fire. Don't let the first chilly snap send you down to the furnace. Use the fireplace. Wear warmer clothing. Wait two or three weeks later than usual before starting your furnace. The coal you save now will help the home front and the war front. And it will help you keep warmer in the really bitter months to come. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama... The Gibbering Things. Well, nature puts on quite an autumn show up here, Margot. Yes, doesn't it, Lamont? Yeah. yeah. Old New Hampshire's pretty country at any season, folks. Are we nearly at our destination, driver? Almost. About a mile and a half more, and we'll be at the Haunted Woods. Huh? Haunted Woods? Yes, sir. The place you've hired me to drive you to is just this side of them. Oh, Aunt Susan never told me that she lived near any haunted woods, Lamont. Uh, Miss Susan Prentice, your aunt, ma'am? Yes, Mr. Cranston and I are going to spend the weekend with her. Oh, that'll be a fine rest for you. Well, those haunted woods don't sound quiet or restful. <laughs> well, they won't bother you, none. These flies, I've never been bothered in them. Neither was your aunt or Professor Sergoff. Who lives smack in the center of uh, them. Why are they called the Haunted Woods? Well, it's uh, it's said that quite a few fellas have gone into them woods and completely disappeared. There was two lumberjacks and four or five harvest hands. The shucks, I figure they simply walked into the woods on one side and out the other. <laughs> <laughs> Your logic is spoiling a nice mystery, driver. Oh, I figured a natural explanation for the gibbering things, too. Gibbering. The gibbering things? Uh-huh. Ever so often, the dog gondest noise is heard from them woods. 
A funny, squeaking, chattering kind of noise. Don't sound like it was made by either man or beast. The folks say it's made by things. You figured that it's not made by things? Mister, that gibbering noise is made by monkeys. Monkeys? In New Hampshire. Yeah. Professor Sergoff's got a couple at his place that he's brought up in South America. I admit I don't know how their squeaky little voices can be heard so far away from the professor's house. But them monkeys is the only natural explanation. Are those the haunted woods ahead of us now? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. That's them. Heavens. What's that? Something screamed in those woods. <laughs> yes, that was just an old screech owl. Oh. Ah, that is again. Well, screech owls will make their home this far north. They must have been brought up here like the monkeys you mentioned. That's right. Another pet of Professor Sergar. Ah, here's Miss Prentice's place. Oh, Lamont, what a lovely little house. Now, uh, I'll uh, get your luggage out the bank. Here, let me help you, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, step directly on these flagstones. The ground's pretty wet. Well, right. uh, we had some thunderstorm today. Started early this morning and pulled down telephone wires and raised all kinds of nets. Oh, that's so? Really? Yeah, why, well, I'd, uh, I'd like to wait and say howdy to Miss Prentice, but as long as I'm out this way, I want to drop off a package at Professor Sergar's getting late, and I'd like to be in and out of them woods before dark. Not because of the gibbering things. Well, shucks, no. Just that the road through there is pretty terrible. A fellow wants daylight to get over it. Uh, I'll stop off on my way back from the professor's, see if your aunt wants anything fetched from the village my next trip. So, uh, so long. So long. So long. You never told me your aunt was deaf, Margot. Deaf? Well, she isn't. Well, she can't be at home, then, after this noisy arrival in front of the door. But it is funny that she hasn't... Aunt Susan! Aunt Sue! Are you sure she expected us today? Oh, of course. Well, the door's unlocked. Let's go in, Lamont. She must have stepped out for a moment. For a long moment. Let's have a look around. You take a peek at the kitchen. All right. Everything here, Spidey? Ship shake? And deserted. Well, the kitchen door's been left unlocked. Well, evidently your aunt didn't intend to be gone very long. Well, what do you suppose has happened to her? Oh, chances are your aunt left here this morning to pay a brief call to some neighbors, and she was forced to stay there by the storm. Oh, I was beginning to think Aunt Sue had been swallowed by those gibbering things in the haunted woods. <laughs> we have Mr. Dorema's assurance those gibbering things are vastly overrated. <laughs> What's that? Now, well, listen. It's the gibbering from those woods. It's from deep in the woods. Doesn't sound like the chattering of any monkey that I've ever heard. Lamont! Could that be the screech owl again? That cry sounded human. It's like a scream of mortal terror. Lamont, we've been waiting almost half an hour now for Aunt Sue. She'd be here by this time if she were all right. Phone's still dead. The cab driver hasn't come back yet, and it's nearly dark. Let's go outside again and watch for him. All right. He said he wanted to be out of those woods before dark. Come on, that chipping again. It's much closer than before. He used to come from just the edge of those woods. And the professor who keeps monkeys lives nearly a mile from here. It's going fainter now. Traveling away. Hmm. Margo, look here. What? In the earth of this flower bed. Tiny footprints. Have they been made by a barefoot child, a baby, since the rain? How did the baby get out here? These prints were made since I was looking around this garden only a few minutes ago. And their sole resemblance to a baby's is their size. Look closer. No child could walk upright on feet that left these impressions. They're deformed. Yes, I see now. Hmm. So whatever made the footprints didn't walk upright very far. Here it dropped on all fours. Those are prints of little hands. But only two fingers are outlined. Oh, what horrible thumbs. These tracks were left by some animal. But what kind of an animal? I never saw a spoor like this before. Oh, neither have I. Look, they disappear here in the grass. Margo, someone's coming out of the woods. A man? What's he got on his head? It's getting so dark I can hardly see. I think it's a helmet of some sort. He's carrying a net. A net? It looks like it. Seems to be hunting for something. Ah, uh, hello there. Hello. Who are you? <laughs> we're about to ask the same question. My name is Sergo. Alexander Sergo. The Martini no. I'm Margot Lane, Miss Prentice's niece, Professor. Miss Prentice's niece? Yes, and this is Mr. Cranston. We just arrived to spend a few days with Aunt Susan, and uh, she's not here. 
I have not seen Miss Prentice for several days. Was she expecting you and Mr. Cranston? Yes, she was. Uh, Professor, if I'm not too inquisitive, what do you hunt with a net at this time of night? I keep a small zoological collection, Mr. Cranston, and uh, one of my little animals escaped this afternoon, and I was searching for it with my net. A dangerous animal? I see you're wearing heavy gloves. It was a small ape with sharp little teeth that can, uh, what you call, nip very painfully. Perhaps you heard a chattering in the woods a while ago. We heard something gibbering in there. That was my little pet. Does it malform hands and feet, Professor? Does it leave tracks like this? You did not see it leave those tracks? No, we found them by accident a few minutes ago. The creature I'm searching for is not a perfect specimen. Uh, These tracks are fresh, which means that it is close by, and I'm most anxious to recapture it, so if you will please excuse me. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, at least we've learned what's behind those footprints and that gibbering. I'm still wondering if that was a screech owl we heard soon after Doremus left his house. What for, Lamont? I'm going to get a gun and flashlight out of my bag and do a little hunting of my own in these woods. But... Uh, where's the light switch? Here. Oh, thanks. Lamont, that gibbering can. It's just outside the house. Do you know it's only a crippled ace that... <gasps> Margo, what? The face. The face at the window. Where? It's gone now. But it was pressed close against the glass. It had no features, Lamont, except eyes. And its toothless mouth. It was the face of the gibbering thing. Come on. Turn your flashlight on those trees as well as on the road. That gibbering thing may be in these woods. As I'm watching, Margot. There's only one set of tire tracks on this road, so Doreen must travel it only one way. Are you sure, Margot, that the face of the window had no features? It was just pink ball flesh. With tiny pig-like eyes and and grinning toothless gums. What could it have been? If you weren't having a nightmare, I don't know. Good Lord, look there. Doremus's cab turned on its side. Come on. There's Doremus. Oh. He's been thrown from his cab against that rock. His head's all crushed. Oh, the mud. Strange. There's no blood around the wound. No blood. Someone or something has washed it absolutely clean. Look at his throat. Big bruise mark. His fall from the cab didn't do that. No. Looks as though some terrific suction had been applied by something like a giant leech. That thing with the toothless mouth. Lamont, you've got to find out what that gibbering monster is. It may have killed Aunt Sue as well as Doremus. Come on back to your aunt's house. After I see you locked safely inside, Professor Seargoff is going to receive a visit from the Shadow. Why are you so worried, Professor? What? Who is speaking to me? I cannot see anyone. I'm the Shadow. The Shadow? An invisible man? A little secret I learned in the Orient. What do you want here? I shall ask the questions. First, did you find the small ape you were hunting for? You know that I was hunting... The shadow overheard your conversation with a Miss Lane and a Mr. Cranston a while ago. Did you find the ape? Yes. What did you do with it? I visited the cages where you keep your pets and found no crippled monkey there. I was forced to shoot the animal. I buried it in the woods. After it had gorged itself on the blood of Doremus? Doremus? You didn't know he was lying dead in the woods? No, I swear I did not, Shadow. I had nothing to do with it. But you know what killed him? No. Don't lie. You also know the reason for Susan Prentice's disappearance. I do not. Her absence will cause an intensive search. She will not be found here. This is a small house. Nothing could be concealed in it. Search it yourself. Luck has been with you so far, Professor. If telephone service hadn't been disrupted by the storm, the authorities would already have been notified and the search begun. The luck of criminals is never good for long. Your time is running out. The police will find the body of Doremus and they'll be told about a squealing monster with a horrible toothless mouth. What? The gibbering thing has been seen tonight. Now you must think and act fast, Professor. You must think and act faster than the shadow. (laughs) Friends, if you heat your home with coal, listen. Here's some important good news. Your friendly neighborhood blue coal dealer is happy to announce that he already has available, on a first-come, first-served basis... 
a small supply of automatic heat regulators to aid in the urgent coal conservation program. Now listen to what an automatic heat regulator does. It takes full charge of your furnace operation, giving you a constant, even temperature day and night. It eliminates those wide swings in temperature when it's always too hot or too cold. It saves you those incessant trips to the basement when you try to control the temperature yourself. It helps protect your family against winter colds, which many doctors agree result from overheating or unstable temperatures. And most important, it saves coal vital to the war effort and money for you. An automatic heat regulator costs little to begin with and soon pays for itself in fuel savings. Don't wait for the first freeze. There are just a few automatic heat regulators available. So act now. Call your friendly blue coal dealer and place your order tomorrow. And now, back to the shadow. Lamont, did Professor Seergolf tell you anything when you visited him as a shadow? I didn't expect him to, Margot. A shadow's purpose was to force Seergolf into some revealing action. I'm confident that he'll make that action before morning, but I'm taking no chances. I'm going to leave you again now and go back into those woods. Why? Professor Seergolf doesn't confine his activities within the limits of his small home. I'm going to discover, if I can, where he carries on his major studies. Let me go with you, Lamont. No, I want you to stay here. Lock yourself in the house and don't leave it. I expect to be gone for some time. Oh. I expect to be gone for some time. Fine. <laughs> Screech owl. What's that? Back door. Who's there? What do you... Good evening, Miss Lane. Professor Seagull. When one locks a glass panel door, the key should never be left in the lock. It is so easy to break the glass, reach inside, and turn the key. Why have you broken in here? I just saw Mr. Cranston going to the woods, and I consider this an excellent opportunity to talk with you alone. That gun. This gun will do you no harm if you're obedient. You and I are going for a little walk, Miss Lane, and you are going quietly. <laughs> Where are you taking me through these woods? You'll soon learn. Here's our stopping place. There's nothing here but trees and that big rock. Yes, watch that rock. It's swinging out like a door. It is a door to a very secret natural cave below. Ladies first, Miss Lane. I won't go down to that darkness. You need not go in darkness. We have electric light here. Step in, Miss Lane. I wish to close my bulky door. No, no, I... Do not try my patience. Go. Oh. Now, down these stairs. And you can see my little refuge. Chippering cries. A little welcome for you. These hideous things that make him are behind that door. Hideous things? So you saw the little creature that escaped tonight? It pressed its awful face against the window. Don't make me look at it again. You won't see anything to frighten you when I open the door. There's nothing in this chamber except those steel cabinets around the walls, that iron water pipe above, and this heavy rope that dangles from the pipe. You will find the rope of special interest. I call your attention to the snap hook no, on the loose end. No, let me go. As soon as I lock no, these handcuffs no. on your wrists behind your back like this, no. and hook the rope to your cuffs no. like this. Now, I let you go. Nicely tethered. What are you going to do to me? I shall satisfy your curiosity about the gibbering things. You have seen but one. I have many such children. Children? Yes. I am their father, their creator. I am their god. I have discovered the secret of life. Of life? I have evolved a complex life form from the single cell. Nature required a billion years to do what I have done in ten. I am greater than nature. You're a madman. Am I? You shall see. The steel cabinets you see around these walls are really insulated soundproof covers for my children's cages. This lever opens the apparent cabinets. Watch. No! <laughs> Before you saw the handsomest of my little beauties. Now you can look at him again and 30 of his brothers. Hear them squeal their greetings to you. Don't let me out of here. Don't be no. afraid. Their cages are strong. They cannot get at you no. now. <laughs> please, please. They're so horrible. 
Well, I admit that I have not as yet achieved perfection in their appearance, but I progress. Ooh. Now, here is my first experiment. It resembles a shapeless sponge, but it's alive. It moves and breathes. Oh, please. And here is a little creature that lacks arms and legs. See it bounce its way about? Its brother in the next cage has twice the usual number of limbs. This one has eight hands. That one has no eyes or ears. And there's one with no head. And here's one without a body. Oh, stop it, stop it. But they're all alive, Miss Lane. All can move and fast. All have mouths and appetites, Miss Lane. For human blood. Their only diet. Human blood? Yes, I keep human cows, Miss Lane, and you are to become a human cow and feed my children. Oh, no! That is why you are tethered here. This chamber is their dining room. I shall pull a lever that opens their cages as I go out this door to safety. They're very greedy, but I will not let them drink too much of your blood, Miss Lane, for now you're a cow and valuable to me. (laughs) I leave you now to pull the lever. My throat! You feel the shadow's hands upon you, Sigoff. The shadow. Oh. The shadow is a man would like to close his fingers tight about your neck. As a respecter of the law, he lets you live. Oh, shadow, shadow. Now lock your hands off, Chico. Don't touch me again. I will. Be quick. There. Oh, I'm free. I'm free and I can leave this room. Go where I won't see and hear those awful things. Yes, go. And I'll go with you out that door. Chico. The door is locked and closed upon you, Shadow. The lever that opens my children's cages is on this side of the door, and I release them now. No! 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 no my children no. do not have to see a man to find him, Shadow. Their greed for blood will lead them to you, and they are to have all your blood, Shadow. You will be dead before this door is open. Dead! <laughs> It is now half an hour since that door was closed upon our former friend, the Shadow. My children have killed strong men within five minutes, so I think it is time, Miss Lane, for us to view the remains, which will be visible, I imagine. (laughs) But first, I shall reunite you with your aunt. You have my aunt here? Yes, and Forge escaped and told me of her intention to notify the authorities. I was forced to add her to my herd of cows. That herd includes the itinerant lumberjacks and harvest hands who have disappeared in the haunted woods. When fools hear their screams of pain, they think they hear my little screech owl. Oh, you... There's no word that gets you. Before I can safely view the dead body of the shadow, my children must be returned to their cages. And my cows take care of that. Your aunt's stall is behind this door. Aunt Sue. Aunt Sue. I will let her out. Margo. Oh, 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 With a touching reunion. You shall see a great deal of each other from now on, for you will be stable together. My male cattle are in here. Come out, beasts. And don't forget that I hold the usual loaded revolver. Oh, poor man. Yes, my male cattle aren't as healthy looking as you and your aunt, Miss Lane, but they have been here a long time. They're walking skeletons. They still manufacture blood. That's all that matters. Call in line, beasts. You with them, female cattle? No. Call in line. Oh, come, Mark. Oh, come. There's nothing, nothing we can do. You're learning fast, Miss Prentice. Now march, all of you, to the feeding room. You ought to have an easy time tonight. My children have been fed and well. You need only pick them up and return them to their cages. Pick up those things? Yes, Miss Lane, and tenderly. Oh. Unlock the door. Go in and do as I've told you. Now you see how tame my cattle are, Miss Lane. You will soon be like them. Hurry in there. Get my pets behind their bars. I'm anxious to come in and and pay my last respects. Your children are in their cages, Master. Ah, now we shall see. I thought the shadow would be visible in death. His mental power is gone. But I do not see him. Can you feel him, Sir Goff? Ah! Shadow! Yes, I'm not an easy victim, Sir Goff. Pick up that gun he dropped, Miss Lane. Something we cannot see has got him. It's Sir Goff to us. Keep back, you men. I know how you must hate this devil, but I promise you he'll get justice. Now, everyone leave this room. Everyone but Sir Goff. Everyone but me. You're going to be left alone here. Alone as you've left the others. No, no! Ah, no do not put those handcuffs on me! Oh, yes. Lock behind your back. No. No, not that clever rope. Do not hook me to that. The way you fastened others. Yes, yes he does. We can do to him what he does. Get out of this room, you men. 
We're leaving Professor Siergoff with his children. We'll turn the vampires loose on him. No, do not open those cages. Do not turn them loose on me. Please, Shadow, please. You're safe, Siergoff. The cages won't be opened. Did you say, Shadow, that those cages won't be opened? That Siergoff is safe? He's safe from those things he created. That room will be Siergoff's prison until the police arrive to take him to another. Police? Prison. Shadow, you promised us that devil would get justice. He will. But the law must fix his punishment. We've been Siergoff's slaves. His cattle. Those things he made have fastened on our flesh. They drank our blood. We want no police. We want no law. We want no law. They have no punishment to fit that devil's crime. We'll attend to Siergoff. And where you are. You men have suffered here, but you're civilized men. You must abide by rules of order, not by instincts of revenge. We're no longer men. We're cattle. Siergoff has made us beasts. And there are many of us, Shadow. You are only one. Keep away from that door. We didn't want to open the door, Shadow. We only wanted to lock it. And we have locked it. We have the key. Pull the lever that opens those cages. No. You're too late, Shadow. Listen. <laughs> Siergoff's children move fast. They've already reached their father. We've given Siergoff the justice he deserves. Well, Margot, Siergoff's cattle were too many and too quick. But Siergoff won't put the state to any expense. Your aunt's safe in her home again. And his children... Those men just trampled them after you finally forced that door. And I'm not sorry things happened as they did. Siergolf was going to turn those gibbering things loose on me. Well, he did turn them loose on the shadow. But, Mark, you haven't told me why the shadow wasn't killed by those monsters. Well, Siergolf made a serious mistake. When he left other victims in that room, their hands had been secured behind their backs and fastened to the tether rope. The shadow was free. One end of the tether rope was attached to an iron pipe near the ceiling. Well, he took a moment to loop the other end with its heavy hook over the pipe and fasten it. And seated in that swing, the shadow was well above the reach of the little vampires. When you were locked in that room, I was sure it meant your death. Well, one can never be sure of anything, Margot. You know, when I was invited to your Aunt Susan's, as I recall, I had promised myself a quiet, restful weekend. <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Now let me introduce Blue Coal's distinguished heating expert, John Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts, and good evening, friends. I'm glad to be back with you again. And this year, with fuel so vitally needed for the war effort, I hope to bring you special information that will help you to heat your home more efficiently and economically. Thousands of tons of coal can be conserved if everyone will give special thought to the efficient operation of their furnace. Operating a heating plant efficiently is easy. And if you will follow a few simple suggestions, you can not only save considerable fuel, but your home will be healthfully heated as well. A clean furnace is number one on the list of important things that will result in conserving fuel. So put your heating plant in good working order. It's easy to clean a furnace. For tools, all you need to do a good job is an inexpensive wire brush and a scraper. You can get these at any hardware store. Why all can of asbestos furnace cement? Have all soot and fly ash. Use the asbestos cement to seal up leaks around the smoke pipe where it enters into the chimney. Make sure that the dampers are in good working order and that all furnace doors fit tightly. Remember, a clean furnace conserves coal, gives you more heat for the fuel you burn, and will keep your family warm and healthful all winter long. I thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plots are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Again next week, the Shadow will demonstrate that... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure 
in the shadows daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen. This is Ken Roberts saying, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> Your local Blue Coal dealer presents The Shadow. These half-hour dramatizations are designed to forcibly demonstrate to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Before The Shadow's adventure begins, a reminder to all homeowners. There's one sure way to get extra quality, extra value, and complete heating comfort. And that's by ordering Blue Coal by name. Blue Coal's harmless blue coloring is the trademark of the world's largest hard coal producer. But even more, it assures you that each ton of blue coal has been laboratory tested for quality and sized and prepared to give you better heat with less furnace attention. So don't gamble with ordinary fuel. Ensure your family perfect heating comfort and satisfaction by ordering blue coal by name. Call your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. At the close of this afternoon's program... We have a most distinguished guest, one of the special assistants to the Attorney General of the United States, the Honorable Francis H. Horan. I'm sure you will all be anxious to hear what he has to say, so be sure to listen. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids those in distress and helps the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice belongs. The only one who knows the true identity of that master of other people's minds, the shadow. Today's story, Ghosts Can Kill. Court will come to order. Proceed, Mr. District Attorney. Your Honor and gentlemen of the jury... You have heard the evidence against this man, Ralph Gorman. <coughs> Three eyewitnesses of unimpeachable character saw him commit the murder. He was caught at the scene of the murder with a gun in his hand. It is the duty of the jury to convict him. Ralph Gorman has been brought to court seven times for serious crimes. I object. Although I admit my client has been brought to court in the past, he has always furnished an unbreakable alibi and has been acquitted. Therefore, I claim that this record is irrelevant. Objection sustained. Very well. That doesn't alter the state's case. In this instance, the accused has no alibi. He is guilty of murder and should therefore be sent to the chair. Order in the court. I think the question before the jury is a clean-cut issue. The defendant, Ralph Gorman, committed a peculiarly cold-blooded murder. There are no halfway measures. He is either guilty or not guilty. I therefore instruct the jury to return a verdict of acquittal or first-degree murder. The jury will retire to consider the verdict. The prisoner will cease this disturbance at once. What's the matter? Don't you like my music? This is a court of law, Gorman. While you are awaiting the verdict of the jury, you will please conduct yourself in a more safe manner. Well, Marco, I've seen many murder trials in my time, but I've never seen one where the accused man played on a mouth organ while waiting for the jury to send him to the chair. Lamont, isn't Gorman one of the toughest gangsters alive? Yes. In my estimation, Ralph Gorman is public enemy number one, Margot. Yet he's never been caught and sent to prison, Lamont. You heard that in the testimony. Oh, he's been caught often enough. They've never been able to convict him because he's always been able to furnish an absolutely airtight alibi. This time, for some unexplainable reason, he has no alibi. So if there's any justice, he should be put away for good. Here comes the jury back in again. It certainly didn't take long to come to a decision. After the evidence they heard, they should. Court will come to order. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. We find the accused, Ralph Gorman... Guilty of murder in the first degree. The court will come to order. The prisoner will stand. Ralph Gorman, you have been proved a menace to society. 
and society has passed judgment upon you. You have been found guilty of willful, deliberate murder in the first degree. Have you anything to say before a sentence is pronounced upon you? Yeah, I got something to say. Very well. Be brief. Society passed judgment on me, huh? Okay, then if you're going to kill me, I'm going to come back from the grave and get even with society. Empty threats will avail you nothing, Gorman. Ah, uh, you don't believe I can do it, huh? All right, I'll even tell you who I'm going to get. That will do. I'm not going First, to... First, I'm going to get that big financier, Oscar Borden, that's always giving away money. I guess Borden's what you'd call a pillar of society, ain't he? Stop, Gorman. Then, just for fun, I'll kill that young guy, Frank Collins, that just got engaged to that social register dame. I'll come back after death and get both of them. Collins and Borden. Yeah, you don't think I can do it, huh? But I can. Yes, I can. Quiet, quiet in court. Ralph Gorman, I hereby sentence you to be taken to the state's prison and to there be executed in a manner provided by law. And may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> Bad enough being in prison without having to listen to that. Stay off the music, will you? Come on, shut up. Hey, Tom. What's going on here? Hey, listen, guys. Make that guy call and stop playing the mud organ. He's driving us all nuts in here. What's he think this is, Carnegie Hall? No, I don't think this is Carnegie Hall. It's the death house. And you guys are in it just like me. Stop it. Stop it, you guys. Are you all get solitary? Come on. You've only been allowed to keep your mouth organ as a special favor. You're going to make trouble, I'll have to take it away from you. Have a heart, will you? That's all the fun I get. Fun? He's driving us nuts. Oh, why do you care, buddy? They're burning me tonight. Tomorrow it'll be quiet around here. Quiet as the grave. Listen, Carmen, you better keep quiet. The warden will be here in a minute. The warden? What do I care for the warden? He can't do any more than give me the hot seat, and he's doing that anyhow. Here comes the warden now. What's all the disturbance in here, Gar? Hey, it's Gorman, Warden. He hey, was... did you hear from the governor, Warden? Yes. I'm afraid I've got bad news for you, Gorman. Governor Roberts has refused to do anything about your case. And they're going to burn me tonight, huh? I'm afraid so. <laughs> uh, looks like society put the finger on me. Just like the judge said. Well, okay. I warned him. Like I said in court... Within a week, the millionaire Oscar Borden and Frank Collins are going to be dead. Now don't talk like that, Gorman. You'll see. And I think I'll get Governor Roberts, too, while I'm about it. That makes a nice trio, don't you think? Oscar Borden, Frank Collins, and Governor Roberts. I'm going to come back from the grave and kill them. All three of them, yeah. Society passed judgment on me, huh? Okay, I ain't kicking. We'll see who lasts last. Well, making stupid threats won't do you any good, Gorman. Stupid, huh? Listen, in a week, those guys are all going to be dead. Lots better than me. Come along, guard. You better warn them. Tell them their time is up when they hear me playing on my mouth organ like this. Extra, extra, hey, read all about it. Ralph Coleman electrocuted. Ralph Coleman threatens life on Oscar Morton, Frank Collins, and Governor Roberts before he dies. Home and executed. Hey, read all about the executed. Is there anything else you want me to do tonight, Mr. Borden? Uh, before you go, draw the curtains and turn off the overhead lights, Taylor. Yes. Will you stay here in my study for a while? It's quiet. There's some things I want to look over. Yes, Mr. Borden. You won't be disturbed, sir. I think everyone else has gone to bed. There's a newspaper here. I haven't had a chance to look at one all day. Right on your desk, sir. Oh, oh, yes. Well, good night, Taylor. Good night, Mr. Borden. Well, I'll glance at the headlines before getting down to work. Let's see. Rebels pushing to province. Merging relief agencies. Gangster executed amid great interest. Dramatic scene in the death house last night. Ralph Gorman threatens to come back after death and murder. A philanthropist, Oscar Borden, Frank Collins, millionaire sportsman, and Governor Roberts. Now, let's see... On the way to the chair, Gorman warned his intended victims that they would know of his presence by hearing him play a mouth organ. These were his last words, after which he was electrocuted. From this picture here, I'd say he was a rather low mentality. A mouth organ, well, that's a bizarre note. Oh, I wonder. Hold on. I can hear a mouth organ now. 
No, no. It must be my imagination. That's odd. I... I could swear I hear it again. It seems to come from the other room. Who opened that door? Why, you're... You're Alf Gorman. You see me, Mr. Borden? This is impossible. I've come back from the dead to keep my promise to society. You're mad. Ghosts ain't never mad, Mr. Borden. Ghosts? Preposterous. We'll see about this. Don't touch that bell, because it ain't going to do you no good. Well, that's one of them. Two more to go. Well, Lamont, as long as you just seem to be walking me around the streets aimlessly, you might at least answer my questions. What do you think of those threats? Threats? Uh, what threats, Margot? The threats made by Ralph Gorman last night before he was executed. Oh, I wouldn't give them a second thought. A six-year-old child knows it's impossible to come back from the dead and murder it's people. The ex, uh, the Oscar Ford and murdered famous philanthropist found in his study shot to death. Lamont. Yes, I hear it, too. A uh, boy, yes, give me a paper. Yes, sir. Hey, keep the chain, son. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, taxi. Yes, hey, sir. Where are you going, Lamont? I think this will bear a little investigating. I'll see you later, Margot. I'm going to drop in on the scene of the crime. Our friend Commissioner Weston should be there. Uh, Cardona, see who that is. Whoever it is, don't let him in this study, Mr. Pordens, until I get through questioning these people. Okay, Commissioner Whitton. Bunny was found uh, here, but... Mr. Lamont Cranston, sir. He says you know him. Oh, yes, I know him. Tell him... Oh, wait a minute. He tries to be an amateur criminologist. Let him come in. I'll show him how the police department really works. Yes. All right, you can come in, Mr. Cranston. Thank you. Ah, Commissioner Weston. How do you do? I just happened to be passing by the Borden house, and I thought you might be here. Well, Cranston, you want to test some of your amateur theories on crime, I suppose. Always willing to try, Commissioner? Well, you're liable to beat your brains out over this one. About three hours ago, Oscar Borden was found at his desk here with a nice round bullet hole in his head. And not a clue. Well, how distressing. Not a single clue, Commissioner? Well, we have two clues, but they don't make sense. Well... Perhaps they don't make sense to the professional detective, but no. an amateur on the intellectual side of crime might be able to help you out, Commissioner. Uh, what were the clues? Well, first I asked the cop on the beat if he'd seen any known crooks hanging around the building tonight. And? And the dumb guy told me he hadn't seen any, except at one time during the afternoon he thought he got a glimpse of Ralph Gorman. And Ralph Gorman is known to have threatened Oscar Borden. I see. And the other clue, Commissioner? The other clue was even slimmer. One of the maids says she heard a mouth organ being played in Mr. Borden's study about the time the murder must have been committed. Why, it all hinges together perfectly, Commissioner, don't you see? Ralph Gorman has threatened Oscar Borden. He plays the mouth organ, and he's been seen hanging around the house. Why, he's your murderer. Very pretty theory, Cranston. The only hitch is that Ralph Gorman was put to death last night at 11 o'clock in the electric chair at State Prison. Oh, well, he was? Yeah, you should read the papers. You see, as an amateur criminologist, you're not so hot after all, Cranston. Well, uh... Have you solved Oscar Borden's murder? Oh, no, not yet. Well, you're no better than I am, then. Commissioner Weston, if I were you, I'd put a guard of large, solid policemen around anyone Ralph Gorman might have had a motive to kill. Oh, yeah? And then what? Then I'd look for the ghost of Ralph Gorman. It's lucky you're not, police commissioner. Now, you'd better get out of here, Cranston. I've got important work to do. Continue with the second act of Ghosts Can Kill in just a moment. Homeowners, would you like to stop those tiresome trips to the cellar and keep furnace attention down to a minimum? Well then, here's what you do. Get in touch with your nearest blue coal dealer and ask him about blue coal's automatic heat regulator. It's a thermostat which is attached to the wall of your living or dining room that controls your furnace dampers automatically. Just set the thermostat control at the exact temperature you wish and your blue coal heat regulator will maintain that temperature day or night. You know yourselves how costly and dangerous to health overheating the house can be. But a heat regulator will ensure you steady, even warmth, which is most beneficial to the health of all. What's more, by stopping this overheating of the house, a heat regulator will save you fuel. And saving fuel means saving money. You can own one of these blue coal heat regulators for only $18.95 plus a small installation charge. And believe me, 
It will pay for itself in the time and trouble of constant draft adjustment it saves you. So, call your nearest Blue Coal dealer tomorrow. His name is listed in the Where to Buy It section of your classified telephone directory under the words, Blue Coal. Hello. Hello. Oh, I thought we were cut off, darling, but now I tell you, I'm all right. Oh, but Frank, I'm so worried. If, if only I were in town so I could be with you. But what is there to worry about, darling? Why, those threats that awful man Gorman made against oh, you. Oh, that, that was just nonsense. I never even knew him, and besides, he's dead. Yes, but Oscar Borden was threatened, too, and, and he's dead. Oh, now, Ruth, darling, please stop worrying for my sake. Nothing's going to happen to me. I'm, I'm in my own apartment, and I have no intention of going out. So nothing can happen. Now, you go to sleep and get your beauty rest. You know, uh, you've got to look your prettiest for our wedding, Tuesday. Oh, all right, dearest. At least I'll be with you by tomorrow. I'll be down on the 11 o'clock train in the morning. Oh, that's wonderful. And I'll meet you at the station. Good night, darling. Good night. Oh, poor Ruth. I don't know why women get so nervous about... Oh, I wonder who that could be. Hello? Is this Frank Collins? Yes, who's this? This is the Shadow. Oh, the Shadow. Yes, I've heard of you. What do you want? I want to warn you, Collins. Warn you against a death. Whose death? Yours. And why should you be warning me? Because if you're not very careful, you'll meet the same fate as Oscar Borden, and for the same reason. Oh, nonsense. Furthermore, I would suggest that if you value your life, you will apply without delay for police protection. Look, I don't know who you are, Shadow, or what your game is. But I'm not afraid of you or anybody else. Have it your own way, Mr. Collins. Have it your own way. Wait a minute. Wait, listen. Huh. He hung up. I wonder what that was all about. I certainly wasn't a very cheerful person to talk to. Maybe... Yeah, maybe I'd better get... Let's see, now, what's Commissioner Weston's home number? See, I think I've got it in here someplace. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here it is. Main... Nine... 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 Be calling at this hour. Now, where's that phone? Hello, Commissioner Weston speaking. Commissioner, this is Frank Collins. I just received a threat. Frank? Oh, oh you did? Yes, I, I was informed I'm about to meet Oscar Borden's fate. How are you on? Over the telephone just about five minutes ago by a man who calls himself the Shadow. The Shadow? Is he mixed up in this? How should I know? Wait a minute. What's the matter? I, I thought for a minute I heard a mouth organ play. Mouth organ? Oh, that's just your nerves, Collins. Is it all locked? No. Go lock it quick. All right, just a minute. Good Lord. I can hear the mouth organ myself over the phone. Collins! You're too late, Collins. Collins! You should have locked that door before you made the call. That's Ralph Gorman's voice. Collins! Who are you? Maybe you heard of me, Collins. I'm Ralph Gorman. Gorman! Oh, don't! Don't shoot! Don't! Oh. Now only one more to go. Operator! 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 This is Police Commissioner Weston. Get me headquarters. Hurry, operator. Hurry! Lamont. Now, come in, Margot. I just heard that Frank Collins was murdered in his home last night, Lamont. Yes. I've been reading the papers. It's dreadful. How could Ralph Gorman have come back from the dead to commit these murders? Margot, yesterday I would have said it was totally impossible. Today, well, frankly, I don't know. At this moment, I can't think of any other hypothesis that would account for the known facts. Then that means... Jiminy, I... What did you say? I merely said Jiminy. Why did you say that? Jiminy? I don't know. I was just thinking. Why? Does it mean anything? Ordinarily, no. In this instance, it may mean everything. At least it gives me a clue. Margot, is your car outside? Yes, Lamont. Well, come on. We're going places. Careful, Margot. Watch how you're driving. You told me to step on it. I thought you wanted to get to the Regal Hotel in a hurry. Well, I do, but I'd like to get there all in one piece. Well, this is a fine time to tell me that. Incidentally, why the Regal Hotel? Governor Roberts is staying there. He's addressing the manufacturer's dinner at the Colossus Club tonight. I'd like to be sure he lives to make it. Oh, Lamont, now you're being mysterious again. Why shouldn't Governor Roberts live to make his speech? Because I have reason to believe he's next on the list marked for murder. 
I have an idea that if any attempt is made on the governor's life tonight, it'll probably be tonight. Ah, here's the hotel. You'll just pull up the curb. All right. <laughs> I said up to the curb, dear, not over it. Oh, I think you're horrid. If I'm not mistaken, so will somebody else before the night's over. Well, goodbye, Margot, and uh, thanks for the ride. This is the service entrance, Governor. Go right through that door there. You'll be on Marine Street. Good, thank you. That's where I told my car to wait. Governor Roberts, do you think this is wise? Wise, Latham? Of course it's wise. What danger can there be? I'm going straight to the dinner at the Colossus Club alone, in my own car, with my own chauffeur. Well, just as you say, sir. Uh, through this door to the street, you said, Porter. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, where's my car? I told Henry to wait. Oh, there he is. To the Colossus Club, Henry. Henry, this is the most preposterous thing I ever heard of in my life. What's our police force turning into? A bunch of old women? Ralph Gorman? Of course I couldn't pardon him. The man was guilty. He certainly can't come back from the dead, can he, Henry? All this cock and bull story about playing a mouth organ, you don't believe... Henry, what's making that noise? Henry, did you hear me? Henry, what's the matter with you? This isn't the way to the Colossus Club. You're heading for the river. Stop the car. Henry, I... Why, you're not Henry. That's right, I ain't Henry, Governor. Don't you remember me, Ralph Gorman? Ralph Gorman? No. No, it's not possible. Well, you see me, don't you? And you remember how I used to play the mouth organ in the death house? Like this. Stop the car. Let me out. I'll let you out, all right, in ten feet of water when we get to the river. No, no. Let me out. You didn't let me out of the chair, did you, Governor? I burned, remember? Well, you'll drown. Stop the car! Stop it, I say, you'll kill us both! They can't kill a dead man, can you, Governor? Ah, oh. 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 uh, the old fool went and croaked by himself. Scared to death. Well, it saves me the trouble. <laughs> I wouldn't be too sure of that, Gorman. Hey, what? What's that? Governor Roberts is unharmed. He's only fainted. He has a weak heart. Who's that? Where are you? You didn't know you had the shadow as a passenger. Oh, the shadow, huh? Well, you can't hurt me. Even a shadow can't harm a ghost. But you're not a ghost, Gorman. Yeah, that's what you think. Don't you know that Ralph Gorman is dead? Certainly. But you're not Ralph Gorman. You're his twin brother, Arthur. That's a lie. No, it isn't, Arthur. I went down to the city records office and checked up on the birth certificate. A very pretty little story. Your mother had twin boys and concealed the fact from everyone. She brought you two up deliberately for a life of crime. Very convenient, wasn't it, Arthur? No matter what crime one of you committed, the other was always seen somewhere else at the same time to furnish a complete alibi. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Arthur Gorman, Ralph Gorman's twin brother. But if we hadn't got the hour mixed up, they'd never have convicted Ralph that last time. Too bad, wasn't it? After all the trouble your mother had taken for years to conceal the fact you were twins. How did you get on to it? Why, a friend of mine used the expression, Jiminy. And I naturally connected that with Gemini. I don't get it. You wouldn't. Gemini is the sign of the Zodiac, which means the twins. Well, Arthur, this is a very interesting discussion. But I think now you'd better stop the car. Oh, uh, yeah? What do you think I am, crazy? They're never going to burn me. That's a matter of opinion. All right, you got me, but I got you, Shadow. Got you where I want you. There's the river right ahead of us. I'm going to drive over the embankment. I'll drown, but so are you. I'll drive right over the edge. None of this emergency brake works, you won't. Oh, my Lord. Oh, what happened? Boy, look at that smash. Oh, those drunken drivers, they ought to be put in jail. She ran head on into the warehouse wall there. There's too many in there. Here's the doctor. Let me through. Let the doctor. There they are, Doc. I see. Stand back, please. Well, how about it, Doc? Well, I'll be... A man in back is Governor Roberts. Hey, Governor, Governor Roberts. Roberts. Is he? Roberts. No. He's all right, I think. Just painted. Shocked, probably. Hey, uh, Doc, how about the other guy? The chauffeur here is dead. Dead? That's too bad. 
Say, his face looks familiar. What is it? Do you know him? A dead guy in a chauffeur outfit is the living image of a gunman called Ralph Gorman. Ralph Gorman? It can't be. Ralph Gorman went to the chair last week. Well, if it ain't him, it's his twin brother. <laughs> if only you'd been able to tell us that a week ago, justice would have been served a great deal more quickly. In a moment, we shall introduce our distinguished guest, one of the special assistants to the Attorney General of the United States, the Honorable Francis H. Horan. But first, here's John Barclay, Blue Coal's heating expert, with some money-saving hints on furnace care and attention. Thank you, Ken Roberts, and good afternoon, friends. Last week, I discussed the three factors which cause heat to be lost up the chimney and how they can be corrected. This afternoon, I want to tell you about another common cause of wasted coal and heating inefficiency, namely ash pit loss. Ash pit loss means the unburned or partially burned coal which falls through the grates into the ash pit. This loss is due simply to shaking the grates too often and too vigorously. Don't shake the fire every time you throw on fresh coal. Let that depend on the weather outside. And when you shake the grates... Stop immediately when you see the first red glow in the ash pit. If you think you're not getting full value for your heating dollars, here's what you do. Call your neighborhood blue coal dealer. He'll be glad to have a trained John Barkley heating expert inspect your furnace. Remember, there's no charge or obligation on your part. So feel free to call on your blue coal dealer. I thank you. And now, on behalf of our sponsors, the Blue Coal Dealers, the nation over, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you one of the special assistants to the Attorney General of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Francis H. Horan. Thank you, Mr. Robert. I'm very happy to be here with you this afternoon and to have the opportunity of speaking to the audience of the Shadow Program. I am sure all law enforcement bodies in the United States agree with me when I say that constructive radio programs are a very great help in the prevention of crime. I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to prove, particularly to growing boys, the truth that crime in any form does not pay. Your program helps to bring this message to millions of people. So keep up the good work. We certainly shall, Mr. Horan, and thank you, sir, for stopping in. It's been a great honor to have had you with us. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by the Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is now on sale at your local newsstand.